Hey there everyone, Atesh here, back again with another video and welcome to this mega video on the C++. A lot of you have been requesting me that we really want to learn C++ from you. And not just from the perspective of clearing the exams in the college or university, but from a perspective where we actually learn C++ as well as we'll be able to use it in the future for any of our project, maybe you want to build games or maybe you want to participate in some competition, a thorough in-depth understanding of what C++ provides you. And exactly for this, this course is designed. Now C++ has a feature or kind of a evolution that it has taken over the years. It's not exactly the same language that you might be reading in your universities because there has been a lot of version update in this language. And I've tried my best to give you a little bit glimpse of what the future version looks like and what will be the uh, after versions that will give you more features like memory management and a whole lot of stuff that will be given to you. So this series is focused on such a way that you not only understand the programming basics, but also in depth of what C++ can provide you and how you can truly understand it. It's a fantastic language to work on with, and I actually learned it a little bit later on, not during my engineering, but later on, uh, to actually work on a project. And that's when I actually fall in love that, yeah, this language has so much to offer. But you actually learn this language not in the theories, not in the books, but actually while writing the code and understanding the future perspective of this language. And that's exactly the series is all about. I'm pretty sure you're going to absolutely love this series. So go ahead, follow along with me, make sure you write all the code. And it's a small humble request that you please make sure uh, hit that subscribe button. And in case the series is helpful for you, uh, do reach me out on social uh, media like Instagram or LinkedIn and just drop a thank note or maybe a suggestion that I would be really happy to get that. So hit that subscribe button and let's together start the journey of C++. And I'm 100% sure that you're going to absolutely 100% are going to love this. Let's get started with this amazing journey of C++. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to the bootcamp of C++. C++ is a very powerful and absolutely insanely fast programming language. It's not wrong to say that it's a beast of programming language, but this beast is not easy to tame. I first started with C++ during my engineering and quickly moved into other languages like Python or JavaScript because I found them much more easier to learn. Later on, while doing the masters, I realized that we need to just craft this project into C++. There is no other choice because of the speed and optimization that this language provides. And that's where I actually learned how powerful C++ can be and how we can utilize its absolute true power. Now, if you're coming up from other programming languages like Python or JavaScript, the syntax is going to look absolutely similar in variety of cases like if else, switch in case and conditionals and for loops and whole bunch of other things. But don't let this fool you. C++ is very powerful and at sometimes it can become a bit complex. This is not going to be a piece of cake that you can walk through. But still, I would recommend you to give it a go and learn this programming language. C++ can help you to bring up your absolute A plus game in competitive programming, as well as if you want to present this language or use this language in your whiteboard interviews, this can be absolutely charmer. And I'll try my best to make sure that everything is super understandable and easy to go through. But a lot of time you're going to require that you need to watch few videos probably multiple times or need to write the code along with me. So make sure you are absolutely serious and concerned about this language because this is a beast that we need to tame. I will also walk you through what are the prerequisites and all the tools that are going to be required and the syntax how this course is structured is totally different from my other courses. There are going to be a lot of topics that we are going to revisit again and again in probably multiple sections and that's probably the best way how you can grab the best out of the C++. I would also like to make a simple point here that a lot of books that you might have read in the past about the C++ or not, or maybe you have heard about the C++ during your college curriculum. Now make sure you just be open-minded about that curriculum and everything. C++ is not a dead language. Every few years there has an update that there is an update that keeps on coming and make sure you understand it's a con constantly evolving language. It's a very precious language and that's the reason why all of the big fan company use that and prefer a lot of programmer in it. I hope you are all excited and all are absolutely 
insanely crazy about this language by the end of this bootcamp. I'm really excited to present this bootcamp in front of you. Without wasting any more time, let's get started with C++ Bootcamp. Hey there everyone, Hitaish here, and in this video, we're gonna talk about some of the prerequisites, why it is absolutely important that you keep an open mind. Uh, apart from anything else, open mind is the most important thing for this language, as well as what are my recommendations for tools that you can use. Now, C++ is not a programming language that was created five or 10 years ago and people forgot about it. This language gets its update almost every two or three years. Now, there is definitely a release cycle which we can talk about it, but make sure you understand this very important point that C++ is highly backward compatible. So whatever you have learned in the past or whatever the code we are going to learn here as well, these upcoming updates are not going to make it break. They are always being supportive for the backward compatible and that's the reason why majority of FANG companies use that even in their web servers. This language is highly popular in the FANG. Now there are certain recommendations that I have regarding the tools that you should use or you should avoid while learning C++. Now one more thing I would like to mention here that in the very next uh, very future video we are going to talk about the release cycle and what are the updates that this language gets but you will notice that some of the points here that C++ release are not really as fancy as an iPhone release. There is not much of the talk on the YouTube or on the forums about the new uh, updates that has been released but let me assure you that this uh, this language has a great community and a lot of people are active participants there. Even in these conferences, you're going to find amazing high-level C++ developers from FANG companies as well as a lot of time the creator of this language is pretty common to find there and you can even meet him, greet him and there's a lot of vibrant community in the C++. Now let me walk you through with what are the tools that you should be using uh, while working with this C++. So let's go ahead and talk about it. So let's first talk about what are the tools that you need to have. Now the majority of the time you need just one thing in order to run C++ code which is GCC. Now there are a lot of IDEs or integrated development environment that already cooks up this GCC in your system. You just install that and you can run the C++ code. Now in most of the Linux system you might need to install GCC directly and then you can use any code editor, might be Visual Studio Code, Vim or whatever is your favorite text editor. In majority of the cases you might want something which is bundled up, you can just install it and forget about the configurations and stuff. In that case Xcode is a great tool if you are on a Mac. Xcode is really fantastic as an environment and you can just simply install it and just keep it go. There is nothing much to do there. I'll walk you through how you can uh, open up an Xcode and create these applications in C++. If you are on a Windows, I highly recommend Visual Studio for C and C++. This is a very robust tool and it's a insanely powerful. It can do a whole lot of things with code suggestions, code coloring and a whole bunch of other things as well. Now another option which is uh, comparatively new but it's getting a whole lot of popularity among the community which is Code Lite. Now I'm not saying this, these are the only ones, there are a whole lot of other set of tools as well but these are the most easiest one for a beginner to get started. So I highly recommend to choose between uh, these things. GCC for if you are on a Linux, if you are on a Mac, Xcode is going to be absolutely fine. Even on if you are on a Mac or on Windows, Visual Studio, C, C++ and Code Lite works there. I'll quickly walk you through with their website as well. So if you'll walk on to the GCC standards, you're going to notice that a whole bunch of versions are being supported here from 98 to 20, which is very recent in the C++. I'll talk more about these versions later on, but you can see that what versions are being supported, what features are being added or not, it's up there directly. And this is a very detailed bit of old school website, but it does the job. Now apart from that, Visual Studio C++ is here on uh, this website and you can download it with C++, Community, Professional and Enterprise Edition. Of course, you know the reasons for that. Community is free, professional, you have to pay a small amount of fees and enterprise. Definitely, it's a software being used by a lot of system developers and they pay for it a lot. So it's a pretty good and you can see that all of the versions of C++ are being supported. Now I know, because you have studied the C++ in the past as well, 
getting these numbers here that hey C++ has version might be a little bit new for some of your developers but don't worry I'll walk you through with that as well so don't need to worry about that. The great thing is there is a Linux development environment here as well uh, with the C++ you can go ahead and read that it's going to walk you through a whole lot of things here. Now Code Lite is uh, fairly new but it supports all of the major compilers that are for the C++. Very lightweight and very kind of a uh, colorful interface that it gives to you and definitely there's a lot of support that is involved in here constant updates are there. Now let's come back and talk a little bit more on to two things which I also want to point at this point. Now you will notice that there are a little bit of the debate about can I use online editors or can I use Turbo C++. Now I'm not really a big fan of online editors. The real development which you need to deploy on some servers actually happen on real machines where you install all of these editors and all of these compilers. Now surely in order to test a quick logic I also use sometimes these online editors but for majority of the real world development you need some kind of installation done on your system. These compilers are great but sometimes they don't give you much of information about what versions of the compiler they are using behind the scene and also when you want to learn more about the writing of files and reading of the files they don't allow it because of the security concern. So if you want to fully understand a subject I highly recommend to use these uh, offline editors or installation version. If there is any update that goes on in the online editors you have no idea how that worked on. So it's absolutely required that you go through the pain and you understand that how these things are installed. I also don't recommend you to Turbo C++ although it's a very it was one of the very popular editor along uh, among some time ago but Turbo is not really recommended uh, at least in this course because it doesn't have that much of the features and feels and nice looking thing uh, compared to other editors. So I highly recommend to go a bit professional way probably Visual Studio Code or Xcode whatever is your system is. So that's all the prerequisite is there and please make sure you are a bit open minded because whatever you have learned in the C++ in the past it's going to be a little bit different here. So only requirement is please be open minded. That's it for this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone Hitesh here and I hope if you are watching this video that means everything is installed in your system. You are able to use any of the IDE. I don't really specific that you should only this one. Whatever the IDE you are using you are able to write code in it and when you hit a play button that means it runs some of the code. If not don't worry I'll walk you through in the in these videos as well that how to do that. But he really one thing I want to specifically mention here that C++ is very close to system and that means there is a crazy amount of detail that you need to understand that you need to go through with this language actually deals up. And this is the reason why C++ is a powerful programming language as well as it is fast. So I'll talk a lot about how actually application runs and how it builds up and I'll try to give you enough of the real world experience that you enjoy this language as well. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about the very first thing which is hello world. Now hello world is a customary program that has been there in every programming language. It obviously got started with the C and the whole idea behind having a hello world program is to understand the anatomy of the programming language as well as to make sure that everything is working fine in your system. Now it's not really compulsory to start with hello world but I don't want to break the customary thing which is being done in every programming language. So let's first understand before moving into C++ that why do we need hello world and what are the things you're going to be introduced for the very first time. Just assume for a moment that you want to design a game in C++. Now this game can be in any other programming language and the syntax behind the scene every language works in this exact same criteria. So for example if you are designing a game you will be first having some of the things some of the magic that goes on behind but first thing is somebody clicks on a button. When he clicks on a button then we create an account for him. Once the account is being created then we simply add life to the player so that he can play and can die in the game. Now you might be thinking hey that's pretty easy. Now the way how every programming language works or most of the programming language work is the top to bottom approach. The code that you write first executes first and then after that and after that. But what is actually what if I say that all of these programs are there in its own separate file. Now program might get confused that hey which one should I run first create button or add life to player. 
and there are chances that this might give some of the error to programming language. In order to solve these programming language, they have decided that even if the programs are on their own separate file or even in just the one file, we will just bunch them up together and there will be a main method which will execute these programs. Now, I don't want you to expect that uh, I understand the very first thing that, hey, what is main method and all of that. We will decide them a bit later on, but right now, this is the only thing that you need to worry, that in order to just make sure that we have a single entry point from where everything starts, we have something known as main, what this is, how it works, we'll walk through with that later on. So right now, I would like to fire up my Xcode, I'll minimize this, and I'll bring up my Xcode, and there we go. I've also created a file on my desktop, not file actually, a folder which is totally empty, which is CPP Bootcamp. I highly recommend to create that, CPP Bootcamp or LCO CPP Bootcamp or something like that. We'll be creating uh, all of our application inside that and I'll attach all of the code in, in the attachment as well so that you can take a look on the code. I highly recommend to please go through along with me. We're about to start a bit of debate about what is C++, what is not in the Hello World program itself. So make sure you are aware of that. So what I'll do here is, it, at the bottom here it says, on the middle one it says, create a new Xcode project. Now in your IDE it might be different, but this is all what we need as of now. Now make sure you are not into the iOS, you are into the macOS and where it says command line tool, you want to select that. Go into macOS and click on command line tools and click on next. The moment you say next, this is gonna say product name and I'm gonna say this one as uh, simply hello world. I'll try to keep everything as lowercase, hello world, and I'll tell you the reason about that uh, later on. And make sure once you select the language here, that should be C++. And that's the only requirement. You can place your organization name as LCO, identifier as LCO, and rest of the things can be according to you as well. Make sure that the names are all lowercase. I'll walk you through more about that as well. And make sure the language is C++. Now click on next. It will ask you where should I save it. And I'm gonna save it on my desktop in the CPP bootcamp. And I'll just click on create there. And now within a few seconds, it's gonna be there. It says no author information was supplied by the version control system. I'll fix that later on. It just want to insert my name in the version controlling. You don't have to worry about it. If it is there, just click on cancel and no need to worry anything on that. Now, once you see that, you'll notice that there are a couple of things here in my system at least. It is hello world, which is having a file main.cpp and there is a products as well, which is having something hello world. Now let's go ahead and also see that in the, co in the finder as well or the explorer as well. Here in the hello world, I have got a few extra files which are code editor specific file. You won't be having that. If I go up here, there is just one file, main.cpp. But here in my editor, it says there is a products as well. What this is, how it is going on. I'll talk about more about the compile language later on. But right now, this is all what we need. I'll bump the font a little bit so that we can see up here. Now, when I run this program directly, it's going to open a small window and it's going to say, hey, this is all going on. If I just open up these small windows here, notice here, it says hello world. And this is what gonna be my scenario for running the program. I think this is the most easiest one for me to explain things for you. And we can see hello world is being printed. But this code might not look like very C++-ish to you. There's a whole lot of different debates about how this program works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove all of this and I'm gonna write a code which definitely you can argue is C++ or not C++. Now, instead of removing, I'm going to comment all of this so that it doesn't execute. You can press control and press, press the slash key. That means this is a comment. This means this is a text. This code will never execute. Although it is there, it's not really a fun. It is just like, it's there, I don't care about it. So let's go ahead and write a bit of not so C++, but still C++ program. I highly recommend to follow along with me because this is the very first time you're writing it. There's gonna be surely some of the errors that you might make, but just follow along with me. First, I'm putting up a pound sign, that means hash. You might be using them on Instagram, I know. And then we simply go ahead and say include, and then inside these angular brackets, these ones, uh, also known as less than greater than kind of a sign, I'm gonna simply say CSTDIO. 
Now, of course, I do agree here, right from the very first moment you're saying, hey, this is not a C++ program. We use IO stream for that. I'll talk about that later on. Right now, I want you to just follow along with me. Now, after that, there is a common thing that says using namespace std. Now, what that is, ah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that shortly. And then after that, I want you to write int which is a short form for integers. We'll talk about them as well. And then we simply can go ahead and say main, just directly put pair of parentheses. Remember in the slides we talk about this main? Yes, this is exactly the main entry point. And then after that, open up a curly brace and hit enter. It's gonna automatically add an ending curly braces for you. And here, all we want to do is write a statement that says puts. And inside the puts, or just after the puts, use these parentheses and then we're gonna simply write a few words here. And the first one is gonna be simply saying, click on button, and we're gonna repeat that again. We're gonna say put, again, the same stuff, use these codes, and then simply say, uh, create a new player. And one more time, just for the last one, we're gonna say put, and there we go. And we're gonna write it again, and we're gonna say add life to layer. And once you are done writing all of the things that you really want to write, we simply go ahead and say return a zero. Now one of the most important thing about the C++ is how do we say that my line is ended. Now once one statement or one line of code is done and you want it to execute, you simply put a semicolon after that. And this is very important. The semicolon plays a big role here and that needs to be an indication that my line actually terminates. We're gonna save this one. We're gonna hit run this one again. And notice this time you see click on button, create a new player and add life to player. So we were able to design this very small, very teeny tiny game-ish thing that we have seen here. Now in the next video, I'll talk a lot more about how this is actually different from the code that we have seen here and what are the different versions that you usually see and how it is actually differ from a lot of things. So there we go, you have written up your very first controversial Hello World program, and we'll discuss more about it in the next video. Let's go ahead and catch up there. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, and in this video, we are going to have a debate about what's actually a C++ program and what's not actually a C++ program. In the last video, we created a program which is a bit controversial, and if you'll write this exact same program, a lot of people will come and will debate you about whether this is actually a C++ program or a C program. It's a very common thing because what the things you have been seeing probably are not being that much updated or nobody has discussed you these things in detail about it. So let's go ahead and first talk about it. So as we can see here, if I'll just close this one here, we have now two programs here. One is being commented out, that means it doesn't work, and one which is actually running here and we notice that it gives us successful output. If I will uncomment this, now there are two main methods in my program and if I'll try to run this one, this will give me an error. The conflict simply says, now there are two main methods. I don't know what should be the entry point of mo my program. You are making it absolutely confusing by writing two main methods here. And that's what this program is showing us an error. I'll just simply ignore these errors as of now, but again, we will talk about more, them, more about these uh, later on. Surely this is not possible. Or even I would like to comment this so that we can get rid of this uh, red line is error here. Now, first and foremost, the debate that's gonna come up is that this is not a C++ program because you are using a C standard input output library here. And also, since I cannot see a C out here, just like we can see here, there is a put statement. That means it's not a C++ program. Now, this is not true. This is absolutely not a valid statement. If your program is being executed by the C++ compiler and that compiler can successfully run it, it arguably is a C++ program. And in fact, that's according to my logic is a perfectly fine program. Now here, definitely we are taking advantage of some of the standard libraries which are more uh, friendly towards the C, but for this particular simple program, I think that's the best way to go through. Now surely we will take advantage of the libraries which are more closely towards the classes and the C++ like IO stream, which are also called as moreover like C++ programs. Uh, we're gonna take advantage of them later on. 
Now, keeping this debate aside, whether this is a proper C++ program or not, let's go ahead and compare these two with the programs which you generally or usually see in the books, as well as the code editor gives us as a default. The first line of statement here at line number nine, you can see it says hash include IO stream, but we called it as hash include CSTDIO. Now, the reason why I called it this way is simply because there are so many libraries, both in C and C++. And many of them are a cross-platform or kind of a cross-programming friendly. And you can use IO stream or you can use STDIO as well. Now, both of these libraries has variety of functions or utilities that you can use for variety of purposes. For example, the C out is inside this file, which is IO stream, which helps us to give an output. Now in the C STDIO, we have this puts method which helps us to display something on the screen. Again, both are doing the same job, so both are fine, there is no big deal here. After that, you're gonna notice that we have written an extra line which says using namespace standard. And here there was no such line. We'll talk about these namespacing later on in great depth so that you understand it. But even if you want to totally avoid it, you absolutely can. The only new thing that you're gonna see here is in the line number 13, it says std colon and colon. This is the new syntax or a bit more code that you have to write every single place if you just avoid this line. So in our case, it makes sense to have this line. We'll surely talk more in detail about what is this standard namespace later on. Right now, I just want you to have, this is gonna be in mostly the programs that we are gonna write, so make sure you just keep a habit of it. After that, we can see here in line number 20, we wrote a simple integer or int and wrote a simple main method. But in most of the programs and online blogs, you're gonna see that inside this main method, there is a whole lot of jargon that is being included. Now, according to the new standard of the C++, you don't need to include this uh, entire jargon if you are not using it. And that's why we are using this syntax according to the modern C++. We don't need this much of jargon. Now, in some cases, when we absolutely need it, then only we are going to include it. Otherwise, you don't need it. You can just write a simple basic main method here. Now, inside that comes up a very arguable thing, which is C out. Now in most of the C++ program, and especially in the universities, they never actually uh, deviate from this. They always write C out, then these two arrows, and then the string like hello world, and then a slash in. Now I'll talk more about these later on as we progress in the course, but I think if you just want to print any, any simple thing like hello world or your name or anything, puts is absolutely fine to use. Now we'll talk more about this, why the C out is being used, why we are doing an operator overloading, is it good, is it not, is it syntax friendly or not, we will talk about that later on definitely. But definitely there are two ways that one is C out and using these two arrows and then you can pass on a string and can print it or you can use my method here. Another interesting thing that you should note here that we are writing a return zero. Return is a specific keyword in the program that simply says, I'm done all executing, I'm all happy, I'm all good. Now my program is executing with zero. That means there was no error in running this program. I'm happily ending this program. So this happily ending this program simply means return zero. Now when I run this program, you're gonna notice that this is also being given to me at the end here. Program ended with exit code zero. If your program is, program is exiting with another exit code, instead of zero, there is anything else like one or two or any number, that means there was some issue with your program and it didn't self terminate it. It was terminated forcefully by compiler or there was some error that was hit. So this is a whole comparison about the thing. I hope now you can debate with your friends or your teacher uh, that this is a C++ program or not. Now, I don't expect you to win this argument because sometimes people can be a bit crazy and overly cautious about what is C++ and what is not. But the whole idea is if your compiler can run it and compiler is specifically on C++, I think that's a fair to say that it's a C++ program. Now, since we have seen a lot about the versioning that uh, just by having a same program on same system, we can run it with a couple of different ways. It's a good time that we understand more about what are the C++ versions when they were introduced and what were the new features that was introduced to them. So let's go ahead in the next video and talk about the versioning of the C++. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and I would like to begin this video by asking you a simple question. Is C++ free? 
And of course, majority of you will answer that C++ is absolutely free, which is not really true. Most of people and beginners on internet believe that everything which is available on GitHub or is just available is just free. It is not the case, but don't you worry. For all the learning purposes and what we're gonna discuss, it's actually totally free apart from course, but uh, again, this is not true. Whatever you see on the internet is not free and sometimes you have to pay some of the fees and that's how things works. Everybody needs to pay their bill, no matter how rich or how poor they are. So let's uh, talk about this argument. I'll talk about uh, some of the versioning in the C++. Remember, you don't need to memorize all of this information, you just need to know about it. Okay, first and foremost, the usual question that uh, is being asked while learning the C++ is what is the official resource or official documentation of C++? To be honest, C++ really don't care much about the official documentation unless and until you are paying them a little. The so-called official documentation is isocpp.org and you can see the standards given here. And you'll notice two big FAQs here. And you're gonna also notice that if you try to read directly from this version, it's not really very friendly. And in fact, they even mention it here when they answer the FAQ, why is the standard hard to read? They say, the standard is not intended to teach you the C++, rather it's an international treaty. So they never say that we are gonna be teaching you C++ through the documentation, unlike the documentation that you see in uh, Python or JavaScript or HTML or Bootstrap. This is not the case for C++. Also, they also answer this question that why are the working material uh, freely available on GitHub and when the standard needs to be purchased from ISO. So they also sell you these standards and if your application is heavily dependent on the C++, you might want to spend some money in purchasing that rather than just uh, totally be dependent on the draft. Therefore, the draft version is available on GitHub, but if you want the standards there, then of course they have given a full reason why you should be buying, why when you can avoid this buying. Again, for all these courses, we won't be buying anything. The things are absolutely there, but again, maybe later on you'll be working in some fan companies and later on you see that, hey, they buy these standards and you'll be using their reference material. Don't get surprised. This is a common thing in the industry is to pay for what they are using up and that's a good practice. Now let's go ahead and talk about the versioning of C++. We have been discussing and we have seen on the GCC compiler as well that C++ comes with variety of versioning. And I'm pretty sure most of you have already read during your universities or your college or your school days that C++ was designed by Barney and uh, the great Barney and uh, it's being released in 1988. It's an upgraded version of C. Previously, it was called as C with classes, but that was not really cool. They called it as later on as C++ or the next version of C. Now, surely the story is absolutely 100% true. C++ derive a lot of his concept from the C. Doesn't mean you need to start learning from C and then only have to move C++. Anybody can learn this language directly. If you have any past experience of programming, whether in C, whether in Java, whether in JavaScript or Python, it surely is going to help. So that's, let's keep this out of the debate. Now C++ gets a lot of versioning and a lot of revisioning over the new advanced feature. As the resources and system get update, the computers get more advanced, then surely the programming language needs to roll out some of the update to take full advantage of these systems. As you can see here that in the 2003, the C++ version 3 came out and it included very basic features like value initializers and a couple of other uh, refinements over the existing one. The major release or the major updates came into the C++11, which was in 2011, and they introduced us some of the great features known as lambdas, null pointers, R value references, and a whole bunch of other things. This version was alone responsible for bringing up the A game of the C++. A lot of resources got updated and this gave us, this lambda alone gave us so much of the power that everybody just loved it. Then in C++14, which was released in 2014, the templating was uh, much more advanced in this feature and it got so much of the revision in the templating and all the templating that you see while the whiteboard interviews and stuff actually are using the C++14 templating features that are being introduced here. 
in the 2017, the seven, uh, C++ 17th version came out. This version was not too much for introducing new feature. Yes, of course, there were fold expressions and a whole bunch of other things. But this version was more about the refinements over existing lambdas, existing variable templating, and a whole bunch of other things. So this was more over under the hood refinement. And in the latest release in the C++ 2020, or also known as C++ 2A, uh, which was released recently in 2020, there being majorly four things being introduced in this one. And out of that four, the three are the range libraries are now available in C++, just like Python and other languages. We do have coroutines and modules. Now these coroutines and modules are introduced in the C++ because some of the new languages came out uh, like Golang, which were giving a tough competition to C++ because they were using these multi-course and multi-threaded uh, machines pretty nicely and very optimizely. So C++ introduced these coroutines and modules so that this language can also perform to at its best while using all the threads and all the cores of computer. So as you can see, this language gets a whole lot of updates over the time and it's not a language which was created 10 years ago and then forgotten about it. There's a whole lot that keeps on going in the community and I think this is a completely fresh look that you're getting about this language in this course. I'm really excited to present this all to you. So that's it. That's all the theoretical things that you need to know about it. Let's move into the next section and talk a bit more about the syntactical charm that is being given to you by C++. Let's catch up in the next section. Hey there everyone, Hatish here and welcome to this new section. Now in this section, just keep one thing in mind that we will be talking a whole lot of things. We'll be talking about variables, methods and a whole bunch of other things. Just keep in mind that this is a little bit different from my other courses. So this is not like we'll be talking about one subject and that's it. We'll be talking here in depth and that's it. We are all done. In this course, we will be revisiting the topics again and again and again because that's the best way to learn C++. So make sure that you understand we will be touching the subjects like a variable declaration or methods or functions, but we will be definitely revisiting them. This is a bootcamp, this is going to be in depth and there's going to be a lot of talking to understand the subject. So first and foremost, let's try to dissect a program which we have seen in the past, sort of hello world. Not exactly, there is no line hello world, but it is sort of a statement. So understand this program or understanding some of the chunks of it is very important. First and foremost, at line number five, you can see there's a statement that says puts, click on the button and it is being terminated by a semicolon. This, in terms of terminology, is known as a statement. A statement is just a single line of code which is terminated by semicolon. Here, it is just putting up the hello world or sort of a string, but it can be used for multiple purposes. Maybe you want to design a game where you want to keep a track of how much the, way or the, how much the player is scoring in the game, so that score can be a variable. And there's a whole bunch of other things we will be talking about that, but remember just one line of code is known as one statement in the program. Next come up is this statement here or this entire block of code which is from line number four to line number nine. Before we talk and discuss about it, remember there are three type of brackets or parentheses in programming language. It is very important that you get a clear cut idea what we call which one of them. If you'll just mess around with them in the naming, it's not good for you. First and foremost, just after the main, there are parentheses. These are always called as parentheses, not as brackets. Then we have these curly braces, or simply known as braces. And after that, the square ones are known as brackets. Very important, maybe you want to rewind the video for a few seconds and want to watch it again, but make sure you never get confused between parentheses, brackets and curly braces. So keep that in mind always. So here we can see that line number four to nine is a block of code known as function. A function starts with a keyword int, but never, it is not compulsory to always starts with int. Int is just an integer. I'll give you more examples in this video also. But after that comes up the function name here, main. And yes, I know some of you might be saying, hey, it's too early for you to talk about um, methods here. We haven't talked about variable declaration, a whole bunch of other things. But this is the building block of C++. You need to have at least one revision here. And then later on, we'll do again a revision of that. And remember, 
every method uses these pair of parentheses and after that a curly braces which is a block of code and inside the block of code there can be just one line or multiple lines here so make sure you keep that in mind and after that at the very end notice the line number four and line number eight here we are putting int here and in the return statement we are returning a zero which is also an integer so this is going to be very helpful for us now, regardless of keeping what's the variable, what's the conditional, or anything else, we're going to talk a bit on this building block here. So let's go into the hello world and talk a little bit more here. So we have defined this main here, and we have seen that there can be only one main method here. But from the knowledge which I've gained in this video, can I declare more of such methods? Let's try to give it a go uh, with the templating that we can use here. And again, this is not C++ templating. Template simply means a structure, okay? So for example, there is another keyword in CPP, which means as void. Void means nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. If your program is gonna use this keyword void and say, let's just name this as nothing, you can name it anything, use a pair of parentheses, there we go, and then curly braces and hit enter, automatically the ending curly braces comes up here. And since my program just returns a void means nothing, I can just simply use and simply say puts and I can simply say hello world, finally a hello world in our program, just like that. And this is completely a valid syntax. This is not going to run right now. We'll talk about that running later on. And of course, make sure you don't forget the semicolon because this is a statement here. It needs to end uh, with a semicolon here. And similar to this, right now we say it void. That means I don't need to return anything. My program doesn't return anything. Here it says my program will return an integer. So we have to return a zero here. It can be one as well, uh, but usually you're gonna see zero here, but some programs are designed that they return one or more numbers there. Now I'll give you one more example. Just like we have nothing, we have integer. What about the strings and character? You simply can use a char for character and can say, uh, I am a char, and that's a method name. So make sure you put a pair of parentheses and then curly braces. And this time we're gonna say, this guy actually returns a character, means it just returns H for my name, Hitesh. There we go. This is also a completely valid syntax. So I told you, it's not really tough. Without having the knowledge about what is variable, how to store the data or conditionals, we were able to design these methods and told you it's not really tough. It's super easy. You just need to take care that why and how you're defining your methods, you return exactly what you say. So here we said we promise to return an integer, we are returning it. Here we said void means we are gonna not return you anything, we are following that. If we say char, then it says, yes, we are returning a character. Here, if I try to return a zero, this is gonna give me an error. When I save it, it's not gonna give me any. When I build it, uh, this is building correctly because it's not being executed right now, but it's a runtime error that, hey, you promised me to return a character, but you're returning me a zero. This is, this is wrong. Make sure to keep your promises. Okay, so I'm gonna put up this here as a character. Characters are enclosed by single quotes, not double quotes. Now, before I end this video, I would also like to talk a little bit on the syntax which is going on here, means slashes. Now, whenever you add a two slashes in your program, two slashes, that means this is a comment. And this is uh, for your reference only. Compiler doesn't care about this. This is your own personal notes or your comments. Now, I prefer the way of using the two slashes because they are much more easier. And this is how I prefer. The reason why I prefer them is because I don't have to find an empty line to write any comment if I want to. If I want to make my notes here that says uh, return an exit, return an exit with zero code, I can do it. And anything after the slashes on the right hand side is being ignored by compiler. And that's the reason why I use it. But there is another syntax of writing the comment which is available in the C++ which starts uh, with the slash and the s trick and then I can go ahead and write it. Make sure it starts with this and ends with s trick and slash. And here uh, I can write multi-line comment. And this is a common scenario that you're gonna see. A lot of people use this. I don't use it that much because it's a little bit overwhelming for me 
and it doesn't have this nice syntax where I can just select a bunch of code and can say control slash or command slash to uncomment a whole bunch of lines. This is a much more easier syntax for me. So now in this video, we talked a lot about these methods as well as the comments and how things are uh, being used. This is known as return type. So make sure when next time we talk about it, you remember the name. We talked in this video about the return type. Okay, I hope you got it. It was not really hard, pretty easy, and we talked about the comments also. So that's it for this very easy and lightweight video. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, and welcome to the video. And one of the best way of learning the programming language is to have a goal that what you really want to achieve. In this, or in this section at least, the goal is really simple. I want to be able to create a program where I can ask a user what is your favorite color, and user should be able to type a color, probably red, and then simply say, hey, red is awesome, it's my favorite too. Although it sounds like a very simplistic program, but if we go in depth of this program, we can learn a whole lot about the C++. Now surely you can find the solution of this program over the internet pretty nicely and easily, copy paste it and run it, but I think you are not here for that. You are here to understand what's going inside of it, what's the basics of it, and a whole bunch of other things. So that's exactly what we'll be learning in this. I've created a new project here, just like we did in the last section, and this is the default code that is given to me by Xcode. When I run this uh, simple line of code, it gives me a simple hello world, then a new line, which is program ended with exit code uh, zero. So this is what it has been given to me. I want to rewrite this entire program in my own way. So let's go ahead and do it one more time. This time, instead of commenting out, I'll just delete everything from here and we'll write everything from scratch so that we can understand more of it. Now here's a side note. We won't be able to create this program as of now because we don't have enough of knowledge. First, we'll create a very similar to what our goal is program, and then we'll discuss a whole lot about theoretical aspect, what needs to be done, what needs not to be done, and then we'll come back here, we'll iterate our program again and again, we'll finally able to get a kind of production ready program. Not exactly, but yeah, it will be able to solve our purposes. Now, first and foremost, you use a simple hash or the pound sign, and we simply say include. Now, there are two types of include which are more popular. The first one is with the double quotes, and there's another one which is with the angular braces here. We will be talking about what's the difference between each of the each one of them, but majority of the time when things are already defined for you, uh, something like a C standard input output or maybe the C++ favorite which is IO stream, then we go ahead and use these angular braces. Now surely you can download more header files. These are known as header files. You can download more header files uh, which are more frameworks or libraries of C++ and can take advantage of them as well. Right now, I don't have much. I just simply want to say that there is IO stream and definitely I mistyped it. IO stream, IO stream, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we have included this file. That means I can take advantage of all the methods that are inside this file. These all header files have a lot of methods just like we had puts. So somewhere there might be a definition of puts where it actually works. So that put is defined in the C stream file and we have got some IO stream methods as well. Moving forward, we noticed in the very first video that we can promise that I'll return you an integer and then I can define my main method followed by a parenthesis and then the curly braces. So this should be no problem for you. Since we have promised that I'll return you an integer, I can come back here and at the end of the program, we always return a zero. Now here's a side note that you might want to take. The moment the program hits return zero, no matter what you write after that, probably uh, you want to write something like puts uh, hello world or anything, it's not gonna be executed. I'll write something here and we'll walk you through that how this actually works. Remember one note, after the return keyword, whatever you are returning, the program or this entire method is not gonna execute anything after that. Okay, now moving forward. Now let's go ahead and do some more stuff. I want to print a simple hello world on my screen. So remember we have to use std, then two columns, and then I can use a cout. There are two methods, cout and cin. Cout simply means I want to display something on the screen. Cin means I'm gonna give you some of the input. So when I say cout and I use these two, uh, these two arrows, I'll talk about these arrows later on, and I'll talk about some of the discussion about whether it is good to use them or not and what kind of ambiguity they can create. 
We'll discuss about that later on. Right now, I'm gonna just simply use two quotes and I'm gonna say hello there. Make sure you don't use single quotes, you use double quotes here. And at the end of it, I'm gonna put up a semicolon. Now let's go ahead and give it a try and save this and try to run this program. I run this program and I notice here that it says hello there, but it's not bringing up a new line. This time everything is just being printed on the same line. So how can I do a new line? That's the skill I have to learn. There are a couple of ways how you can do it. You can come up here and can say slash n, which is a very special thing. And when I save this and run this one, you are gonna notice that this time I get a new line. Now there are a couple of other ways which we are going to talk and what the slash n thing is, but there is another thing that you can do. Before the semicolon, you can come back here and you can use two slashes and then again you can say std colon colon and you can say end l. And what this is going to do, exactly the same thing that we have seen in the slash n. When I run this, there we go. It says program ended with exit code zero. So we need to discuss a little bit about what is the C out, what is the slash n that we discussed about and what basically is the standard and how we can reduce this. Just to give you a brief overview or a brief hint, we can write it here something uh, known as using uh, namespace and std and once I declare this, I can shorten my code by removing this and also by removing this and now it looks much better. And when I can simply run this program, this gives me exact same output. But remember, all of them are the same. So now we need to discuss a little bit of the things that how the C out is working, what is this arrow things, NL, and a whole bunch of other things. So we need to get back onto the theory session, discuss more about it. Then we're gonna iterate this program one more time and a couple of more times. Let's move into the presentation in the next video and talk a little bit more about what is this all going on. What is namespacing in CSS? This is a subject or topic which is usually discussed later on in the courses or books. I am not really a fan of that. I think you should get a clear idea why this namespacing is being used right from the very start. And it's not really tough, it is actually super easy to understand. First and foremost, as I said, be open-minded. Don't just assume that C++ is a language which can build up things on just command line. It's a pretty versatile language and it can even build up the web application just like your Python or your Node.js and JavaScript. This language can build web applications and in fact is being used in building web application. Surely it is not really very popular among the startups because having a programmer of C++ first and foremost is expensive. It is really capable of generating super fast application, but the architecture that is being used behind the scene is, can, is really tough to manage. And that's the reason why majority of the people at Google and Dropbox level, they use this infrastructure and language. Now moving forward on that. So what is this namespacing? So first and foremost, we saw that when we were not using this statement here, we had to use something like std and then two columns. So what is that syntax? We're gonna understand that and it's really, really simple. So I would like to understand or give you an example of a simple web application. So let's talk about what is this namespace. Let's just say there are multiple people working on a web application which is being built up in C++. One of the programmer and came up and write this login system for this application and for some reason he defined a method which says get ticket which is doing something we don't know what it is doing but it is doing something another programmer who is working on the same application wrote another file which is sign up and said hey i have a method get ticket now right now you can see these methods are exactly same they are identical there is no difference in it. But in the working part, they are totally different. Now, how can you define, and if you write a simple program which says get to get and get to get, your program might be absolutely confused that which one should I use first from the sign in or the login. Now, surely their internal working might be different or might be the same, doesn't really matter. The point is program is confused and it's never a good idea when your program is confused. Program should have absolute clarity about what is being used. In order to give more clarity to your program, this syntax is being used, which says, hey, first and foremost, I want to say get to get need to be used from the sign up file or sign up module, whatever you like to call it here, doesn't really matter at this point. And again, when the second time I'm calling it, it says I want to use this method from the login file this time. And notice here the two column syntax. 
Told you, it's really simple. It's not really that hard. And the, another thing that you need to understand here that, that right now, when I define something like use namespace standard, this line simply means throughout this entire line or after declaring this line, whatever I'm using by default, these all methods are coming up from this standard library, module, file, whatever you want to call that. We'll discuss more about this naming as well. But right now, everything is coming from standard. So I don't need to specifically point every single time that standard to colon use C out, use a standard colon C out. It is mentioned here that every single time whenever I am using any of the methods, they're coming up from the standard file and you can use it. If I don't use you, if I don't declare this line here, then writing this is compulsory. So there we go. I told you it's really simple. Now surely there can be many other things that we can discuss here like scopes and rules and there can be other namespacing as well, probably something like uh, XYZ and there you can have it. These are also discussable things which we can discuss later on. But I think this is all good information that you need to know right now. I hope you have enjoyed this example as well and I'm pretty sure you're gonna kind of never forget about these namespacing. So there we go, we understand this point here. Now we're gonna do an iteration of this program in the next video, then we'll understand more things. That's gonna be more fun as well. Let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here. And in this video, we're gonna do the very first iteration to move closer to our goal, which was taking an input from the user about what is your favorite color and then display that, hey, that is awesome and my favorite color too. So we're gonna be moving one step closer to this. We have understood a whole lot of things. This iteration will give a lot of subjects to talk on. We will be doing that definitely and then we'll move forward. So first and foremost, uh, right now I think this hello world is all good. We have all understood this. I can delete this line here. Since again, I'll be returning this zero because that's a compulsory thing, so I have to do it. Now let's move forward and talk to something here. Now notice here that I was able to declare this integer. Similarly, if I want to reserve some of the memory or let's just say you are designing a game or a bank account, you might be storing some values there for the bank account, your account number, uh, how much is your bank balance, what is your name. So we need some of the variables or some of the memory space where I can store all of these information. This is done through the variables or the constant, depends on what you're using. And in the C++, first and foremost, I have to define explicitly that what type of value is gonna come up in that memory location. It can be integer, it can be character, it can be string, it can be a whole lot of other things as well. We'll discuss more about that. So first and foremost, I'm gonna say int and I'm gonna say number. Now make sure you explicitly call this as number and then you put a semicolon here. We'll discuss about these namings as well in a minute, but right now this is all I want you to do. Once you have this, then I'm gonna simply say we are using a simple uh, C in. Now this time we are using a C in, so make sure you use these arrows. We'll talk about these arrows as well in one video, but right now this is all what I want to do. And then I'm gonna say number. So what this line actually means, that I have actually declared a number, which is a reserved memory space. C in is responsible for taking input from the user and whatever the input comes in, I just want to store that input in a number. Okay, great so far. And then I want to use one another syntax, which is printf. Now in the printf, not, on, not this one, let me command Z, uh, printf. And I use a pair of parentheses after that. Of course, make sure you put a semicolon. Here, I'm gonna say uh, something like this. Your ID is, and then I use a person D here. So make sure you put a person D here. And then we're gonna put up a comma. And then whatever the number value is, I'm gonna add three to it. So I'm gonna say plus three. So a lot of things are happening here and still we need to insert a bit more stuff here. So first and foremost, I have declared a number and then this C in is going on the terminal and will bring the value for the number. In the printf syntax, I'm saying your ID is. This person D is known as a placeholder and this placeholder value is calculated just after the comma, which is number. But not only that, we are adding three to that number. First, let's give it a try. There are a couple of issues that we need to fix. Then a whole lot of talking needs to be done. So let's go ahead and run this. When I run this program, this time the program is actually waiting and it's not doing anything. 
if I come up here, I can add three and I hit enter and it says your ID is six and then on the same line program ended with exit code. Now here I would like to place a thing which is slash n which means new line and we'll talk about these new lines as well in the theoretical aspect a little bit later. But when I save this one and I run this program again, and this time let's give an input of five and hit enter. This says your ID is eight. So we can notice that we are able to do calculation number plus three. We're able to insert that value in the, in the placeholder, which is person D as well. And we are able to get the input from the terminal as well. So there's a whole lot of things, whole lot of things and whole lot of talking that we need to do. Uh, first and foremost, these integers and these numbers and these numbers are also specific that we need to discuss if i just say something like uh, a dash number or something like that or maybe uh, you want to call it as a plus number these are gonna not gonna be working this is gonna get uh, it says hey unexpected unqualified dash id so a whole lot of things can go wrong just even declaring the number so we're going to talk about this. There's a lot of rules that you need to take care of that. But this is our first iteration. It's very close to grabbing the color from the user, but not exactly there. Before we go there, we need to have a talking and we'll do that in the next video. Let's go there. Hey there everyone, Hatesh here. And in this video, I will walk you through that. What are the precautions you should, uh, you should take while defining any of the variables here? The int number is a variable which is gonna store some value for you. But right now I say it as number, but can I call it as friend? And as soon as I say it as friend, you notice that it changed the color as red. And this is not really a good thing. Usually all the code editors help you by, by saying these colors or by giving you errors on the go to help you understand that can you name this variable something which you shouldn't be. So let's understand what are these uh, things that you should take care here. Let me save this up here. This is all good and let's talk about this. Whenever you name anything, whether that's a simple variable or maybe a function or anything else, maybe classes or anything that we're gonna study, there are some rules that you need to follow. And this entirety of the rule is known as identifiers. First and foremost, you can use any of the uppercase letters in the alphabets or you can also use any of the lowercase. Just make sure you remember one thing that C++ is very case sensitive. So when you declare something like Tim Timmy and another Tim Timmy, there are two different keywords and different variables here. So if you store, let's just say five in the first Tim Timmy with the capital T and 10 in the Tim Timmy. So remember, they are gonna be separate memory spaces that are being allocated. So make sure you remember case sensitive. These are two different keywords here and different variables here. Another thing that you need to understand is that you can also include numbers while defining it. But there is a small catch here. You can use numbers in between or at the end, but you cannot start any variable with a number. So make sure you don't do that. Avoid using the numbers in front, but use them in the between or at the end. I tend to generally avoid numbers as a general rule, but that's completely up to me. That's my personal criteria or personal rule that I've made for myself. You can also use underscores as well. But there is a small catch with underscore as well. I'll come back to that in a second, but make sure you can also use underscore. So instead of saying Tim Timmy, I can say Tim underscore Timmy. That is actually a better approach. Now also remember one more thing that you cannot use a reserved keyword. Just like I tried to use a friend there and it didn't work out, it gave me an error. There are certain reserved keywords in C++. I guess they are around 75 or 76 of the reserved keywords in C++ 20. Don't quote me on the number because it might be one or two here and there because new keywords are being introduced in the C++ 20. Now, do you need to memorize all the 75 or 76 of these keywords? Absolutely not. Nobody, nobody, not even a single programmer on the planet memorize all these keywords. Eventually, as you get familiar with the program, the more you code in C++, all these keywords are automatically introduced to you and you tend to automatically figure it out that should I be using it or should I not be using it. So don't just panic for these 76 or 77 keywords. They are not to memorize. Just make sure you understand that there are certain reserved keywords. For example, main is one, friend is one, and you'll automatically get a friendly with all of them. So moving forward. Now in C++, 
uh, there are certain non-Latin keywords. They are being supported, but still I've mentioned them in the red. So, for example, you want to use some of the non-ASCII characters, maybe some Chinese letter, maybe some Hindi alphabet characters. They are supported, majority of them, in the C++20, but there is a lot of big catch here that sometimes if you are moving your code onto another machine, it might not run there and there are a lot of issues in configuration of that. So my recommendation is not to use too much of these non-Latin keywords. Maybe you're coming up from another country or where another language is being used. Recommendation is to stick with these uppercase and lowercase English letters. That's actually a better idea and make sure you use that. Another thing is, uh, please don't go beyond the 31 characters. It's never a good idea. Even compiler uh, faces a lot of difficulties when you go beyond 31 characters while naming of the things. And yeah, you might be saying, who goes for a 31 characters? But yes, there are people who may even go longer than this because the uniqueness in majority of the compilers is for 31 characters only. So stay in the 31 range. No outside of that and that's it. Now there are a couple of more things I want to discuss here. First and foremost, about the underscore. The underscore simply means there is private character or private uh, literal that we are defining. We will talk more about what is private, what is global, what is scopes, and a whole bunch of other things. Just remember, underscore at the start means private. We'll talk more about that. Some people use two underscore as well, and two underscore means system reserved keywords. So general recommendation, don't use underscore at the start, don't use numbers at the start, and don't also use two underscore. Stick with the regular keywords. Now let's bring in the big debate about the C++. Should I go this way or should I go that way? And yes, this time also, a lot of people will come and say, hey, the first one is actually the C++ style and the second one is more Java style. I call this an absolute BS. No factual knowledge here. Now this is all dependent on what style of writing code that you are choosing. Both of them are absolutely valid. You can use underscore to separate names or the two words, or you can use a initial capital letter to separate those two numbers. The whole idea is make sure you keep a consistency while writing the code. If you're using underscore syntax, make sure throughout the program or throughout the application you use underscore. If you're using capital letters to separate them, also known as camel casing, make sure you go for that. Nobody is going to deduct any uh, any uh, points for that. Uh, nobody's going to blame you for using the letters in that way or this way. Uh, in the regular real world application development, people just appreciate that you are using a consistency in writing the code. So make sure consistency is the key. Now there is one more thing that we have noticed uh, while writing the program that sometimes I was using this backslash n. What does that even does? Now backslash n is known as character literal. There are certain characters or character literals in programming which are used, which has special meaning. For example, here we can see that this slash n has a special meaning of giving us a new line. And it's not just the slash n, there are a whole bunch of others like slash b, we have got slash t for having a horizontal tab, vertical tab, and a whole bunch of other things. Now, again, you don't need to memorize even these because as you program more, they are going to be more familiar to you. Surely for theoretical purpose or for college or school purpose, you can memorize. These are being asked sometimes, but this course is not about to just get you passing marks in the college. This is more about actual usage of C++ as a developer, as a programmer. So there we go. We have talked a whole lot of theory in this uh, particular one video. There is a little bit more theory because this is just about the naming convention. Uh, there is a little bit more that you need to understand before we move forward into building an actual application which takes the input of the color name. Too much of things going on for that. But these are all going to be important and interesting for you later on. So that's it for this video. Let's catch up in the next one and try to build a program which can take the input as a color. That's it for this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here. And in this video, we're going to be actually finishing up the program where we can take input uh, for the color from the user. Before we go ahead and let's talk about one more thing here, which is going to be very helpful for us. Here we did notice that we are using one keyword again and again, which is INT. It simply means integer. Now surely I can talk more about the range of integers and longs and all of that, but actually that's too much early for talking about that. Right now, we just need to understand that what are the different data types that are being supported. 
in C++, I have to explicitly first mention that what kind of value is about to come. Is it going to be a character? Is it going to be a simple true false value and what not? So for that, we talk about the data types here. And these are known as primitive data types in C++. Primitive because they were present in the very first release of C++. After that, we realized that we need a lot more than that. And we came up with more data types, more files and libraries to support more of them. But these are known as bit of primitive type. So they're pretty simple to understand. The first one is bool, or also known as boolean. Their values are very specific, just true and false. And true and false is really a meat and heart of the programming, and we do a whole lot of things based on that. That's why just true and false, yes, just two keywords, are being used in the, in the data type. After that, we have character, which is a char. And remember, character is different from a string. Character is just a letter, H, I, T. But a string is different, like Hitesh or LCO, as a complete a name here. After that, we have been using integer, which is just a number. Float is a floating point number, means a decimal number. And then we have got a double floating number. Now, the difference between the int, float, and double is about the precision. The integer is just like 10 or 200. But the floating is 200.3, 200.5, 100.6. And then, if you want a bit more precision, probably in a stock market, then we use a double floating point number, which has a very long precision. Now, definitely we have more keywords like long and a whole bunch of others as well. And eventually, while writing the program, we understand uh, about what is the range that is being included and a whole bunch of other things. If I'll introduce them as well here, we'll be just talking about the theories and definitely I'll give you some of the assignment work as well to read. There you can understand more about them. Finally, we have one more interesting keyword, which is valueless, which is void. Here is the important thing. Make sure you listen to this carefully. Void and zero are two different things. For example, I request to a web application that give me the current temperature. If it is giving me a temperature of void, that means I was not able to give you any temperature. But it gives me a zero, that means zero is an actual temperature. So make sure you understand that zero doesn't mean void. Void is emptiness. It's nothing. So just remember, these are the two things. Now let's go ahead and try out that here. Now, there is one more thing I would like to mention here. That's this at line number 14 is a declaration of a variable. Now I can go back onto this next line. I can say I want to start the number with an initial value of zero. This is variable initialization. Again, terminology is nothing of a big deal. Here I'm declaring it, here I'm initializing it. But you can actually do all of these in the same line as well, and you can say something like number equals zero. So you are initializing it as well as declaring it at the same time. Pretty good practice, just wanted to clear that off here. Okay, this is not going to affect our program much here, but now what we saw here is that I have my all the data types here, the basic ones, characters and stuff, but how do I actually store a string? Now that's an interesting question. Let's go ahead and answer that. Now just like we have this IO stream, first I'll get rid of all of this because we have seen this program already. Now I'm gonna go here. Just like we have IO stream, we actually can download a whole lot of header files or can create ourselves as well for you. Now here, some of them or majority of them are given to us by a C++. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a file specially which is known as string. Now this string consists a whole lot of string properties and files pretty powerful as well, and we can use it to store our values. Previously, just like I was saying int, now I can declare string data type as well. And I'm gonna say string, and I'm gonna say this as uh, my underscore color. Feel free to be using any other variable name, and I'm gonna put a colon there. Now, if somebody gives me an entire string, like my name, Hitesh, I can store that in this variable here. Pretty interesting. But as of now, if I go to my terminal, I have only see that C in can actually get an input in just one character, and that's pretty much it. Now we have to use something a little bit different to get that. First, I'll use a C out, and I'll say a little bit like this, and I'll say, enter your favorite color, and like that. And definitely I would like to add a slash N so that it has a new line here. Or if I don't want to use a slash n, uh, just like that, I can use an end l2. But I'll settle for slash n here. 
Now the next thing is, usually we have seen that we go ahead and use the cin to take an input from the user, but this time we want to take an input a little bit more on that. So just like we have main, we have something known as get line here, so get line. Now get line works in a different way. Get lines inside the pair of parentheses, you have to insert two things here. The first one is what is going to be the method through which you want to take input. The method that we are going to go ahead is going to be C in. So I want to use C in or input stream to take input. And where do you want to store that input? I want to store that into my color. There we go. Nice and easy. No big deal so far. Now what you want to do after that, we want to display some message to the user as well. So I'm going to be using again a C out. So there we go. So how I want to display that is simply with a message. So I'm going to be first saying C out. I'm going to say, hey, then a space, and then I'm going to be using this variable, which is my color. And I'm going to say, again, two arrows, and then again, a string is going to say is and a starting space first is my favorite two. And then shortly a semicolon there. Okay, a lot of things going on. First and foremost, this is definitely a little bit new, but we are going to understand that later on, this is simply making our life much more easier. Instead of doing just a CN and storing a single character, it makes our life easier by storing an entire line in my, uh, in my variable. Probably somebody is saying that my favorite is not pink, it's a baby pink. So for that reason, we are using it. Now let's go ahead and test this program. Definitely this program has a lot of bugs that we can fix, but right now it's gonna just do the job. So let's go ahead and hit a run here. And there we go, it says enter your favorite color. And I'm gonna say uh, just right now, I'm gonna have a purple as a color. And it says, hey, purple is my favorite too, but the program actually ends on the same line. So again, previously I used a slash in here. This time I'm gonna go a little bit different. I'm gonna go with these guys and I'm gonna say end L. There we go. Just for fun, just to have a different variety here. Let's save this and run this one more time. And it says, hey, what's your favorite color? This time I'm gonna say a baby pink. And notice when I hit enter, it says, hey, baby pink is my favorite too. So there we go. After learning a whole lot of things about colors and a lot of things about uh, data types and a whole bunch of other things, including a new string library, we were able to take input from the user and we were able to just craft it nicely. So I'm going to give you a different example to this time. Okay. I have taken an input from the user for the color, but this time what you're going to do is you are going to take two input from the user, the first name and the last name. And once you have taken the first name and last name, you're going to print a message that says C out, welcome. And then first you're going to write the first name and then after add a space by using a string, then just add a space. And then at the end of it, just write the last name. So this time you have to declare two variables. Both of them should be of string type, just like we have given here string, my color, go ahead and say uh, string, first name, string, second name. So take two input from the user, first name and last name, go ahead and do this. Again, this might sound absolutely basic to you. You might be a past coder, but doing these program is important as I'll be increasing the intensity of these programs and assignment later on. And also I won't be providing a solution of these uh, assignments here. You have to provide me, no spoon feeding is gonna happen here. That's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here. Welcome to a new section. And before we even get started, there is just one point I would like to mention that yes, I know I'm introducing some topics very early to you, but this is the best approach to learn C++. Because some of these topic, topics, I agree, they are tough, but the only way to understand a tough topic is by revision. So we need a whole lot of iteration and again and again discussion on these topics so that you finally and fully understand these subjects. So don't worry, we will talk about them again and again. So if you don't get it here, don't pain out, it's okay. Okay, so let's get started and talk about one of the very crucial thing which makes C++ very powerful. And these two topics are pointers and references. We'll talk references in the next video. Right now we'll be talking about pointers. Now pointers, as the name suggests, they point on to something. So what they point on to something? This something is a memory location and that's it. That's all you need to worry always about. Pointer points to a memory location and that's it. That's it, really simple. 
Now, what makes C++ really a powerful language is that it is able to deal with the memory so much directly. We have these features as pointers that can interact and talk to memory directly. This makes C++ a very powerful as well as very dangerous language. These pointers can be very dangerous to handle and in fact a lot of time you're going to see bugs and security issues as well as crashes due to these pointers. Rest of all the programmers in the world of Java, in the world of Python, in the world of JavaScript, they understand a whole lot of things about the language, but this pointer makes C++ unique and that actually stand apart a C++ developer than uh, any other language developer. It also took me a really long time to understand these concepts, so again, uh, I'll try my best to explain these to you. Now, we'll start with the basics of a uh, pointer, but before we go into the pointers first, uh, this is the boilerplate code, so make sure you understand this. Uh, a simple IO stream as an include, a namespace, a main method which returns zero and nothing else. I will usually be starting from this point in almost every single video, almost, and make sure you are quite familiar. This is also known as a boilerplate code. This doesn't do anything, it's just there. So we have seen so far that if we want to declare an integer, first we have to mention that the variable type is going to be integer, and then we say life and the value of the life is going to be four. So I am initializing a variable uh, here uh, with the life as well as I'm, I'm declaring it as well as initializing it. So this part is a declaration and I'm initializing it with the value of four here. Now my editor is complaining because I haven't used a life here and that's okay. Now surely at any given point of time I can go ahead and update the life value to 5 and that's what variable does. They vary over the time of program. If you want to make any, any variable a really constant that it shouldn't change any point of time, there are certain uh, identifiers, not exactly identifiers, they have a very special name which we'll talk about later on, but I can add a simple const in front of it and now it's going to complain that hey, uh, you have declared that this shouldn't be changed by using const and now you're changing it. And these are known as qualifiers, but we'll talk about these qualifiers, this const is a qualifier, but later on. So here you can see that this is not allowed. So this is what we have seen about this. Now again, coming back onto the point that this is how we declare an integer. And this is how we assign a value into the integer. This can also be break down into the two parts. I can go ahead and say this is here and life is going to be four and that's it. Why I'm mentioning this again and again? Because once you learn the pointer, they are almost exactly like integers. Not much of a difference. Subtleties are there, but it's almost like that. So keep this in mind and let's go ahead and try to understand about the pointers. They are very simple. Don't be afraid of them. Let's just say you have an integer card here again, and we did exactly what we did with the life. We come up and say card is going to be equal to 40. Okay, and then if I have another integer variable which says my underscore card, and that is going to be point to card, what do you think is going to be the value of my card? And I think you can guess it. Let me go ahead and do a simple printf statement here, and there we go. I'll say that value of card is and then a colon and I'll add a person D here to add this integer and I'm going to say go ahead and get me the value of my underscore card. So I think by now you might have already uh, come up with a number. So all of you those says 40. Let's check it out. I'm going to run this program. And of course, I should add a slash n here. That would be better and a bit more readable. So I'm going to run that. And there we go. We see the value of 40. So it was pretty obvious. You have a, a memory uh, reserved for you that is storing a value of 40. And the same memory now is, is being stored or being same values being stored in the my card as well. So there is nothing kind of a very extraordinary here. Now, same thing happens with the pointer as well. So notice this example, we're going to replicate this example with the pointer. Let's go ahead and do that. Pointers, just like variables, need to be declared in advance that what kind of value will be coming up into that. So we simply say int or there are other versions of it, int64 and a whole bunch of other. Right now, let's just keep it very simple. In order to declare a pointer, we first need to use this asterisk. This is not a multiplication sign. This is an asterisk in C++, which denotes a pointer. So my P is going to be the name of my pointer. And I have 
initialized it, just like I have initialized card at line number 16. If I want to assign some value in it, then I will use my p. Notice the difference here that I don't say asterisk my p. Asterisk is used only at the very first time when you initialize a pointer. Now, again, since I said pointer points to something, and that's very simple, pointer can only point to a memory. Just remember this, life will be much more easier. So pointer points to a memory. Now, how do we point to any memory? You use an ampersand sign and then you can point to any variable. It's not going to point to the variable, but rather it's going to point to its memory address. So I can say here uh, something known as my card, and it's going to point to the address, which is in the memory of my card. If I just go ahead and say card, it's going to point to the memory address where card is stored. Remember, again, pointer starts with asterisk, and in order to have a value of the pointer, pointer doesn't store values like four or five, they are created so that they can store some of the address here. Okay, now just like I did in the line number 18, I can do something like this again. Let's just say I have this integer being defined, which is my underscore card. And this my card, again, this is an integer. You can also do another syntax here, which is an M uh, asterisk sign and then can say my p. Now this is totally new and I totally agree with you on that point. First and foremost, let me show, let me make sure that you understand what this is called. This is called as pointer D reference. So pointer can be D referenced here. Now a couple of things that we need to understand. First and foremost, what is inside my P at line number 21 and what is inside my card since I've already updated it. Let's go ahead and check it out. So first and foremost, I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste this here. First and foremost, I want to check inside what is inside this my p. Notice this is a pointer, not an integer, integer pointer. So I'll just come up and we'll say, hey, I want to get to know what is inside my p. As soon as I do this, it's gonna give me a warning. And just wait for a second, as soon as I save this, there we go. Now warning says that this person d is not good enough. Remember I told you there are a lot of format specifiers so for pointers, we cannot use person D. We have to use a person P because I'm talking about pointers here. So there we go. Now let's go ahead and run this one here, first and foremost, to see what's inside this. If I run this, notice this big value, which is 0x7ff. This is exactly a hex value of your memory address. If, you'll, if you can, you cannot, but if you could, uh, go into the exact memory, you will find that this is a location or memory of this my card. Now this is what we have got into this, but once we have dereferenced, means whatever the value at that memory address, just take that value, I don't know what that is. It is just some value because I have just an address. So whoever lives that address, just dereference that into my card. So it's time that we go ahead and check what's inside this my card as well again. And if I go ahead and I'll save that and I'll run this again one more time, notice the third time you again see 40. So the values are not changing here. The values exactly remain same. So it's almost like saying, hey, uh, Hitesh lives in Jaipur or let's just say Jaipur is just a home, just assume. So whoever lives in Jaipur or Hitesh lives in Jaipur it's always gonna be coming to me that I live at that place. So again, told you, pointers are not very difficult. Just remember a few things. It starts with always declaration with asterisk. While assigning any value, you directly assign that. And there is also a concept of pointer dereferencing. I don't expect you to fully understand this topic because there it needs a revision. A hundred percent, uh, at least five or six revisions are necessary on this topic. Now in the next video, we're gonna talk about this ampersand sign because this ampersand sign is much more trickier than pointer. A lot of people think pointer is tricky to understand. No pointer is easy. The tricky part is this ampersand. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about these ampersand, AKA references in C++, and that's actually much more fun to learn. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Majority of people believe that C++ is tough because there's a concept of pointers which makes it a tough language. Not true. Pointers are the most simplest thing in the C++ uh, entire programming language. It just points to a memory location, doesn't care about what's inside that memory location. 200, 
2000 doesn't really care. It just points to a memory location. The actual culprit which makes this language a bit tough to understand for beginners is referencing. This referencing is the actual culprit which can even change the values and is a little bit hard to understand but I believe this video will give you much more clarity about referencing and changing these referencing. Usually in the traditional C++ books and programming this is introduced to you by creating a program which uh, swap some values or something like that. I think that's way over complicated. We're gonna understand that by a much more simpler example. So let's go ahead and this will be a little bit practice about pointers too. So first and foremost, let's just say I want to declare a variable score. How to do that? An integer score, there we go. And that's it, it's all done. If I want to store certain value in it, I can either move on to next line or I can just initialize it by 200 as a starting initial value for score. No problem in it, so far we have seen all of it. Now I want to create an integer pointer. Integer and pointer, I'll call it as my p for pointer. Now this is an initialization of pointer. If you want to declare some value in it, again, I can go to next line or I can just say, hey, you're gonna be just storing some values. So pointer, as I said, always uh, stores some reference values. So it doesn't really is used to store 300. If I do so, that really doesn't make sense anything here and even the compiler actually complains because pointer is not designed for that. So rather pointer will say that I'll store a memory location of score. So far, no problem, no issue. Let's go ahead and print out both of these things. So I'm gonna say printf, there we go. And I'm gonna say something like this and I'll say value of score is, and then we're gonna use a person D, of course a slash n, and I would like to copy this and we'll paste it again one more time. And this time I'll say uh, value of pointer is, and I'll have to use a percent P and that's it. Now we have to fill in the blanks. So percent D, what is the score? So I can put a comma and can display the score value here. If I'm using a pointer here, I can simply say my P for pointer. No big deal. We have seen all of this uh, so far. So we're gonna save this and we're gonna run this one here. And notice at the very bottom, it says a value of score is 200 and the memory address given to us is here. Okay, no big deal. Everything is good so far. Just a bit indentation. There we go. Looks all good. Now, next thing that we are going to study about is references. And we have seen the references a little bit here with the help of this. So this M% is actually storing the address. But just not only the address, you can create a standalone reference as well. For example, I can simply say again, these references are of data types. So you have to mention it is an integer or character or whatever it is. So I'm gonna say uh, that what is going to happen, this is an M% and I'll just call it as another score. There we go. Now, can this reference point to something like 400? No, it cannot because a reference is a reference to something of a memory. A memory address needs a reference. 400 doesn't need a reference. So just like pointer points to a memory, a reference is to something for integer or for a character. So in this case, I'm creating a reference to this score variable. Now it's different from pointer. Pointer just points to memory location. Reference is actually a reference of whatever the value is scored in the score. Now the more things will get clear that just like pointers, once you declare it here, asterisk my p, you can use it just like my p here. These references can also be treated almost like a variable. So another score is although a reference, but if I update its value, that for example, I want to say it as 800 this time. Now what's going to happen? What is there in another score? You can guess it. Another score is now having a value of 800. But since this is a reference actually to the score, the value of score is also changed. And this is the toughest thing that is not easy for bigness to understand. To get it more, we're gonna copy this line and once we have done this update, we are gonna print the value of score as well as pointer here. We are going to save this and we are going to run this and we'll discuss it a little bit more. So now here you can see that the first value was 200, which is pretty okay, and the pointer is pointing to the exact same reference. We didn't change the pointer to anything. Then the score value is updated to 800 and the pointer is still pointing to the same memory address. So the real culprit who can change the value is this reference. So be cautious while using this reference. 
any update that you are making to reference, you will be making a change in the actual value. And this is the most important thing. Make sure you, even if you watch this video two or three times, that's totally okay. Remember, just onto a side summary note, pointers are easy, they always point to the same value, but these references are tricky because once a reference is pointing to any variable, whether that's integer, long, double, character, whatever, any change in the reference is going to change the actual value. And that's it. That's all you need to take care of here. So there we go. This is your brief introduction to the pointers and references. I hope you were able to understand probably 60 to 70% of that, not more than that. If you have understood 100% of it, you are absolutely brilliant. You were able to understand it. I'm really super happy. But if you, even if you have got 60 to 70, that's okay. Keep moving forward. I'll introduce more simpler things now uh, to cool off things a little bit and we'll start from there. Let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitaish here and welcome to another video. In this video, we're going to talk about arrays. Arrays are pretty simple, but we're not going to be talking about arrays just like ordinary arrays in C or in other languages. C++ has a bit of different flavors on array, which usually is not being talked too much in the books and for good reasons, because they just want you to get an introduction of array and that's it, not the C++ way. We're going to be doing the C++ way. And in this video, I would also like to mention that we will be talking a little bit on to the pointers because it is very essential to talk about them. They are the strength of C++ and in most interviews as well, the questions usually come around on the table around the pointers in the array. So first and foremost, those who don't know, array is just a continuous memory allocation and you can store multiple values in just one array. It's a sequence that you can have to store multiple values. Now, there are a couple of ways how you can define an array you can store multiple values for it. I hope many of you are already aware uh, that instead of declaring five or six variables, you can just declare an array and hold all those five and six values in it. So pretty easy. Now, first and foremost, uh, let me walk you through that how to declare integer array. So first and foremost, data type is essential. So whatever is it integer type, character type, whatever the type of array is, we first need to define that data type. Then after that, mention the array. So in this case, I'll define an integer array. So I'll say integer underscore array. So this is my integer array. Now after that, you have to define what is going to be the size of this array. You have to explicitly first mention that how many elements you're going to store. I said I'm going to be storing four values in it and that's it. And uh, definitely you can just put a colon and can call it a day off. But in the recent version of the C++, it has been updated with the newer syntax that you can initialize it as well as uh, you can just assign a values in it directly. I hope that you are aware of it. If not, let me mention that, that array always starts their counting from zero. So if I said there's gonna be four value in it, that means I said zero, one, two, and three. So counting, they are four, but the counting in the array starts from zero. So I'm gonna say that I have a value one, two, three, and four, so these are four values. What if I add more than four values? So notice here it says, uh, hey, let me first put a semicolon so that it stops complaining, <laughs> there we go. So this is all a good code, but if I add a five here, now what's going to happen, it's gonna automatically detect here and it says excess element in array initializer. It's good, one, two, three, four, five, but you say it here, you're gonna be just adding four values, so no ambiguity in the code itself. So let's move it to four and let's go up there. Okay, so this is the most basic thing that how you declare an array. Again, would like to mention this is a bit of a newer syntax in C++, so in the older C++, it's not gonna work. So make sure you're cautious about that. Then after that, if you want to have any value of the C++, what we do is we are gonna mention that and we're gonna say uh, integer array and we're gonna simply have an end line here as well. Now, if you want to access any element of the array, all you do is after the name that you have defined, you put a square uh, bracket here, and then you simply mention the position of the value. So at zeroth position, you can see we have got value one. At one position, we got value two, and so far and so forth. 
So we're going to first save this one and we are going to run this one and without a doubt it's going to just mention one because that's at my first position. I can also try that what is at the third position, save that and run that and without a doubt it gives me four because that's at the third position starting from zero. Now let's make things a bit interesting and this is going to help you a lot in understanding the pointers too. What if I don't put any values? If I just mention this one here, what's going to be the output of this one? Now arrays, if you just want to have a direct output of this value here, they are actually a memory address uh, storage here. So this is a memory address pointing towards the very first or very first uh, position of the memory from where the array has started to allocate the memory. Interesting point and we will be coming back onto this one later on a bit later. First and foremost, let's keep it that way. So this is a little bit of advanced way of declaring an array as well as initializing it. The most common one is uh, let's have another array. You can name it anything. So I'll call it as another array. So previously we used to initialize it like this. So this is an initialization of array, assuming that uh, we'll have four values in it. And after that, you just mention another array and at every single place, wherever you want to add any value, you just mention that what value will come at that place. So let's just say, I'll say that at the very first position, I would like to have a value nine. No big deal, we can have it. I'm gonna say C out, I'm gonna say another array and what is the value at zeroth position and just of course make me or give me an end L or end of line as well. And I think this is not a complex code. Everybody can understand it that you get a nine here. But the interesting thing comes up. What about the first position? I haven't mentioned anything about the first position. I have just initialized it. I haven't filled up any value. It's important to you oh, that you understand when you don't fill up any value, what's the default value in that memory or in that container? So here we can see it's zero. We can try it for the second value too. I run that and you can see that again a zero value. So that answers easily our question that what happens in that space when I don't put up any value there? You get the answer here. Now let's move forward a little bit and talk more about the things which are or can be a little bit tricky to understand. Now as I mentioned that uh, when I just directly display the value another array, it points me towards a memory allocation. Now this will also uh, surprise you a little bit because this is more over a C++-ish way that since this another array is already pointing towards the array, that means the memory location of an array, I can directly say asterisk and I can say another array and if I just use a value of 29, what do you think that's gonna happen? Now this is the most interesting stuff about the C++ array. Since we noticed that the C++ array points toward the memory and I said that it points at the very first position of the array. That means previously this another array and its zeroth position was having a value of nine and we can see that by having this. But now what happens once I update this? Let's go ahead and run that, save this. And now you're going to notice that previously the value was nine and now the value is 29. So this is also another way of updating the value. Is it very crystal clear? No, not at all. But this is a common question that is being asked in interview to understand that you are really a C++ array person or you just knows about the array. Okay, now there is a little bit more that we can do up here. So I'm gonna go a little bit here and we'll give you another. So what I can do is since we already know that now we can deal up with the memory like that, I can declare an uh, integer array pointer, uh, star AP for in integer array pointer, short for that. And I can directly allocate the location which this another array is holding. Remember, I'm not saying square zero or something like that. I'm just directly using that memory address. So what additionally you can do is you can say that this my array pointer can increment a value. Now, there is a shortcut that I'll be using here, but technically all I want to say is array pointer plus one. So whatever the array pointer value is, just add a one to it. But as a shortcut, we use AP plus plus or whatever the value is, just plus plus to add one value to it. Now, interestingly, notice here that what's going to happen and what we really want to do this time is uh, first and foremost, we added a value zero here. Now, at the first position, I'm adding a value of 19. 
So what do you think that when I try to access this value, what's going to be there? Let's go ahead and give it a try before we do anything here. So I'll come back here and we'll paste it and give me the position here. So rather, no, we don't need to copy this, my bad. We need to copy this so that we can get a value. Copy that, paste that here, and this time give me the value at first position. Save that, and I want to just check that what's the last value that is being given to me. Run that, and we get 19. No big deal, everything is just according to plan. We assigned a value at first position 19, and that's what we get here. Now here what we are doing is we are declaring an integer array pointer, which is pointing to the start of the array. But as soon as I said AP++, that means I'm incrementing my array pointer. C++ pointers and especially array pointers are smart enough to not just allocate to anything else. They know that this is an array. That means the next memory address is going to be the next value in the array. Pretty smart, pretty smart. So. To verify this, what I'll say that this array pointer, now whatever that is being pointed towards, is gonna update the value. Just like here I said at line number 24, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. But this time I'll say that this value previously was 19, now it's gonna be 209, random values. And now once this is being done, I would like to again see what is inside the first value because I have incremented it just once, okay? Let's go ahead and see that. And now, this time, the value is being updated. Instead of the 19, the value is 209. Again, I do understand that this is a bit of complex stuff because I have introduced arrays and the pointers as well, but this is array in C++ means pointers are gonna kick in. So this proves a couple of things. First and foremost, my claim that array is a continuous memory allocation, which can hold a lot of your value, is proved here because as soon as I uh, assigned my memory address of array into a pointer, first and foremost, that address was assignable. As soon as I did just one increment update, since the memory was constant there or continuous there, I was able to switch on to the second point, which was storing my second value. So a lot of proofs have come up here, but this is moreover a C++ way of having arrays. I hope this was not too confusing. If it was, just go ahead and watch the video uh, one more time and I'll give you these exercise files as well. Make sure 100% you play more about adding more values, more increment and changing it a little bit. That's the best way to learn. That's it for this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to the video where we're going to talk about integers. One of the reasons why I told you earlier that please be open-minded with this course is because nobody talks about integer this much late in the course of a C++. Usually people like to straightforward talk about data types and then their long values and their whole bunch of other things and then conditionals, loops and arrays and that's it. This structure is specially designed so that you can understand in depth of the C++. And we'll be talking about all of these, but right now, let's just keep the talk very simple about integers. Now, integers are not just int that we have been writing so far into the C++. There is a whole bunch of variety that is available with them. Now, the shortest one, uh, the value that you can define is a character, which stores just a single character value, probably A, H, Z, just one single value. And after that, the comes is a list of integers that you can define. There is a short int, there is an int, there is a long int, and there is a long, long int as well. The difference is how much memory size they actually holds up. The longer the memory size, that means the longer value can be hold up. Of course, numbers can be infinite and there is a whole range of numbers that you can store. We are not talking about the precision of the number because that's going to be coming up later on when we'll be talking about another data type, which are floating point values or doubles. But right now, you just need to understand that uh, integers are just simply numbers, no fractions, no decimal, nothing at all. And shortest int is the short int after character. We are not counting the characters here. Then we get int, then we get long int and long, long int as how much number you actually need. Now, there are also counter versions of them, which is unsigned int because number can be negative or positive. Unsigned int means there is no sign being marked as negative or positive. Usually the default ones, the ints are being marked as them. Now, again, you don't need to remember too much of them, but only thing which I would recommend here is to remember that all of these short int, int, long and long, long int, they have an interrelation between them. 
what's going to be the size of it is a question that can be answered only about how much size is the shortest unit taking up. And in relative to that, all of them takes different size. So I know some of you are on Windows machine as well. So we're going to write a simple program that can give you more precise idea that how things are going to work and where you're going to find some of the ambiguities in the size of a short int, int, long int and long int. So let's go on to our uh, code editor and make sure you are just onto a code editor here. So I'm going to just simply run this. This is empty program as of now doing nothing at all. So first and foremost, we'd like to write a comment for you that will help you to understand. So just remember that one byte uh, is one byte is of eight bits. So just remember that I hope that's a very basic computer fundamental information. I think most of you know about it in case no, then you know it right now. Now we're going to write a simple program here, not going to do much, just a printf statement. There we go. And here I would say that size of this data type is, and then we're going to use a percent, usually we just say percent D and of course a slash N and then after that we can just uh, put up any values. Now I'm going to be doing a little bit of the additional things here. So I recommend you to follow along. There is an inbuilt method here, which says size of, and inside this size of, you can pass on any expression or type of which you want to find out the exact type or exact size of the value. So for example, I'm interested in to find out how much size the integer is taking, and I can simply go ahead and save it and run it. But what's going to happen is that this person D is not going to be working exactly because this is not the format specifier you might want to use in this case. So the format specifier that we are going to be using is percent LD, which is going to be good for us. Again, for every single thing, there's a specific format specifier, kind of a fill in the blanks for character strings. There's a different for each of them and no need to memorize. You are going to eventually learn it through the series automatically. Now, when I run this one, it says that the size of this data type is four. Now, this is not going uh, really great. So we're going to just convert that into more readable format. So I'm going to just simply add a bits here and we are going to multiply this by eight. So multiply it by eight. And this is going to give us a better readable, understandable results. So we can see that int is of 32 bits here. Great so far, so far good. And the smallest unit that we have got is the car and I can save and run this one here. And you can see this is the smallest unit that we have got. So we have got int, then we have got this uh, short int as well. And we can run that and see how much that is consuming of the memory 16 bits and you can find it out for almost everything. So we have seen short, uh, we have seen int as well. And there is another one which is a uh, long int. And I'm going to save this and I'm going to run this one. And you can see that this is 64 bit. Now, the next one that we see here is the long, long int, which is supposed to be twice of the size of 64 bit. But you're going to see a bit of ambiguity here that it is not the twice of size, but rather long int and the long, long int is consuming both the 64 bit in my system. If you're on a Windows system, they might give you a different result and the Windows based system and the Linux based system have a different approach here. Now what you're seeing on my machine is going to be there in most of the online editors as well, because they are also Linux based system and Macintosh is also a Linux based system. That's why you're seeing it up here. But this brings us to the point that there is sub subtleties and ambiguities here that should not be done that much. And we have ways to avoid it as well. The first one, which I also sometimes make, not usually, but sometimes. So let's just say we want to define an integer. I have been defining it as simply int, but now I want to define it as long int. So you'll see that this is how we define it and this is how it works usually. But in most of the modern compiler, you're going to notice that it's not compulsory to have this int. If you just say long, this also works exactly as same as a long int. And similarly for long, long int. This is a bit of ambiguity and most of the senior programmers would not recommend you to do so. But still, uh, a lot of time you're going to see a lot of code is being written just by saying long or just long, long. And it's okay. Uh, I still think that a long int makes program much more clear and readable and that should be done. So make sure you keep in mind that and we're going to be discussing a little bit of that here. And another ambiguity that comes up is the program portability. So I, if let's just say I'm writing a simple program or drivers for my application, which are system level, 
and which are based on how much size the long is actually consuming. So I don't want to write a program where long is having 64 bits in some system and twice of that uh, in some another systems. I want to be consistent with my program. In such of the things, these libraries comes into the play and they plays a big role in C++. Usually most of the courses and books don't talk too much about these libraries and modules that are included with the C++ because these are actually the real world programs and usually books like to stay away from them. So what we get uh, in the recent versions of the C++ is there is a C standard uh, int here which allows you to use certain things which are always 100% guaranteed that they will be of exact size that what is mentioned here. And they start with all of these uh, ints here. So uh, int 8 bit, 64 bit, 32 bit and 16 bit. So whatever you want to use, it's kind of a guarantee that what they will be getting up here. So it's always like, hey, I'm going to be 16 int. So I'll always be 16 bit no matter what the system you are using or resources you are using. And just like them, we have these unsigned version of it by saying U in front of them. And if I just run them, they are the unsigned version of it. In the regular case, if you want to declare anything int or anything as unsigned, you have to explicitly mention unsigned int, just like we have been doing for long int. We have to say unsigned int and then only it, gray, it works like that. So I highly recommend you to write a simple program with just uh, prints out the size for everything, int, short int, long, long, long int, and character as well. I think that's going to be super easy for you. Now just onto a side note, I would like to discuss some of the fun things about the recent editions of the C++ as well. So, so far we have seen that I can declare any integer, call it as fun, and I can define any numbers into it. For example, 22, and I can print that as well. So no big deal. Uh, we have seen this already. So printf, there we go. And we're going to simply say fun, oh, not fun, <laughs> fun value is, and then we can have this uh, person D, not that one, person D slash N, of course, and I can just have a value of this fun here. So pretty big, uh, no big deal. We have seen this uh, many, many times. But now what you're going to additionally notice that C++ in the recent version allows you to directly use either the binary values or hexadecimal values directly. I don't remember all of these values. So here in the, I'm using mathisfun.com, pretty interesting website. And you can pause the video or you can search it on the internet that how to convert a decimal number into binary or hexadecimal. I know how to do it manually, but I'm not going to be showing that in this video, bit out of scope. So if you want any hexadecimal values here, you can use that directly by using a hex code here. So I think for hexadecimal code, it's a zero X and then I can place 16. And here we notice that this is actually the number which is for 22. And if I run this, it gives me exactly the 22. So I can use a, this syntax to actually convert or use hexadecimal values. And interestingly, similarly to this, if I want to use these binaries, I can actually do that. I can convert integers into binary and binaries into that. And the syntax for that is 0b for binary. And then write all the binary numbers that you are having. And this one also is going to give us the exact 22 because we converted that from online. Just a fun, interesting side fact that yes, this 0b is a recent addition. I guess in C++14 it was introduced, but not sure. Don't comment me on that. Uh, don't quote me on that. So just make sure that it is there. It helps a lot of programmers in the competitive programming because sometimes these approach are much more easier to solve problems. If you have this knowledge, I think you can take it an advantage uh, for this one. So there we go. We have officially covered integer all of it, but there is a lot of data type that we are going to be covering up. So let's go ahead and catch up in next video. Hey there everyone, Hadesh here. And in the, in the order to understand the C++ data types in depth, it is very much essential that we cover at least two topics here, which are conditionals and loops, how the iteration is being done. I know we haven't talked much in depth about what are arrays and even some of the advanced data types which you might be looking forward. But in order to understand them properly, these things need to be done right here. So in this video, we'll be talking about conditionals and in upcoming videos, we'll be talking about loops. We will get them first out of the box here and then we'll come back onto more data types and you will understand the exact need and necessity of them in the C++ via these concepts. So first and foremost, conditionals. 
The conditionals in C++ are inherited exactly from the C and there is no need of modifying them because they are already very much uh, working and in most of the other languages as well they are inherited the concepts directly from here and they work absolutely fine. There is nothing much magical about them, they just work pretty fine. So first and foremost we got a condition, we evaluate that condition to certain aspects and parameters. Probably we want to test the condition that whether it is above 10 or it is below 10 if the name was entered or not, if email was proper or not. So there's a lot of condition that you can test up and then based on what is the outcome of that condition, that condition always throws up the result as it was successful or it was not successful. The test was okay or it was not okay. So based if the test is uh, giving you a result of true, that means it was all okay or whatever you tested it for, it came as a positive result, then the true block will execute. And if condition didn't mend, then the false block execute. Now, it doesn't mean that a lot of beginner understand that uh, the condition tested true, that means we only are going to execute the true block, that's the good part of the programming. No, it's not like that. Testing for certain things and executing one block or the other block is just a fundamental of programming. Just to give you an example, when you test out a condition that whether the temperature outside is 35 degrees, and if the temperature is above 35 degrees, then you put a message to the user that, hey, you might want to bring an umbrella, or if it is below 35, you want to say, hey, the weather is pleasant outside. This doesn't mean that the condition that we tested out is tested for a good code or a bad code. No, it's not here right now. So just don't assume that false is not a villain here, true is not a hero, they are just a block of code that we can have. Now in C++, we get two types of conditional that we can check up, rather simple if and else and a, and a block of if and else. And another one that we can have are ternary operators, which are pretty common, a little bit tricky for beginners to understand, uh, but they are very, very common to use because they are very precise and concise. So let's go ahead and talk about it. So I'm gonna go up here. So first and foremost, in order to have these tests, first and foremost, we need to test them against something. So I'm gonna simply design a variable rating and I'm gonna assign a value of five to this rating. No big deal, we have seen this kind of statement uh, many times. And then comes up this how we write these conditional code. So a special keyword is introduced for that, which is if, and out, outside of the if, we use a pair of parentheses and then curly braces. Remember, the curly braces is actually the block of code and you can write any number of line in it, which you want to execute, pretty obvious. So let's go ahead and do that. So I want to check if the rating is five or not. So I'm gonna go ahead and say if rating is exactly five, then I'm gonna simply go ahead and put a message here that's gonna say uh, five star rated. Now here comes a couple of debates. Again, we have discussed that, but still would like to point out that, that having a puts and having a C in or C out, it's totally up to you. Doesn't really matter. It doesn't make any program C++ or not C++. We have already talked about this debate. Another thing is, make sure you keep an eye on this double equals. Single equals means assignment. You are using the five value and putting that five value in the rating. When you use double equals means we are testing it for a condition. There are other conditionals as well. We'll talk about them later on. That means greater than, we have less than, uh, we have greater than, equal to, and a whole bunch of others. Right now we're gonna just check if it is exactly equals to five. And when I run this, without a doubt, it's gonna give five star rated. So no big deal for that. Now if I change this rating to four, then obviously we want to have another block of code that if the true block doesn't uh, execute, we want to have a false block. Then the false block is pretty easy. We just use another keyword, which is else, and we can just write else block here. So I'm gonna simply say puts, and we are gonna say not five star rated. There we go, we're gonna save this one, of course, after a semicolon. And we run this, this time the rating is not four, so it's gonna say not five stars. So this is the basic of how uh, codes are being executed. And of course, just a side note, nobody is stopping you to come inside a block of code and again writing an if statement here, you can go ahead and write that and you can nest this as much as you want to test further these conditions. Sometimes things doesn't work just by checking an initial condition. Inside that, you also want to check another condition, giving you a basic example. First, in a web application, I would like to check whether things are empty or not. In my 
in my form which I've given to the user. Once I notice that the form is not empty, then I'll move into another condition. We'll check that whether the email is in the proper syntax or not. And then I'll come back another of the if and I'll check whether this email exists in my database or not. So there can be a lot of conditionals that can go ahead. Won't be going in too much of depth of that. Uh, right now, this is all good and okay. Now, another syntax that you can see here is I can hit an enter and I can add insert another block of code and can test out for another condition. I can say again else and I'm gonna go ahead and check if for it, not if stream. I'm gonna check for if, there we go, another condition, go ahead like that. So here I would like to check if the rating is actually exactly equals to four and I'm gonna again put a simple put statement and I'm gonna say four star rated and semicolon, there we go. Now it's gonna first check whether the rating was five star if it is not, it's gonna come back else in this block. If the rating was four star, then if the rating was not four star, then for everything else, it's gonna be here. Uh, not four or five star rated. So we're gonna simply run this one and we execute it and notice that only four star rated gets print because this is exactly the block. For beginners, it might be a little bit challenging to understand, so I highly recommend to stay more on this lecture, maybe watch it one more time. It's gonna be all good. Now, I hope you have understood this piece of code because now let's go ahead and move a bit more on to fundamental side of how C++ actually execute things. So this is the basic block of code. You have a condition and then in, after that you can uh, put some statements. So first I'll move to the statement. We'll simply have a put statement that's gonna say, uh, go for it. Make sure you just put anything up here. Now, this condition is very important to understand how C++ execute it. Now, C++ actually evaluate any of these conditions that you check it out for uh, two things. Either it is true and false, and which are treated in the C++ as a zero or a non-zero value. If the value is going to be zero, that means I am assuming that there is a false here. False simply means a zero. If you put a zero here, that means no matter what you do, this code is never going to execute. And you might have noticed my, compi my compiler is complaining for that, that it's, not, it's never gonna be executed. And if I put any of the non-zero value here, like probably one, then I simply go ahead and run this, it's gonna execute it and we see here, go for it. Not just one, it can be 11 as well. And I run this, this is gonna still execute because again, zero and non-zero value. But there is just one exception here that it doesn't execute anything for zero, but also if you write a simple null here, which is also being treated as a sort of non-zero value, or zero actually, no, not non-zero. So just remember zero and null are the only things. Apart from that, if you put anything here, uh, then it's gonna be there. Now also you can go ahead and say, hey, false, which is also gonna be interpreted as zero again, but if you put out true here, then again, it's gonna execute. So these are the fundamentals of how these things work. So make sure you always keep it in mind. Okay, so the basics are C++ are pretty easy. Let's go ahead and talk about one more thing here, the last one. So we're gonna have a simple printf statement here and we are gonna be simply saying uh, your rating feedback is, and then I'm gonna be using a string here, so I'm gonna use percent %s this time, of course, with a slash n. Now, let's go ahead and talk about these ternary operators. Ternary operators are shrinked version of if and else, and they are exactly like if and else, but they are a bit shorter in syntax, that's why people love it. So we noticed here, there are a couple of parts in an if and else block. The first part is the if, and then we check for a condition, then there's a if, success block and then there is a, inside the else there is else block. So how in this ternary operator it works, uh, first you go ahead and say condition. After the condition you put a question mark, you put up a true statement or true block here and then after you put a colon and you simply go ahead and put your false block here. There we go. So this is the basic idea of how these conditions are being met. Let's go ahead and write this. So in the condition, you might want to check it for something. So I want to check if my rating is greater than four. So that's gonna be the my condition. And then I can execute either a true block or a false block here. So pretty easy, very easy ternary, but 
see, I hope you can see that they save a lot of space and are pretty easy to test around. So if I go ahead and run this, now since my rating is actually uh, exactly four, not greater than four, that's why it's stated as your rating feedback is false block. So there we go, nice and easy. We can definitely check it for uh, exactly four. If you want to go ahead and do that, that's pretty easy too. It executes a true block here in this case. So since our rating is four, and we are going to be deciding as something here. So here's a small, a very small assignment for you. In fact, two. The first assignment is uh, we are going to be saying your rating feedback is awesome if the rating is four. If it is below four, then we are going to be saying uh, your rating feedback is we will work on it. So just make sure you put a simple colon here and then we are going to be doing it. So make sure you use this one here. I hope you're going to be understanding it. Apart from this, I'll give you a small assignment more. What we want to do is we will have a rating system which will take and accept the rating from one to five. And for every single one, uh, for one, we're going to say we'll do better. For two also, we'll have a different message. For three, we are going to have a different message. And for all these other numbers, we'll have a completely different message that please enter the rating between one and five only. So design a simple program which uh, rates, which accepts the rating from one to five on a customized message on each level. For every other thing, it says, please choose only between one and five. So I hope you can bring this program to life. It's pretty easy. I hope you can do that. So go ahead, do that and reach me out on Instagram to share your uh, program, whatever you have written. So that's it for this video. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hadesh here and I hope that you did the last assignment that I gave you in the last video. If not, right now is a good time to pause the video and even at least give it a try because programming is something which until unless you struggle a little, you are not going to get good in it. In this video, I hope that you have done the assignment and you might have realized that dealing up with such cases can be really a long and lengthy code. Now, although there is no shortcut of having it, you have to test out each condition because we are writing code for that. So there is no magical shortcut for that. But there is another syntax which is inherited directly from C uh, into C++, also known as switch and case, which can reduce some of your work, but not. So in this video, we're going to be talking about switch and case. We'll give you enough of the hints that there are some gotcha movement here. So you'll avoid that. So they're not very hard, pretty easy. Now, a couple of things that you have to remember here, and again, thank goodness I'm using Xcode. It gives me a lot of code suggestions that are gonna help you to learn these things as well. So let's just say this time we got a rating and somebody has rated our app as rated three. So we want to test out for multiple condition. Just remember one thing that whatever you are testing it for, it needs to be constant, what against you are testing it for. So we're gonna be simply using a switch and case statement. I'm gonna write it, not gonna be using the code which is suggested to me by uh, my code editor. I'll do that later on. So first and foremost, we use a keyword switch, which is again, highlighted in red. That means it's a keyword. You cannot use it as a variable declaration. And after that, you put a pair of parentheses and then curly braces, just like that. Just like we have seen in the if conditional block as well. The switch, first and foremost, needs that what is the thing that you are tested it for. So rating is gonna be tested against multiple cases. Is it rated one? Is it rated two? So we get this guy first and foremost here. Then after that, once you are inside the switch and case, then you simply go ahead and write multiple cases for which you want to test against. And remember, this should needs to be a constant. One is definitely a constant. One always remains one, so that's why we have it. Then instead of the semicolon that we have been putting up so far, we put a colon. Make sure you keep an eye on this one. This is important. Then you hit enter here. And after that, you simply add as many lines of block of code as you get. Consider everything after the colon as being written inside these curly braces. And it's almost like that. But we don't actually use curly braces, but you can write as many lines as you can. I have just one line here, which is simply puts, and that's going to be simply saying uh, rated as one, rated as one star. So we're having this much only. And then most important thing is the break keyword. I'll, uh, I'll make you uh, understand this break keyword in a second, but this is the most basic stuff that we have got. Okay, no big deal. And uh, definitely I can just simply go ahead and just to show you, I can copy this and I can paste it up here as well. You can write as many lines as you can. After you have being done all of it, just make sure you write a break. 
So I'm going to be just copying this one because I have a couple of other cases that I want to test here. Now, when you when you will also be pasting these stuff, these things will happen and they are bad. Let me show you why they are bad. You edit it as two. You go ahead and remove this one here as well. Even this one here as well. But this is still not a very readable code. This is not a consistent code. In the world of programming, indentation and where you put the things is also very important. Although at the time of compiler, uh, it's going to do the job and will just not care much about these spaces. But making your code more readable is also one of your responsibilities. So make sure you always keep an eye on that. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that here again. So this is my case for two. And I'm going to say rated as two star and here obviously three star. Let's go ahead and change it that we are checking it for case three. I'm going to copy this one. I need one more here, which is going to be case for four. I'll indent them properly. And I need one more, which is going to be cases for five star. And there we go. We got five star, five star. I won't be calling that this is much less of a code compared to F and L's. Surely a little bit less, but this is more readable, more uh, precise code in this particular situation. Now, once you're done with matching up all the cases that you're having, you can write even more. Once you're all done with that, then comes up is another keyword, which is default. Default means I have tested it out for all. It didn't match any of it. Then this is the default one, like I'll execute if none of them executes. And I'm going to go ahead and simply use a simple puts. And I'm going to say, please rate our app only between one and five. There we go. Nice and easy. Put a semicolon here and make sure after that, it's a good habit to put a break here. Here, it's all about habit. Okay. Now let's go ahead and run this program here. And we're going to run that. It's going to say that rated as three star. That's nice. That's easy. Now let's talk about, you have understood all these case and all these switch keywords, but there is another keyword, which is a break keyword. Now break is a special keyword, which we're going to use later on in loops as well. What it does, it throws the control flow of your code just outside the block. So here at line number 38, after this parenthesis, not parenthesis, after this curly braces, it's going to throw the execution of the code just right here. But if you don't put a break statement, then strange thing happens in C++. Like for example, if I don't put a break keyword here, then automatically it's going to see that, hey, rating is three. So I'll match this one exactly here. I will execute this line of code and I'll also execute everything after that. So this will also execute. And since it's going to see the break after here, then it will stop executing the code. So when I run this one here without the break, you notice that it says rated as three star and rated as five star. This should be four. And let's run this again. But you got the point that it's going to rate as three and four star. In this case, this is not something that I would like to do. But in many cases, you might want to have it. Uh, so make sure you keep an eye on that, that what is really you want to have. This automatic going into another of the case is known as a fall through. And in most of the modern programming languages like Golang and stuff, this automatic fall through is not there. You don't need to have any keyword like break or something. If you intentionally want to go there, then you have to write certain keyword in those languages. But again, they are fairly new. C++ is an old gem. And that's why it has all some of these subtleties here. So make sure you keep an eye on that. As I told you, it's not really a very tough thing. And now let me show you that how code editor sometimes helps you in having these codes. So if I write a switch and hit the tab on my keyboard, notice here, it gives me a lot of boilerplate code that write your expression, I hit a tab again, it gives me a constant for which my expression needs to be evaluated. And then I can write all of my statements here. You're going to see most of the code editor actually or professional code editors for C++ are going to be doing this automatically for you. And that's a good thing. But again, don't make it a habit in the initial days. Once you're done with the all syntactical part and syntactical sugar of the language, then while building the application, we mostly focus about logic, not about these uh, fancy stuff. We know that code editor can give it to us. Okay, so there we go. Nice and easy program about handling how switch and case work in C++. I hope you have enjoyed it. And let's catch up in next video. Hey there, everyone. Hitesh here and welcome to another video. And in this video, as well as the next video that we'll be dealing up, we're going to be talking about loops or also known as iterations. Pretty simple, very easy to understand. If you want to do certain things again and again, you simply use loop. 
But if you're gonna do the thing again and again, it's gonna be an infinite loop that we cannot terminate. So there are 3.5 rules in almost every programming language that you follow along if you are understanding the loop. Now, syntax for the loop can vary a lot. In fact, in C++, we have probably the widest range of loops that are available in any language. We got while, do while loop, for loop, and recently they have introduced the range-based for loop as well. In the books and everything, usually the range-based loops are not discussed, but we are not books, we are gonna be talking about them as well. So let's understand these 3.5 rules of the loops that we have got here. They're pretty easy to understand. I'm not gonna be talking here about uh, you should write first while or do, we will do that in the code editor, that's the best place for it. But just understand and always keep these three things, uh, 3.5 things actually in mind. First and foremost is where the condition is getting tested. Now all the loops have their different point where they actually test the condition. And you need to pay a little bit special attention where actually the testing of the condition is being made. Some loops look a little bit weird for the first time user. For example, for loop, the condition is being tested in the middle, but when the program executes, the condition is being tested at the very first time. So make sure you pay a little attention that no matter what loop you're using, where the condition is being tested. I'll mention each and every one of them. So make sure you keep that in mind. After that, what condition is getting tested? Now we have understood where the condition is being tested, but what condition is being tested is also important because I'll mention this one thing here that sometimes you don't really care about uh, what condition is being tested and through which you land into some of the illegal memory area which you shouldn't be uh, lying upon that. So make sure you understand what condition is getting tested. Is it equality, less than, less than, equal to, whatever is being tested. Pay a small attention there. And the third, uh, almost last, which is change the value that is getting tested. Because obviously if you're gonna be testing the same value again and again, it's gonna give you the same result and you'll be keep looping or keep or keep not looping for the loop. So make sure you keep on changing the values and that's the most important thing that will keep you away from the infinite loop. And last, the point five condition is that some of the loop are having this feature of automatic change of value that is getting tested, especially in the range based loop, which is sort of a recent addition in C++, this is automatically being done. So make sure you take care of that as well. And that's why I have mentioned it as a 0.5 because it's automatically being done. But yes, you should pay a small attention there. So let's go ahead and talk about how these things are done. Let's move on to code editor. Okay, so now we are on the code editor. And one thing that you will be doing a lot is I don't expect that anybody understands the loop syntax on the very first go. It will come to you after practicing probably 20 to 30 times by making different programs. I'll try my best to make sure that you understand it. Most of the time, there is no escape for any programmer that you will be looping through arrays because uh, most of the time, if the data is coming up from database or any external resource, it's a very common practice that we iterate quite a lot over the arrays while creating them or while uh, decreating them. So make sure you keep that in mind. We have already seen some of the bits and pieces about arrays, not much, I'll show you more on that, but we're gonna be going for this like here. So we're gonna declare a simple my numbers as an array. And of course this is an array, so make sure you put a square brackets there, it's important. And we're gonna use the modern syntax of defining the array as well as uh, initializing it with some of the values there. So let's go ahead and initialize it with some values. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. I'll space it out evenly so that they look nice. So this is the array that I have to loop through here. And uh, the syntax that we're gonna see in this video is while and do while loop. They are pretty easy. First and foremost, we initialize any variable uh, that's gonna be equals to zero. It's very common in the loop that we use the variable i for iterating and i and j and k. Uh, simply in the very first release of the book of C, iteration was uh, simplified as i and that's why in all the loops we see i, so i comes from the iteration. But it's not compulsory, you can use an X or Y or just range or names and a whole bunch of other names. Feel free to name it anything, it's not compulsory. Then we're gonna go for a while. So while is again a keyword and the syntax is pretty, almost similar to the if. You just put a pair of parentheses and then curly braces and go like that. 
inside the parenthesis you test out for the condition that you are looking up for so I'm looking for the condition that I should be uh, less than 7 so if I check out here there we go 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 so there are 7 values and in order to get all the values remember the array starts from 0 so technically 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 values are there the moment it's going to check for 7 it's going to be a false condition i'm not checking for greater than or equal to 7 i'm checking uh, all less than 7 so at 6 it's true at 7 it's false because 7 is not less than 7 7 is equals to 7 so keep that in mind pretty simple and obvious thing for uh, experienced programmers so we're going to go ahead and like that now again we're going to be using c out this time and we're going to be putting out some numbers just like that and we're going to be saying current number is is and call it like that and then we are going to be just displaying the array my number remember how do we display the numbers if we want the first value we just simply say zero here if i want the second value i say one and two and so far since I have a variable which is i which starts with 0, if right now I just say i, it's going to display me the 0th value. And uh, I have to keep on increasing this number. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and do end line here. Nice and easy. So if I'll keep on running this loop like this, it's not going to do anything because remember, as I said here that you always need to change the value that is getting tested and we are not doing this final thing here we are not changing the value so obviously once the value is being printed I can simply say i is going to be equal to i plus one so that is a common syntax and we are incrementing it there we go not so bad pretty easy not so bad so we're going to run this one here and we can see we get all the numbers four five six seven eight nine and zero pretty good Okay, another short syntax that you're going to notice is simply something like this i plus plus or sometimes plus plus i depends on what you want to do first whether you want to increment and then use it or want to use it and then increment in this case I would like to go for this one because I want to use the number and then I want to increment it and next time it goes up the number already is being incremented. We definitely can have a long debate about these uh, pre-increments and post-increments. But right now, let's just keep things simple uh, because we have a lot to cover here. So there we go. Nice and easy. Okay, now I'll introduce you to some of the keywords as well. Then we'll talk about another type of look because they are super simple uh, specialties here. We have studied about one of them, which is break. So let's go ahead and talk about it. So we have seen that we have these if statements that goes like this and we can test out for anything. If I test out that I want to do something very special when i actually becomes equals to 3, then you can go ahead and do it. For example, if there is an additional thing you want to print out, you can simply go ahead and simply say uh, c out, and I'm going to say special thing, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and do an end line here as well, and go ahead and save that. And if I run this one here, uh, notice here after the six which is technically the position number three we got our special thing and things are going absolutely fine and good we can do these kinds of testing too what you're going to notice that sometimes we don't want to do testing but there are special cases where you want to simply just break here things now once you're going to do that what's going to do it's going to throw everything out so the loop that you're running as soon as it hits the break keyword it's going to throw the control here at line number 26 just right here. And just to prove the point, we can go out and simply say uh, C out. And we're going to say something like this out, outside of loop. There we go. And of course, a simple end line. We're going to save that and run this one here. What you're going to notice that as soon as we hit this third position here, that is not being printed because this part doesn't execute and we simply get out of it. So 0, the 4 gets printed, 1, 5 get printed, 2, 6 get printed, and as soon as we hit 3, the 7 doesn't get printed. Rather, the break keyword gets in effect, and it just throws it out here. Also, what you're going to notice sometimes that since this is just a one line, a keyword here, or one line of thing inside the if, sometimes people like to avoid these uh, things here, and that's totally OK. That's fine. Uh, this is a very common syntax this one there we go so this is a very common syntax you're going to notice this works exactly like that absolutely fine so this is a very short 
keyword here and uh, people use it sometime. Now I like to put it back here so that I can explain you more stuff. There is another keyword, the break we have already seen, the another keyword that is uh, continue here. So this continue keyword also works almost similar to break but a little different as well. The break actually breaks the entire flow of that block and just throws us totally out but continue is just like skip this one iteration, uh, can, don't do that and just uh, go after that. But if I'm gonna run this one directly like this, this is gonna give me a problem that the number gets printed but it just, the number is right now still three. It just continues and go back here and it's gonna just crash my program eventually and even my computer because things are not looking great. So I'm gonna stop this right now and notice here program exited with code nine. So this is an infinite loop, a very bad situation for memory. So what you can do rather here is before hitting this continue, you can just do an increment here. So we're gonna simply say uh, simply I++ plus plus, and there we go. Now. Once we hit the continue, before that the increment has already happened, so next time when we come here, the four is not equals to three, it will skip this entire part and will jump here. So technically, we'll be skipping just one number in this case. Let's go ahead and hit that run, and simply four, five, six, seven, remember which is at the third position, gets a skip here, and we simply go ahead and run that. In order to understand it more, I recommend students to actually get a simple here. And we just print a number that says skip this one. And then we simply go ahead and do an end L. There we go, nice and easy. And we run this one. And we see that we get this skip this one and then the rest of the things are continuing. So nice and easy and fun stuff here. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave all of this for you. So I'm gonna make a copy of it. I'll comment this all of these things out. I want to write it one more time because I want to show you another looping, which is pretty easy, but I don't want to do all of this jargon stuff here. Let's keep things absolutely simple. So this is all good and nice and easy. I'm gonna run this one and hopefully everything is working fine. There we go. Now another style of loop or another style of very popular loop is do while. Although you're gonna see the do while uh, more into the more into the stuff where you are actually writing either the drivers or some hardwares like sensors and stuff like that, there this do while loop is being used most. But in the software application, do while is not that much popular. I did a lot of do while stuff while designing and writing code for the sensors and drivers, sensors for humidity and a whole bunch of other things. There the do while is much more popular. The syntax is ridiculously simple. All you do is you take entirety of this, including the condition, you cut that out, and you simply go ahead and say do. And at the very end of it, you simply go ahead and paste that and put a semicolon. That's it, that's it. And you might be asking what's the difference between them. As of now, it looks exactly same. The difference is really simple. At the top, the condition is first getting tested and then we are entering into the loop. Here, first we are executing it and then we are checking the condition. That means no matter even if the conditions are wrong, it's gonna execute this whole stuff at least one time. And to prove the point here is this one, which is eight. So if I go here at eight, now I'm initializing the I value at eight, remember, I shouldn't be executing this one here because if you look at here, if I is less than seven, then only execute it. And I is directly at eight. So this part will never allow me to even run this code. And this can sometimes lead to some of the trouble because you're running it at least at one time. So you might be accessing some of the area of memory which is not really legal to access, but you are able to do it because you run the code here and you are accessing the my number at eighth position here, which is not good. So let me show you that if I save this and run this. Right now it's not gonna do much harm to me because it's just a garbage value that is being thrown at that position. But you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. That's not a good stuff. And of course, no matter what happens, our outside guy is always getting printed. So there we go. We have seen and discussed a little about the loops that we are having. These are the two most common loops that are being used. The while loop is much more common in the software industry. And the another gigantic and the charm, uh, uh, kind of charismatic uh, loop that is we are gonna discuss are the four loops. And yes, there are two of them. So I hope uh, let's keep this video short and just up till here. And in the next video, we're gonna be talking a bit about the loops as well as a little about the strings as well. Just like we have talked about the arrays here, we're gonna talk a little bit about, this, uh, about the strings as well. Surely we'll cover that in depth later on, but right now, just a small glimpse.
Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here. And after realizing, and after recording the last video, I realized that it's getting too long, so I need to break down this for loop into two parts again. So here is again uh, me getting started. And in this video, we'll be talking about just the for loop and another for each loop, which is a recent addition in the C++. And in the next video, we'll be talking about bit advanced things that you can do with these for loops. So here's my another take on this video. So let's go ahead and get started. This is a brand new file that we have got up here. So one of the most common things that we do with the loop is uh, iterating through over the array. Surely it's not really compulsory that you always iterate through just an array. You can iterate through over a variety of other things and even just numbers and stars and patterns as well. But in this case, we'll be doing something more meaningful, which is iterating through an, a number array. So we're gonna call this one as simply integer type my nums, which is gonna store a few numbers. Now interestingly, this time I'm gonna just start it with an empty square brackets. I'm gonna go ahead and use the modern syntax like this. And we are gonna be storing a few values. So two, three, four, five, and six. Just one more, there we go. So this is also a perfectly valid syntax. The C++ compiler automatically can figure it out that these are the value that will go inside this array. So I should create an array big enough that can hold this value. It sometimes is not recommended by a lot of programmer because you should explicitly mention that how many values you're gonna get, but this is also okay. And in the real world writing of the C++ program, we use that quite a lot because sometimes we are not even sure that what values are gonna be going in there. So defining them on the go sometimes, sometimes is being done, not all the time. Okay, so for loop can be a little bit uh, dangerous for the beginners and it might be confusing as well, but it's not. It has a lot of pieces that we need to understand together as well as we need to just go through with them. So first and foremost, the keyword is pretty simple. We just use a for keyword. We put a pair of parentheses and there we go. So this might be looking very similar to an if else or a while here. So yes, it is, but what goes inside this for loop is actually a three part thing that you have to go. The first part is initializer. The second part is the comparator or which compares the thing. And the third part is either incrementer or decrementer, or you can call it as a changer. So remember, three parts are there. So previously in the while loop, we were declaring something like this, that I'll have an initializer i that will start with zero and I'll work with that. Now in the case of for loop, this entire initialization actually happens inside the for loop. You can do it. Now the good thing about this is that this i variable is gonna be available just for this for loop. Once you are out of this, you can again use a for this variable i here because this variable is created for the lifespan of this for loop. And once the loop is done, that's it. It's automatically get kind of deleted, not exactly deleted, but kind of deleted. So that's the first part. And make sure you put a semicolon here because this is a three part thing. Once that is being done, that you have initialized a variable with whatever the value you need, not always zero, but whatever the value you need, then you simply go ahead and say i is gonna be less than five. Now remember here, first value, second value, third value, fourth value, and fifth value. Since the array counting starts from zero, as soon as the value reaches five, that means I really don't want to work on that. That's my ending case here. Put another semicolon. So this was the second part. First part is initializer. Second part is checking for the condition. And the third part is gonna be incrementer. So in the shorthand, I can simply write I++. You're gonna see some people writing plus plus I too. Both are absolutely good in the case of for loop. And once we are out here, we can simply go ahead and say C out and we can define this my nums. Just like previously we saw that in the my nums, the zeroth value is first value, first value, technically, and second value, third value, you can go for that. Or here in this case, I can go for ith value because i actually starts from zero and is getting incremented. And I'm gonna go ahead and simply get an end l here. So let's go ahead and do that. So there we go, pretty basic, simple loop for iteration. And I know at this point, the while might be looking much more easier than this, but for loop is the most used loop for every programming language. Let's go ahead and run this and no doubt we get all the results up here, no big deal. Let's, let me quickly brief you that how the working of this loop is going on. As soon as the for syntax goes on, and if you're initializing any variable inside it, 
first and foremost, this initialization happens and only happens one time. Now here's a side note that it's not compulsory that you always should initialize in here, although you can. You can simply go ahead and kind of take it up here. You can do something like this that I'm gonna go ahead and initialize it here. And I'm gonna just start a value here. So you can, you're totally allowed to do so. But usually if we are using a for loop, a temporary variable is being needed and that's why this variable is actually declared inside the for loop. This initialization happens only at the very first time when the loop is executing. After that, this never happens. It doesn't reinitialize the variable again and again. After that, the condition is being checked every single time. So step number one, initialize a variable. Step number two, just check for the condition. If the condition is true, write just after that, it will not move into I++. Right after checking the condition, it will jump inside the body of the loop and how many statements you have given are gonna execute. Once it reaches to this closing parenthesis just before that, it jumps back into this parenthesis and will increment the value for you. After that, in the second iteration, it's gonna go back here, we'll check the condition, we'll perform the operation, will jump here and just when it jumps here it's going to jump back here and will increment for you. As long as the condition becomes true it's going to keep on entering the loop and will execute that. So that's kind of a thing you have to do. Now in case of array or whatever the iteratable objects or data types are being given to you you have to manage everything on your own like incrementing the values and checking for the condition and a whole bunch of other things. So this is a very common syntax you're going to see. Now, many times what you're gonna notice that sometimes people just don't need to iterate over an array. They just want to print a number from zero to four. They can just do it by simply saying, hey, I just want to print that number that whatever you're getting. I'm definitely gonna get a warning that you are not using it. But if I just run this program here, this gives me all the values from zero to four. So no big deal. That kind of stuff is pretty, very, very basic. So I'm gonna keep it this way. Okay, now since there are so many iteratable available in most programming languages that it was eventually needed that we need some kind of enhancement over these for loops because we all the time need to iterate over arrays and we all know arrays are fixed size elements so there can be some improvements being done that can help us to iterate these uh, loops easily. So an enhancement over the for loop came into the picture which is also known as a for range loop or also for each loop in some languages. What it does, it uses the same syntax you can notice here, the for, and we have a range declaration and range expression. So what basically it means, I'm gonna remove this for a moment so that we can see the syntax more clearly. So starting point is almost exactly same, but what we can do here is we can do bit more enhancement. So I'll first and foremost, we'll hit a C out here so that we can see the separate output. I'm gonna say something like this, get a break and we are gonna simply end line it. There we go. So now we can easily see the two outputs here. Okay, so in the for each loop or for range based loop, we use and we start with the exact same syntax that we have got here. Now here we just have to enter two things separated by colon this time, not the semicolon. Remember, this is an important key fact. And all I can do here is I can initialize any variable. I can again initialize through i because I was just initialized here and as soon as we reached out here, the I was kind of deleted. Remember I said kind of deleted. So I can use I again here because it's a temporary variable. And you have to also mention that where I need to loop through. I'll just simply say my nums, this is where you have to loop through. And then here also, it gives us so much of the easier syntax that you can simply go ahead and see out and can simply say that I want you to just print out whatever the value I is and I'm gonna hit an end line here is. Now I hope you can understand the syntax and the differences between them. Here I was using again this array syntax, uh, the square bracket E syntax which says I inside it. Here I'm not doing anything like that. I'm just using I and let's first run this and then we're gonna talk about this. So let's go ahead, run that. We see a get a break and we see exact the same output from the array. So you can use any of these arrays. In fact, uh, most of the arrays, I prefer this kind of syntax because it's much more compact and easier. Now notice here how many things this loop is doing in the back end for you. Initialization, surely we are doing it, but we are not telling it from what to initialize it. We are just saying, start with whatever you like. I'm not mentioning anything here. And then I'm mentioning my array here. So whatever your iteratable, now remember, 
arrays are not the only iteratable in the C++, there are a bit more iteratables as well. I just mentioned my iteratable. Automatically, compiler tells my variable i that you need to start from the very first element, and this is how much variable or elements I have got in the array, and you need to terminate just right here. So automatically, these information are being passed to my i, and then also, I don't need to use this syntax here because it automatically jumps from these values. I can directly use this i because every time i is jumping into individual element and this can be strings as well, an array of strings or array of numbers or floating point values can be anything. So this is a very compact syntax, but it takes beginners to take a little bit while to jump into this syntax. So again, this is a classic for loop. You're gonna see them in hundreds of places. This is a bit more advanced of C++ uh, for each loop or for range-based loop introduced, I guess, in C++14. And it is really, really popular. You're going to see them in a lot of code. So again, go ahead, practice them a little bit. Try to print out numbers from 1 to 10, uh, 10 to 1, and a whole bunch of other things. I will come up, come back, and we'll talk more about these for loops and the for each loop in the next video. We're gonna get a little bit introduction more to the strings and how these loops can be absolutely powerful and some not so common ways of using them, which are gonna see a lot in the GitHub and people who write C++ code a lot. So we need to get familiarized with that as well. So let's go ahead, move on to the next video and talk more about for and the for each or for range based loop. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here. And in this video, we're gonna again talk about for and the for range based loop. Now, the reason why I am putting up another video on the same topic is because I want to introduce you some of the shorthand notations that are being used. What confuses a lot of people in the beginning stages, the experienced programmers are so much friendly and they understand so much in depth of the language that they use shorthand notation almost everywhere. And they just kind of get in the habit of using them. But when the beginners see these codes on GitHub or Bitbucket, they just get confused at how that is being happening. So in this video, we're gonna talk about that. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So first and foremost, we have seen so far that we can declare an integer, call it as my nums or my numbers, just like that. And we can initialize it with something like this. So one, two, three, four, five, whatever, whatever the values you're having, it's okay. Now, how about one more thing that you will be iterating quite a number of times over the strings as well. So you need to understand a little bit about the strings. Now strings in the C++ are actually of two types. The one that we are talking here are directly being copied and pasted from the C or are being brought into the language from the C. Remember C++ is just an enhancement over the C. So these that we are talking here are from C, but there is another type of uh, strings here in the C++ which are advanced. And we're gonna talk about them later on in the course. Right now, just talking about the core level or the basic level of the string. A lot of people have stopped using it much more because they are not as much powerful as C++, but still a lot of code you're gonna see around. So what we can do is we can use a character and we're gonna call this as uh, my string or something like that. So I'm gonna call this as my string. And there we go. So how do we define it? We simply go ahead and use these codes and we can simply put up my name here. There we go. So this is the basic string that how you can define. And here you're gonna notice, and of course I forgot to put these guys. So you're gonna notice that I can, just like I can define an integer array, I can define an array of characters and can call it as a string. Now, no big deal. We have seen that, that this can also be printed and we can see that uh, my name, oops, my name is and colon, and then for the string, we use percent %s. I'll definitely add a slash n here. And then I can simply say my string. No big deal, we have seen this kind of code in the past as well, I guess. And we can see that it's gonna print my name. Of course, if I don't forget my semicolon, let's run it one more time. And there we go, it gets me my name. No big deal, we have seen this uh, in the past as well. But there is another syntax that you can use. And remember, the character sequence that we have created here, let me show you that, let me show you that because it's much more easier that way. So if I define another string here, so I'm gonna simply say char and I'm gonna call this as my name and then I'm gonna define it with a different way, with this syntax. So if I'm using a, this, this kind of a syntax, I have to code every single character into these. So let me go ahead and quickly do that. Okay, so this is almost exactly same as what we have seen above. So here we are defining just with a double quotes, that's okay. 
But what this syntax at line number 17 explains us a little bit more that this is not how things actually look like and this is not how things are actually inside a string. What you need to do is you need to come back here and add a zero at the end of it. And this is how we use it. Now this might sound absolutely weird to you and why is it having, uh, again, we forgot to put the code, these guys here, so there we go. So notice here, every single string that you're gonna see in C++, which are defined in this way, always have this zero as a terminating character or null terminating character. Keep that in mind because a lot of shorthand notation are about to come. Remember, or even say it out with me, that every single string is terminated by this zero here. Even though here we don't see it, but actually behind the scene, the compiler is putting up one zero for you at the very end here. You cannot put it manually here because this is not how it works, but here you have to explicitly mention it. And at first, it, it's gonna look exactly same. If I just say my number, it's gonna look exactly same, that hey, you are able to put up Hitesh, no big deal. But when you loop through the things, then it becomes a little bit extraordinary. So let me show you how the looping can be done and I'll do some of the looping with the pointers as well. So we're gonna go ahead and do first a C out and we are gonna put up this. Uh, we're gonna say take a break and I'll add just a slash in there. Okay, now let's go ahead and do the looping. First and foremost, a simple for base loop. So how do we loop? We simply go ahead and initialize. So let's go ahead and use int i and i is gonna be getting started with you know it, zero. Now what's the condition that you are checking? Now remember, the condition you can definitely mention specifically by counting one, two, three, and so forth, but that's not what uh, most people like to do when they are iterating through over the string. What they simply say, that whatever your string name is, in this case, my name, and I know that you are gonna be iterating through every single character, so when, as soon as you reach to a certain character, which is not equals to zero, then just go ahead and exit it. And I'm gonna simply go ahead and increment that and we'll talk a little bit more onto that in a second. First and foremost, let's go ahead and print it out and see that if the logic that we are talking about is actually working or not. So we're gonna simply say character is, and then we're gonna go ahead like that. And we're gonna go like this and we're gonna say my name and we'll break it down to an ith character here. And definitely, I would like to go ahead and have an end line here. There we go, nice and easy. Looks almost okay. So we're gonna run that and we can see that yes, my name is getting breakdown here. Now this weird syntax or weirdo that you are see seeing up here is running on the same concept again, that in every single string, the last character is gonna be zero. So I'm testing out that, hey, keep on running this string until unless the whatever the ith value that you are seeing doesn't really become equal to zero. So already this is a reverse logic, which is a little bit tough to understand for a beginner. But on top of that, we are taking an advantage of this guy here. I took this advantage on this my name, but since I just want to show you a proof, this also works in the my string. So just assume that this entire line is not even present. And you are seeing this for the very first time with a syntax which says my string. And here also you see this as a my string. Now in that case, for a beginner, it might become a bit uh, unobvious to kind of assume that these kinds of things are happening. When I run this one here, you see that, hey, this works, but what this whole thing is, I don't see any kind of zero in my string here. So that kind of thing actually happens. So I'm gonna put it back here so that you can have all these things. Nice and easy, there we go. So this is a very common stuff. You're gonna see this a lot. And even sometimes what you're gonna see is something like this, and which again becomes a bit weird here. So let's first go ahead and run this one one more time. So we're gonna go ahead and see that if it is working. And you see that, yes, it again works. Now again, in the, in the classic example of if and else, I told you one thing, that all the zero values are false and all the non-zero values are true. So as soon as this one is able to grab a value, which is h, that means condition is true. So it just works. At the e position, it just grabs a value e. e is not zero, so it works. At the very end of the string, it sees a zero, which is a false condition. So automatically it triggers it as a false. And that's why you exit the loop. Again, these are a little bit weird stuff, but this is so common that programmers don't even think about it and they just write it this way. And then people get a whole lot of confusion here. 
Now we can do the same stuff uh, with the character pointer as well, and which is pretty common to see. Sometimes people like to loop through the pointers as well. And again, this is pretty common and pretty easy. So we're gonna go ahead and change this one here. So we're gonna simply define a char. Let's go ahead and say that this is gonna be my character pointer. We're gonna call this as CP. The first big question that arises is, from where should I initialize or to what value should I initialize my character pointer? If you have taken notice from the past video, I said that you just need to point out your pointer onto the very start of the array. In this case, I'm gonna point it to simply my name here. So as soon as I point it, it gets a point onto the very first or starting position of the array. Then you can simply go ahead and run the same logic that we have gone through in the past one. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that again. I'm gonna simply say that uh, my character pointer, the CP, keep it running till it hits zero. So not equals to zero, just check for this condition. It's automatically gonna get it. And then simply just like you increment your I, I can just go ahead and simply say plus plus. Remember in one of the video I told you that character pointer is smart enough to jump through the next value of an array. And now, once we are having this, we are going to use a dereferencing of pointer. Remember, we talked about this as well in one of the last video. I can go ahead and take this one here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this one here so that we can have a small break. And we're gonna say, uh, take a break part two, so that we realize that what kind of value we are executing here. I totally can understand that for some of you, this might be too much, but you need to understand it right here that's the actual C++ and we'll be going a little bit more in depth. Okay, so we see take a break here, this one executing fine and this one is executing fine. So this is also a common syntax. You're gonna see that some people look through with the character pointer. Again, weirdo syntax number one goes up here. Weirdo number syntax two is going up here as well. But this is not all about it. You can go ahead and do a whole lot of stuff that you can go and do. So let me show you one more thing here. Okay, so I would like to show you one more thing, just one final thing, I promise. So we have seen that how we can loop through these. I would like to show you one more easier way of looping through these strings. Surely you can do all these fancy stuff, a lot of people do. But now we have a different kind of loop, which is for each loop. So we go like this, go like that. And in here, in the for range base loop or for each, we put a colon, we have to two pu put two things. The second one is what is I have to iterate over. And in this case, it's gonna be my name. And what's the first thing which is gonna hold each of the values? We know that the string is comprised of characters. So we're gonna define exactly same data type here, which is gonna be char. Uh, let's call it as i, which is iterating through over it. And then simply, we, we're gonna go ahead and simply print that out. So we're gonna simply say something like this, char, or char is like that. And we're gonna go ahead and say, just give me an i. And of course, give me an end L2 here. There we go, looks nice and easy. Okay, please go away. There we go. And we're gonna run this. And before we actually run this, I'd like to get a break part three so that we can see where we are differentiating our code so that it's easier for us to remember and see that. Go ahead and run this one here. Now notice here things are happening a little weird here. Not much, but little. We are here, take a break part three, and we are able to iterate through over it. Program is exiting with the code nice and easy. It's pretty good, but notice very closely, we are seeing a char, which is h, and then final at the end of my name, there is a blank space here as well. So what this blank space is? This blank space is actually a proof that yes, at the very end of it, there is a zero. But this loop is little smart to to not to show that because it knows that uh, there is a character type being created and character type cannot actually just show you that zero number there. So although you can avoid it if you can, but you can add a little bit of the syntax here to make sure that you don't go for it. Uh, again, we have seen this already. We can just simply introduce simply if a condition here. I'll be using a shorthand notation here. So we're gonna simply check if whatever you are looping through, in this case, I'm looping through with I, is actually equals to zero because I know for the string that's the last character, I just want to simply go ahead and simply say break. There we go. Once I save this one and I run this guy here, notice this time I'm not getting that weird empty space, but everything is looking nice. Again, it's a habit of programmer to eventually go into the shorthand notation. Just like here, I'm not using these curly braces. I tend to use them shortly if I can. It's a habit that eventually goes up. And this sometimes confuses a lot of people. 
So I hope you have understood a whole lot about the string and the iteration and the for and for each loop, how they are used, and especially this uh, is a little bit weird at first, but eventually you're gonna realize that a lot of things need to be treated uh, through these character pointers and any sort of pointer as a matter of fact. So I hope this video was a little bit fun and a little bit challenging for you too as well. I highly recommend to watch it one more time because I really think that the beginners can actually go through it in one time. Go ahead, do that, and we are going to end this section right here. Go ahead, get yourself an iced tea or some water or something, and we're going to catch up in the next section. Hey there everyone, Hatesh here, and welcome to another video. And in this video, we're going to talk about precisions. Now, we have been dealing with numbers so far, and we have been using almost just one data type, slightly couple of other data types as well, but mostly int. Now, there is another data type which is available in the C++ and which is known as float data types. Now, float data types gives you more precision over the data. They are the values which are defined moreover by the decimal values. And make sure you do understand that 20 and 20.0 20 are two different things for computer. And these are available in three different flavors or you can say three different level of precisions float double and long double. Now I won't be going into the depth that, hey, this goes for from this much of the bit to this much of the bit. That's actually too much of the theoretical. You definitely can go ahead and Google it a little bit and can find about it. What I'm gonna tell you is how they can actually manipulate your program without knowing, uh, without your knowledge. So make sure you keep in mind this one simple fact that take caution while using them. It might be an urge for a new programmer that says that why we are using int when we have a higher values, our systems can now have a larger memory. And instead of using 20, we always can define it as 20.0 and that's gonna be almost equal to that. But that's not the case. Uh, using these float values doesn't comes with just the usage and the bigger memory, but they also comes with a cost of precision and that can be dangerous to have in the programs if you don't know what you are dealing up with that. So let me show you what it actually does and how to find out how much system memory it's going to take for you. So for example, first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and do the regular printf and we're going to simply go ahead and say uh, float size is and then we're going to hold that into a placeholder. For the float, we're going to be using ld uh, because we're using a size of here. And we're going to say bits, of course, with a slash in. And after that, we can use this size of. Now, this reminds me a simple thing that although we are using size of as like it's a method almost similar to main, but it's not internally. There's a lot going on with the size of operator and probably in some other videos, I'll talk more about it just to keep in mind that uh, we might go into a tangent here, but I really just want to make sure that you understand that size of doesn't always need to use like this. It has a way more different architecture if you look into the actual documentation and probably we'll talk about it some other day. Right now, let's just keep the things simple. So we have these uh, floating types of values as well and I can just simply say long here and can print out these values. So let me run this one here. And as we see that float is of uh, eight bits, which is not correct because we need to multiply it by eight in order to get the exact precise value here. So now this is accurate. So we are using 64 bits and we don't have just the long. If you see up here, we have double and as well as long double and they are just twice the size of whatever the long is. And this might be different on your system. In my system, it's saying 64 bit of the float, which is usually the general size. But as I mentioned in one of the earlier videos, the size can be deceiving on based on the system. So if I just go for the double in my system, it's just a double of 64 bits. Uh, no, uh, the double is also 64 bits here. The long double is actually uh, the twice the size of what we were looking up for. So long double, 128 bits. So it obviously might be think you might be thinking that why we are using uh, ints in place of that. So let me show you first uh, one of the example that we can have. So let's just say if I go ahead and say this is my float and just like we have design uh, said float double int, we can just put up the data, si uh, data type here. I'm gonna say my uh, precise my precise value, or you can name your variable, whatever you like. And I'm gonna put up a specific value here, which is gonna be 20.2. So make sure you also follow me up here. We are gonna do a simple example with 20.2. So later on, you can just manipulate and change that. And I'm gonna go ahead and print out this value. It's gonna be super easy. 
and I'm going to say my precise value is, and then we are going to use a placeholder. For the float values, we tend to use a simple F here for floating values. And I'm going to also add a slash n so that we get uh, after that. And just to avoid a bit of confusion because I'll be adding a few more things here. And I'm going to be saying that my precise value is in float so that we get not much of the confusion with the slash n. So just for fun stuff. Okay, after that, I just have to mention my precise value here and end that with the semicolon. So let's see what is the result here. When I go ahead and do the result, what we notice here, it's actually not the 20.2 that we saw here. It's actually 20.200001. So this is the most interesting, interesting stuff. Now here in the placeholder, you can specifically mention that how much value in the precision you want. And we'll be doing that later on. But before we go ahead and do that, I would like to show you something interesting here. So we have noticed that we can add the values too. So what happens if I add 20.2 and 20.2? So that might be a pretty obvious and very easy as a calculation. And you obviously might have guessed the result that it's 40.400002. Okay, now let's do a quick test if it is actually the value or not. So I'm gonna say, I'll use a simple if and else conditional. And if I'll say that my precise value is actually equals, make sure you put a double equals, is actually equal to 40.4, then we got 0, 0, 0, 0, 002. So that's the exact value that I got. And I want to simply uh, put up a value here. So I'm gonna say puts, you got it right. There we go, looks great. So are you expecting that this value is gonna be printed? Yes, of course, because this is what we have got in the result. But when I run this program, this value actually uh, doesn't get printed. And you might be thinking, hey, what's wrong in my code? Why is it not getting printed? Because if I write a simple else conditional block here, and I say put uh, something here, uh, or literally something, there we go and I run this program, you're gonna notice that something is getting printed. So definitely this code block is getting executed, but I'm not getting a precise value here. And the reason for that is when you use these floating values, you have to be very cautious while doing these arithmetic operations because int is just an integer, it doesn't come with the precision and this floatings and doubles and long doubles comes with its own precision. So just to give you a more brief idea that you can come up here in the percent and you can specifically mention that how many values you want. So I'm gonna just say 1.30F and I'm gonna hit uh, just a play here. And now you can notice that the value was not actually uh, 40.400 uh, and one. It was actually a bit more than that. And after a certain numbers, you can see that it's gonna be bit more different uh, here. So this is what we are getting. So again, this comes with a, a cost of precision that you have to always take care. And in some of the banking application or stock trading application, this might be good, but make sure while you are doing your arithmetic calculation, it might give you some of the results which you are not expecting. And this is just what we have uh, talked about the float. Remember, we have got double as well as, uh, as, well as long double, which are much more precise values and consumes a lot of memory. We have seen that uh, the double and the long double are usually the twice the size of the float that we have seen. So make sure you keep an idea in the mind and all those who are thinking that float gives us more precision, so we should always use float. It might not be a good choice at some of the cases. So I hope you have got much more idea. I highly recommend to go and read a little bit more about these more precise values, long double and the floats here and definitely refer a couple of books as well to find out how much values they start and all of that. I think you can do that. That's a pretty obvious thing. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, and let's understand one more fundamental block about learning C++. And the reason why C++ is used in variety of system level things is because of its capability of handling exceptions. Now, yes, I know and I totally understand that your memory of try catch block has been totally corrupted by this divide by zero exception, almost every book. And I'm pretty sure once or the twice you have studied this try catch block, you have always seen the same example divide by zero. And I personally believe 
that it needs to a little bit modification now we have seen enough of divide by zero examples so in this video i'll try to give you a bit of different example that is much more fun and will clear much more basics about these try catch block instead of this regular old uh, divide by zero surely that's a great example it's an old classic but sometimes newer stuff is well appreciated so try catch block is really simple. You want to execute some of the code and you believe that it might throw you some of the problems and these problems are kind of unavoidable sometimes and you are pretty sure that it might happen. So testing out the case for that it might happen, you can just uh, take care of that problem because if you're not gonna take care, your program is gonna crash. So crashing is bad, but if you certainly know that I do may get into, I may fell into this error and I can just handle it and keep on executing my program. So that's why the try catch block was initially designed and it was adopted into many other languages as well. So let's go ahead and see a very classic and very simple example of this try catch block. So in this, we are gonna simply declare a simple variable, I'm going to call this as integer type and just assume that somehow we are making a request to web, just assume we are not actually making it and we are talking to some of the API, maybe Google API, maybe Facebook API, whatever that is. And it's getting a value of a one here for some reason, I don't know, or maybe just two, whatever the number you want to grab. Now also, fictitiously, somehow we are able to determine that whatever the value is coming up from this API, we are able to determine the data type of that value. It might be two, it might be 2.0, or it might be a character. So I want to write a simple code and I know that sometimes my code is going to fall into error. So in that case, you can simply go ahead and use a try catch block. So let me go show you that what the try catch block looks like. So first and foremost, you get a try as a keyword, you put a curly brace, you enter, you hit the curly braces. And then after that, you use the keyword catch. And then catch actually needs a pair of parentheses. And then you hit curly braces and enter that. So this is a basic foundation of a try catch block, you simply try to execute some piece of code. And if you are not able to handle that, or you are sure that there's going to be error, you throw that into a catch block and catch block nicely handles that provide a nice error message to the user user can just keep on moving forward. So I'm going to go ahead and write that and this is going to be our simple C out. And we're going to simply have a simple text here, which is going to say, uh, keep on moving with rest of code. Looks great. Looks great so far. Now let's see that how we're going to go with the try catch block. So let's just say we are going to go ahead and have a simple C out again, a lot of things are fictitious here to understand the syntax. And we're going to simply say that uh, trying to use trying to use API value. And uh, you realize that you are trying to use these API values. And after that, you did some testing as well. And we're going to say did some testing with uh, API of value. So this was probably an if else block or uh, probably something more that you did rigorous testing. And after the testing, you realize that if all things goes wrong, and just assume this is an if and else block, I really don't want to put an if and else block here, it's going to make example much more confusing. But just assume that now the if and else block starts. And you'd realize after doing the testing and inside the if and else block that you are not able to handle this API call. So you just introduce another keyword, which is throw and you simply throw this call API. Remember, if you're going to execute this throw just directly here like this, you're always going to actually throw it, which is not a good thing. You should do some of the testing that what result you are getting after the testing and then we should throw it. It makes sense as a genuine program. Okay, we go ahead and do stuff like this. And I would also like to put a message for you. My compiler is going to give me some errors, but I'm going to still write that. I'm going to simply write the throw uh, a simple C out message for you. And the message is really simple that no code execute after return and throw. So whatever you're writing here after a throw, it's not going to execute. So we're going to simply put it like that. And there we go. Nice and easy. Now let's go ahead and work on a really simple I forgot a semicolon here as well. Let's go ahead and work on this catch. Now this catch first and foremost need to be very precise that what kind of data type is going to be coming in. Now, 
errors and these exceptions do come with their own exception data type as well, but we're gonna talk about them later on. Right now, I just want to keep things simple. So let's just say there is an integer uh, type of value that is being thrown up inside the catch. Then we can go ahead and simply go ahead and say, say out, see out, and we can say integer exception handled. And we're gonna go ahead and do like that. So I hope you are following along with me in the this fictitious world that we are in. Again, my compiler is always gonna throw an error because this line of code never executes. Once throw actually reaches out, then none of the code is gonna execute after that. And that's why we usually like to keep this throw inside an if and else or some kind of block. So if we enter that block, we just want to exit from there. We're gonna simply go ahead and hit that run. And we're gonna see that uh, we forgot a whole lot of slash ins, which is making uh, none of the things as readable. So we're gonna go ahead and enter slash ins almost everywhere, run this one more time. And now we can see that we try to use the API value. We did some testing with the API value and realized that we are not able to handle it. And then integer exception was handled nicely in this block and the rest of the program keeps on executing. Now, if you're not gonna be handled that nicely, then your program is gonna crash and we're gonna see that in a second. Now, for example, you realize that I am not pretty sure that every time we are gonna receive an integer, there might be some cases of API that it might give you a 20 point or 2.0, which is gonna be a simple float. So what you can do in that case, you can define as many catches as you would like. So there can be another type of catch here, which can say that, hey, I'm gonna be assuming that you gives me a float and I'm gonna call this as Y or I can even call it as X or F, whatever you like. It just is a kind of replica value. And we are gonna again do a C out. We're gonna say something like this, that float exception handled. There we go. And of course, this time I'll not forget the slash ins. And there we go. Now, if somehow we are able to determine that what the value we receive from the API is actually a float, then this time, obviously, it should not go inside this integer exception. It should go rather into the float exception. If I run this program, this time we see that trying is all good, testing is all good, but this time we actually automatically got, got into the float exception. So based on the type of the error that you are getting, you can actually go ahead and do it. Now the problem actually arises when you don't know what type of exception you might get here. Now these are very precise information that we are throwing up, but obviously sometimes the web world can be a little bit tricky to understand what data type might be coming up. Probably for example, you might get a simple character from the web. And if I remove this and say H, just for my name, H, you receive this character as an input. Now if I run this, you're gonna notice something bad is happening, that we tried to do all of these things, it went all nicely, but after sometimes we get this uh, lib C++ uh, errors, and your error is definitely going to be different because you are into different system. Terminating with uncaught exception, and this line which said, uh, keep on moving with the rest of the code, actually is never executing, so that's a bad thing we are trying to avoid with this. So in these cases where you are not able to quickly predict that what kind of error is gonna be coming up, there's a default thing that you can do. So there's a catch and inside the catch, if you put out these three dots and then write all of this and you can say, uh, and we're gonna write a very classic, very irritating message for the user, which is uh, something went wrong. I usually always avoid it, but just for fun, we're gonna have this. So when I use these three dots, that means if I'm not able to give you the exact precisely the error code that what kind of error is gonna come up, then we can use this syntax here and can have this one. So let me run this program again. And this time it said that, yeah, we did all the testing and APIs and stuff, but this time something went wrong. So definitely our code is now able to catch these exceptions and rest of the program is keep moving forward and we don't get any problem at all. So you realize that yes, we can understand these try and catch blocks pretty nicely and they are not really very tough to use. They are even one of the simplest thing that you can have in your program. So I hope you have enjoyed this bit different approach about the try catch block. And if you want to read more about that divide by zero try catch exception, you definitely can read out a few blogs and I'm pretty sure you have studied that somewhere or the other on the internet or some book. I hope you have enjoyed this. Let's catch up in the next video. 
functions are really the essential building block of C++. Yes, I know C++ is moreover like a object oriented programming, but you're going to see functions quite prominently dominating the language. This is not a full guide of functions in the C++. We'll take care of them later on in the course. But I want to give you a sneak peek of functions because we need them for some of the topics that I want to discuss early on. So this is going to be your sneak peek about the functions. Don't worry, it's super easy. I'll give you some of the hidden basics and behind the scenes of the function, not just uh, this is a function to print hello world and there we go, we print the hello world. We're going to do a little more than that. So let's go ahead and first obviously let's do the basics of the functions. So as we can see this is the basic function that we have got main which exits like return zero like that and that's all what we have got here. Now if you want to define any other functions first let's do it a bit uh, not so obvious and not so correct way. Uh, let's just say we have a function that says uh, simply say hello. Just like that this is a basic function. Now in the C++ you have to mention that what kind of things are going to be returned from the function. If nothing is being returned that can be called as simply void. And inside that we can have the definition of the function like what this function is going to do. In this case the function is going to do simply a puts and is going to just say hello. So it's going to say hello there. There <laughs> and there we go. Nice and easy. Now how do we call this function? Now functions are called, you just say the name of the function, like here we can simply say say hello and put a semicolon and we're gonna run this one and you're gonna see something very, very different here. So we're gonna run this one and obviously you have already seen that there is an error. Now error is that says, hey, I don't know what this say hello is and you might be saying, hey, we have defined it just here at the bottom. Now in the C++ what you need to do, there are obviously a couple of ways, but you need to define all of them above uh, or before using that function so that the compiler knows that yes, there is a method being defined and you are trying to use it here. Definitely there are a couple of other shortcuts and handy ways to handle the situation, but now we can see that there is a hello there. So that's the very basic of it. Surely there is more to functions in it. We're going to talk about them later on. But now let me show you something a bit different. We're going to define another one here. So we're going to simply say this time a simply void. And this is going to say two. So this is a function which just says two. Now let's go ahead and run this one. We have seen that if I just go ahead and say puts. And I just literally say uh, two here. There we go. Let's go ahead and use this one as well. We're going to say say two run that and obviously it's a pretty obvious output that you can obviously guess that it says hello there and then we say a two. But this kind of example which is used quite a lot in books and almost every tutorial gives a false impression that puts two and having these means we are going to always get a print. That's not the case. Putting up or printing the value doesn't mean it's getting returned here. This return keyword has its own significance that it throws out some value. These functions are not returning anything. They have explicitly said it by using the void. They are printing it because you asked it to do so. But if I really don't want to do this, I can simply go ahead and say that I'm going to be using something int and I'm going to be saying something like this that here instead of puts, I'm going to just comment this. I'm going to say return to here. Now when I say return to, now this is an accurate version. I have explicitly mentioned that I'm going to be returning a two here, which is going to be of integer type and I'm returning it. Now when I say two and when I run this program, you notice that it says hello there, but no two there. And you might be asking, why is it so? Because you never asked it to print two. You just said that, hey, I'm going to be returning two and that's it. If you want to say that, hey, I want to print the value that is being returned by the function, you have to explicitly say it. You have to use it in the printf and then we're going to say that, hey, I'm going to be printing a, a integer with a slash in and then you can just call the method directly here, which is say2. Now, say2 returns us a value 2, so after some time it's going to be saying that, hey, my value is actually 2, which is replaced by 2 and that 2 finally gets into the placeholder value. So that's exactly what's happening behind the scene. If I run it this now, now we're going to see this too here. So that's a, that's a very different approach here. Now let me show you something a bit weird as well. And you might be thinking that, hey, how is this going on or how this is working? 
Okay, so this is a bit different example. So I'm gonna be working with a little different. So I'm gonna say, say three. So this time I'm saying void and this is gonna say, say three. Say three, there we go. And instead of just returning the two, what if I just say puts and something like this three. Now we are having this value three. Now this can actually be very decisive for you. So for example, if I just copy and paste this here, and instead of two, if I just say this is say three, if I run this program, this is gonna look exactly, and yes, that's a wrong syntax. So we're gonna say three like this, hopefully. Okay, are we missing out something here? Yes, it says that, hey, you should be Okay, void is not a function or to a pointer. So yes, of course, we cannot do something like this. Instead, we have to just say three. So let me just fix this. Okay, there we go. Now this is all good. There we go. So we're gonna run this one. Now you're gonna notice something bit weird and bit different. Notice here that this two and this three, although looking from here perspective, they look, hey, this is just two and this is just three, but they are not, they are not. This is an integer while this is a string. So on the integer, you can just go ahead and say that, hey, they, this says say two. And if I add another two to it, then I can run this one. And this is gonna say four because integers can add integers. But if I just come up here and say, say three, and then I try to add any number to it, probably three, this is gonna give me an error. And you're gonna notice directly my compiler is gonna throw me an error. There we go. It says invalid operand to binary expression. So void and int are not compatible. You cannot do this. So make sure you keep an eye that if anything is inside the string, it's actually a string. It's not a number, even though if the number is inside it. Now, some people might come up and say, hey, can we convert this void into int? Surely we'll talk about these conversions later on, but just to give you a fact, no, you cannot. If you try to put something like this, that hey, can I put a pair of parentheses here and come outside of it and say int? This is also not allowed. This is a wrong type casting that you are trying to do, which is not allowed. So make sure you keep an eye on these couple of things here. And I'm gonna be just making this again a valid code so that at least when you download this stuff, this actually works. So there we go. I have told you some of the precise things about the functions and how to use them. And just in doing some fun, we have defined three different methods, void, integers, and again, a void. We will talk about these functions later on in the series, but right now this is all good enough for us to understand some of the topics that are very important to understand, but only can be exampled out by using these methods. So I hope you have enjoyed this one and don't you worry, functions will take care in much more depth later on. This is just a sneak peek of the functions. I hope you have understood some basics about it. And that's all for this video. Let's catch up in next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video. Have you ever heard about linkers? I guess no, and it's totally okay to not to know about linkers before this video. Now, when I first started learning my C++ during my engineering, I also didn't know much about linkers. There was nothing much in depth about it. When we started to dig more into the depth of programming during my masters, then I actually learned what linker is and what to, what we should take care of while designing a language and more stuff. So linker is something which, is, which comes in between the process when you execute your code and your code compile and gives you an executable a binary there. If you work more on the Linux system, you might be already uh, in the interaction with the linker here. I'll keep the discussion brief and will give you two very amazing resources that you can have so that you can understand them. So here is the first one. Uh, both of them are actually Stack Overflow link because I believe Stack Overflow is one of the resource where you get more precise answers because there is no direct documentation of the C++. So here is how does a linker, uh, I'll, I'll copy paste all of these links into the exercise file attached to this video so that you can have it. So here's the simple code. You write a simple main.cpp or whatever the file name. And you said, I'll be including these IO stream or whatever the library is. And during the compile time, these libraries and headers actually get included and it generates a simple kind of object file here, main.o. 
And then your linker actually runs the standard runtime library and generates an executable. And this executable can be different for different system. It is not compulsory that it always generates an executable. And in order to understand more about what is the linker, I'll give you a little bit of the read uh, readable material here, which says what do linkers do. And this is probably one of the most precise answer I have ever seen on the online. And it's uh, pretty, pretty in depth and you can easily understand that. To, to give you just a brief gist of it, uh, it just is an intermediate file and you can read this one here, that when a program is compiled, the compiler converts the source into object bytecode. And from the object byte code, there are some uh, mnemonic instruction that only uh, computer architecture understand. And these are, are done by the compilers. I won't be going much into the mnemonics instructions and the architecture of a programming language because it took us six months to dive deep into this thing and to actually understand it during the semester of my master's. So I won't be going that much in depth, but this is a great uh, resource. So first and foremost, I'm gonna copy this and we'll give you along with the exercise file here at the very top. So I'm gonna paste this one here and we'll comment it out. And uh, I will also copy the another one as well so that you can go ahead and take a look up here and paste that and comment that as well. So these are the two links, you can take care of them. So this is a brief uh, kind of discussion, not very much in depth, but now you know about the linkers. Now let's move on to another objective and the main part of this video which we are going to talk about qualifiers. So in case you do remember, in one of the previous video, I showed you a brief hint about the qualifiers. For example, if I have an integer which I, which I call i for some reasons or maybe anything else and we assign a value of 5, that's totally allowed. And later on if I want to update the value, something like i++ or maybe i is going to be equal to 7 now, that this is totally allowed to me. But when I introduce another keyword here, which is const, it makes my integer as a constant and now the assignment or any other value in the i is not allowed. So what is this const? Uh, we discussed briefly about here that it says const qualified, means these are some kind of qualifiers and we're gonna be talking about these qualifiers here. So basically we got two majority types of qualifiers. There are a little bit more than that, but the two major qualifiers that we have are the modification qualifiers as well as the life duration qualifiers. As the name suggests, the modification qualifiers allows you to modify or not to modify the value that you are putting up inside any variable or any data structure. And the life duration qualifiers gets you more idea about for how much duration the variable should be available to me or the value inside that variable should be available to me. In the modification type, you're gonna see mostly three of them, the const, volatile, and mutable. Const we have already seen, it just fixed the value for the duration of the entire program execution. The volatile is something which you're gonna see quite a lot when somebody is writing multi-threaded programs in C++, very common to see there and pretty common there. If you are looking up on the GitHub about some multi-threaded processes in C++ or some server processes, this volatile is something gonna be there. Volatile is simple when you put a keyword volatile, then the same variable can be modified by the other thread in the process. And that's why it is being used to share some information from one thread to another thread. And mutable, we all know it makes things mutable, so pretty obvious there. So again, there are two things, mutable, immutable, changeable, non-changeable, so it makes things mutable. And for the life duration, you're gonna see three types of the things, the static, register, and the external, or extern. And the static is, I'm gonna give you a brief example of static to understand it more. And for register, if you want to give a suggestion, keyword here, suggestion to the compiler that store this information into a register, which is very fast to access, usually done in uh, some kind of hardware level-ish code. Let's just say you are writing some drivers for a humidity sensor, then you're gonna be suggesting the compiler that please store this information in register. It's just a suggestion you can give compiler. Some, sometimes compiler actually ignores your suggestion and don't store that. So it's one of the things you should take care of that. And extern is uh, maybe you want to store something into external libraries that can be done or can be injected in the code at the time of linking or linker, then it's used external. I know this is too much of information, but it's okay, just hear me out. 
And also you're gonna notice that there used to be one more keyword here, which is auto. It is not being used now. And probably if you're coding from last five to eight years, you probably haven't seen that yet. Before like uh, eight years or something, it was pretty common in almost every single code. But now we realized in the C++ community that auto is actually a default keyword for the lifespan, so we don't use it almost anywhere. So just keep that in mind. Now coming on to the point, I avoided a topic a little bit, which is static. So let me give you a brief example to understand what is static. And we're gonna be designing a mini game-ish to understand the static, because that's where it is being used most. It is used to track the life cycle of an entire variable or anything. So if you want to keep a track that this is a very constant value and my entire program is gonna be using it probably anywhere, then this is used like this. So let me give you a brief example of that. Let's go up here and I hope you got this one. So we're gonna remove this here. Now let's design a simple game. While designing the game, you realize that I'm gonna give a user a life up or also known as one up. If you have played Mario a little bit, it's common there. So we have designed it like that. And here we say that the initial life of the Mario player is gonna be three, which I believe is accurate. And later on you realize that I'm gonna be, once a user do certain task, then we are gonna return it. So we're gonna simply say life is gonna be life equals to life plus one. I will make a shortcut of this later on and we'll show you some of the differences there. But I've kept that discussion for a little bit later in this video only, but uh, we are gonna talk about that. So as you know, we are gonna get a three as a life, one adding to it, so it should give us four here. So here we're gonna say that I do have a life variable as soon as the main thread starts, and we're gonna initialize the value by three, same value there, and we're gonna say C out, and then we are gonna make a simple uh, information to the user, something like uh, your starting game life is, then obviously we are gonna be adding a uh, variable here. So there we go. We're going to say live. There we go. And L, there we go. No big deal. We have seen this kind of code. Nothing very fancy here. Then later on, user do something very specific and the life variable needs to get updated. It's going to be updated based on whatever the value is being returned by the life up. So pretty simple. No big deal. And after that, you simply go ahead and say, hey, printf or see out whatever you want to use. No big deal. We're going to say your game life or your updated game life updated game life is and then you use obviously a person d a slash n and you just display the life value here which is updated life value so this is pretty common and maybe you want to design another method which says life decrease and that decreases your life and probably you assign a user to have this one up at multiple levels in your game so pretty common scenario Let's go ahead and uh, save this and run this. And when I run this, uh, notice here your uh, starting game life is three. And then I said, uh, get an update here, it says four. And again, it got me an update. So this piece of code seems to be not working. Not true, actually. None of them is actually working nicely. What is happening here is also known as scope of a variable. The scope of a variable is definitely a very detailed discussion topic, but whenever you declare any variable here, it is accessible only to its block of code. So if you're defining any variable here, it's gonna be valid only in this block of code. So every single time you call up this method, this life variable is again getting initialized by three, and we are getting a value return here as uh, four. So every single time it's behaving like you asked it so, but this was not originally the intention of the game. And the intention of the game is to store this life or anything at the very top and then keep the state of this variable to be updated in all the processes because it's just not about main. There are gonna be many more method which will be interacting with this same method here. So in such cases, no matter where you are defining your variable, you need to add a static keyword to that. Static means that no matter where I'm defining it, it's now in a global state. So wherever you're gonna say life uh, or wherever, whatever method or thread you are using it, it's gonna be always be the same life that we are all talking about here. When I run this one again, after adding the static keyword, now you can see the life was three first, then four and then five. So I hope this gameish scenario gives you a much more better idea of how and where these things can be implemented. 
again one more thing i shouldn't be talking about that here but just on a side tangent line here this static keyword actually works almost similarly in the classes as well so just you add any any uh, material anything which you add static here it's going to be behaving same as the classes but we are going to discuss that later on now coming on to the point you saw that here we see three four five now you're going to see sometimes that a prefix and postfix operator also comes into play so people are going to say plus plus something like this but there is also another syntax here which says a plus plus life so what is the difference between them now this is a great point to discuss that and even understand it so when the when i'm going to run this one here notice here that for the first time the life was three so that's great but when i run this method here my life is still three and then the next time when i go ahead and do it then my life is actually four so this is also known as postfix operation means first use the variable and then do all the updates here and similar to this we actually have a prefix operator that means increment it first and then use this variable so when i run this one now this is going to execute the way we we like it to behave so there we go three four five so again depends on how you want your program to behave they are being used now surely some people will come and say which one is more efficient the plus plus life or the life plus plus in theory the plus plus life is actually much more efficient uh, because actually technically if you are going to see what does this life plus plus and this all means uh, this actually means that you are saying a life is going to be equals to life plus one so this entire thing actually returns you a temporary object and the life is actually evaluated twice here now in the smaller integer it's not going to bother you even like any tiny fraction but if you are dealing with the larger values and larger data structure then these small things actually can cost you a lot of things especially in the system drivers and there this is not actually a good practice for there there if you use this one then it doesn't really return you a temporary object and saves you a tiny teeny bit and when you compare prefix and postfix you're going to realize uh, by a lot of uh, things that this plus plus life is actually even more efficient than life plus plus again i'm not saying one is good one is bad they both have their own way of usage and working so make sure you keep an idea on that i know this video included a lot of things that you never thought about it and never got much into depth of it but i'll try to keep them very simple and these examples i hope they are and they are helping you to understand where the scenarios are actually being implemented so that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Adesh here back again with another video and in this video we're going to talk about operations. In the last video we talked about prefix and the postfix operation because that was the best place to understand it. Now in this video we're going to talk about more on operations like arithmetic operations and others as well. Now surely one can create a whole section on the operations and probably five, six or 10 videos on it. And for all those people who are looking for how many videos are in the course or how much the time duration of the course is, for that it's gonna be great advantageous for me. But to be honest, I really don't want to do that until I'm, unless I'm very much forced on that. But in this video, we're gonna just discuss that how these operations actually work on. Pretty simple to understand. We don't need to waste an entire section on that. Let's go ahead and give it a try. So let's just say you are creating a game and the game is having initial life of three. And uh, after that, this game is gonna have some of the initial points as well. So we're gonna have some of the points. Uh, let's just say you are having just four points as of now. Now after that, if you want to calculate a score, we know that we have a lot of options of calculating the score. Probably for example, if you just want to store the points in it, you can. And we have already seen that this equal operator, the single equal is responsible for putting the right hand side value inside the score. So we are referencing two times here. That means point is already holding four. So score will obviously have a four. Now, not only like that, we can have an addition operations, which is pretty obvious to you by now. We can have this one and can say that uh, points and lives are gonna be added and then will be scored uh, 
then will be added into this score. Similarly, we can have plus, we can have subtraction by minus, we can have multiplication, we can have a division as well, we have a modulus as well, which is given too much emphasis, but I believe most of you might be familiar with that in case you don't know. Modulus is an operator which gives you the remainder. So if five is divided by two, the remainder is one. So this modulus is automatically gonna give you one and that's it, no big deal here. Now these are the pretty basic common operation that you are gonna see all along, but there are a couple of others as well which are a little bit more interesting than this. So let's just say you want to score points into that, but for some reason, I don't know what, you want to store a negative four into that, you can just say negative four, and you're gonna notice that some people call this as unary operator as well, but I think this is pretty obvious that whatever the value is, you are converting a negative of it by, in theory, technically, you are multiplying that value by negative, but we don't write it that way. We just say negative points and it just gives you the negative point. In this case, the score is gonna be holding up negative four. There's similarly plus as well, but this doesn't make sense, so nobody talks about that. These are your unary operations and basic operation. Now also, what you're gonna notice that if you want to add something to the score or existing value of the score, or let's just say that the score that you have created is having an initial value of uh, two, and what you want to say after that is score is gonna be equal to score plus points, for some reason, you want to call that. Now, one important thing that you always should keep in mind is whatever this operation is gonna perform, it's gonna hold the result for some duration into a temporary place, and then after that, it just uh, stores here. Now, in the case of integers or even float, it doesn't really consume much of the memory, but if you're talking about system level things, you'll be storing things in registers, which is very small, so in that case, make sure you're aware of it. What you're gonna notice that if you are evaluating the same thing again and again, it might eventually, not here, eventually consume a lot of resources. So a lot of programmers like to write a shorthand notation, which is plus equals. The meaning is exactly same, score equals to score plus points. Here, score plus equals points. Now, it is not just a shortcut, it's also an optimization of the code. It's not here because it's just an integer but let's just say if I've created a class or structure which is pretty lengthy and doing a whole lot of stuff, then it is available. And you guessed it right that yes, just like we have plus equals, we have this minus equal as well, we have multiply equal as well, we have divide equal as well, and we have modulus equal as well. Meaning is exactly same, we don't want to evaluate score again, that's why we are saying instead of score plus equal, we are saying score Instead of score equals score plus points, we are saying score plus equal points. So you get the point. So these are pretty obvious and very easy to understand and no big deal. We don't really want to create a separate video just for these additions and these special ones, which are these guys. Now one operator which we have seen in the past as well, but we haven't talked much about it. Let's just say you want to have an if-else condition. You want to do certain things on life. Maybe life is uh, equals to zero. So you might have noticed that we go ahead and say, uh, life is equals to zero. Two equal sign are used for comparison. Now there is another very similar to this, but just opposite of that is not equals to zero. This exclamation says not, and it's gonna keep on running till life is not equal to zero. Very common practice to work with the negative ways and negative aspects in the conditional because sometimes this approach is much more faster and easier to work on with, so these are there. And in the if and else, you, we also have seen a little bit of this like uh, greater than, less than, a whole bunch of others as well. There are some of the equality checks as well. So let's just see a looping through the array. So far we have been saying that uh, if the array of life is greater than five or something, we can also put an equal sign here which checks not only here in this case, life is less than five, but also life is less than or equal to five. We'll talk about these or later on in a separate example a better example than this one. But here we can see that just like we can compare equals, we have these less than, we have these greater than, we have got these less than, e greater than, equal to, or less than, equal to. So these are pretty basic one, pretty obvious one. Make sure you keep an eye on these equals as well as not equals. Told you, it's not really a big deal. It's a pretty obvious and simple statement and we're gonna just simply puts here, puts, and we're gonna say into the if 
block so that at least code is accurate and is doing something. So this is the most basic and obvious thing that we have seen so far and there is nothing much to do and talk much about these basic operations. Now there are a special category of operations known as AND and OR and we're gonna understand that by a dedicated example. Let's move on to the next video and talk about it. I am pretty sure that you might have studied during your school time that there are operations like AND and OR. If not, not, not to worry too much, I'll explain them. So there are a couple of logical operations that are used and pretty much overused for good reasons in almost all programming language. They are AND, OR, and sometimes NOT as well. NOT we have seen that we can put an exclamation sign and it just flips the property. True becomes false and false becomes true. But there is a little bit more in the AND and OR. So for the end, just assume how we are talking in day-to-day -day life and that's how it all works. If somebody says, uh, I would like to have a glass of water and coffee, you just serve him water and coffee. And if somebody says, would you like to have coffee or tea, you don't give them both. You are asking for a choice whether you would like to have a coffee or tea. And similar things happen in programming as well. So for example, if I just come up here and we'll be designing two specific examples for that. So let's just say there is my first uh, Boolean uh, op value here, just like int we have bool. Remember bool can store only two types of values, true and false, literally true and false, and that's it. So the value first is gonna be is signed, is signed in, and I'm gonna say that the value that's gonna be stored as a true. And another similar value is gonna be is admin, and that's gonna be true as well. So just assume that you are defining a simple website, which is having an admin access, and you are checking for conditions here. And in that, you are just simply putting up a message, or you are somehow giving the access of admin privileges here. So I'm gonna say, uh, welcome admin, welcome admin. So how you'd like to evaluate that somebody is admin or not? Obviously, he should first sign in into the website and then there should be a role of admin for him. Now, how can we check both of them in the same condition? We simply go ahead and say that uh, whatever the value of is signed in is and he should be admin as well. So I'm going to put two ampersand sign and I'm going to say he should be is admin as well. Now, if both of them are going to be true, then only I want to allow him to get into the admin area. Else, we are going to put up another block here, which is going to say just put uh, no admin access, something like that. And of course, with a semicolon, save that. And if I run this program here, now notice it says welcome admin because a user was signed in and was admin too. But if one of them become false here in this case, it makes 100% sense that I should not give him the access to admin. And if one of them, whether this is admin, which becomes false, or if it is not logged in, then we should not give him the access of this admin. So that's how these logical operations of AND are being used. And another case can be there that later on you designed a simple, instead of this is signed in, you have designed something more specific, like is FB user, and you have also gained something like bool, which is gonna be is Google user. So later on, you have implied certain conditions here that your admin can actually sign in by clicking on Facebook icon or the Google icon. So in this case, we don't have this is signed in. So instead of writing these multiple conditions, which is is FB users and it then is sign in. So we can, we can go a whole lot in depth here. I'm gonna comment this out. We'll come back on this example a little bit later. First and foremost, I want to check out that simple example for a regular user, not admin. I'll come back here. So let's go ahead and write an if block. And I'm gonna simply say puts, and we're gonna say welcome user. So for the user, we don't have nothing much to do about admin. We are only worried about he should be logged in. And logged in can be allowed through Google or through Facebook as well. Any one is true, we are okay. We can allow the user to log in. So I can come here and I can say is FB user. And we use two or these pipes just above your enter key. And I can say is Google user. 
So whether he's logged in from Google or Facebook, I don't care, he should be just logged in. So either this is true, or if this is true, I can allow the user to log in. And if I just run this application, surely this is gonna get a welcome user message. Okay, this is all great, this is all good. But here, if I come back onto this situation again, the admin, the things are a little bit tricky here. Now we don't have this is signed in, so we're gonna remove that. Now we are asking that user should be signed in, but sign in can happen from either the Facebook or Google. So this comes up into the one more little bit intermediate level of permissions, and we are using these ampersands. So we can combine these and and or as well. Let me show you. It's much more easier than explaining. So I can put up one more pair of parentheses here, and here I can check that he should be signed in, so he can sign in from Google user, or he can be signed in from FB user as well. So this whole is gonna be evaluated as either true and false, and whatever the result comes up is gonna be further will be evaluated against admin, but this time with an and operation. So I hope you are getting that how we are now able to change all these things with these and and or. And this is a real world example. This is how exactly people check in their website how the admin privileges should be given up, how the user privileges should be given up. So I hope you are able to understand that how these are, things are done. Again, a small hint here, that sometimes you're gonna see that people miss these uh, parentheses here as well, which is not really a good idea. It's never a good idea to make a user confused while reading your code. A lot of time you're gonna see that people say that, hey, don't put parentheses while evaluating your plus, minus, multiplication, addition in just one line. Always a bad idea. Put parentheses so that things become much more clear to read and understand, and that's always a good code. Here, just a simple parenthesis, we can see that this is gonna be evaluated first, so we're gonna get either a true and false on that, and then the result, which is gonna be, let's just say we get a false here, so false, and then this false is gonna be evaluated with the is admin, which is true. So he's not logged in, and he is admin, so what we're gonna get? No admin access. So there we go, told you, it's super easy to understand. So there we go, keep this example handy and I hope you will be able to understand these AND and OR operator pretty nicely. Another thing that might come up uh, sometime is, very rare, I'll undo that as well, that whatever you are doing and whatever the value is being evaluated, we just wrap it sometimes with a parenthesis and then after that we put an exclamation sign to reverse whatever the logic here. In this example it doesn't really make sense, we would never like to do it here, but you're gonna notice that sometimes some special cases are there where we put these exclamation sign, so we wrap the entire thing and then put an exclamation sign. So there we go, this is your basic brief idea. I'm pretty sure you will never forget about these and and or now onwards, and let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Atesh here, and in this video, we're gonna talk a little bit on a different subject, which is bitwise operation. Logical operation and bitwise operations are totally different. They take advantage and use almost similar things which are ampersand sign and the pipe character for R, but it's the subtleties that actually makes you different in a C++ world. Also, these special things are used quite a lot in coding interviews as well in the big companies, so you might want to pay a bit attention here. First and foremost, we're gonna see a very simple example of it. We're gonna run that and then we're gonna see what's actually happening. So for example, I would like to bring up simply an unsigned int or a signed int, however you like. Let's go for the unsigned int because that's usually the case that we're gonna see. So an unsigned int, and uh, I rarely use the variables x and y, but in this case I would like to go for that. So I'm gonna go for six, and we are gonna go again an unsigned int, unsigned int for y, and then we are gonna get uh, seven here, or maybe nine, whatever you like. And then again, we are gonna have an unsigned teacher Z, which is going to have uh, X, and then we're gonna use single ampersand and the Y. The single ampersand, single or are completely different for the, from the two ampersand, which is and and or. These actually works on in the space of bits only. So let me first and foremost show you what's gonna be there. So we're gonna simply do a printf or maybe a C out, and we're gonna simply say value of z is, go like that, and we're gonna simply place a z here, and definitely an end line here. Let's go ahead and run this and see what this is gonna give us. 
this gives us zero interesting now what if i change this one to something more uh, like probably seven then if i just run this and we're going to notice that we are getting six so what is exactly happening here in order to understand that we need to understand that how these and and or and a bit shift and all these operations actually work their mathematics is a little different from what we are commonly used to, which is a decimal based system. So we're going to take advantage of two different websites. Hundreds of such websites are available. You can do it even using your pen and paper. I just don't want it to do it for this one. So I'll take advantage of some of these websites. So first and foremost, how do we convert a decimal number into the binary? I'm using a convert binary dot com slash binary dash to dash binary decimal dash to binary. So feel free to use any of the resources, it's not really a big deal. So if you enter any, any decimal number here, for example, seven and click on convert to binary, it converts that into uh, its binary format. So similarly, you can convert each of them. Now, these operations that we are doing here with the single ampersand sign, we can do that here as well. So we are using end for uh, bitwise end. There is an or as well. There is an XOR or exclusive or as well. And apart from this, you're going to see that sometimes you are going to see this guy as well, which is almost equivalent to the exclamation that we saw. So it's a not operator, but this is how it is used. And you're also going to notice that sometimes uh, there's two guys here, which says one. This means a left shift of one. And this means a right shift of one. I know this is too much. So we have talked about and or XOR a left shift and a right shift, and of course, a not as well. Now let's understand how they work. So in this website, which is easyonlineconverter.com, you can actually perform these operations directly in the decimal too, which will help you to calculate the result. So here we did a calculation on six and seven. So you can go on this website and can write a six and the seven as well, and can calculate what's going to be the value of end, what's going to be the value of or and stuff like that and i need to go for decimal yep i'm saying seven let's go ahead and calculate we see one here for this guy we see six for xor we see seven so how these are actually being done let me walk you through a little bit on that first and foremost we're going to switch to binary here and then we're going to convert two numbers six and seven so six is already being available so i'm going to just copy this well paste here six there we go you are now binary and i'm gonna go ahead and calculate it for seven and this is my seven pretty easy i think many of you remember that as well and now we can calculate and for it so here actually you understand what's actually happening so as i told you and and or are very specific operation for the and we need both the cases needs to be true so if the question is one and one then only we are going to get the result as one because one and zero are treated as true and false in the or if any bit is one then we're going to get the result one whether one and zero we're going to get one or zero and one we're going to get one so similarly to this here we can see if we calculate the and operation even if the one bit is off then we are going to just turn off the bit or also known as zero if both the bits are turned on or our value one then we are getting one as the result or is different so we're going to calculate that and we see if any one of the bit is on then we can just get an or and similarly we have an xor which is exclusive or so i hope you can calculate all of these things like that and similarly not is also going to be same then we have a left, left shift as well. The left shift actually works on just one number. That's why this another number is like that. And if I calculate this, you might have noticed that we are shifting uh, the one, the numbers uh, one to the left. And that's why we are seeing only one one here. The numbers are being shifted there. And on the right shift, if I go ahead and calculate that, now obviously it is being shifted on to the right. And these are very important operations from the competitive exam, competitive programming, as well as for the interview perspective. I won't be going much into the depth. Otherwise, we will just create a tangent and we'll be just sucked into this one. Just wanted to introduce the topic for reading more. I highly recommend to reference some of the books because they are much better in explaining these theories. But I think if you have uh, learned enough here in the video, you can do a little bit of the digging on your own and can work on it. 
some of the problems are actually much more easier to solve using these bit operation. So make sure you just keep that in mind and move forward with that. So I'll just rest this topic here just for the sake of completion. I wanted to touch it. We have done it and let's move on to the next video. If you are not much worried about the memory leaks, then I don't know even if you are writing actual CPP code or even not. So writing just a code for printing patterns and just adding two numbers is okay. But one of the thing which you should be definitely worried and in fact read a couple of books. Yes, there are a whole set of books available on just the subject of memory leaks. It's a very common issue in C++ and in fact for me or any course it would be really tough to create enough of scenarios where we can walk you through with the memory leaks but eventually with experience working with the senior developers and reading tons of books you're going to realize that memory leak is a serious issue in the C++ and you need to write your code with a lot of caution because compilers and even sometimes even after running the code you don't realize that there was a memory leak until unless that memory leak actually happens. So just wanted to put a caution in your head that yes, it happens. And I would like to discuss a couple of keywords which can protect you or can might not protect you from these memory leaks. So let's go ahead and take a simple example. So let's just say we have a very simple example and we are going to go ahead and declare a simple uh, integer pointer. So we're going to say this is my integer pointer. I'm going to say my P for my pointer and there we go. Now I have initialized this pointer. Uh, I have declared this pointer, but I haven't initialized it yet. So I would like to initialize it with a space. So this pointer is going to be responsible for referencing or to pointing an array of integers. No big deal. We have seen this in the past as well. So my pointer is going to be going like this. And uh, you know, I'm going to be just declaring an integer array with 100 values. Okay, we have seen this so far. But now what additionally you can do is you can reserve some kind of memory with that. In order to do so, in order to declare a memory for it, we have to use a keyword which is new. Once you use this keyword new, then that means I have initialized a pointer which is referencing to an array and that array is going to hold 100 values in it. So pretty big, no big deal. And we have gone through and we have done it. Now we're going to see out this and we're going to simply say memory space memory space allocated and there we go nice and easy no big deal the moment you write this code and even if you try to run this code this is going to work fine there is going to be no problem here as here uh, of course apart from this slash n your program doesn't crash even if you change it to like thousand or ten thousand it's still not going to be crashing because these days systems are pretty much amazing but there are going to be certain cases where this is actually a potential memory leak and it will definitely easily leak your memory here. So in such cases, what is being uh, recommended that if you're using the keyword new, 100% you should use a keyword delete to. New simply means you are forcefully allocating some memory and it's your job to free up that memory so that your resources are free when they are needed. So this is pretty simple. We're going to simply say delete and then you simply reference my P here and this is going to be fine. But there is a, a nice catch here that if you are declaring a simple pointer which is storing a simple one value, you are allocating it, then you can just go ahead and do it. But if it is for an array, you are allocating a continuous space of memory, then you have to delete this entire space here by using this syntax here. So make sure you take care of that while writing it. Of course, this is not going to make any difference in the code because our system is pretty advanced, high memories and high performance, high CPUs, GPUs. It's not going to be bothered much about these 10,000 spaces here. But make sure you're keeping an eye. So is this a correct code? No, this is not. This is still not a recommended way of writing a C++ code. Of course, not to mention this is not a good code. What I did is uh, a simple allocation of memory here. But these allocations sometimes may fail and may crash your application. So one of the way or one of the bad way which I did in my initial days of my C++ code that I was writing is there is another keyword that you can mention just after the new and you can simply go ahead and say no throw here. Now this no throw will not throw any exceptions. So this is like a hundred percent you are making sure that your program should crash. In this case it doesn't crash but when it actually gets to the point where it is about to crash it's going to even 
get a no throw. So it's not gonna throw any try catch block or anything. It's gonna just crash. So please make sure you don't do that. If you're working at a fang level, any contract position or something like that, you're gonna be yell by your senior. So don't do that. It's it's not really great. I learned it th through the hard way. So that's why I'm sharing it. There is no shame in sharing the experience of writing or uh, learning how the good code actually comes in. So what you're gonna see in this case is we are going to cut this entire thing and we're gonna use rather a try catch block. So in the try catch block, we first go ahead and try to allocate these spaces. And then it's usually a good idea to specifically catch that error, which can be found out pretty easily. This is almost like a malloc, calloc, you might have seen the C, but I'll not go in that much of depth. So we're gonna simply put up three dots here and then we're gonna simply get a C out, which is gonna say uh, failed in uh, allocating memory there we go of course with a slash in so this is actually a far more of a better code if i put a semicolon this is far more a better code compared to what we get up here because we are now initializing these things into a try block so potential fail are going to be handled into the catch block as well as if we are able to successfully allocate the memory we are deleting the memory not only just that pointer but entire space is being deleted here now so this is all good about having the memory leaks in the C++, but don't consider this as a full guide. As I mentioned, there are dedicated books to have this. Now, I would like to bring your attention to one more topic which we have discussed in the past as well, which was these left shift and right shift. So we have seen that if you want to have a variable, uh, probably a simple X or C, whatever that is, and we're gonna have a five value inside it, we want to do a shift in Y. So we can actually go ahead and simply say, hey, just shift this uh, or not this X is going to be shifted by one or two or three, just like that. Now, here comes a point which I would like to discuss a little bit that this is a perfect code. This is going to work fine. But you're going to notice a little bit of the debate in the community of C++ that why I'm using puts at a lot of places in printf and not the C out. C out is definitely a class based thing and it's being used quite a lot. It's totally C++ ish thing. But what a lot of people don't like is this shift operator. This is definitely a shift operator, but this operator is actually being used here as well. And that's why it's not really recommended that you should overwrite these operations too much, which are pretty common. And imagine instead of this uh, here, it would be something like this. Definitely, it would be a confusing code. So these practices should be avoided. And that's why you see that after this guy, none of the operator was overwritten in the C++ after uh, the revisions in 2000 of uh, C++ 14, in the 17, in the 20. We never saw these operator overridden things because there was a lot of heat in the community about the usage of these two arrows. They were meant to be left shift. They should have been uh, kept for the left shift and the right shift there. But somehow in the initial version, they were overwritten and now it's too much of work and too much of learning curve if we shift that, that's why you see them being used less in the community and in, in the big codes, they still prefer printf statements like that. So just wanted to share this brief uh, thing for you because it's, it's good to know things in the world of programming and bit of history as well and what's happening in the community as well. So I hope you have enjoyed this memory leak video. Let's move on to the next video and talk more on stuff on C++. Hey there everyone, Hitoy here back again with another video and welcome to this new section. In this section, again, we're gonna be understanding a bit more about some different type of data structures. Uh, by the data structure, I mean, just like variables, we have other places in which we can hold these data values and data information, and we'll be learning more about them. And definitely we'll have in between the discussion about things to take care in C++ and more good practices as well. Let's start with the basic one, which is struct or also known as structures. Now structures are being modified a lot in the CPP and in the recent version, a lot more capabilities are being introduced as compared to what you see regularly. Now in the structs, you can even define a bit of a syntax of methods as well, but we are gonna talk about that in later on videos. Right now, I just want to briefly introduce you to things so that we get a brief, nice warm up about the structures. Now structures are almost everywhere where classes are not being used. So definitely we have classes to work on with the data, 
But right now, let's keep the thing simple. You're gonna see a lot of structures in the CPP code. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Just like we have int, we do have a struct as well, which starts with a keyword, struct, another one. And I told you, you don't need to remember all these keywords. Eventually, when you learn about the language, you automatically get friendly with them. Now, you won't be naming any of your variable as new. You won't be naming them as delete because you know they are keywords. You also won't be naming anything as static because you know there's a keyword there. So as I told you, nobody remembers them. Eventually, it comes to that. And sometimes code editor actually helps as well. So let's just say you're designing a website, probably like learn code online, and you have a user which you want to architecture for this uh, website. Now, once you have decided that we, there will be a user, make sure that you define a user, put a semicolon after the structure. It's usually forgotten uh, by a lot of people, including me, so make sure you keep an eye on that. Now, in the user, or uh, this is almost like a blueprint that you are designing. And this is moreover about, this is gonna be the thing, but you don't put actual information here. For example, if I just go ahead and say const and integer is gonna have constant type integer and the user is gonna have a UID for a unique ID. I also want to store the user's name and email. So I'm gonna simply say uh, const char and that's gonna be the name. And I'll also design const char and we'll have email as well and i'll also design uh, one more thing here which is how many courses are being assigned to this user so i'm going to say int and there's going to be course underscore count so there we go we have got a few blueprints being designed now these are just the blueprint it doesn't consist of any value using these blueprint you can create as many users as you would like and they will be totally kind of a separate places in that places. So this, for example, I do have a couple of things here. So this is going to be a user number one, and this is going to be a user number two, totally different, but they came out from the same blueprint. And that's why they look almost very identical. So this is a whole idea about how things are happening. Let's go ahead and create just one user, another one you'll be creating uh, just for some aspect. So how do we take advantage of this user structure that we have created? We simply first call it as user. Then we can name the user anything so that we can reference it again and again. My first user is gonna be Mickey. And then we're gonna use again the shorthand notation which is recently being introduced. Uh, not recently, but it's being like five or eight years, probably, probably eight years that we have introduced this curly braces syntax and we can define all of it. In the previous days, once you define this user like Mickey, you have to go ahead and say uh, Mickey dot uh, UID and then assign a unique ID to it, something like that. And uh, something like one, two, three, just like that. But now this is much more easier to deal up with that because you can just use these curly braces and define all the syntax right here. So this is going to be my user, which is going to have a user ID of 001. The name of the user is gonna be Mickey and it's gonna have an email as well. The email is gonna be mickey at the rate cartoon.com. There we go. And it's gonna have a course count as well. Let's say for the starting, he has purchased two courses on our website. So that's how we deal up with that. Now, let's go ahead and try to print out some of the information from the mickey, so see out. And we're gonna say, I have a mickey user and I want to find out what's its email. So I use a dot. And by putting up a dot, I can access all the properties of the Mickey. For example, in this case, email, and this is gonna give me an email. And I'm gonna simply go ahead and just end the line here. There we go. Now I'm gonna simply go ahead and copy this one here. We'll create another user here. This time, this is not gonna be Mickey, but uh, Donald. And this is gonna be a user number two. His name is obviously Donald. And this one is gonna be Donald at the rate cartoon.com. He's having probably three courses here. So you're going to notice, although they are coming up from the same user structure, but they don't interfere with each other. They are totally different, totally separate. Whatever the value you try to put it up here, it's going to be unique to itself. If you try to get an email of uh, donald.email, you'll be given served with the information which is related to the Donald here. So we're gonna be working with Donald just for fun sake and we'll be giving and talking more onto this information. If you want to overwrite any of the information, you certainly are allowed for that. So we're gonna have this Donald and you want to access, let's just say change 
course count of Donald. So you can go ahead and say that now Donald has access to not three, but actually four courses. And uh, in this case, uh, I can actually show you and print out this one here. So let me first print out and then we're going to talk about something which you haven't actually seen much attention there. So Donald dot course count, save that, run that, no big deal, Donald has got four courses. But what you didn't actually notice here that what I can do more or further is my Donald can also change email here, which is not really a good idea, but in this case, he's allowed to change email. So we're gonna say Donald new email is D Donald, D Donald D at the rate tune, you not even, tune.com. Now this is a bad practice. I would never like to have change users email in any of my application because you have authenticated the user based on email. But here I can actually do it if I put a semicolon here. And I can see that the email is now ddonald.tune.com. This brings us to the question that, hey, here the constant, the user ID is not allowed to change. Even if you try to do that, if I go ahead and say, hey, Donald is gonna have a new user ID and the new user ID is gonna be 221. If I just wait for a couple of seconds, there we go. We see that this is a const qualified type and you are not allowed to change it. This brings us to the question that, hey, how come you are not able to change this UID, but you are able to change this name and of course email as well. Both are being specified with this const. Now here comes a very important thing that you need to understand that here I'm making this integer as a constant, but here I'm not fixing up the name or email. I'm actually fixing up this pointer here. So pay a little bit attention here that this constant is for the pointer and not for its value. I'm saying that, hey constant, you cannot refer to anything else. You need to point exactly at this point, but what the value you are containing, I'm not really much worried about it. I'm not bothered about it. So make sure this is, you need to understand. And that's exactly why I have created a couple of constants here and the course count as just directly integer. Remember, pointer is constant, not the value inside it here. So I hope you got the point here. So of course, this UID is not allowed to be changed. So I'm going to make a comment here. So there we go. Nice and easy. You've understood a whole lot of things here. Now coming back here, uh, what you're going to notice that sometimes this Donald is actually a little bit too much to write that some people actually create a references for it. So again, the reference is going to be of type user, just like if you want a pointer or that can point to integer, you create integer pointer. This time we are creating a user pointer. Again, rest of the thing is same. So I'm going to call this one as simply D for Donald. And that's going to hold a reference to this Donald. So reference means ampersand, and then we're going to simply say Donald, just like that. Now notice here that just in case you are having a hard time in imagining this, just assume that this is actually an integer. So just like we hold an integer reference, an integer variable, this time Donald is a reference of type user, so it needs to be user. And notice my compiler is complaining for that. So we're gonna hit a command Z and there we go, it's all happy. Now, if you have used a pointer here, then the syntax is gonna be a little bit different than what we, what we are having here. For example, if I just go for the D dot, it doesn't suggest me anything. And if, even if I say D dot uh, email, I'm not allowed to change anything like this because it says, I don't know what you are looking up for with D dot email. And if you try to change this some like this, it's gonna say D at the rate D dot com. And if I just go ahead and say, and notice if I, here also it just complains that, I don't know what you're using, what you're pointing, what do you mean by this dot? This dot can be used in the struct, but this is a pointer reference to it. How can I do that? So in case you want to have an access of that, there is a different syntax and structure for it. So all you have to do is first get your reference pointer. And then what you can do is you can use this dash and then this greater than sign, which is arrow. Now you can access to anything. For example, for the Donald, I want to change the course count this time. And it's going to be maybe he is too much studious these days and he wants a 12 course access. So there we go. Now we were able to change that. Now, since notice here that Donald and D are exactly the same thing. We have discussed this in the past as well. Reference means this is exact object that we are talking about. This is exact same thing. D and Donald are one or the other. Internally, we are referencing to its memory. So they are exactly same. So whatever the change that I've done here are gonna be reflected in 
uh, exactly at same place. So I think there should be no problem in assuming that. So if I just try to get a course count, I've updated the course count. If I just get the Donald course count, it's going to be 12 at every single place. So no big deal. Now, of course, this is a great discussion over the structure that we have done, but we could have extended this discussion a little bit more because in the recent edition or the edition that you might also be running of C++ has a little bit more to the structure than just defining these data types as well. We can add more functionalities to it as well. In fact, a lot of code that you're going to see is having that too. But I think we are going to keep that discussion for a later on videos. So it's too much for just one video. Let's keep video short and keep on smiling, keep on enjoying the code. We're going to catch up in next video. Hey there, everyone. Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, we're going to be talking on to a, some lightweight topic, which is enums. Not that much lightweight, but compared to what other things we are discussing, it's really a lightweight. Enums can be a great alternative for preprocessor constants. And on the very first place, what is preprocessor constant? Don't worry, it's not a big topic. We can finish that up in just one line, exactly one line. And we're going to be talking more on to enums in this video. A quick side note, if you are learning more from the Microsoft documentation, which I'm pretty sure if you have tried to learn more on to the C++, you might have stumbled upon the Microsoft official documentation from C++ for C++ because they keep Visual Studio Code as a product. So they like to post some updates as well as a great documentation. Now, just a quick side note, if you're learning enums from those documentation, it's going to be a little hard because the example that they use, at least as the time of this recording, is of deck of cards, which is pretty a little bit uh, not so friendly for the beginners. If you have been coding for five, six years, eight years, then it's going to look absolutely breeze. Otherwise, for beginners, it's not really that much of a simple example. What we're going to be here using is going to be a simpler form of that exact code, but much more simpler than what they are mentioning on their blog post. So let's go ahead and talk about these enums. It's a really simple and easy topic. First and foremost, I talked a little bit about the preprocessor constant. So in the C++, you're going to see the syntax like this, where it says hash define, and then let's just say bold. And then you're having a bold or maybe any other value, you want to put up a value of three, you want to put up a value of zero and four, whatever that is, you can just define it. These are preprocessors. So this is exactly the preprocessor. And this bold then later on can be used as a constant wherever you like. In most example, you're going to see that hash defined pi is there. And then we can have a 3.14 and all those values for the pi. So most example actually use that. Now, instead of these preprocessor constants, you can do is something different, which is design your own enums. So let's just say we're designing some features for Microsoft Office. So I'm going to simply have a keyword enum. And then I'm going to say Microsoft Office is going to have a few features. And I'll talk more about that in a second, let's say. So this is the enum that how we define it. Now inside this, you can define as many constants as you would like. For example, we'll have a bold feature, we'll define a simple and again, come on, there we go. We'll have italics and we will have maybe underline and we will have crossed as well. So however feature you would like to have, you can actually go ahead and define that. There we go. So this is my Microsoft Office feature list that I'm having. And that's all I have to do to define the constant. Important thing is, in the bold, we were having the value of 9, 8, or whatever the value is. What's going to be the value inside this bold in italics? And that's where the magic of enum actually kicks in. So for example, if I define my attributes, 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 and we actually mark it to something like uh, bold first and foremost, and try to find out that what's actually the value inside it. So I'm going to simply say C out, we're going to have my attributes, we're going to have an end line as well. And there we go. So what do you think? And what do you expect is going to be the value of attributes? If you guessed zero there, then I'm pretty sure you have heard about them in the past as well. But interesting thing kicks in if I change the value to italics. Now if I run this, the value is one. And similarly, for the underline, the value is going to be two automatically. So they kick in with the zero and keep on incrementing the value automatically, you don't have to explicitly do it for yourself. But interestingly, if I say that the bold value is not going to be zero, but rather going to be five, 
then obviously the bold value is going to be 5, but what's going to be the value of underline may surprise you that it's going to be 7 now. So automatic increment actually kicks in in the enum. So they are more over like integer type, but like a uh, auto increment type of stuff. So bold is five, italics is gonna be six, and underline is gonna be seven, then eight and nine and so on. You can move forward there. So pretty easy and very interesting implementation of enum. And this implementation is especially there after C++ 11, because in the C++ 11, enums were converted into class. Previously, there is a lot of debate going on that we have something like my attributes, we have to design enum, my attribute, and then colon, colon. It, it was a whole lot of mess. Now things are much more simplified. And yes, one more information that I am restricting some of the topic not to be disclosed here because this is an easier way to understand enums. Surely, I'm not explaining all the things here about enums, otherwise it will confuse you, but definitely I'll try to cover up it in another example where things are much more easier. So just keep that in mind. Okay, one more thing I would like to discuss here that you have understood that you can assign some default values to everybody as well. Probably you don't like italics to be six, you can define it as a seven here as well. And when I do so, uh, notice here now it automatically becomes eight. So auto increment kicks in, but you can also define a value according to whatever you like. So for example, here I'm gonna keep, uh, give it one, this is gonna be zero and stuff like that. In some of the code, you're gonna see the values are incremented at the power of four, again, for optimization of the code, because sometimes people like to have bit references here as well. Not going too much in depth, but yes, sometimes you are gonna see that. Now what more specific comes up into the C++ which might surprise you a little bit is inferring of the value. By default, enums are almost treated and almost work like an integer, but if you like, you can put a colon here and can define that I don't want you to behave exactly like these ints, but rather I would like to save a little bit of space and I want you to act like uh, unsigned integer eight bits here. So you can actually go ahead and do that. And now you're gonna run that. You will be internally saving some of the memory there. So again, you can just cast them as whatever you like, but make sure you are fully aware that how you're casting them and how it's gonna affect the memory. So these uh, things may surprise a little bit to the new people because usually books don't cover that, but in every single code you're gonna see everywhere that they are casted specifically like this to save some of the memory and for the bit references as well. So there we go, I told you, it's really simple to have these enums uh, under your belt. They are pretty easy and very fun to use. A lot of people are now using it instead of those predefined processors and all those other things. So I hope you have enjoyed this video. Let's catch up in the next one. One of the very common question that you will be dealing up quite a number of time is, is C++ a strongly typed language? For those who don't know, strongly typed language are those, although there are many features of a strongly typed language, but one of the feature is that the data type or the, the thing or the variable in which you'll be storing some value need to be in advance declared that what data type it is. Is it int? Is it character? Is it string? In C++, we always do that. That means, yes, of course, C++ is a strongly typed language. Now, one of the new feature in the C++, not exactly new, but relatively new feature, actually a little bit challenges that in the community discussion. Let me assure you that C++ is a 100% strongly typed language, but you're gonna notice some of the subtleties there and a lot of debate as well. So let me show you what it actually works and how it actually works. Now we can definitely go with the integers and longs and whole bunch of stuff, but we're gonna use one of the library here. Uh, that we are gonna be working with and just a string. I tend to love it, I use it a lot, so we're gonna be using it. So let's just say you create a simple function which is gonna return us a string and this is again an API call. So there we go, it doesn't take any parameter, it just makes a call to the web and in response you get some of the data from the website. So we're gonna say got some data from web. Nice and easy with a slash in, of course. So we are returning or we are getting this data from the website. It can be JSON call, APIs, whatnot. It can be really big amount of data. Now when I come up here, so if I want to just take this response data, I first and foremost need to declare a data of type string, obviously, and we're gonna call this one as response. Usually I call that. And then the response is gonna be holding the value, whatever the value comes up from the API call. There we go. And I would like to print this up as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and say see out, 
not like that c out and we're gonna put up a string here and uh, api call value and put a colon just like that and then after that we are gonna be having these guys and then i want to print the response nice and easy no big deal we have seen this kind of stuff in the past as well nothing new here so far and we get the data from the web but let's just say you don't have any idea that what kind of data is going to be coming up from the from the web maybe it can be an integer of course that can be uh, one of the thing or maybe it can be a simply long so in those cases where you don't actually know what kind of data is going to be coming up a relatively new keyword comes into the picture which is auto so you can make it auto and it's going to automatically define that what kind of data type you should be getting in the response to handle the value here. Now, of course, there are certain rules along with the auto that how it works and all those things, but let's not go into too much of the depth. Let's try to first understand what role this auto plays. If I run this application, it still is able to handle my string nicely. But the question now comes up, is it really internally auto a data type in itself or it automatically assigns a string data type? For that, we need to understand one more keyword here, which is just like the size of we have seen. It's pretty easy to have this. So I'm going to be running a simple if and else condition. And in the statement, I'm going to put a simple statement that's going to be saying that a type of both ID matches and a slash n. So now the goal is really simple that I want to match this response what type of value this response is. So there is a method here. You can see that uh, my code editor is really nice here and helping us. There is a type ID here. And if I just use this one that I want to find out what is the type ID of this response and compare it, not triple equal, JavaScript stuff, uh, double equal, we are going to compare that with a type ID of simple string. So if both of them actually matches here, then we can obviously verify that yes, the response is of string type. Let's go ahead and run this one. And I forgot a semicolon. And let's go ahead and run this one here. And we can see that yes, we are, we are able to get inside this if block and that's only possible because of the both ID matches here. So just make sure you understand one thing with this big long lecture that auto is not in itself a data type that is available here. The job of auto is to automatically define things and automatically get it up here. Now we are going to prove this with one more example. Of course, when I'm, we are not going to leave it just like that. So let's just say this is int and we're going to say this one as uh, another uh, API call yes i'm running out of the name sometimes so we're gonna go like that and this time we have already promised that we'll be returning back a number so we're gonna go ahead and simply say i want to return five for no good reason just five it came out of the head and we're gonna be doing this again one more time so let's go ahead and say auto and this time we are gonna call this as a rep for response and we are gonna say another api call so i didn't mention here anything and there we go now let's go ahead and see that if we are able to grab this and run this even. So we're going to say just rep and we're going to be appending it. We're going to say another, another with a, another API call. And I would also like to add a line break here. So I'm going to say NL. There we go. Looks nice and easy. And if I run this one here, you're going to notice that uh, the API, another API call, which definitely can use a space here, another API call value is five. And yes, I would like to check it again that if we, if this auto is actually creating this time a response here for integer. So I'm going to be saying rep, not repo, is actually an integer this time. We're going to run that and we're going to say type of both ID is int this time and we're going to say type of yeah this one is okay we're going to run this one here and hopefully there we go so we see that type of both id is int now this closes the big debate which is usually there around that auto actually is a data type with itself is automatically just works there no it's not like that auto doesn't work like that auto actually gives you an exact data type that you're looking up for and in the recent code a lot of programmer has started to use it even in the places where you shouldn't be using that, not a good practice. If you already know what kind of data you will be handling, you absolutely should mention that. But in the case where 
things are really tricky to figure out that what kind of data type is going to be coming up. For this, this is a nice and welcomed addition in the C++, but again, I don't guarantee that this auto might be running in all the compilers that you are working on the online as well. So be cautious about it. If you have installed it locally, I'm pretty sure it's going to work. But for online, I'm not pretty sure. I haven't tested all of them. So that's it for this video. I hope you are enjoying them. If you are enjoying it, please just take a moment and let me know on the Instagram that, hey, we are enjoying your course. That's all I'm asking. Please do so. And that's it for this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video on C++. This is going to be the last video of this section and after that we'll move on to the new section which is much more exciting than what we have seen so far. Again, everything is going to be just smooth and easy just like this one. Now in this video, I want to talk about two types of memory which is available to us, the stack memory and heap memory. We really don't talk much about these memory and how the program is actually behaving behind the screen in most other languages. But if you are working on C++, you definitely should know a little bit about them. Now, surely this video is not going to be entirely and will give you a whole lot of knowledge about it, but enough that you can just make better decision on what you're going to be going. Now, also, some of you can see that on my screen, I have a tab opened up about Visual Studio. And that might be a surprise to you that why we have this tab open up? Are we going to need this IDE? No, that's not the case. I just wanted to have a discussion on this. And also some of you might be a little bit panicky that as well, that why we are on the JetBrains page about the sea lion, which is a remarkable IDE. But you might be thinking, I'm not interested in buying it because it's $199 for the first year and I'm not in, in, interested in making that much of the investment right now. Now don't worry, we are not going to be doing that. This is just for the discussion phase. And remember, at one point you were all about, no, I don't want to buy any courses. Now you are inside this course, you are getting a whole lot of value what you have paid up. And eventually in your life, you probably might end up on one of these IDEs and you might end up in paying them, but not right now eventually some part in the life when you're going to see, yeah, that's actually very cheap to pay. Now let's go ahead and talk about the memories and then we'll come back onto the discussion later on uh, about these IDEs. So in this video, we're going to be talking about two kinds of memory, stack and heap memory. Now one thing that you need to understand that we have this whole memory block or also known as simple RAM. Now, a lot of people discuss that some memory is in actually your uh, RAM or some is another in your cache or other kind of memories. It's not like that. Both stack and heap memory are part of your actual memory, which is your RAM. The way how they work, fundamentally, it is actually same, but the allocation part is little different in both of these cases. So just keep in mind, they are all the part of same thing. The working or the fundamentals are also same, but the starting initialization of the memory is little different. The first one is the stack memory. Now stack is really the fastest memory that you're going to get. And this is the most default one, which is used by your program. And also keep in mind that stack is a predefined size. Once it has been allocated uh, two megabytes or whatever that is, it's that, that's it. You cannot have more than that. Now, surely uh, it doesn't just reserve the memory for your variables and stuff. It also reserves a little bit more of memory so that program can execute nicely and smoothly. And that's th th that it. And just remember, stack is a memory. Whenever you define a variable, it's going to just allocate a memory. And after that, it's going to allocate more memory on top of it and on top of it. So the, the pointer which is allocating these memory actually keeps on moving like that. So it's the fastest thing because you don't have to calculate much of the things. You just get compiler information, that integer of this x byte. So just allocate x byte. This array is of y byte. Allocate the y byte and move on to that. And that's it. There is nothing much to think about it. And that's why it is one of the fastest memory here. Another one is a heap memory. Now heap memory is also a predefined memory, but it can grow based on your demand. And again, heap sometimes look very, very attractive to a new beginner. And when you have started to code that, hey, I want to use heap, but that's not the case. Heap is not really that much of fast. Surely it has its own purposes and works, but just make sure that it's also a predefined and it gives you selected allocated memory space continuous, of course, but it can grow as well. So just keep that in mind. Now, what's the difference that how can I allocate stack memory or how can I allocate the heap memory? Now, let's go on to the Xcode and talk about that how we can manually do it. 
So here we are on our Xcode and here we're gonna understand that what's the difference between a heap memory and a stack memory as well. So first and foremost, I'm gonna put up some of the comments that here I'll declare the stack uh, type of memory and here I'll be talking about the heap memory. But before we go ahead, just another side tip. Now, in most of the program, you might have noticed that I'm using this using a namespace standard here, but actually it doesn't really always need to go up there. It can also go inside the main method here and some of the programs you're gonna see it like that. And even some of the experienced programmer actually prefer it like this moreover. And some of the experienced programmer even say that I don't like to declare it at the top, even I don't like it at all. I usually prefer to call it out as a standard and then a C out and work like that. Now, although at first it might look there is too much of the code, but again, the code clarity increases. That's why some of the people prefer it. But just for the sake of difference here, we're gonna be keeping this using namespace inside the main so that you get an idea that yes, this is also possible, quite a common thing in a lot of GitHub codes that you're gonna eventually be seeing up. So how, to, how does the stack memories are located? And you might get a little bit surprised here that it's uh, really simple. We're gonna get an int score and that's gonna be score of 100 and that's it, that's your stack memory. So, so far, whatever you have been using is actually a stack memory here. And uh, let's just say, since we have learned a little about the structure as well, let's bring in the structure because that's where the major difference starts coming up and uh, the visualization comes in. So we're gonna create a user. There we go, put a semicolon at the end. And here we're gonna have a const int ID and we're gonna have an integer age. And that's pretty much it. So we are having this structure. And now let's go ahead and declare uh, or initialize a new user, which is of type user. So how do we do that? We simply say user, and that's gonna be uh, simply Mike. There we go. So we have learned how to do that in the structure. Now, as soon as I do this, this starts complaining me. This is not a complaint about stack or heap. It just is a completely different complaint, which we haven't discussed yet, which is default constructor of user is there. In case you have coded before, you probably might be aware of the constructor but I will cover the constructor later on in detail. Right now, let's just get rid of this error. It's pretty simple. Whatever the name of your structure is, just make sure you create something like this. User, put up a pair of parentheses, then put up a colon, and uh, then whatever the integers or IDs or float you have defined, we just have to allocate some kind of default values into it. So ID is this, age is gonna be 22, and I'm gonna put curly braces here just like that. And that's it, it's gonna stop complaining just for now and we are all happy with that. Okay, so this is all easy, but now let's go into the heap that how we can declare exactly same these integers as well as this structure through the other kind of memory, which is heap in this case. Let's go ahead and check that out. It's pretty easy and it might surprise you a little bit as well. So we're gonna go ahead and say this integer pointer is gonna be of heap and I'm gonna call this as, not head up, we're gonna call this as heap score. Now, how do we do this? We simply use a keyword new, and then we just define this data type here, which is integer. And as soon as I do this, now this is heap score is gonna get a memory allocation in the heap type of memory or heap kind of memory. Now, definitely I can go ahead and use it like that, and I can do a deep referencing of pointer, and I can say, heap, I don't know why I'm writing it head and head again, but heap score is gonna have a value of 200 and that's all good and that's all okay. Now, although this is a little bit more line of code here, but technically speaking, internally, this is exactly what this is happening here. The new keyword is very essential and very important here. So how I'm gonna define this for structure? Almost exactly like that. We're gonna create a user pointer here this time. And instead of my key, we are gonna call this as Nike or Nike however you like to call it. We're gonna again have to use the keyword new, otherwise the purpose of allocating a heap memory is not gonna be solved. Moving further, we are gonna say that this is the user and that's it. Now, although in some of the code, you're gonna realize that a pair of uh, parentheses are also being used. Yes, I'm one of them who likes to use them. It's not compulsory, but you can leave it off too. But I recommend you to use it like that way. It makes more clear clarity into your code. Moving further, so how we're gonna allocate somebody's information into that, uh, just like we have been doing in the past, uh, we can simply go ahead and say Nike uh, .ids and ages, or we can define it. We have seen that already in the structure. I'm not gonna go into much depth. 
one thing that we are missing here is if you are allocating something or allocating memory manually, then you have to have to delete it. For example, we have already discussed that once, which is going to be here in this case, heap underscore score. So this is now deallocated or freed up memory. And we're going to again use the concept of delete and we're going to free up the memory here. Again, one more couple of side notes here. Now, just like you have done this, you can do this for floating values. You can do this for uh, enums as well. You can do this for uh, classes as well. You can also do this for arrays as well and a whole bunch of other things. Just remember, if you're using the new keyword, you have to have to use the keyword delete here. Now, this rule doesn't really apply for the smart pointers. We haven't talked about much about the smart pointers and the null pointers. We will talk about them later on in some videos. Right now, this is all good. This is all okay for us. As I told you, this is more over like a discussion and a fun way to learn the things in an interesting, of course, way. Okay, these are all good. Now, in some of the IDEs, people can actually tell you more on the discussion about are they actually the heap memory or they are the stack memory by showing you the exact memory references there and even the hex values of memory. Here, but in this case, if I just go ahead and put a breakpoint and I run this application, I do get some of the results here in my IDE like CPU, the memory usage and how things are going on. But it's not really that much impressive and in fact, to be honest, this debugging is probably one of the worst debugging for the C++. And I haven't seen much of the programmers who actually develop applications on C++ using this IDE, which is Xcode. And also they don't use the IDEs of these uh, code blocks or code light or whatever the online editor that you, they are use, you are using. They never prefer that. And this brings our discussion to the original tab that I showed you earlier. Visual Studio, although it's a Microsoft product and some people don't have much of the likings about the Microsoft, still this is one of the best in class tool to develop any kind of C++ application. Their debugger is hands down one of the best debugger you are gonna ever see. It not only just can give you all the memory references, you can even select your array and can have a reference of it. And it's gonna give you highlighted version that this memory slot is being allocated for the array. So good in explaining the thing, so good in debugging and understanding what's actually happening to your program. But again, this can also lead that even if somebody is a beginner and he's playing too much with the memory, any wrong click can actually even crash up your memory and your system may even restart or may uh, introduce some of the problems as well. Usually there are some safety bits around all of your parameters, but you know, we are playing with memory, things can go wrong. It's a very, very powerful programming language. Now here I'm talking all about the visual code and not the Visual Studio code. Visual Studio code is a completely different product and Visual Studio is totally a different product. The talk we are having here is for the Visual Studio. Recently, they have also rolled out a version from preview to actual version for the Mac as well. I did try it, not even near, not even near the Visual Studio, which is available for the Windows. It's really hands down one of the best. But there is another guy who is not far behind the Visual Studio. And even at some cases, they are even a bit ahead of the Visual Studio, which is the C Lion. And don't get surprised if your company gives you one or the two licenses that, hey, we always code on this. So here's your license key and use that. Most of the companies actually who work on C++ will give you these IDEs so that you can better perform and can worry less and write more code there. Now they have a lot of good things. I highly recommend that after this video, at least watch their video. I'm not asking you to buy it. I'm not asking you to download it. Just have a take a look at what are the features they offer you. And if you would like to have a trial of 30 days, I highly recommend to go with that. Now, this brings us to a little bit more onto the discussion. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fire up my terminal and we'll show you some of the more stuff as well, which we haven't discussed yet. So on almost all the system where you're writing this code, there is some version of the compiler that is being installed. In my case, I'm using the default GCC, which is available here. And if I check out the GCC version here, I'm using the default Mac toolchain version here. And of course, there's a double version here. And this command might not work on Windows, uh, so that's totally different. I'm using the version which is given to me by the Xcode directly, and this is fairly a latest version, but it's a bit of an Apple-ish version of their own compiler. And if I go ahead and check out this one here, so we can stop this one, you can go away. 
And in my project setting, the get started file, which might not be there on your system, there are a lot of things given to us into the info, into the build setting, and a whole bunch of other things. Make sure this is selected and not this one. There are different settings for it. If I go back here it, a little bit, you can notice here it says Apple C language and Apple C language for the C++. So what I have been using is the dialect of C++14 so far and the standard library that is being using is libc++ and the version C++11 support that we are having here. Now surely I can go ahead and change this one. I can change the dialect to 17 and something but for this series that we are going to be discussing mostly I'll be sticking uh, to the 14 version. Whenever I'll change any versions or anything, I will inform it in advance and definitely it's going to require a whole lot of trouble for us to install, let's just say, if we want to have a discussion on C++20, aka C++2a, that is going to be definitely a pain. It's not going to be a piece of cake that you say pip install this or npm install this. It's a whole bunch of bit nightmares, so just wanted to advance advancedly cautious you about that. This is not your college where you just run the Turbo C++. It's going to be different. It's going to be a little bit pain. So make sure you are, uh, you are totally uh, expecting that. So that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to this new section on functions of C++. First thing I would like to admit here that this is not your traditional course where we just keep on going through the topics and topics or the books where we just start the function, we absolutely 100% talk about functions, nothing else. I will deviate at some point in this section as well about discussing on some of the advanced topic as well as some of the minute topic of the C++ which will make you a better C++ programmer. You will understand these topics in depth. Also, the topic that I'm about to introduce in this section later on, a deviation, a tangent, is going to be much more easier to understand right here because you are having that open-minded nature just after a couple of videos then later on separately introduce them. So we'll have a small hint of them and then we'll talk about them later. Now as of now let's talk about functions. C++ is known as an object-oriented programming language which is 100% true but majority of the work is still being done in the C++ through the functions. Functions are a building block of C++ and you are also going to notice that later on when we are going to discuss about classes also, these functions are used a lot. They are exactly the functions but inside the classes they are known as methods. Same, exactly 100% definition and working style and syntax, everything same. But once you just cut them and paste them inside the classes, they are called as methods. So we're going to be talking about them later on as well. Now one of the method or the one of the function which we have seen so far is the main uh, method here. Now main itself is a reserved keyword and main is the first entry point of the method. And there is a small exception with the main as well. Usually we have seen that whenever we define a function, we need to call that function and without calling that function actually never executes. But not with the case of main. Main is an entry point. It automatically gets called by the compiler. So we don't worry much about that. Here we can see a simple int main. And then we have some of the body of the function. And we are returning 0. And then the curly braces and parentheses. All bunch of things. We have seen them uh, here. Now if I have to generalize that how the methods are. Or the functions actually look like in the C++. I can actually just name it like that. Little funny. But yeah that actually works. So first and foremost it says here we can see that it says int. It can be string, it can be void, means I'm not going to return anything. So it simply says what I will give back. So whatever the function is going to return back, this actually comes here. So that's why I have written here what I will give back. By I, it simply means what function will return you back. After that, you put up a function name and you can put up any name, but definitely don't use the reserved keywords. Like in this case, the main is the reserved keyword here. Now after that, we use a pair of parentheses here. Now inside these parentheses, sometimes you add some values, sometimes you don't add any values. And I'll come back on to this, that what there is a bit of jargon and introduction to the null PTR and a whole bunch of other things. We'll talk about that. But right now, it just simply means what you will give to me. So for example, if you are designing a function which adds two number, while calling this method, you want to pass on two numbers here. And then what I will do is simply the part inside these curly braces where you write 
whole bunch of things that you want that you, this function should do. It can be one line, a hundred line, a 10 line, whatever that is. Maybe you are designing different methods for login for Facebook, login from Google, and that's it. You are defining them in a separate file or separate place, and then while well, your actual program runs, you just call that method. It's the best use case of not rewriting your code and just putting all the code into one method, and whenever you need that, all the code, you can just call it here. Now here we can see it simply says uh, return zero and after that nothing executes here. Now since we are having a discussion of function, how we can avoid a discussion about call by values and call by reference. We will be writing this code as well because it's understood best in that way. But for example, if you have a method which says void life up, it takes integer life and we simply increment the value of life here. Now whenever a main method is gonna come up, it declares an integer and we call this method with the int here and we try to print out the life, it's not gonna be incremented and that's the reason why we call this as a call by value. Because whenever you pass on any reference or any integer, array, string, whatever that is, you actually pass on a copy of that, not the exact variable that you're looking for. A copy is being created, a copy is being passed on to this method, void life up, copy gets incremented, but the actual value inside the main method never gets actually incremented. That's a bit strange for the new people, but let me show you that how it actually works. Oh, this guy is also up. I need to close that, there we go. So if I come back here and if I run this program right now, there's nothing, it's absolutely clean. So let's go ahead and create that simple method and it's not gonna return anything. So we're gonna say void and we're gonna say life up, that's the method name. And this method actually takes an integer type of value as an argument and we call it as simply life. And we go ahead and do this and we simply go ahead and return or not return anything, but we just increment the value. There we go. Now inside the main, if I come back here and I create an integer life, that's gonna be starting with a Mario life, which is three. And we call this method, which is life up. And you need to call this by passing an integer data type which is life in this case. Once I do that and I try to print out the value here of the life, which is gonna be simply life, and I say end line, there we go, nice and easy. Now, in this case, if I run this program, this is gonna give me a three here. Although the increment is happening and it's not about the prefix and the postfix operator, we are definitely using a prefix here, which should be adding up the things. So this is not working greatly in this case. Now, one more thing I wanted to show you here, but I'll show you that in a second. So keep this example in the mind and especially keep this life variable in the mind. I'll come back to that in a second. So what's actually the solution of this call by value? The solution is really simple that you can actually go ahead and call by reference. Now this call by reference can happen with the multiple ways actually. Usually people talk about just one way, but it can actually happen through two ways. So compare the two here. The first one is a simple method that we have written, but if I move on to the second one here, I'm expecting that you need to pass on a reference of this life. And since you are passing on a reference of the life, the reference can or the address can be handled by the pointer. So I need to declare a pointer and then I need to do increment on the pointer itself. So let's go ahead and try that out. So first and foremost, we are gonna pass on a reference and reference is handled by the pointer. So we're gonna say pointer and then we are gonna do an increment of the pointer. Now, since this is absolutely confusing, plus plus star life, then I'm gonna wrap this up inside a pair of parentheses so that we know that we want an incrementer on this pointer here. So I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna run this one. And this time we see that the four actually comes up onto the point, which is the life is getting incrementer, incremented for our game. Now, one thing I would like to mention here that it's not absolutely compulsory to call it as a life. I can call this as simply ABC and I can do an increment of ABC. Now, it, all, it doesn't really matter if you call them exactly what you'll be calling in the main method. This is sort of a generic method and whatever you pass to it, it just increments that. So it can be life, it can be stock, it can be your role, it can be any number basically. It, the only thing important here is it should be type of integer. That's all what we care. If I run this program again with the ABC, it's still gonna result the four because that's what it does. You pass it on a value, it increments that. But for the better code practices, I'm gonna call it as a life because it makes sense. 
So this is one way of handling the reference, but there is another way of handling the reference as well. So in this case, you're gonna notice that this time, what we're doing is previously we were passing on a reference here. Remember in this example, we were passing on a reference here, but in this example, we are not passing on any reference. So the main method is actually working how it was supposed to be working. Just pass on a life and forget about whether it is called by reference or value, doesn't really care. While designing these method instead, we just simply say that this time we'll say that whatever the value somebody is trying to pass on, even if it is a copy, we're not gonna take a copy of it, we're gonna take a reference of it. And you know, once you change the reference, means you change directly at that memory address and it's gonna be changed everywhere. So let's go ahead and cha change that out. So instead of this passing on an a reference of the life, we are gonna say that, hey, now we don't need a pointer or anything we are gonna just take the value as a reference here. And now all we need to do is simply here add or increment the reference here directly, add one to the reference here. So when I save this and run this, and obviously this is gonna work same here. So make sure you are aware there are two methods that are being done here. Remember the second method that we are doing here, we are changing or incrementing the references here directly so be a little bit cautious about doing this one here. Okay, so this is all good, this is all nice, but also I would like to bring your attention to something more. This name here, we have seen that how this doesn't really affect about you call it as a life or ABC. Now let's have a little bit more discussion. Surely video is a bit longer, but we need to have a discussion this one here, just right here. So for example, I create a simple integer return type. I call this method as simply add me. And in order to add the values, I need to have two values, int A and int B. Feel free to call it anything, doesn't really matter. But the only thing that matters is the integer type here. We're gonna come back and we're gonna say, since it's a return, A plus B is gonna be the thing which is gonna get returned. No big deal, we are taking two values, we are adding them these values. Now here, I would like to declare a couple of values. First and foremost, let's call them as v1. The v1 is gonna have some value, doesn't really matter what value you put up there. We are not here to learn about mathematics of addition. It's all about any values. And also apart from that, I'm gonna declare float values as well. Surely my, comp my compiler will complain me a little bit, but we'll not worry much about it. So v4, and we're gonna have some 7.5, whatever that is. Okay. Now we have these uh, add me method being ap uh, applied here and we can use it to add it to integers. So let's go ahead and give it a try. So I'm gonna call this add me. And in fact, calling this add me directly, I would like to put out a C out and directly dump the value from this add me. And I would also like to go ahead and simply have an end L, there we go. Now in here, we definitely can pass on integers. So let's go ahead and pass on V1 and v2. So what would be the answer of this one? I hope many of you can already figure that out. Let's go ahead and do that. So we see four plus five, which is obviously nine. So we get a result of nine. Now what if I don't pass on an integer? What if I pass on the float values here? We say v3 and v4. We go ahead and run this one. And now this time we see the 12, which is not an accurate result because we are omitting the six decimal six and decimal five here. Not really good, especially you would not like to happen this for your banking application. You added some values into your bank and suddenly you realize that somebody is not taking care of whatever is receiving after the decimal values and probably it might cost you a million dollar. You would never like to happen that. So there we go, we realize that uh, values are being truncated and this is not really a good thing. So you realize that I'm gonna add another method here and this is important pay special attention here. I'm gonna simply say that this time, the value that is gonna be returned is gonna be float. I'm gonna still call it as add me. And this time, all you need to do is you simply have to pass on me float A and float B. And what I'm gonna return you is gonna be simply A plus B. There we go, just like that. And you can notice that although the name of these functions are exactly same, this is actually allowed in C++. You can have exact same name for the two functions, but they are totally different here. A function name doesn't make it unique. To make it 
to actually create a signature of the function, you need to have it's what's gonna be return type, what's you are accepting. So there's a whole lot of things, including this return that's going on to create a unique signature and C++ compiler is damn smart. So you're gonna realize that in a second now. Now previously we were getting this result 12. I'm not making change any change inside this one here. I'm gonna just run it directly. And now it is smart enough to know that I shouldn't be calling the float, uh, I shouldn't be calling this integer method of add me, instead I should be calling up this add me, this one, which accepts the float value, because the argument that you are passing me is float. So it's a very smart compiler, and we can see now the decimal values are being respected while we are adding up. So 12 to 13.1 is definitely a big difference here. Okay, one last thing before we cut off all of this, one last thing. Now sometimes you're gonna notice that uh, these methods are actually being uh, cut out and being pasted at the very end. And this is gonna give me a error and we're gonna run this one, it's gonna give me a compile fail. So there we go, we can see the build is being failed. Because a method, before you actually call them, needs to be defined. Now definitely, I will give you on that, there are other methods or other ways uh, by which you can define them at later on as well, but I think that's enough of a discussion for at least this video. I hope you have enjoyed this, and I'm pretty sure you have. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video because there is a lot more fun there. Let's catch up there. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video, and in this video, we're gonna have a very interesting discussion. So you might have seen a lot of people saying that you can build a whole lot of things with C++, uh, like you can build web application, you can build softwares like Microsoft Office, a whole lot of games too. But how these things are actually done, you're gonna learn that in this particular video. Now also I would like to mention that it's almost like a similar question that how do you build a web application in Python or maybe in JavaScript? Of course by usage, tons of code in libraries, frameworks, and the help from other people. But since C++ is taught with a completely different mindset in colleges and even in schools, that people really don't get exposure of how I can actually build that or how I can do that. It's so usually always about just printing the patterns and just solving a problem to get marks. This is not the case and this shouldn't be the case, but sadly. Anyways, let's go ahead and see that how we can build up our header files in C++. So let's go ahead, first get the basic example, then we're gonna go much more in depth of it. So we notice that we are having this program here and we eventually realize that, yeah, this file is getting a lot bigger because we have this life up method, assume this is a 50 lines of code, and we are having these couple of admies here. Now having too many of admies definition, you can see where we are going. These are for integers, then float, then probably double, maybe you, for some reason you want to add strings as well. So this can get a little bit messy. At this exact point, we can have a new header file where we can move on these two add me methods and whenever we need that, we can actually call that. We have been actually doing it, you didn't even realize that. So whenever we needed these uh, string, we actually were using this and we were saying that, hey, I want to bring up these strings as well. So if the file is actually coming up from the system or the default installation of C++, we usually call it in the angular brackets here or angular thing, whatever they call it. So diamond brackets, I think they call it that way. But we have been using this string so far. So if you want to design something on your own, you can actually do it. It's not really that much difficult. And even my code editor helps a lot, but there's nothing much there. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and click on this uh, project name. In this case, it's get started. We're gonna right click, click on the new file. And I'm gonna be choosing from the Mac OS. Notice you should be on Mac OS if you are on the Mac. Otherwise, you can just create a new file. I'm gonna simply select the header file and click on next and it's gonna ask me the name of it. So I'm gonna be simply saying this is gonna be uh, header.h. Again, my code editor is not helping me anything here. It's gonna just generate a file, a simple empty file which has an extension of .h. .h is important here. I'm gonna select the target as well because this is the only thing I have to do especially on Mac. In Windows, you don't need to do it. I'm gonna click on create and there we go. So this is the default code here. Now again, notice here, this above part is all commented out, so we don't have to worry about it technically. But this part of the code is actually a boilerplate code. Remember, in the main file also, there are some boilerplate code that you need to have this IO stream or at least some kind of thing to print out the stuff. Then we were having this boilerplate like main method compulsory to have it. 
Similar to that, if you want to create a header file, we need to actually start the header file and then we have to define or end this header file as well. And after that, we simply define the header.h, which is my header file to get started. And in case yours is a different operating system or something, you can just pause the video and write these two files. They are cross-platform, Mac, Windows, Linux, you have to go ahead and write them. Now, once you have done with that, then we can go into main.cpp and I'm gonna literally just cut out this two here, two methods, and I'm gonna go to editor.h, we'll come back here and we'll paste it here. There we go, that's all what we have to do here. Now, notice here one more thing that I have just cut and pasted them. Is it the best way to write the header files? Absolutely not. There are good practices about writing the header files as well, but I'm keeping things absolutely simple here. So we're gonna go ahead and save this one here. Now, once I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna build this one and it's gonna give me an error. So let me build that. It says build failed, obviously with a couple of errors. It doesn't know where, what is this add me. In order to resolve these errors, all I have to do is simply say, include a header file, which name is header.h. Once I save this and build this, now the build is actually succeed. And even if I run this, notice here, now we are getting the same result. So you notice that creating these header files is actually not that much difficult. It's just as a separate file, which can include some chunk of our code so that things doesn't really become extremely lengthy in our main method. So this brings to the question that if I can do it and I can put a lot of my code there, can I bring somebody else's other people code into my file so that my life becomes much more easier? Absolutely. In fact, we do this all the time. If I go and give you some of the examples, you're going to realize that. So there is one very famous library, which is known as CPP HTTP lib. Now this is, I guess from, uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that name. I'm going to call this as Hirose, but I have no idea how to pronounce that. So this is a very, very popular and very respected library. And you can see this is a header only file here. It says a C++ 11 single file header only cross platform. So you can just add all the code from this library and then you can talk to HTTP or web. They given, it has given you some of the examples as well that you can have a get method being called and you can have hello worlds and a whole bunch of other things that you can do. Definitely we are not there up to yet that we can uh, talk about these uh, file types and logging and a whole bunch of other things, but giving you that yes, it's a possibility. Another very famous one is this lame, which is a library used for audio, totally built up in C++. And if you look up for the software that uses the lame, you might get surprised uh, that how many uh, Mac OS classics and Windows uh, software actually use them. So quite a, quite a bunch of names here as well. And definitely a lot of other people are also using it behind the scenes. So this is about the audio. So we have some of the web framework as well, just moving there before I would like to discuss a lot of your favorite libraries, because there's a lot of hype nowadays about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Majority of your libraries are actually being built up in C++ and the C++ library further gives you an interface over JavaScript or Python so that you can have it. Otherwise, having such a performance on these uh, the so much of the mathematics that is being done is only possible with C++. Python performance is not going to be good, but since Python is just an interface which ultimately runs the C++ code behind the scene, that's why performance is really good. Moving back. So one of, one of the very important thing that is being done quite a lot in the FANG companies is development of web applications using C++. A lot of frameworks are being used, I'll name a few here. The first one is CPP CMS, which absolutely they even have to say on their website, not a CMS. We are not a CMS. We are a general framework to develop a web application. And whatever you have seen in the web application and React, Angular and other things, not exactly that way, but actually is possible here. Another very famous one is uh, the Ipkins Crow, which is really very powerful. And you're going to see some of the great benchmark results here as well. And it is completely capable of doing all the things like defining your routes and you can have all these routes. You're gonna see very similar to Express. We can handle the JSON request, how to build. Is it really easy to do all of it? Absolutely no, don't take it for granted. This is not your JavaScript or your uh, Python stuff that you can just install it and can run it. It's definitely going to give you a whole lot of pain. 
I remember once in one university, which is New York based, I'm not allowed to take name, but I was teaching this semester uh, a part of a week where I had to show them that how Crow can be configured in C++ and can be interacted with the MongoDB. It took us just for the configuration 15 days for all the class to actually do it. So it's really, really uh, complicated for beginners, but just to mention that, yes, it's possible. Another very famous is Core or Core, however they say, they say, and they are much more easier compared to rest of the others, but again, Crow is much more in the popularity game. Then we have a Q Django. Uh, they don't really care much about the Windows, uh, Debian, Mac OS, and all these things, but they don't really care much about Windows, surely pretty popular one. Another one you're going to see is WT, uh, quite famous, nice and beautiful website, a whole bunch of other things they give you, and you're going to see a lot of people are actually using it as well. Apart from that, it's also possible that if you are, maybe you're configuring Crow or any other web application, you might be interacting with databases as well. So almost all databases provides you the drivers that you can see here and can configure for your web application. This is MongoDB's official uh, GitHub repo, which they give you for the C++ drivers. So you can see a lot of things here that what you can do, what you cannot do. Is it easy? Nope, don't even think about it. But just giving you some idea. Another one here, which is a single JSON file, if you want to interact or parse some of the JSON, this is very famous library here. Uh, you can just look for this JSON. Again, uh, this is from uh, Sheridome. Again, uh, Sheridome, Sheridome, I don't know how to say that even, uh, which is a pretty popular JSON. It's a single JSON file. And they will also give you some of the examples as well that how you can talk and interact with the JSON. Uh, some of the examples are here, uh, some of the examples are here. Is it easy? No, not at all. But the really easy part is you can simply say just include json.h just like we have done the editor.h and you can just write your code. Moving back onto the point. Yes, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities with the C++. Almost everything that you can do with Python, JavaScript, or any other language, C++ also gives you almost exactly and even more opportunities to do that. Is it very popular in the market? No, not at all, because only a handful of uh, kind of restricted community is handling that. But let me assure you that all the big fang companies are using it and having a division of the C++. Is it easy to do it? No, not at all. Just get that completely out of your mind. It's gonna be a pain, but it's rewarding. So that's it for this video. Enough of fun for this one. Let's go ahead and move on to the next video. And I have a lot more to talk about this header here. So let's go into the next video. I know, I told you that we are gonna be focusing more on functions, which we are, definitely we are focusing on functions. But I cannot just let it this opportunity slip away where I have a perfect setup example to introduce you with templates. Now templates are fairly new to C++ and old traditional colleges and university usually don't teach that because it was not introduced at that time. If you have been heard, if you have ever heard about this competitive programming as well as whiteboard interviews, templates are used there a lot because it saves us a lot of time. They are not something like really newly created. It's just moreover like a generalization of the things. In some of the other languages, they are also compared with generics. I don't think, I don't really believe they are anywhere near to the generics. I think they are moreover, much more open-minded compared to anything else. So without a further ado, let's get started with that. It's actually super easy. Now, when I run this program, obviously we have seen so far that it runs nicely about the header. In the last video, we saw all of that, creation of the header files and stuff. Now, let's just say if I remove this header file, that means now my program is not even aware that any such file exists. If I build this program, obviously the build is going to be failed because of obvious reason, it doesn't know what the header file is. Now, surely I'm not going to bring up these two methods here, let's keep them there, but rather I would like to define a very generic method here that can take input both for integer and for float. Here, previously, we had to design two different methods and maybe uh, more for uh, if you have booleans or maybe if you have strings, maybe for some reason you want to add them. There can be, you can see obviously the pattern going on in here that there can be five, six, or even 10 such similar methods. But if the goal is so much generic that you just want to add the stuff, then you can use templates here. Templates are pretty easy. Let me show you that. First and foremost comes up the keyword, which is template itself, and then comes up these diamond brackets are also known as angular. Now here I can say that there's going to be a type name of t. Now just like I was able to use integers, I was able to use strings. Similar to that, you can create your own data type, which is 
just an empty data type. Anything can come in between that. And thus, let's just say this is the empty data type here that you are making. Now here can come integer, then can come a float. And you're going to be calling this entire thing as integer or your data type here. Let me give you more on that. It will give or bring up more clarity here. So with this one line here with the 17, line number 17 here, I have created a new data type, which is T. And just like I use integer, I can use this T. Let me show you that. First, I'll show you with integer and then I'll convert that into T. So my data type, return data type is int and I call this as add me. And then inside that, I expect that int A value is gonna come, int B value is gonna come and what I'll return is gonna be return is gonna be simply A plus B. This was a really simple example before we had. But now, since I've created new additional data type, which is T, I can go ahead and replace this int with T. And T is not very specific data type. It is moreover general. It is just a template and anything can come in and fit in. And this simple one line of code can actually handle almost anything. It's gonna just add the things. It's not worried about, is it integer? Is it float? Is it double? Is it anything else? If you're gonna use it, it assumes that, hey, whatever you are sending me up, it is completely addable and I'm gonna just mix them together and we'll return it back. And now when I build and even run the program, you're gonna notice it doesn't give me error. In fact, it works nicely. Now template is not this much only, but this was a brief introduction and a very first uh, kind of a touch to the templates. But surely we can, ad we can advance this example more by using arrays at such uh, template types and a whole bunch of other things can be done. But this is a quick first introduction and I think this will help you to have a again and again and again introduction to the templates and will make things easier. So there we go. I'll keep this exercise file for you as well so that you can download it. And now going back into the function world. Let's catch up in the next video. Hey there people, hit the share. In this video, we're going to talk about a very... The pointer is not special, the function is not special, it's nothing special here and still a lot of people get confused about this. So it's a simple pointer which points towards the function and then this pointer actually is capable of running that function whenever you like. It's a really simple concept but sometimes with a bunch of uh, heavy code it actually becomes much more diluted to understand and beginners face absolutely trouble. So I don't blame you if you don't understand this concept absolutely 100%, even after watching the video a number of times, it's okay. When you'll actually be building up the stuff and things, then it will become much more easier. The first time when I actually used it a while we were building up a simple block of code, which uh, it was a simulation in Network Simulator where we were trying to simulate that what happens if we put up a wall, which is instead of filling it up with concrete, it fills up with the water and we have to calculate the radio waves onto that and Wi-Fi ranges. It's, it's a thing which everybody does in their masters and PhD in the network simulator. But that's a side story, another of that. We're gonna talk about these uh, functional pointers. So let me start with a very simplistic example. So first and foremost, let's just say you have a simple uh, integer here, which says a get two and for some reason it's named as get two like that it doesn't do much of the stuff it just returns you a simple expression of literal two and that's it so that's what the simplest example and we can do a lot of stuff with this for example i can declare an integer type here and i can say what i got and this is going to get or hold the value whatever the value is being returned by get two now this is probably the simplest example that we have got and if I just go ahead and print out that what I got and of course let's get an NL, there we go. So without a doubt and without thinking too much you are able to say that hey I know what the value it is holding up, this is just holding the value 2 here. And yes you are absolutely right, there is no magic going on in this case. Now notice here a couple of things that here we are able to return the 2 and here we are able to actually run this directly. This is just a placeholder which is holding the value which is which I got back from this method after running the method get to. But pointer is a bit special. Pointer is not a storage unit or where you can store integers or something. Pointer just points towards something. But when a, when a pointer actually points towards a function, it gets a bit more capabilities. It becomes a superman. And you can even run that function 
based on this pointer. So let me show you that. It's actually super easier after this example. So let's just say we have a simple data type here. We are going to just go for void here, simplest thing. I'm going to call this one as interesting, just for fun stuff. And what it's going to do, it's going to just simply put here and in the puts we are going to say I am interesting. There we go. Of course with a slash in. No, we don't need a slash in. We are into the puts. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is instead of declaring this integer, I would like to declare a pointer. Now the pointer needs to be of the same data type which you are holding the function return value, in this case void. If there would be int here, I would be creating integer pointer or double pointer. You got the point, nothing more. So here what I'm going to do is I need to create a pointer. So I'm going to use asterisk here and I'm going to say this points to interesting. There we go, nice and easy. And this is gonna be pointing towards simply this interesting here. Now there are a couple of things that we need to understand here that whenever you put up these parentheses, it actually runs that method. I don't want to run this method here directly. So I'm gonna remove this parenthesis here. I'm gonna just say interesting. Now, right now I'm pointing to a memory location where this interesting is holding up, but I'm not running it right now. I'm just making sure that my pointer actually points towards it. But there is a little bit more syntactical sugar that we have to add. Now here in this pointer, first and foremost, what we need to do is wrap this pointer inside a pair of parentheses so that it becomes one unit. Whenever you're going to be doing anything to the pointer, I highly recommend to wrap it up inside parentheses, whether adding some value or running it or anything like that. Now in this special case, which is a functional pointer, remember the topic name is functional pointer. So we have to create this pointer just like we have created functions here and functions here. So make sure you put up a pair of parentheses here. And that's the whole story behind this weird syntax. And now this is totally fine. And you understand each bit and piece about why this is happening. Once you understand the why, then things becomes much more easier and the code looks absolutely simple. Now, if anybody ask you that why we are putting up these, uh, you, can rem you can point them. Yeah, we put them in the main too. We put them in interesting too. Why we are not putting up these guys here? Because we don't want to run it right now. So there we go. You got all the answers here. Now again, the point interesting here is how we can run this. Now, since you have got this reference of this interesting method, you can use the dereferencing of the pointer and can run it wherever you like. For example, I can just use this uh, points to interesting and I can just go ahead and run it like that. There we go. We have run that. So, uh, Let's go ahead and here also you can see that we are running any method by just putting parentheses after that. Simple, similarly to this, we are going to just go ahead and run it like that. Let me show you something interesting here. Let's go ahead and run this and notice, interesting, I am interesting gets printed here. So this is actually more C++-ish way of doing it, but there is a slight variation in the syntax. It's not really common, but you're going to see some programmer actually uses that. This is just a syntax, alternative way of doing this stuff. So make sure you just keep an eye on that. And maybe if you forget, that's okay. So you're going to see if I just copy and literally paste this up here, you're going to notice that some people like to run it again by putting an asterisk. And once you put up an asterisk, you have to have to wrap this up inside parentheses. It's a good practice. So this is also going to do exactly same as what's being done in line number 27. But some people like to use this dereferencing syntax. I don't use it. I have never used it. When there is a simpler syntax, I prefer that way. So if I run this one, it's going to print two times. I'm interesting. I'm interesting, which is definitely very, very interesting. So I told you functional pointers are not really tough, but sometimes the example is too much uh, clouded, then it becomes much more uh, tough for a user to understand. And now I think wherever you're going to use that or see that you can simply deduce, hey, I know these are very easy to understand. So I hope you have enjoyed this one and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video on functions. I'm pretty sure that whenever you study about the C++, there is some forum or some senior developer who has told you this, that be extra cautious while using null in the C++. And for all the good reasons, null is very ambiguous in the C++ and the fact behind why it is so ambiguous is because of the fact that a lot of C actually comes into the C++ and that makes it very, very difficult. The function overloading thing was never present in the C, but when the advanced one was made in the C++, then this function overloading thing kicked in. 
And this made null very ambiguous and every single programmer is gonna warn you that be extra cautious while using null. Now we don't have to worry too much because just to save the day, the null PTR or null pointer came into the role, which is in itself a, a bit of a data type as well, along with solving the ambiguity problem. So first and foremost, we need to understand what is the problem. And then once we understand the problem, then we can actually introduce the null PTR or null pointer, which can save the day. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So we have seen that function overloading is a quite common thing in the C++. Let's go ahead and do a function overloading and test this out. So this is not gonna return anything. This is gonna say print me or print val, however you like to go ahead and do that. It's gonna take an integer a as an input and whatever we give it to it, it's gonna just do a printf for that. So let's go ahead and do a printf and this is gonna say uh, integer value is, of course we have to use a person d with a slash in, no doubt for that, and a, there we go. And when I run this program, uh, let's just call this method, which is gonna be print val, there we go, I provide a direct integer there, five, and without a doubt, it's gonna print the entire thing, which is gonna be integer value is five, so no big deal in that. Now let's go ahead and print out the other thing as well, for example, if I just copy this entire block and paste it up here, I'm gonna say instead of expecting integer, just expect a double this time, and we're gonna say double value is, of course I don't have to use a person D, I think person F is gonna work fine, and this time instead of five, if it is 5.3 or any decimal value, if I run this one, this is absolutely 100% allowed in C++, not in C. Now picture becomes a little bit blurry when you go ahead and do the same thing for the pointer. Now let's just say this is exact same thing, but this time instead of saying that instead of double or integer, just expect an integer pointer A, and now you have to print the pointer value. So we're gonna say, oops, we're gonna say pointer value is, and of course we have to use a proper uh, empty space here, which is person P for the pointers. And now it prints up. Now, of course, this is 100% valid and 100% legal in the C++, but picture becomes a little bit ambiguous as soon as you introduce the keyword, which is null. Now, as you can see, this is a default keyword, but compiler is not gonna allow me to build this and build is gonna be failed because the print val is now ambiguous. This null is ambiguous. Now, you will see in a lot of code that people actually go through the sneaky ways of removing this error because a warning is definitely better than error. So what they do is, you'll see this in a lot of programs and even in books as well, that they define a, a kind of a constant here. So let's define that, a macro here, which is gonna be null. And explicitly we mentioned that the value is zero. As soon as I do this, the warning goes away. Surely it introduces a new, more, a new warning that the macro is uh, redefined here. Now I'm not gonna go much into the macros in detail, probably in some C course, but right now this is all good. Now this is a common practice, and in fact if I run this, this just works absolutely fine. Because now you have redefined null. Originally the null was meant to be just a pointer which points to a start or a zero, so now you are having actually a literal zero value and you can see that this, this thing is actually not running. This is not, we are getting the code, we are actually running it in the integer side because this was redefined as a zero. And I told you null is different and zero is totally different. So we are never actually running this block of code. And this is a very ambiguous situation that you wanted to run this explicitly but somehow the sneaky way is actually running this block of code and running completely different block of code is never good in the program. Surely there are more sneaky ways to actually run this line of code, but we don't want to go more sneaky. Now in the, I guess C++ 11 version, or 14, I don't remember exactly, we need to check the specification for that. They introduced a new keyword, which is null PTR. Now this, is actually a C++ way of handling the null value. And whenever you need actually null, uh, we usually use this null PTR. It's a pointer which points towards the real null. And when I run this piece of code here, you can notice now this is actually running the exact block of code which we wanted, which was pointer value is. And honestly, it is also pointing towards the real null, the zero value, the start of the memory. And this is what we exactly want and be extra cautious while using null pointer. It definitely can save your day, but it can also ruin your day if you are not extra cautious while using it.
So I hope now the concept about the null pointer is much more clear to you because we have already seen these function overloading and all those stuff. I told you C++ is very interesting. It's somebody just tells you the entire C++ like a story and I think you are enjoying this a lot. So let's go ahead and move on to the next video and understand a bit more about functions in C++. Whenever I talk about recursion, there is always somebody who has already heard about it and say recursion is a function which calls itself again and again. Absolutely true, but almost 80% and the 20% part that you are missing up is this. Recursion is a function which keeps on calling itself again and again, but with an exit strategy. If a recursion is not going to have the exit strategy, it's going to keep on calling itself and eventually will run out of memory and program will crash. And this confuses a lot of people in the beginning that how even recursion actually works. Now definitely we are not going to go in depth about the recursion and creating its tree structure and everything in the theoretical aspect. I've done that in much more detail in my data structure course, but rather let's get a beautiful and very simple example about recursion. So as I said, make sure you keep that in mind. A recursion is a function which keeps on calling itself, but with an exit strategy. Even sometimes, uh, Google actually plays a little bit with you. If you'll go on Google and we'll search for recursion, and this is kind of a programmer inside joke, which is out in public. If you'll search for recursion, it will always say, do you mean recursion? Keep on clicking on this recursion, and every single time you do, it's gonna just show you recursion, recursion, and recursion. A kind of fun and tricky way to make sure you understand that yes, recursion is important for Google, even although a lot of programmers will say it's not very efficient way and consumes a lot of memory and it's not good for competitive programming, but still, Google loves recursion. Moving back, let's go on to this and try to see that what we are gonna be building up to learn and understand about the recursion. So recursion is a function which keeps on calling it again and again. And if you have heard about the factorial, how do we find factorial? So I'm gonna put up a comment first here. So in order to find any factorial, factorial, there are a couple of ways of how you can go ahead. The first way is, let's just say I want to find a factorial of five, then we have to say five is gonna be multiplied by four, multiplied by three, multiplied by two, multiplied by one, and you get the factorial. Now there is another way of finding out factorial, and which is if you want to find a factorial of one, if you want to find a factorial of five, then multiply uh, one by two by three by four and by five. So the strategy is pretty simple that whether you start from the highest number, you keep on decreasing it till you hit one. And if you start from the lowest number, you keep on increasing the number till you find the number of which you want to find the factorial. And both of the programs are absolutely 100% correct because they give you the the same result but with different strategies. So we're going to create a program using factorial. Surely this can be created by a normal way as well but we'll use recursion to do so. And now I'm going to show you a bit different syntax as well which we haven't discussed much. This time I'm going to define this helper function below the main method. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this one as it's going to return me an integer. I'm going to call this as factorial not like that. Factorial and this factorial will take a simple integer n or whatever you like to call a as a simple input. And now what this factorial is going to do, uh, this factorial will call itself again, but this time instead of n, this is going to call it a with n minus 1. Now if I run this program right now, it's going to just keep on calling. It's never stopping there. If I even pass on 5 here, next time it will call itself by saying uh, 4, then 3, then 2, then 1, then 0, then minus 1 and minus 2. It's going to keep on rolling. So it's very important that you first figure out an exit strategy here. And of course, here we can see that if 5 is given to me, then we have to keep on multiplying the number as well. So multiplying the number is pretty simple that we are going to just take this n and we are going to multiply that by factorial of 1 minus. So technically saying 5 is going to be multiplied by factorial of 4. And factorial of 4 is 4 multiplied by 3 by 2 by 1. So there we go. Now this is all good, but still we are facing one problem, which is how do we exit this? Because if we are going to run this one, this is infinite thing. So we need to figure it out. Notice here, we are always stopping in this strategy. The first one, we are stopping here for five. We are stopping here for one. So we can check that whether a number is actually greater than one, or if it is equal to one, then we need to stop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this out 
and I'm going to put up a simple if and else block here to check the condition. So I'm going to go ahead like this and I'm going to say I want to check if number is actually greater than one. If number is greater than one, then I want to keep on doing it. What do I want to do is I want to do these things and even I'm going to put up a return here as well. But what if the number actually becomes uh, greater than one, then simply go ahead and return one here. So return one, there we go, because the factorial of one is actually one. So that's why we are doing it. There we go. We have used the first strategy here. Now you're gonna find a lot of program on the web and on the books as well, which follow the second strategy as well. Nothing wrong in that. Okay, first and foremost, why this method is defined after the main? You told us earlier that you cannot do it. Yes, of course, you cannot do it. If for some reason you want to do it, you have to mention and tell your compiler earlier that, hey, there is a method named as factorial, factorial, which is defined somewhere. And the definition is that it's going to accept an integer and that integer is going to be simply n. And there we go. It simply means that I am telling you that there is something here uh, which is going to come up, but I'm not defining it here. I'm going to define it later on in the program, but the definition or the invocation needs to be there at the top. It's almost similar to that. Hey, I'm going to say that, hey, there is going to be an integer y. I'm not putting up a value into it, but I'll use it later on. It's almost similar to that. So it is totally allowed. Now let's go ahead and uh, write main method for this one, although really simple, but we're going to do a little bit different this time. I'm going to define an integer n and it can be any integer, whatever you like. I'm going to print out a message to the user by C out and I'm going to print out simply uh, say that not an enter, enter a value. And it's going to be good that if you test out that the value that user is giving to us is actually a positive value and is not a negative value. So these checkings we are definitely not doing, but it would be good if you do that. And I'm going to just go ahead and put a colon there. There we go. Now, just like C out, we have this C in as well, which uses these, again, operator overloading, not a big fan, but we have this value here. So C out displays the thing on the output, which is on the screen. C in takes the input from the user and you can store that input directly in any number. In this case, I'm gonna store that into N. Okay, there we go, nice and easy. But now there are a couple of issues that we need to actually deal up with that. First and foremost, why are you having this? Because it said, hey, didn't you use that? Now, I am not going to define a namespace standard here. I'm going to rather say this is coming up from the standard. Again, I'm defining the namespace and I'm using a scope resolution operator. Yes, these two columns do have a name. They are known as scope resolution here. So I'm going to simply put up them. I prefer it this way, but again, you can use, uh, use namespace standard again. No big deal. Okay, moving forward. Now, all we have to do is call our method. So we're going to say simply C out, not C out. We have to use the standard. So standard C out. And then we are going to just print up the message. So your result for factorial is, and then we are going to just put it like that way. We'll call the method here, which is factorial. We'll pass on whatever the end user has given to it directly. Not a good idea, but still we're going to do it in this one. And we're going to have an end L. Why it is not a good idea to directly pass on this here? Because we haven't done any kind of checking here. There you go. Should be all happy. If we are going to pass on this value directly into our method, there are high chances that program might crash. So it's a good idea that if you store this value into some another variable or maybe someplace else, do all the thorough checking that whether the number is positive or not, whether it is decimal or not. And then once you are all satisfied, then you should call this function. But we are not going into that much of depth. It's a pretty basic, simple program. And we're going to run this program. This time, instead of hard coding the value, it's asking me a value to be input. And again, depends on what compiler or code editor you're using. It's going to be a little bit different from you, but I think you can figure it out. If I put up a five here, it gives me a result of 120, which is accurate result of finding a factorial. Now, recursion is really a great subject and should be studied in depth. I have taken a great care of it in my other courses on data structures and algorithm, where we have learned how the factorial, how this recursion actually works, how to build the trees of recursion and multiple ways and multiple aspects of recursion as well. So if you're interested, go ahead and check out that other courses. But I think this is all good for us to move forward. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Do we really need to talk about macros? 
I guess, yes, we actually need to talk about macros. Personally talking, I'm not a big fan of macros. Yes, I have used them and probably I have overused them when I was actually working on C++ projects and the initial days it's an urge of using the macros a lot. I find myself guilty of using them a lot. But the point is you shouldn't be using them that much. Now, in case you remember, we actually discussed a little bit about the macros. I didn't explicitly mention it, but actually I've used it there. So remember when we were talking about these uh, null values, when we wrote this value null here, just like that, I actually defined a macro. I didn't explicitly called it as macro, but technically we were defining the macro. So when we said uh, hash define, and I said that null, not null, the null is gonna be now zero. What happened is, is that I'm defining a macro here. And whenever I say that this null is actually zero, this is the syntax of the macros. You simply say hash define, and then you mention the macro here, and then you mention the value of it. And technically, internally, what happens that whatever the value you write here is actually gonna be copied and will paste it in place of whatever the macro that you are writing or whatever the code you are writing, it just replaces there. And this makes a big problem. Remember the int block of code was getting actually returned there, not the pointer block. And this is the reason because your code actually got copied and pasted there because of the macro. Now let's talk a little bit more in depth about these macros since we have already discussed them a little bit here. I'm gonna remove this one here. First and foremost, macro has a lot to do that how compiler actually sees your program and how it interprets it. Now there are definitely good books that I can surely recommend you, but I think if you'll be doing masters or PhD, you will automatically come to them. Or if you are working in a company which extensively use C++, then these books are good. They are all about the compiler design. And if you'll search on Amazon about the compiler design, you're gonna understand more about it. Compiler design is not about designing a new compiler, it can be, but compiler design is a subject which is more about understanding how the compiler works, how the linker works, and what are the phases in which your program actually executes and finally does a task. One of that iteration while compiler reads your code has linkers, and another one which from them is actually checking how the syntax of your program works and semantics of your program. Now during the very, one of the very initial phase, Everything that is returned with the hash or the pound sign is actually read first and that's the reason why it first brings up all the libraries and the functions that are defined into these files. It brings them and store them somewhere in the memory so that whenever next time you say that from IO stream, I'm gonna be using something known as cout, you can actually go ahead and use it directly without any problem. So when you define a macro, it definitely all the macros are loaded first in the memory and whenever you use that macro, it actually just writes them. Let's go ahead and write a very, very bad example here, which is return zero. So you can see every program has this return zero, but maybe for some reason you don't like it. So you simply come up and say hash define, I want to simply define the macro that says end, and the macro is gonna be return zero. Now this might confuse a lot of people that in the null there was just one value, but that's not how the macro syntax works. You just write your macro name here and after that whatever you're gonna be writing, it can be a long string, it's gonna be treated as a replacement. So now instead of this return zero, I can go ahead and say that I want to use end here. The moment you say end here, then whatever is written after here is gonna be actually copied and will be pasted at this place. Now notice here, we are missing a semicolon. So we have a couple of options, either use a semicolon here, and that's gonna compile your program successfully, or you can include your semicolon in the macros as well. Although I have never seen any program even written by a beginner which uses this kind of syntax where they put the semicolon E in the macros. This breaks the consistency of the program, although it's gonna exit fine, and let me show you that, that if we have any integer A, which is having a value four, C out, we are gonna have A being displayed and end L. There we go, nice and easy forgot a semicolon here, there we go. Now, although this is gonna compile and run nicely with an exit code of zero and everything is going great, but this breaks a consistency in the program that here you're using everywhere semicolons, but here actually you are missing it, no point of doing it. So usually you're gonna see that this is being removed and this is being placed up here. So now you know that macros are nothing more but the replacement that is being done. So copy and paste it here from here to here. And there we go. This literally means exactly the same. 
And macros definitely are more powerful than this, but this is a very weird example. But surely you're gonna see that sometimes people who are even beginners don't even hesitate to do these small stuff. Now macros are not just about hash define. There are a couple of other keywords as well that you're gonna see along with the macros. There is hash if define, if end, and a whole bunch of others. You have seen a small glimpse of them when we were writing our own uh, different header file. There were some keywords which was given to me by my code editor. They are all macros that are being loaded there. Now also, uh, let's go ahead and see uh, another simple set example of the macro. Let's just say you want to write an end message before the program ends. So what you can do is you're gonna see end message and then you can write more stuff like C out and this C out is gonna say uh, something more like this, program ends here, not gear, here, and we got a slash in and just like that. Now, before ending any program, you can use this macro here and can say end message, not message, end message, and simply put a semicolon. And now before ending the program, you're always gonna get a message like this, which says program ends here. Another thing, very common thing in the macros that you are never gonna see macros or you are gonna rarely see the macros with the lower cases like that. The macros are usually like this, end, and here also they are like more over end, message so that it's become explicitly clear that what macro is and what is the code that it's replacing. Now surely this is gonna be a little bit weird for you at the start that why even we are using. So let me give you some of the more practical examples that I've seen in the code that people actually write. So for example, uh, let's bring up that. So you might have noticed that we are defining this integer and this is A and four. This is a common beginner friendly program but in most of the professional programs, people don't like to use int because it's not, just don't consider this as an int. It can be a long, a double or anything. So these are not very reliable, the default one from the compiler because we are not sure whether it's gonna take 32-bit memory, 64-bit or 128. The more reliable way is actually to use something like this, int 32-bit. And this, although is not gonna affect much on our program, we're gonna still get the same result but how much memory is being used here is actually governed by this program. So instead of using this, you're gonna notice a lot of professional programmers, especially the old ones, which have been writing uh, code in 90s, like 91 or 92 years, they were in their prime and were writing system drivers and a whole bunch of other things. Their code is actually very, very efficient. You're gonna notice them, then they usually define a whole lot of macros in their program and they simply say that, hey, uh, I'm gonna be using, let's just say I'm working for a company LCO and this is LCO int. And initially I was writing all of the code. So I'll say that this is gonna represent int uh, 32 underscore a t like that. Now, instead of saying that this is int 32 t like this, they usually say this is my data type, which is LCO int. Now this is one of the fantastic use of the macros that I have come across over the years. Now here, this makes programs so much efficient, so much efficient. Right now, no difference at all, but let's just say for savage of the memory, you want to say, hey, I don't want to use 32 here, I want to probably use something more over like eight. Now with just one change here, it goes away and change my entire program and I don't have to mess around every single point where I have defined this simple thing like int a. Right now this is just one int, but it could have been like probably 5,000 places where I have defined my variables. And this one change of the macro can actually change it. Not only change it, people have written some of the great programs which can uh, produce a program for 32 bits and the 64 bits of the system just with a change of few macros. Definitely more optimization is necessary and required, but these are some of the best examples I have seen. Obviously, I'm not saying that I have a huge amount of experience in C++, but whatever I've seen in the system programmings and the driver code that we have written, uh, this is all I'm sharing here. Another place that you're gonna see that uh, sometimes people use it, these macros, even to shorthand notation as well. For example, there is a character constant uh, pointer constant here. This is a very common thing. So you're gonna see that sometimes we declare variable with a whole bunch of mumbo jumbos like I want a constant. Uh, it should be a character pointer. And again, then we have a const here. We don't actually got into an example where I have to show you this exact syntax, 
But trust me, this is something which is commonly used, especially in the methods overriding and a whole bunch of other things. Now, this is a long data type here. So what people do is uh, they just say that this is my uh, CCPC or LCO CCPC, something like that. And they just put it like that. And then they, instead of writing this long syntax, they can come up and say, this is LCO CCPC, something like that, and then can define your variables or whatever the reference you want to give inside this. Uh, surely this can also serve really great, but I am a big fan of these kinds of examples where with just one simple syntax, you can change a whole lot of things. Now, some of the examples you're gonna see if you will be working later on in game engines or something. In the game engines, usually you are not gonna be seeing values like C out and stuff. They usually are being overwritten by uh, console log or something. You might have heard about the console.log in the JavaScript. In fact, you can define your own console log as well because macros are not just replacing the values, you can pass on values into them too as well and that makes them super powerful. So Okay, so I hope you got all of this. Now I'm gonna show you one more last example. And this is a common example that you're gonna see. So if you're working with some of the game engine development or you're working in a company which is heavily uh, involved in the C++ work, then you're gonna see this quite common. Usually we don't have this C out syntax of the format. So for example, if we have this uh, score here, which is having a value of four, maybe 400, and you want to debug that value. Debugging simply means you just want to dump out the value on the screen, a very common thing which everybody does. So we're gonna go ahead like that and end L. Very common thing to see around, and almost everybody uses that to dump out the value to see what's actually this variable is storing. Now you're gonna notice that these uh, values are actually being micro-driven, macro-driven uh, many times. For example, uh, you can simply use this macro, and we're gonna say console underscore log, and macros are actually capable of taking input as a parameter as well. For example, you can give it in a value A here, and then you can simply define your macro here, which is gonna be C out, and I just dump the value as A, and I simply use an end L here. There we go, nice and easy. So now this time, instead of saying that score and this whole syntax, I can just get rid of this, and I can simply say uh, console underscore log, and this value is gonna be passed on, whatever the value you pass on. You can just go ahead and run that. And this is much more readable and much more a good syntax compared to those uh, C out. So there we go, we get a 400. And since uh, the C out is actually quite uh, nicely written and quite well overridden, you can go ahead and add more stuff as well. For example, if I declare a string data type and call it as name, and then I can simply add a value here and then I can again use more friendly version here, which is console log. And I can simply say name here, and this is gonna dump out the name as well. So whatever you give it to the C out, it, ju it just easily dumps out on the screen. And definitely this code uh, actually sees much more beautiful just because a single line of macro was defined. But yes, this brings us to the point that yes, macros are being overused by beginners. I did that mistake, I don't want you to do that. Uh, it's it's an urge that everybody wants to use too much of the macros, your program look absolutely clean after using that. But sometimes too much over usage of macros is not really recommended. And one of the reason is that your macros actually are never stored in the same file or the main file. Usually your entire macros are into completely different file. So if somebody else is reading your code, here's gonna see what this console log is. Are we even writing, are we even integrating JavaScript in this or maybe something else? Uh, then he had to go into those programs and see that, ah, this is a macro being defined here and that's what we are using. So it sometimes creates unnecessary confusion, unnecessary waste of time, because it's not that you are only gonna be working on your project, there is a team involved, and this is a team confusion. And then sometimes you even might get called from your team lead that, why are you even doing this? This is not a good practice, you should stop doing it. At this point, here in line number 15, I would say, yes, that's a very, very good code practice, but at line number 18, no, I wouldn't suggest doing that, you might get a bit of a talk, so don't do that. So there we go, this is your brief introduction about macros, definitely this is not a complete guide, there is a lot more hash if and if ends and a whole bunch of other things about macros, but I'm gonna just rest this discussion right here, you got enough knowledge that you, can, you are not totally fresher into that, and that's where we are gonna end this video. Let's catch up in the next video.
everything and in fact majority of the thing that we see in programming are derived from something more mathematical or from real life. But since there was so much of the monotonous while reading them in the universities that we forgot the even actual actual goal of doing all these things. Bringing things from real life and mathematics means people will be able to understand them nicely but opposite of that happened. Whenever I talk about classes and object, people don't think about classes and object from real world. They just think like class is a blueprint. Anyways, we're going to talk about these classes and everything later on. Right now, I want to talk about variadic. Now, variadic is not a very programming specific thing. It is a very mathematical thing. Variadic means a function which can accept an infinity amount of arguments. And that's why it brings variadic into programming as well. A lot of programming are now supporting a variadic method. And to be honest, we have already seen variadic in the past. The variadic operator is actually the triple dots. And if you'll focus a little bit, you are going to realize that we have seen these triple dots while we were learning about try catch block. And that was an example of variadic. I didn't introduce you directly there because it might get a bit of confusion, but right now we can talk about variadic directly. Now, I will not just talk about variadics because it is pretty simple that you can put up a three dots and accept any input. We can just go ahead and add a few values there. No problem in that. But I would like to bring up more things so that you can have more open-minded discussion. We have seen about templating, not much, but a little bit. We have also seen about recursion as well. And now we're going to see about variadic as well. Now, in the, fun in the recursion topic, usually people think that recursion means everything is going to happen inside the function. But no, you need to open up your mind. Only thing that's matter is keep on calling it and there should be an exit strategy. So let me show you that how we're going to do the things and uh, what's the goal. The goal is really simple. I want to simply have a function. And let's first define a string as well because we're going to use that. And make sure you have this string library included because now onwards I'm going to be using string a lot. So I'm going to be calling this as simply uh, my name. And there we go. We are going to be inserting my name here. There we go. Nice and easy. So now I want to create a simple function. I'm going to call this one as simply func. And whenever I call this function, I should be able to provide any values, probably one, two. Then I also want to provide a decimal values, 3.4 maybe 4.5 and I should also be able to provide these uh, strings as well like my name and it should be able to print out all these things. Now in order to design this it's not really compulsory that you are going to be always passing on these things or in the same order. You can pass on one here as well. So we want to define a function which is more flexible and can take any amount of input and can display them out. So we're going to be using recursion for that. And definitely since the numbers that are coming up or the string are coming up are in different format. So this is a great point where we can use our templating. We are not dependent on integers or booleans or string. We just want to create a generic type of data type which can accept and be converted into any of that. So let me show you how this is going to be done. First and foremost, let's get uh, started with the template. So I'm going to say I want to use a template. And in the template, I will be defining a data type here. So let's call this one as type name. And in the type name, I'm going to say this is going to be called as T. There we go. That's it. There we go. Nice and easy. Just below this template, we want to create a simple function. We're going to call this one as func. And this func will accept a data type of T. And we're going to call this one as small t, a, b, y, whatever you want to call that. This is just a data type and smaller t is just a variable name. And after that, I'm going to say that cout is completely capable of handling that and will be handling and displaying the small t and will have an end l. There we go. Nice and easy. Now, surely this program can work nicely, but the only problem is the error that we are getting, which is no matching function for call. Because if I come up here and say this is a function and then I want to display my name, I can go ahead and say my name and it's going to work absolutely fine if I comment this out. This can, this is perfectly capable of displaying my name if I put a semicolon after that. So it's completely capable of displaying my name. And even if I say one, this can completely display my name as well or one as well. The only thing that we have to do next is to use these variadic so that we can have variable number of inputs here. Let's go ahead and overwrite this function so that it can take multiple inputs as well. So we're going to go ahead and say, hey, I want to define another template. And this time 
I'll have another type name. We are going to call this one as T. So this is one. You can define as many type name as you wish. And this one is called as T. You can call another one as Y or whatever you like. But this time I'm going to say that this time I'm saying that this type name is going to be variadic. And if you want to make anything variadic, just use triple dots. And now it's a variadic. Now you can call this one as A, B, C, or maybe called as args. Args is most commonly used because there are multiple arguments coming up. So that's why you're going to see this variable name quite common, but not compulsory. Feel free to just call it as simply A as well. Now we can go ahead and define this one here and use this one. So I'm going to simply say, hey, I'm using this func again. I can overwrite that. And this time it's going to say that, hey, I'm going to be taking multiple inputs. So the first data type will be calling this one as T again. No big deal in that. We can do it. And another data type that we have is args. For the variadic, you have to mention that this is going to be taking up multiple inputs. So whatever you call it, you have to use these triple dots there. And we're going to call them as args. So this is my data type. To make it multiple, use triple dots. And you can call this anything, uh, args, Hitesh, LCO, whatever you like. Now let's go ahead and put up a definition of this. Now in this, what we're going to do is, first and foremost, I'm going to go ahead and use a C out to display this T. And there we go. We are going to put up an endl as well. Let's go ahead and do this. There we go. Nice and easy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to again call the same function this time. But this time I'm not going to be passing on the single argument, which is t, but rather I'm going to be calling up these args with these triple dot. Now what's internally going to happen every single time this argument or the list of argument is being passed on, the first value is going to be considered as this here, t, and rest of all the values will be stored into the list of arguments. So every time you keep on passing on one, the one is getting printed and rest will be considered as a list of argument. The second time, the two is going to be considered as here two, as the t, and it will get printed and rest of all the things three to here will be passed on here. Now we are using a recursion here. You didn't realize it, but yes, there is a recursion. So eventually, every argument that we are passing is getting consumed. First one get consumed, then two, then 3.4 gets consumed, then uh, 4.5 get consumed. And finally, when there is just one argument being left, there is no list there, then automatically the C++ compiler will not call this one because for just one argument, we have already defined this. So this is an exit strategy here that for one, only one argument when you're passing it, I'm always going to use this. And for this one here, we are just using it. So this is just a bit complicated, but this is another version of the recursion that you have seen. As I said to you in the earlier, in the very start of the series, please be open-minded because the thing that you're going to see in the C++ are completely different. And this is another example of variadic as well as recursion as well. Now I can go ahead and uncomment this and can run it. And you're going to notice a very, very subtle difference here that if I go ahead and print them up, now first time the one gets printed. Now this one is actually from this function here at line number 31. And after that, all these which are getting printed out, till here are actually being printed out by this second method. And finally, this is getting printed here. So let's go ahead and give it a try as well. Yep, of course. So let's go ahead and say, I'm going to call this one as uh, one func. And we'll definitely use this guy here. And this one will also have a little bit of the messages. We are going to say two func and definitely we'll use these guys. So let's go ahead and run it one more time to understand that how things are going on. So notice here that we used a one func and definitely we could use a little bit of spacing here so that things become much more easy and readable. So we see that first method here at line number 31, the one func is being invoked and is being used. Now after that, in here, we are using every single time the two funks. So for one, for two, for 3.4, for 4.5. But after, as soon as we use this string here, now things are different. Now we are seeing this uh, one func again, and which is displaying this, which is really bad because I didn't put up any spaces. There we go, nice and easy. 
So now you understand that how actually program works and how they are working. And this is a classic example of using recursion, variadic functions. And we learned a little bit more about templating. Told you, templating is just overhyped. It's super easy to understand, nothing wrong. And at least with me, most topics are really easy to understand. So that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hatesh here and welcome to the new section of Object Oriented Programming. Whenever I discuss this subject, object-oriented programming, it brings to my notice and attention that a lot of time, these terms, even object-oriented programming and many other, were introduced in programming so that people can refer things not with a programming perspective but from a real-world perspective and it's much more easier for them to write code. But just opposite of that happened. I, I'm not here to blame anybody that who actually created this scenario, but let's forget about that. But the whole idea with these concept is to make sure that you understand how things happen in the real life scenario and brings it up here. But instead, many of us actually start going after the definitions of these things like classes and object and what is abstraction just to write in our exam paper and get marks out of it. Not really true, not a great idea. In fact, all these terms that I have written here and probably more are actually so much easier to understand if you think up about them from a real world perspective. For example, I'll definitely cover more about all of them, but let's just say abstraction. Now, if you just forget about going after the definition, abstraction is something which we have been doing from the very first video of, of this entire course. For example, if I come back onto these, uh, the example that we discussed in the last video, here you're running just a function without caring about how this function is working. This is definitely an, an abstraction. And yes, of course, you can argue here that no, I do care about it. I have written this code here. But let me bring you the point. The moment I said that a macro was defined and which says end program, we were not writing this return zero. A layer of abstraction we inserted here so that you don't care much about it. And yes, of course, you can argue that I have written that macro. How is that an abstraction? Another e example I can give you. Notice about the C out, how easy it is to just use a C out and display anything, probably a string, any variable, any double, integer. You didn't wrote that. You didn't care about it. You were just writing it. A layer of abstraction was introduced so that your life become easier. We write so much of the code so that an end user's life become much more easier. He is able to order Uber just within click. A layer of abstraction, which is definitely necessary for the user. User doesn't need to see this much of code. And abstraction is something similar to that. And it's being used every single place. The details which you shouldn't know, you don't know about them, you don't really worry about them. And that's basically your abstraction. Surely we can have more discussion and in-depth talk about these discussion on uh, abstraction, inheritance, polymorphism, classes and object. But to give you more idea about what I really want to implicate here is make sure you always think very simply and not very complicatedly so that you understand this whole way of writing the syntax of the code as well as understanding how we can perfectly use this object-oriented programming and not get too much in depth. I would like to start this entire section by giving you some of the theoretical discussion about classes and object and then we'll move on to the next video where we'll actually write some of the code here. So moving on to this, I won't be giving you this example onto my presentation, but rather I would like to bring you on to my another software, which is a design software. You don't need to learn it, you just need to watch it. So let's just say I have three screens here, which are considerably not really very accurate uh, depiction of that, but they are an iPhone screen and you decided that I want to place a button on these three screen. You have two options, you can go ahead and design three buttons, but to maintain the consistency, what designers usually like to do is they simply go ahead and simply create a button, which is going to have a very specific color, probably red or something on the borders, and in the fill also will put up some more colors like uh, a shiny red or whatever the color you're looking up for. Now we can go ahead and put up a text inside that, and I'm gonna say just simply like click me, and you have also decided that I'm gonna be putting up some things onto it, maybe 200 of the spacing. I know it's not looking good, but let's just say you have this. And so the medium, you decided that this is gonna be a little bit more on the bold side. This is my ideal button that I would like to have. Now we can go ahead and make this a button and I, I can add this into my component list. You don't need to worry about what is this component list. But this actually saves a lot of time for me. Now I can go ahead and drag this button up here. And 
I can place it wherever I like. I can drag it up again here and I can place it up here. And this just single design can be used, you get the idea, the single design can be used at as many places as I like. But later on you decided, you know what, this is not really looking great and I want to change a few things in here. Probably you want to shrink it a bit. You can go ahead and shrink it and this impact is being placed on every single place. You can go ahead and do that. Now we can go ahead and even change the color of them if you would like. You can go ahead and do that even in the borders and all of that. Now what's more interesting here is I can go ahead and say instead of the click me, I can go ahead and say clicked and I can just go ahead and do that. Although they are being designed from the same uh, prototype, but still they are completely different, completely changeable and are in itself a separate unit which can have its own value. The base is really same. Anybody can tell that yes, these three buttons looks almost exactly same, but they are able to store their own data, which is click me or clicked. And this is the whole concept behind classes and object. You create a blueprint or kind of a base from which all of your objects are gonna be inspired from or heavily based on. And then you can just create as many objects as you like. And definitely all of these objects are separate entities in itself. You can place whatever the data you like to have. This one is uh, click me. This one is gonna be uh, probably gonna be a uh, logged uh, login, something like that. You can go ahead and do all of these changes. Still, they are based on same things. So moving back, as I told you, that yes, class as an object is not something very uh, tough and difficult topic. They are super easy to understand. If you understand this example, this is exactly the same thing that we'll be doing in the code. We'll be creating a blueprint, we'll call it as a class, and all the objects that are being derived from this class will be called as an object. And we can place our separate data, uh, separate values into it, can put up methods and functions and a whole bunch of other things. So there we go, we have started a topic which is absolutely fun to learn and understand. But as I said, be open-minded and don't think too much. They are super easy concept to understand if you think them with a light head. So go ahead and do that. In the next video, we'll learn more about the syntactical sugars and things which are there for us while creating the classes. A lot of in-depth discussion which you are going to 100% enjoy them. And I'm pretty sure you're going to have fun in this section too. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video and in this video, we're gonna get started with object-oriented programming, actually writing code for a whole lot of concepts, classes, objects, data members, constructors, and a whole bunch of other things. Now just a couple of things you need to keep in mind. First and foremost, so far whenever we have written the code, we have used this boilerplate code which was almost empty and we have always started from here. Also, I've given you all these exercise files as well. Now from this video onwards, I will be writing in a continuous file. So whatever I will write in this video, I will continue from the exact place in the next video as well. The reason for that is that if I've written a class here in this video, I want to continue there and want to explain more concept on top of that. And every time writing again and again, same things is not really beneficial for any one of us. So just keep that in mind. And of course, everything will be attached in the attachment of the exercise files as well. If you're watching it on my personal website, if you're watching it anywhere else, I don't know where you are watching. So let me know where you are watching this course. It's going to go on a lot of places and on the private platforms as well. So let's get started with that. So let's see how we're going to do that. And of course, one more thing. I will be writing classes in the same file as our main.cpp. Now in majority and in, in fact, almost all the cases, in fact, when I make the courses like MERN or full stack or something, this is not a practice that is being followed. You don't keep your classes in the same file where your main execution happens. You usually keep them on a separate file and that's where the things actually reside. So just assume that you have cut down that classes and placed that in some other file with .cpp like uh, user.cpp or something else like that. But for the teaching purposes, I always like to keep them in the same file just get an assumption that these codes are being cut down. We have created a new file, user.cpp, and we have pasted there and we have uh, now bringing this file there. So just assume that. Okay. Now let's get started and talk about the concept of creating the classes. As we have seen, we need to create a blueprint or almost like a template and not exactly template, but almost a structure on which we are going to base our object. Now creating the class is really simple. All you have to do is simply create a class and give it a name. Usually the name of the class is the first capital letter and that's how you create your class. 
Now, of course, this is an empty class, which is of no use. Make sure you put a semicolon there as well. And this is the standard. Again, it is not compulsory that you have to keep up this first letter as capital. You can go for smaller as well, but not a good idea. It's a good practice to keep this letter as uppercase letter. How do we create object? First and foremost, bring the class that you want to use into your thing. Like here, we are bringing up the string uh, library or string file here. Similarly, we can bring the user file as well. And in order to create the object, there are a couple of ways. Remember the memory video where we talked about heap and stack? Almost that syntax can be followed up. So for example, I can create a user and this is gonna be called as Sam. Now it's almost similar to something like I'm creating an integer object and calling it as uh, Sammy, something like that. So it's almost a similar structure. Always keep that in mind. Okay, I'm gonna remove this one here as of now. Now an empty class, again, is of no use. So we need to put up some of the data inside this class. First and foremost, I'm gonna create here int and that's gonna be secret. And secret is gonna have some value. Let's just say 22 and we're gonna talk about the secret value later on. Now, this class is gonna have a keyword here that's gonna be public. And we're gonna put up a colon there and hit enter after that. Now in here, I would like to give it this class a name here, which is initially gonna have a value, uh, simply default here. So I'm gonna say default. You definitely can place an, a simple name here with no value at all, that's also perfectly valid, but I'm just for this example giving it a default value here. Now I'm also creating a, a function here, but in, since I'm creating it inside the class, it is known as method, but one or the same, they are exactly same. So I'm gonna simply say void, and I'm gonna call this as class uh, message. Again, feel free to name it whatever you like. And I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is gonna simply say C out, and we are gonna say a message that say class is great, put a comma, a space, and then we are gonna say name using that variable, getting an end line, and there we go. That's all it is. Now usually, if the things are that much small, I really don't like to put up this much of the empty spaces here. So I usually like to shrink it down like this, and even this. So there we go, it's just a one liner of code. So let's go ahead and save this. Now, as many objects as you can create from this user class, like Sam, you can create another object as well. So I'm gonna create another one here, which is gonna be said as a page. there we go. And now, you're gonna notice that Sam can actually access a whole lot of things. Now definitely, we will discuss in later on videos that why this secret is not accessible, why there is a cross being marked. Again, it might not be there in your IDE, but the whole idea is you cannot use secret right now. So I'm gonna say simply sam.name and we are gonna say that your name value is gonna be now Sam because until unless you overwrite that value, the value is gonna be default. Let's go ahead and say Sam dot and we are gonna now print the name here, which is gonna be class message. Now, only this much and of course semicolons, let's not forget that. We're gonna run this program here and you're gonna notice that class is great, Sam. So value is getting great. What about if I just go ahead and say Hitesh dot class message? Now in this case, you're gonna notice that since we haven't overridden the value default, that value is still there. So this proves the point that yes, this is a completely separate object and this is a complete separate object, both being created from the same class yet totally independent. Now I can go ahead and say that now your value is gonna be updated. So let's go ahead and say that my name is gonna be uh, Hitesh which it is, and we are gonna go ahead and now again use this, which is gonna be class message, there we go. Now we're gonna see that previously the message name was default, but after that we updated it to my name and there we go, nice and easy. Okay, so there's a whole lot going on in here. Uh, make sure you understand that, but if you want anybody to access these information, you have to keep it after the public. The default status of the class is actually private, so nobody can access this secret. And even if I try that, it's gonna give me an error. I'm gonna say that I want to access the secret and I want to update the value at 22 to like that, and it's gonna compile and will give me an error that secret is a private member of the user. And private, consider this almost like a restaurant. In the restaurant, you can access tables and a whole lot of things, but this is almost like a kitchen of restaurant and you don't have access to kitchens of restaurant. But it's not like you cannot go in there. 
Surely there's a different syntax. You have to put up a request and then you can go ahead and get that. We're gonna talk more about it. I hope you have grabbed it. So as a simple assignment, I would like to give you a simple, just create a user from this uh, user class by your name, assign it your name and print a message, class message. And please post that a screenshot to my Instagram or a story or somewhere else, reach me out. And in the next video, we're gonna talk more about these uh, variables that we have declared in the class, also known as data members. Let's go ahead and catch up in next video. Hey there everyone, this here and welcome to the video. And in this video, we're gonna talk more about how the getters and setters works after having a brief discussion over the classes. So as we have seen here that classes are not really very something alien, it's a pretty easy syntax to work on with. We can see there is a keyword class involved, a first uppercase letter to define user, and then we have some of the data members. Now variables or arrays or whatever you're defining inside the class, you can use any data type here. They are generally in terms are called as data members. And then we have this public keyword. And you might have noticed that whatever you're writing inside this public keyword is actually accessible by these objects. And in fact, if I just come up with any of the variable or the methods that I'm defining inside the class are actually easily accessible here. So that's nice. But why these are not being accessible, like you, you might have tried, I'm pretty sure you have done it. When I say sam.secret, it actually gives me an error that this is not accessible. You cannot actually do that. It's a private member. Now the default for the classes is that whenever you define anything inside the class, this keyword is automatically there. There are two types of things majorly, there are more as well. But in the C++, we have these private members as well as public members. Public members are accessible for everyone. You can access it wherever you like by any objects, but private members can only be accessed by the classes. And there's a strong reason for that. Sometimes classes want to have their own privacy and as well as own security. And for those reasons, some of the members obviously are gonna be private. So why don't we put this private keyword? Because it's a default keyword. You don't need to put it actually. So that's why usually you are never gonna see that. But in this, this is actually happening behind the scene. And obviously, as very initial level video, you might have noticed me talking about uh, some of the good practices as well. I'll come back on to good practices in a minute. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and see that obviously this variable is here. Somehow I would like to just change the value of this particular variable. Now, since security is involved in this, what usually do or what usually programmers like to do is they like to create their own special methods which can actually access these values and which can actually change something in this value. So by these methods, there can be more further checking can be done that whether the data that's coming up is actually all polished and exactly the data that we are expecting. So due to these reasons, these methods are created. What we are seeing here is purely the syntactic sugar or the syntactical thing that we are having here. We are not putting up any special security check here, but I'll show you that how we can do that. Pretty simple stuff to do. So first and foremost about the getters and setters, and you get it right, getter, get the value, setter, set the value. So first let's define a setter because that's the easy one. Setter always usually consists the word of set here, and similarly getter always expects the word get here. Again, uh, it's not really compulsory to put the word set and get behind these functions or methods. It just is a common practice and a good practice to follow. So I'll say that this is a method which is going to set the secret. So I'm going to call it as set secret and defining it. Yes, this is a setter. In here, I will expect that somebody is going to pass me a value. So I'm going to just accept the value and to properly actually change it, I will accept it here. So I'm going to call this one as uh, a simple reference to this a new secret. There we go. So nice and easy. I would like to put up a space there as well. There we go. So we have gone through this and pretty nice and easy. Surely there is a small syntax here, uh, which I haven't mentioned it yet. I'll come back on that as well in a second. And now what we're going to do is whatever your secret is, is going to be set up with this new secret that is being provided to me. Now this is definitely very, very simplistic thing and it doesn't even make sense. But in the real life scenario, what you're gonna see is something like this. Before that, there is usually a conditional check and if the condition meets successfully, then only, uh, not memset, it, if the condition actually meet, then we go ahead and use this secret is gonna be equal to new secret. Otherwise, we simply go ahead and write an else block where we send a user message. Uh, send a user message that says, hey, this data is not allowed to be set in the secret. So this is usually being done, but I'm gonna just remove it now because you understood the concept now. 
remove that and of course remove that there we go we're gonna move this on all on the same line nice and easy and there we go looks all great now okay so can we now access or set any value to this secret let's go ahead and give it a try i'm gonna save this and now let's just say that sam has an access to this set secret and now i can provide any value here probably i want to provide a value of 333 let's go ahead and do that now can i do that uh, let's go ahead and here now here's the problem that we have accidentally got into it but this is going to teach us a little bit more now notice here it says non-constant l value reference to type int cannot be bind to temporary type of int what it's basically saying that you are passing on this integer here but i'm taking a reference here and the some of the older compiler this might even compile but this is a definitely a dangerous potential that this code might break anytime now my compiler is giving me error probably yours might not give so in such cases where you are taking a reference and another uh kind of a setback is being done not setback but actually a protection layer is added by having this as a simple const now i'm making this reference now a particularly as a particular mole stable so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to run this program now and you're going to notice uh, it's build failed because we might have missed something here where we are missing we are actually missing a curly braces of this user so let's go ahead and do that there we go and needs a colon there we go Okay, now let's go ahead and try to build that and you're going to see the build is succeed this time. So the problem was really simple that we need to add a protection layer which some of the modern compiler actually keeps it as a good basis and it's good for us. Okay, moving further. So now we are able to set this value to new value but how can I verify that because I still cannot access this value, I can set it. Now for, uh, for getting the value we have to provide a getter as well. Getter usually has a data type almost always because you need to access it and then we are going to simply say get secret and get secret the only thing that it's going to do is just return the value so we're going to simply go ahead and why are you and we are going to put it like that and we're going to say that hey i want to return a value which is a secret there we go again in this case this is really really very very small example because we have returned it directly in usual cases, you really don't want to return the exact secret directly. Maybe you want to add something to it. Maybe you want to add a message, add some value, strip off some of the values. But again, this is a really basic boil down example. Now here, what we can do is I can simply go ahead and say C out and I'm going to say Sam dot get secret. So whatever the secret value is, give me that. And I'm going to put up an end L and you're going to notice that instead of the value 22, now it's a 333. Let's go ahead and run this one. And we're going to see that the value is 333 this time. Great. So far, we have understood everything about the getter and setter. Now, let me quickly summarize that. A setter actually sets the value into any of the private data member. For the public data member, it doesn't make sense. In the set secret, we here we have used absolutely basic that whatever the value is given to us, we are just directly passing this value. Usually in the big scale programs, you're going to see some of the security checks and some of the filtration being done before setting this value into here. Get secret usually is much more simpler compared to the set secret because no such intensive and exhaustive checks are being done. Here we simply go ahead and set the value or return the value to the user. In this case, we have done it directly, but let's just say this is a big object uh, which returns some of the value from the databases in that you might want to return that uh, in this big object, there might be many values like username, email, password, creation date. So you obviously might want to strip off the password from that and return the rest of the values to the user. Just a side example. Okay, a couple of other things as well. We haven't talked much on to that, but we'll be doing that later on. So one of the good practices that you can do and can apply here, since we know that this is a private data member, but since I declared it as directly a secret, it's not really working out great for you. So you're going to notice that in such cases, usually these variables actually start from an initial underscore. We discussed that in the very first start of uh, this entire series that usually private members are uh, underscore and the system are double underscore. So in this case, it really makes sense if you put as initial underscore over the secret. And of course, we have to put up these underscores every single place where we are actually accessing that. So this is again a side good practice, just like we have this constant. Now, as of now, the compilers are not giving error for this small because this is just a syntactical sugar own good practices, but I recommend you to do so. So I hope you have enjoyed this one here as well about the getters and setters. 
and let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, we're gonna see more modularity that is being introduced in the classes. As well as, I'm gonna show you some of the trickeries with the constant objects. And yes, you can, just like we can ordinarily declare any object from the class, we can also declare some of the constant objects from the class, which are really troublesome for the beginners in order to understand them properly. So I'm gonna explain them in a very easier manner. First and foremost, let's go ahead and talk about a few stuff which are very important for you to know and understand. You're going to see that some of the examples are, or some of the actual uh, GitHub codes, you're going to notice that they are classes, but they don't have any of the methods. Yes, they do have their uh, private and public, uh, these uh, data members, technically that would be a perfect name, but I'm going to call them as variables so that you can loosely understand it. So there are a lot of variables being declared inside the classes. And if any class consists only of the variables, it's a good practice that you convert this class into the struct. And struct and classes are very close in uh, C++. I'm gonna discuss that in a separate video, very small, but it needs a separate dedicated video on its own. But struct is not really a good thing if you want to have these methods inside it. Right now it's not complaining, but it's not really a good thing. So if you have some of the methods or functions inside the class, uh, then it's a good idea not to use struct, but rather classes. Okay, moving forward, uh, you're going to also notice that one of the video I said that this class is actually kept into its own separate file so that multiple team can work on it. You are going to also notice that even these methods are kept into its own separate file. So how that is achieved, let me show you that. So let's just say this class message is a great example of putting up into a separate file. Assume that this is probably a 50 lines of code. Then what you do is simply cut out the definition of the method or what's the working of this method. Put a semicolon here. Now your class is actually moreover a basic guideline which says that there should be a method which is a class message, it should be a void type and we are not accepting any parameters here. So this is the basic guideline. And later on in some another file you can actually put up this same thing here that I'm gonna have a void which is gonna have a class message. Class message goes like this and there we go. Let's make it a bit more onto separate line so that it looks like moreover a function. So there we go. But the problem is right now that this class message in its is a standalone message and anything which is defined inside the class can only be accessed by the class object. Here we can see the Sam is able to access that, Hitesh is able to access that. But this is just a regular something which is outside of the class, not even a class object. How it can access the name here, which is a variable defined inside a class. So in order to do so, we have to modify a bit of syntax and make sure that this method known that you are not a standalone, you are a part of a class. In order to do so, you first come up here just after the void or whatever the data type you are having and you mark your class name here and after that you put these scope resolution operator. As soon as you do this, this means that now this is not a standalone method but rather a part of this. It just is that we like to keep the definition somewhere else and that's why we have broken it out and placed it up here. This makes your code much more modular. Again, uh, I'm expecting that you have you are pretty visual and you are able to assume that yes, this is in, in its own some separate file and this entire thing is on its own separate file and then our main method is really cute and very small one here. So there we go. Okay, so pretty nice and easy and similar to this, you can actually grab this one and move it to on separate file. I won't be doing it because we need to learn more from this file, so I won't be breaking it down. I'll just keep this guy separately here so that you understand it. Moving forward, there is one more topic which confuses a lot of beginner in the initial days and which is goes something like this. So, so far we have been creating an object and these are just variable objects. Not explicitly we have mentioned, but they are just regular objects. You're going to notice that just like we declare uh, another user rock, you're going to notice that some people like to put a const there as well. And it's a very common practice to have constant objects. And it doesn't really bother your compiler or anybody as of now, but this is a valid syntax, you can do it. But the problem actually starts when you try to access some of these members. Let me show you that. Any members you're gonna to try to access, this is gonna give you problems. So for example, I want to get the secret, and as soon as I say uh, get secret, you're gonna notice no suggestion there. As soon as I put this, even compiler is gonna complain me that, hey, uh, there is something wrong here. There is something issue that you are trying to create here. 
Now, uh, let's go ahead and first do a C out so that we can see some of the problems as well. So this is gonna get the, uh, my bad, forgot to put these guys. Again, doesn't really matter. It's gonna still give us an error and we're gonna have end line. There we go, nice and easy. So how can I make sure that my, this rock is able to get access to this get secret? Because it's a common practice to declare constant objects and also I don't want to break the code here as well. So in such cases, it's not like you can convert any of the method into a constant qualified object or constant qualified method which can be accessed by constant qualified uh, object here. So it's, it's a confusion, yes I know. So what we want to do is we want to create a method which can be called by these constant objects. In order to do so, the only thing right now we can do here is, is just mark a const here and that's it. It's gonna solve the issue. So we can see now rock is able to access the get secret and if I run that even, you're gonna notice that the default value is being accessed here, 22, not the big point here. Anyways, my before code is not being broken because non-constant object can access constant methods, but constant method cannot access non-constant methods, just like here in the set secret. So here's the rule or just a simple guideline I can walk you through that you can definitely make anything as a const qualified method, but you shouldn't do that everywhere. Here we can do that because it's not doing anything, it's just returning a value. So such objects you're gonna see usually are marked as a constant and it's a very common thing. Now the problem starts with the beginner when they have to rewrite this in somewhere else. Because what you're gonna see is uh, something like this. So let me show you that. We're gonna cut this out and we're gonna mark this like that. So when something is written like this, it becomes really, really confusing for the beginners that what on the God's green earth is this even? Why is there a const, an int, and all of that? And how should I rewrite it? So what they do usually is they come up like this. They say int, that's my method, which is get a secret. And we are gonna go like this. And then I'll just put up the definition here. Now, if you're gonna do this, this is gonna be problematic. This is error because as I told you, the, the name of the method is not just the name here, which is a class message. It is comprised of a lot of things and which includes what is the data type you're gonna return, what are the parameters you are accepting, and even if there is a const or any keyword marked after that, that also needs to go there. So this needs to go there const, and of course we have to do the usual stuff, that this is a part of user class, and we have to put a scope resolution operator here as well. So this is gonna just make everything uh, perfectly fine and everybody is super happy. So again, yes, there are some security steps being put up so that we don't mess around with our own code. And it's a very, very common scenario to mark these as constant and move them after that into their separate own file. So there we go. As you can see, as I told you that we'll be working on the same file because we can do a lot in here. So in the next video, we're gonna be moving more into the same uh, class here. We'll make it a bit more onto a professional level code so that you can understand other people code quite nice and easily. That's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. You won't believe this, but this happens in almost every course. I provide some of the resources which I ask students to, hey, go ahead and please read this line by line. It probably is gonna take a little bit longer to you to understand this, but please go ahead and read this. And eventually somebody comes up in the comment section and says, hey, I'm not able to understand it, please make a video on it. The reason why I didn't make a video on this because I want you to understand it on your own. This is kind of an assignment. And here is some assignment almost similar to that. In this video, we're gonna discuss about constructors, destructors, bit about copy constructor, and that brings to the topic of the rule of three. You're gonna also see the rule of three, the rule of five, and a couple of other rules in the C++. They are not something which is gonna give you an error. These are the best practices which are being uh, given to us over the year of time. So there is one which is known as rule of three. As you can see, it was us nine years and five months ago, and it is active uh, one years and four months ago, viewed insane times. So yes, this is a common practice which is still being followed. And I don't think there is any other resource or even Medium article or anything that explains it so nicely as it's being done uh, on this particular resource. Stack Overflow definitely is not a blog, but sometimes people give such a thorough answer that I don't think so anybody can compete <laughs> anything after that. 
So in the rule of three there, we have a bit of summary. You're gonna understand that after this video, but just to give you, here's a small summary here, that either if you have to declare the destructor, copy constructor, uh, and operator as well, you probably should declare all three of them and Therefore, similarly, we have a rule of five as well. It's not really compulsory to do, but still I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and we'll paste it up in the top lines of the comments so that you can have a link of it and can read it on your own free time. Now moving forward, first and foremost, what is a constructor? Now constructor is a method which is called as soon as you create an object. So in the moment I said user Sam here, a constructor was called automatically. So what does this constructor do? It doesn't do much, it just reserves memory for you. And you might be asking, I haven't actually declared any constructor or any method like that. Now in C++, if you don't declare a constructor, an implicit constructor is being called for you. This is automatically there uh, by the C++, kind of behind the scene. And constructor are of many types in C++, the implicit constructors, you can define them called as explicit constructor, they're copy constructor, they are operator constructors, and a whole bunch of others as well. But we're gonna keep things simple. First, I want to show you something, and then we're gonna understand a whole everything from the scratch, absolutely basic. Now let's just say I define a simple user here, and this user is gonna be called as Peter, Peter Parker from Spider-Man. And instead of just declaring the Peter, I would say this object is gonna be equal to Sam. Now what happened behind the scene that every property which was available in the Sam, including its name and whatever the secret overwrite, now is being copied into the Peter. And this is a very common thing. Just like you copy a value from another variable into another variable, similar things can be done automatically for you. Now, if I go ahead and try to access anything, let's just say uh, this Peter object, uh, try to access the set secret, not set secret, I want to get secret this time. We're gonna get a get secret and we are gonna just print it out. So let's just go ahead and do an end L and I run this program and you're gonna notice still we get the exact same thing which was given by the Sam as well. So every property is being copied in here and I didn't explicitly say that copy name, copy secret and copy all of that. All the properties which were there in the Sam copied into the new object which is Peter. Now behind the scene, a copy constructor was invoked and this copy constructor is responsible for copying all the properties, regardless how many you define, it just copies all of them for you. Can I overwrite these constructors? Yes, of course you can. In fact, we will be doing this in this video. Video is gonna be a bit longer, but it is important for us to understand these constructor, destructors, copy constructors, and bunch of others as well in just one video. Let's go ahead and do that. For that, first and foremost, we're gonna just remove everything from the main. Yes, we are scratching the code again. So remove this and we are gonna be removing the stuff of the entire classes as well. I'll keep this string as well because I'm gonna need that uh, a after a few minutes. Okay, moving further, we're gonna be creating a fresh class here. So go ahead, it's a good idea to write along with me. So let's go ahead and declare a class. We're gonna call this one as simply phone because a lot of phones are being designed these days. Now in this, we are gonna have a string. Make sure you have included the string here, otherwise we won't be able to use it. So string, so we're gonna have this name. Again, we are following good practices by using underscore. The default value of the name of the phone is gonna be just a string name, empty string. It, the phone is also going to have an OS, usually which is iOS or Android or skinned Android, which most people actually use. And we are also going to have a prize as well, which is gonna be integer in this case, but some people like to keep the prize even in the string as well. Again, side note. Now, once we have declared all of the private data members of our class, now comes the interesting part. We're gonna now declare a few of the public stuff in this class. So put public like that. Now, the usual syntax of the class is that how do we define a constructor? A constructor is a special method in the class which is exactly same as the name of the class. If your class name is user, it's gonna be named as user. If it is named as phone, it's gonna be named as phone. It doesn't have any data type. You can notice here we are not returning anything. Even if we are returning, usually we don't return. And in fact, it's not really makes sense. We don't return anything from it. So it doesn't even say void. Uh, parameters, we can talk about it later on, just, if, uh, just a second after that. But this is basically your uh, constructor here, default constructor. There are a couple of varieties of constructor as well, but right now this is all good. 
I'm going to mark this as default const come on default constructor there we go there are other type of constructor as well that you can define that means I can just again and remember we were totally allowed to have uh, multiple methods with the same name this is almost exactly like that so in this constructor user will be passing us some of the information as soon as they create the object of it so we're going to say that you will be passing me a string which will be not like that which will be name you will also be passing me a string which is going to be the os and you will also be passing me an integer which is going to be the reference of the price so there we go this is also a constructor but this is not a default constructor actually this is a bit different uh, i would like to call this one as a parameter constructor although there is no specific name for this i'm going to call this as parameter constructor simply saying and this constructor actually go ahead i'm going to close this one as well there we go more screen space so what's happening here is this is a basic constructor the default one and this is the constructor where you have to pass on us some of the parameter. No specific name, but I'm calling it as parameter. Apart from that, we can also override the copy property. Remember, in the previous uh, one section, in this video only, we were able to copy all the properties. So if you want to even override that, you can actually do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we have again this constructor phone. And this phone is going to accept the uh, integer or not integer this is going to accept parameter uh, with the exact same properties that the phone is having so phone and we're going to get a reference of it so remember instead of the int or string it is accepting a data type of its own type which is phone and that's how we are able to copy all of these things similar to here we are able to accept string and integers we are accepting a phone type here again this will get much more clear in a second so there we go so we have got this one as well uh, copy constructor i'm going to write that here as well this is copy constructor and we are writing all of them here just because we want to just overwrite them otherwise naming them is doesn't uh, really sensible here okay okay moving forward we are going to have a basic method which is going to be of return type string it's going to say get name and basically it's not going to do much we have already seen that it's going to simply say i want to return uh, os and you can return any one value to prove that yes we are able to modify the copy so this is a regular getter we are not putting up any setters here just getter is fine and apart from that we will also learn about destructor so just like whenever you create an object and a memory is being reserved for your uh, object of the class a memory needs to be freed up as well so just like constructor is being called automatically a destructor is also being called automatically to free up the memory space you don't need to explicitly call it it automatically gets called but we're going to override that as a little bit as well so there we go this is how you write your destructor the only difference is is this tilde sign which is just below your escape key and that's what is a destructor i'm going to write the name here as well which is destructor there we go okay now we have defined the definitions here obviously we need to mark them up here as well so we're going to do them one by one but the problem is if i leave them as it is right now they're going to give error and i'll face them for example if i just create a new phone here and that's going to be samsung not like that samsung and a1 this is the new phone if i try to even build this program right now this is going to say build failed no errors at all the reason for that is you have a lot of definition but this definition doesn't have any of the body so we're going to comment them and we'll uncomment them eventually so let's go ahead and start with the easy one the phone so a new syntax i would like to introduce you first and foremost the class name and then two columns or scope resolution operator then the name which in this case is actually phone of uh, the method name which is phone and what we're going to notice a special syntax here so this syntax goes like this you put up a colon sign after the name of the method and you can provide the default values whatever you want to set now in most cases these are default values but since we are overwriting some of the stuff let's go ahead and do that so we're going to say uh, the name and then we are going to put up a comma and this one is going to be os and then we have the pricing so underscore price and then you can put up these empty parentheses here not here empty parenthesis here and that's all that's all it's going to be and uh, it's going to be all happy with this one here 
notice here all errors are gone i can actually remove this here so this is all pretty much good and happy but this doesn't prove that we have actually overwritten some of the constructors so what we're going to do is i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to say as soon as this default constructor runs i'm going to say puts and i'm going to simply have say a message default constructor there we go and that's it that's all i'm going to say now notice here very closely something very inter interesting happens i'm going to save this and i'm going to run this notice here build succeed it says default constructor so everything goes nicely but this doesn't prove any point that we are able to do anything at all. Now notice here, let's try to have a method here first and foremost, which is going to help us to see things uh, more clearly. And notice here, we have this copy constructor, uh, not copy constructor, we have this getter here, we're gonna uncomment this, which gives me the value of the current OS. Let's try to run this one, an interesting thing you're gonna see in a minute. So Samsung.getName, which actually gets the name, doesn't print it out so let's go ahead and print that so we're gonna say see out like that and we are gonna say get name and end l and there we go looks nice let's go ahead and run this one here and notice right now it says default constructor then there is an empty line the empty line is because the os name by default is empty and using this syntax, you can actually pass on values onto this. So for example, Samsung uses some kind of a skinned version of Android. I'm gonna call this one as ND, and I can run this one again. Now notice here that we were able to get, I'm gonna shrink that a bit here. We were able to see this ND here directly because of this syntax that we can use. Although I haven't passed up anything inside this, this is being overwritten from the default value. So yes, constru these uh, constructors, even the default constructors are powerful. But what more powerful thing is, is this constructor, which is a parametric constructor or parameter constructor. I'm gonna uncomment that. And this time, let's go ahead and define a constructor, which is this one. So for this one, Again, we're gonna follow the same syntax. We're gonna have a phone, scope resolution operator. We're gonna have a phone and that's it. This is being defined. But this time what we're gonna do is a bit different. So while defining this constructor, notice here we said that somebody will pass us this string name, OS and price as well. So first we need to accept that this method or this constructor actually accepts that. So. We're gonna say, and in fact, you can now, uh, instead of wasting much more time, I can copy this because we are accepting this much of the thing. So copy that and paste that. This is all the function definition. Now, interestingly, what, uh, what else you can do here is you can overwrite these uh, values. Let me show you that. So I'm gonna come up here, just like above, we're gonna put up a colon first, and then after the colon, we can provide all these values. For example, the name is gonna get a value from the, from the user provided name. And then put up a comma, and we're gonna say then we are provided with the OS. And the value that's gonna get is the user provided OS. And then provided by the user, the price, and the price we're gonna set up the price. Notice here the difference. The underscore price is something which is defined inside the classes here, here. But this price, is this price which is provided by the user. And we're gonna see that in a second, that how user is actually able to provide that. After that, although the default one is all good and happy, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit an enter here and I will add something, a message here. So I'm gonna say puts and I'm gonna say, this is parameter construct constructor, there we go. Now, previously we have defined a phone with no parameters or no information at all. Now let's define another object, but this time we will use this parameter constructor. Now the declaration of the object is gonna change a little bit. So phone, and let's go for OnePlus here, pretty famous brand these days. OnePlus uh, eight, I'm gonna say, but as soon as you define this one here, now you're gonna use a pair of parentheses as soon as you use this, this means we are using this guy and we need to provide some of the information as well. So let's just go ahead. First, I'm gonna provide that it's a one plus eight. The OS that it's running is definitely Android, definitely a skinned Android, but let's just say. And the final, the price is, I guess, 7.99, uh, pretty good. So there we go. Now, as soon as I do this, I don't set up anything at all. 
when I run this program, because of our custom message, you're gonna notice that this is a parameter constructor. So this time, the first constructor didn't got invoked, but rather a second constructor got invoked, which proves the point. Again, we can actually copy this line and see what's inside the OS of this one. So let's go ahead and instead of Samsung A1, we are gonna use OnePlus 8 and run this one here. And without a doubt, we see the Android as an OS this time. Pretty nice, pretty nice. Okay, now what you're gonna notice that if I create another object here, something like this, I'm gonna say this time a phone, and phone is gonna be a regular one plus eight S this time, but this is gonna bring all the features and properties which is there in the one plus eight. There we go, I didn't did anything at all, but now you're gonna notice that this is totally allowed, and even if I print up this, and I say that this time, you're gonna show me what OS you are running. In the OnePlus 8S, it's gonna be exactly same. And just to differentiate it, I'm gonna say Android, and I guess the skin they used, I'm not pretty sure, uh, it's Oxygen, so I'm gonna call this as Android Oxy. Uh, just, just a side information, so notice here that this time, uh, this OnePlus 8S is also running on Android Oxy. So we were able to copy all the information from OnePlus 8 into the OnePlus 8S. But you don't want to do that. You want to overwrite things on your own. So this time comes up this last guy, which is we want to overwrite even the copy constructor. Let's go ahead and do that. How can we do that? Now, having this copy constructor is actually super easy. Let me show you that. So first and foremost, again, phone scope resolution operator, we're gonna have a phone, and this phone is gonna accept a data type, so const of itself, which is phone, and we are gonna receive some of the value inside it. Okay, what this value is, this value is sort of a package which consists all the information like string, OS, price, or any other data member that you have used. So this package is called as value, or values would be uh, much more easier for you to understand, okay? So once you have received all the values, now what happens is that first and foremost, we're gonna put up a message that says puts, and we're gonna say overwrite copy constructor, there we go. Did I wrote it correct? Not even copy constructor. So the fun part is over. Now let's go ahead and move on. So what we want to do, what copy, what this copy constructor actually does, it takes every single value from one plus eight and moves it to one plus eight S. Okay, point to be noted. So what will go inside this underscore name property, whatever value gives us. So it's going to give us this values dot and then you can access the name. So this is what actually is happening behind the scene. So let me go ahead and say this one here. So underscore OS is gonna be given a value from the values, remember the big package, dot underscore OS. And surely you can overwrite all the rest of the values as well. Let's go ahead and do that for price as well. Why to leave that? And that's gonna be coming up from values dot price as well. Now the interesting thing here is, this is a default operation that we have done. But if you want to overwrite and show these overwritten operations a little bit, what we can do is inside the OS this time, we're gonna add a string to that. So just use a string and put a plus sign and it's gonna add. So this time we're gonna say this is actually a skinned and a space or a skinned a dash and then whatever the value we are providing it up. So we have just with a simple skinned here, we have seen that yes, we can overwrite the value. This is what happens default and this is, we have modified a little bit, and that's all it takes to overwrite any of the constructor here, which is uh, just like that. Okay, and looks like we forgot a semicolon somewhere. There we go, nice and easy. Now this time, when these, uh, these things are gonna be happening up, now the things are gonna be a little bit different than how you're actually copying into the things, because we are now gonna be using these uh, overwritten constructor. Now let me show you, although it says code will never be executed, but notice here, that now, if I copy the value, what's going to be the name of the OS this time? Let's go ahead and run that. And you are going to notice here that it says uh, Android Oxy, but it should be saying uh, skinned here. Let me show you that. Let me fix that up. 
Totally my bad. Didn't even saw that, that this is a really, really bad error. I was writing everything after return zero. I'm pretty sure you might have already noticed that, but that's sometimes when you explain the things, it's not really easy to look at the code and then have it. So anyways, we have uh, just got everything similar to that. We have got no changes in that. Just have to move this return zero a, little, a bit later there. Now, as you can see that uh, we have defined this copy constructor here, and which is accepting a value of type phone. And we have overwritten that by putting up a message for us, as well as the default, this is exactly what is happening. A set of values are returned to you. You just move them to your data members and that's basically it. But we have overwritten that value in the OS and that's exactly what we are returning into the get name method. So let's go ahead and run this one more time. And this time what you're gonna notice that this time override the copy constructor is uh, kicking in and then this time, whenever you see OnePlus 8S, it's actually a skinned Android Oxy because you're not allowed to copy it directly. You're adding a little bit of more code on your own. So there we go. This is the basics of copy constructor. Now moving forward to one more, which is destructor. And destructor is something like I usually don't like to define it much if I'm not pretty sure that I'm explicitly allocating some of the memory because this happens automatically and we don't have to do anything much in this. So let's go ahead and try to uh, allocate a destructor or uh, put up a definition for that. Again, it's really simple. You give a phone, uh, resolutions like that, a tilde sign, and then you simply go ahead and say phone. This makes it a destructor and go ahead, define it like that. Here we don't do much of the stuff. We're gonna just uh, simply do a printf message and we're gonna simply learn one thing, which is destructor called for, destructor called for, and inside that we are gonna just put up a percent %s to get what for what value the destructor is being called. Because as I said, the constructor is called as soon as you create an object. So memory is allocated for that object. For every single that object, a destructor is obviously gonna be called at the end of the thing. So after the main method has run, then only the destructor will be, will be called. So here I can just simply say, hey, give me the name for which you are calling it up, but it's gonna give me an error, I'm pretty sure. Let me show you that, or let me try that. Yeah, that gives me an error. Uh, the error is really simple because it doesn't know how to actually put up this underscore name into this percent s because this uh, this string is actually coming up from this string and this printf is moreover a very friendly function for the C level based things, not for this uh, class written in the C++. But there is a simple solution. You can convert that by saying C underscore str and run a method on that. So pretty uh, hacky stuff. I don't like it even this much either, but instead of using the C out, we should have actually used C out in this case. But anyways, uh, let's go ahead and run that. And now you might, you might notice here that a destructor is called for one plus eight. Destructor called for one plus eight. Did we call it as one plus eight? Uh, it should be called a destructor called for and then there is an empty here. So the name is not being defined. So it's, it's behaving a little bit sneaky. It shouldn't be. So it should call it up for we didn't actually allocate any name for the Samsung A1. That's why it is having uh, this issue of not getting any name here because it's not having any name, so that's okay. And let's see why is it calling one plus eight because we actually uh, created an object with the name of one plus eight only and in this one plus eight S while copying value, we didn't override anything inside the name. We actually copied everything exactly. So if you want to have a much more, much more uh, explicit message, we can go ahead and do that. And it's gonna call this one as new dash. And now things are gonna be much, much better and easier to understand. So we can see now it's get called for one plus new, one plus eight and one plus eight. And then the empty one for the Samsung uh, that we didn't actually pass on any name. Now you're also going to notice that actually how this destructor is actually called on my machine. Again, it, it is being called a uh, different on different machine and different architecture, different compilers. So here, the last actually was created was this one plus eight new, this object was created. So the first destructor actually got called for this one. And after that, the previously declared and after that, the previously declared. So it's usually this exactly same on the Mac machines and the compilers that we use as a default, but there is no guarantee here. It can be different for the different compilers and different versions as well. I know this was a really, really long video, but I hope you have understood more about destructors and constructors and make sure that you read a little bit on the Stack Overflow as well. That's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. 
It might sound absolutely absurd, but why would anybody like to disable some of the constructor? And even you told us that it happens automatically in the background. But not when you actually explicitly declare the constructor, then the default constructor which was meant to be called, if you don't declare one, is never gonna be get called. So make sure you understand this. Another thing which comes up pretty common is why would I like to disable any of this constructor? It seems good because it allocates memory, but in many cases you really want to disable that. Let me show you one of that case. So notice here there are a lot of probable, remember I said probable ambiguity in the code because now you have multiple ways to define an object and here you can just pass on an object and we saw that this created a problem in the destructor as well. Here also we can see that there is another style of declaring an object where you have to pass on all the values. So this is definitely an ambiguity in the code and you can avoid that ambiguity by a very simple uh, sneaky trick here. So we don't even actually need to declare or pass on the values and stuff like that. We just need to declare the constructor and uh, put up all these things, all these things directly up here and that's gonna be all okay. But anyways, even if we have defined a definition here. Now what happens if I just simply cut this out, this constructor and move it into the private area? Now because I have moved it into the private area, now any object that you create is not gonna be accessible or is not gonna have an access to this default constructor. But everybody still has an access of this constructor or any other constructor that you have written. So now nobody is allowed to declare the object through this way. So the, the lack of information of the name, OS and price is now not allowed. Just by moving things into the private sector, you have now uh, declared your class much more ambiguity free and it's much more sensible and readable for the user as well. So there we go. This is a small sneak peek and you can just go ahead and do that and I'm going to comment that because this is not allowed. Uh, so declaration of any uh, object through this method is not allowed. The only way now to invoke an object from the class is via this method and that's uh, simply just a one line of code and not even a one line of code. We have just moved things into the private and public sector. And this brings us to the point that yes, these private areas and public areas can serve us a lot in uh, defining or even creating objects and basically writing ambiguity free classes. So there we go. Very small video compared to the last video. I hope you have enjoyed this small trick here and let's go ahead and move on to the next video. One of the very interesting keyword in the C++ is this, literally this. And I'm really happy that this keyword is so much well implemented in C++ compared to some other languages like JavaScript, where this keyword actually uh, created so much of the trouble and nuisance for a lot of programmers over the years. Thank goodness now it is fixed in the recent version of JavaScript, but we are here to talk about C++. Now in the C++, this keyword is very fundamental and this video can be broken down into two parts. First, the memory aspect of the C++, since you'll be working with the C++ memory aspect is very important and as well as a bit more easier implementation aspect where you see that where C this, this keyword is actually used. And the later half of the video is much more easier compared to what we're gonna be doing in this existing file. So have a little bit patience, you're gonna understand this keyword by the end of this video pretty nice and easily. First, let me show you the, the implementation, not the implementation, the um, memory aspect of this keyword. Okay, this is exactly the same file that we have used in the last video. We're gonna do a bit of modification and we'll basically, we want to see where all of these objects are being stored. We want to find out the memory address. If I would have a better editor at this point of time, probably a v, a Visual Studio, then I could have shown you it a better aspect here, but what we have uh, is what we have. We have to make a full use of it. So I'm gonna add a little bit of the printf statement and where I'm gonna say uh, a simple statement in this that value of object is, and I'm gonna insert a placeholder, which is gonna be person p for pointer, and of course a slash n. Now what I want to do is I want to pass on an object reference here. So m percent for the reference and feel free to choose anything in this I'm going to use one plus eight. Now interestingly what I want to do is uh, I want to simply run this program and see what memory address I get in return. And this is the memory address and it's pretty unique uh, f4b0. It might be it hundred percent it is hundred percent going to be different in your case. Now let's try to see what this, this keyword actually is. Uh, 
So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to have a different method defined here. Let's go ahead and add one more method here. So I'm going to say int and this time this method will get price. So I'm going to say get price. And there we go. We have seen these kinds of definitions in the past as well. No big deal so far. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this one. So int it's coming up from the phone and its name is get price. There we go. Now before I return the price, I want to just see one more thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this exact line from here and I'm going to paste it up here. Now this time I don't want to have a reference because this is not yet created. So what I'm going to write is I'm going to write a keyword here which is going to be this. Okay, nothing else. I just want to see what this actually is holding when I run it inside this new method that I've created, which is get price. Okay, once I've done that, obviously I have promised that I'll return an integer. So I have to return that. I have to keep my promises there. So I'm going to simply say just return the price, nothing else at all. Now, once I do this, now I can actually access this method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this line and for the same object, which is one plus eight, I'm going to refer this method here, which is going to be get price. There we go. Get price. There we go. Now I want to compare that the value written by this object and value written when I run this method again inside uh, this one here, what actually this returns me. Basically, this is what I want to say. And when I run this, you will notice a little bit surprise here that the value that we have got, uh, the value of object and value of object, I should actually put up a different message so that we can see it. And this one is going to be value of object, uh, value of instead of object, we are going to say get price is this and we're going to run this one. And now we can see that although we are successfully able to run these things two differently, but they are returning me the exact same memory address. And how is that possible? Now this is happening is a good thing for us because no matter what happens, we are actually referring to the same object every single time. And this keyword doesn't really deviate no matter from where you call to it. For example, we have this uh, get name here. So I'm going to hit an enter here so that it looks like more function ish. And there we go. So I'm going to just copy literally this line up here and we'll paste it up here. Now this is definitely a completely different method and this is going to run from uh, get name. And again, we are using the same keyword here, which is this. And you're going to notice uh, if I run this, and are we using get name? Yes, we are using it. So we're going to run this one here this time. And notice here that the value of get name is referring to the same object, same object and same object. So what we can conclude from this that no matter what happens, whenever you're going to use this keyword, it's a self referencing pointer, it's going to always refer to the object which it has just created. And this can be used for a greater advantage. So what I'm going to do is first and foremost, uh, let me just actually zip this up this exact main file so that I can actually transfer it to you. So give me a second, I'm going to just zip it up so that you can check the attachment. Okay, so I have zipped up everything. And now that is also going to be available for you in the attachment downloads. Now also I have cleaned up this entire file so that we can have uh, more stuff. I'm going to even remove this one as well. We don't need it. Now we're going to declare a simple new class, which is going to be much more easier to understand and will help us to understand the concept of where this keyword can be used and what actually it means to say a uh, self referencing pointer and why it was even created. It's a pretty simple and very significant thing. You'll be using it more than what you think. So we're going to simply create a class and we're going to call this one as a rectangle. There we go. And the rectangle class, we are obviously going to have a few members. So let's declare a double we're going to call this one as length. And it would be rather better if I call them as underscore length because these are private. And we're going to have one more which is going to be uh, breadth. There we go. Nice and easy. Now comes up the interesting part where we define our public accessor values. And the first one that we are going to have is going to be a rectangle. Now in the rectangle, I'll use a pretty old syntax of defining the constructor. Definitely this is allowed. What we have seen in the last video, that is also allowed. In this case, I'm going to say that somebody is going to give me a length. If not, I'm going to sign a 2.0 or 1.0, however you like, as a default value so that we don't face any trouble. We should be in the real case would be allowed. Uh, in real case, real, real world scenario, I would be saying 0.0, .0 but again, let's just say. 
And in the breadth, we are going to say you are going to be giving me a default value. If somebody passes me any value, that's going to be the default value. Now here, what I'm going to do is simply just once this is being done, I'm going to assign uh, values of my length to L, whatever the L is being passed on, and breadth will get the value of whatever the B is being passed to us. Okay, nice and easy. We can put up a message here as well that the constructor called, but I think we understand the constructor concept now easily. I don't need to do it now. Now, interesting thing comes up once you define the area of it. So let's just say we are going to have a double here, which is going to be a method that's going to say that I want to calculate the area. So let's just call this as area. Now, I'm not going to move the definition outside of the class. I'm going to keep it right here because it's a really simple one. There we go, area. In the area, all I do is I just simply return an expression, uh, which is going to be a multiplication of a length and the breadth. So as soon as you do so, since the value for the length and breadth was given to me already and is being set in the underscore length and breadth because of my constructor, I can just simply say that underscore length should be multiplied by underscore breadth. And that's it. It's going to give me an area of whatever the rectangle is. Now you also want to define one more method here where user can do something like this. So we're going to say that we want to return a simple integer or you can also return Boolean as well, but that would be a little bit more complicated with the if and else syntax. So we're going to call this one as simply compare. So this is going to help us to compare the area. And what it does is actually you have to pass on an object of type rectangle. And we're going to call this one as a rectangle. So rectangle. And this is a very common scenario. The capital R denotes a class and smaller r actually denotes the object created from this one. I know this sounds very confusing and the things like values or value or area might make much more sense to you. But this is a very common syntax. You will be seeing this a lot. So better to get friendly with this right here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to return a value or an expression uh, based on comparing the things. So we are going to return. And what I want to do is I want to compare the two uh, things here. So first and foremost, I want to compare uh, the thing that whatever the area I'm currently holding. So something like this, I want to compare area, which is I'm already holding. And I want to compare it whether this is greater than or smaller than uh, the whatever the uh, the this rectangle is being given to me. So I'm going to say uh, rectangle. Come on, I need to copy this, copy that. And I'm going to paste that. And on this one, I'm going to run this area here. Now, this is a big confusing point. First, let me show you how this one is going to be implemented. Otherwise, you will never be able to understand what this piece of code is actually being written for. So let me go up into the main and show you that. So we're going to have a simple uh, rectangle. And this rectangle is going to have uh, h1 as a rectangle. Now remember, whenever you say h1, you have to pass on values here. So we're going to have 3.0. And we are going to have uh, 3.0 again. Again, I I'm going for the square a bit here. Okay, this is all done. Now again, we are going to have a rectangle. This one is going to be h2. And since with the h2, I have to say 4.0. And I'm going for square 4.0. Okay just a minute more. Now, I want to do something very interesting. I want to run a simple if and else conditional statement here. And I want to check which box is bigger. So obviously, I have to do some kind of comparison uh, between them. So that's why this method of comparing the values are being created. So in the condition, I want to check out something like this h1, this is a box and this can access all the method. And I want to run a method which is going to be compare here. Now in the compare, again, I have to pass on an object which is of type rectangle. So I can simply go ahead and pass on an h2. Now this should give me a result based on that. So I'm going to simply say uh, here, uh, a simple put statement or maybe see out. I'm going to say something like this, that uh, h2 should be in the strings, h2 is smaller. And otherwise in the else, I'm going to say h2 is bigger. Let's go ahead and do that. h2 is bigger. There we go. Nice and easy. But now there is a problem here. First and foremost, this is a confusing code here because you have no idea on which you want to run this area and on which. Because in the parameter, 
I am calling H2. So definitely this is 100% clear that what we are getting here in the rectangle is being used here. Okay, but how can I run this area method on this existing object? Remember H1 is calling it, so H1 is an existing object. So in order to solve this problem where we want to do something like this, where I want to run a method on two similar objects, rectangle one and rectangle two, H1 and H2 basically are from the same class. So H1 wants to run a method and also want to run it on this H2, which is also a rectangle. So in this case, what you're gonna notice that I want to compare this area with the rectangle area passed on. In such scenario, you're gonna see this keyword being implemented because this always has 100% surety that it referred to itself. And that's why we go ahead and refer to this here. But you might have noticed that we are not actually allowed to use this dot area because this also comes with a unique syntax in itself. And whenever you want to refer to yourself, you don't always call this dot area, but rather you say this dash and this keyword. I know it's very, very uh, strange kind of a syntax of a dash and then this arrow sign, but yes, this is how actually it is being done. So now let me show you uh, if we are missing up. Yep, we are missing up a colon there. There we go. Now if I run this one, uh, this says H2 is bigger. And even if you want to see that what actually it returns, you can actually see that. We're gonna do a C out of whatever the value is being returned. So I'm gonna say H1 is gonna run an area of compare on H2. And you are gonna see that. And if you have seen my if and else video, you might have noticed I told you that C++ actually deals all of such comparisons and everything as zero and non-zero values. So I think there should be no surprise in seeing that there is a zero being given to us. Zero means a simple false and if the comparison or this entire equation results in false, then it's going to return zero. And if it returns to something else, for example, if I say something like this, uh, H2 wants to run a compare on H1, then it's gonna give us a one here, which is non-zero values are definitely considered as a truthy values. Not true actually exactly, but truthy values and false C values. So again, I do understand and I do expect that you will not have a full clarity on this because this is a very, very confusing keyword and for beginners, it's really hard to understand that why we are even doing it. But again, just remember, whenever you want to self-reference anything, then this keyword is used and with this, uh, this strange arrow is always and always being used. Okay, I hope I was able to give you like 30 to 40% of clarity. I don't expect you to understand 100% of it in one go, but eventually as you will write more C++ code, this will become a next nature for you. That's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh is here and welcome to another section on C++ programming. Now we're gonna learn more about the object-oriented programming. In the last video, we discussed a whole lot of things about classes as well as objects, some neat here and there tricks and some of the very essential concept with them. Now, personally speaking, if you'll ask me my thoughts, I think that classes and objects are a great feature and has enhanced our writing style of code quite a lot. But I think what's my personal favorite feature in the entire object-oriented programming is inheritance because inheritance is something which has given us a lot of power to reuse the existing code as well as write less code which is based on the existing code. You'll understand that in a second because you now have a full uh, knowledge about why what we are talking about here. So this is my personal preference and personal fact and personal uh, things that I love about inheritance. It, a lot of programmer might not agree on this point. They might think that object is something which creates unique uh, things with the same prototypes and stuff. But again, these are personal thought. I believe inheritance is uh, very less being enhanced and focused, but I think it should be more uh, credited towards the better use of programming. Anyways, let's go ahead and talk about these things and you will understand a whole lot of these things. So first and foremost, what did we saw that we are able to write a class. Whenever you write the very first class, it is called as base class, but not to get on to the exact word of base here, because sometimes naming convention changes a lot from book to book, from professor to professor, and from learning resource to learning resource. Some call it as base class, some call it as parent class, and some call it as alpha class, and there can be many other names as well. I just like to prefer to call them as base classes. 
In the base class, we saw that we declare the structure of the base class by using the class keyword and inside that we define a whole lot of methods into that. And uh, these are just basically functions, but since they are inside the classes, we call them methods. I'm ignoring the fact that there will be a lot of data members in the class as well because that is pretty obvious. The class is going to have some of the data members. What makes everything interesting that based on this class, I can also create a derived class. Not to go naming again because this derived class can be called as child class, uh, beta class, uh, inherited class. There's a whole lot of naming. The point is that once you make any class, uh, a notation that yes, this is a derived class and derived class from this purple class that we have created. The moment you do it, you can actually use all the methods from the base class and everything that is there in the base class, you can use it. But not only that, you can modify some of these things as well. Like for example, I don't like this uh, second rectangular box, box, which can be considered as a method. You can overwrite it. The name gonna be same or Maybe sometimes functionality can be same and some additional functionality can be introduced to it. But not only that, you can write your own methods in that. So remember, I hope you can imagine the whole scenario. Let's just say somebody has written this base class and there are 500 methods in that, um, a completely amazing class which does everything else. But now you want to write a completely new project based on this class and want to add uh, probably 50 more things into that. So instead of just uh, writing all these things from the scratch, you can just borrow all those 500 class just by saying a small syntax and can write, start writing your 50 more methods on that. So that actually brings a whole lot of power uh, to the programming style that we are following up here. Now with this also I would like to touch a small thing here. We have noticed in the past that when we write class, a class has different areas which are accessible to different things. For example, I, sh I, sh I saw you, um, I shown you that we have this uh, private area at the very top which don't need to any marking, it's by default a private area. But also we can declare these a uh, public area as well which can be accessible outside the class as well. So there is a couple of, uh, just one more keyword here, which I haven't talked much because there was no need of that. But you're gonna notice with this uh, table that I have, I have uh, put up here, that we have a couple of keywords here. The public we have seen, the private we have seen, one that we haven't seen yet is protected. And just like, exactly similar, we have public area, we have private area, you can mark the keyword protected and that's gonna be protected area. The public area, now again, it doesn't matter if you are just defining some variables or data members in it, or you are defining entire method into that. The point is, it just is an area where everything is accessible. So in the public, uh, all the base class that you are creating or all the derived class you are accessing or anything else, anybody can access that particular area. Things become interesting when you define a protected area. Now the protected area is something that whatever the methods you have defined in the base class will be accessible to the derived class, but not to anybody else. Not a general public can use that. But if you put anything into the private area, then it's only gonna be accessible through the base class only, and not even the derived class can get access it. So remember, uh, it's gonna be all about what area you are defining, and it's not like the base class automatically gets an access to everything. You have to explicitly mark that if somebody creates a base class, uh, somebody creates a derived class based on this particular class, he will get the access or not. So it's all about area that you are defining. Again, we haven't talked much about the protected because we, at that time, we didn't have any knowledge about the derived class. And since in this section, we'll be talking about the derived class, it will automatically get much more clear to you. So I hope you are excited about learning a lot more things in this section because I am very much excited. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Mitesh here and welcome to another video. In this video, we're gonna write some code to understand more about inheritance, as well as alongside, we're gonna understand about the overloading. We have seen in the past that overloading is totally possible. It's a feature of C++ where you can declare method with the same name and they can have different stuff that they can do. Now, same thing is applied in the inheritance as well. Method can be with the same name in different classes and based on whose object you are creating that can behave differently. It's gonna be much more easier to understand through the code perspective. Now here's a tip that I would like to give you. It's always being said in the community of C++ that make sure you spend enough of your time on the very base class. Now usually the base class that we create, we don't allow anybody to create objects from the base class easily, 
but it's a very good advice that you spend a lot of time in creating the base class and then the derived classes are going to enhance the feature eventually. You're going to understand that in this example as well. Let's go ahead and create Superman as well as Spider-Man in this example. The goal is really simple. I want to work on a class which is man and this man is going to have the basic feature of a man and based on these classes I want the user the ability or other coders ability to create classes which can be converted as Superman and Spider-Man. A bit a uh, weird example but I love those superheroes. So we're going to get started with that. Okay. So first and foremost, as I said, we are going to have a simple class. We're going to call this one as man. There we go. No big deal. We have created these kinds of things in the past as well. In the man, we are going to have a few protected things like a uh, man is obviously going to have a name. He is going to have uh, age as well. So there we go. Two basic things. Now, what I want to do is I want to restrict that nobody should be allowed to create objects from this main class easily so the default constructor need to be disallowed and we have seen this trick already if you have watched the previous videos that we're gonna go ahead do like this man and uh, there we go that's it i don't want to put up any messages inside it i just want uh, this default constructor to be disabled that's why i'm putting it up in the private area remember when i don't mention anything that means it's a private area then obviously i'm going to introduce a new keyword which is protected now protected means i want my base, I want my inherited classes or my child classes to be able to use this piece of code, but not anybody else. Public is just public. Okay. Now what we're going to do inside this, we are going to first and foremost override this constructor, which is going to be the man. I want, this is how everybody should be able to create a uh, object from this class and even the derived classes. So we're going to have a simple const string. We're going to take a reference of name as well as we are going to have a const int and a reference of age and then thereafter we will be inserting them into everybody so we're going to say that hey name you will get a value of from the name that is given by the user as well as hey age you will be getting the value from the age given by the user and we can close you out like that so there we go this is the default not the default constructor actually, the parametric version of the constructor is being overwritten. Apart from this, I also want to spend a little time in defining one more method, which is going to be simply a run method. And I would like to put up a message here. In this, I want to simply say, hey, puts, I want to display a message that I can run. And usually, man runs with a regular speed, so there's nothing much super extraordinary here. Now also just for some fun stuff, I won't be using it, but just for fun stuff and show you that yes, all three uh, key factors or accessors are actually included in the base class. So here we are going to simply have an access of void, which is going to say, say name. And there we go. And we can actually make it as constant as well, because it's not going to return anything uh, or it's not going to change anything. Definitely it's going to return. Now here I have defined its definition. Since it's public, it can be defined outside as well. So how do we do that? I hope you remember that. We simply say, hey, this is man, these two guys, and then simply say name. And of course, a const keyword is going to be included. And we are going to just say the name. So this time I'll use a C out and I'll say something like this. My name is and then it's going to display the name and we are going to just access the property name. We are going to do an end L and there we go. Sounds easy and pretty, pretty easy. And yes, I'm having a typo. There we go. Fixed up. So there we go. We have spent, assume, we have spent uh, enough of time in designing a class which is main. Very thoroughly designed. We have uh, protected these default constructor. Every time a constructor needs to have a name and age being passed on if you create any object from this main class. But usually the main or the base classes which are created are not for creating the object. They are, these are just the templates or helper classes which allows you to create more interesting classes. So we are going to just create new classes here. So now let's go ahead and see that how we can create a Superman class. And you're going to notice that creating Superman class is going to be super, super easy. So let's just say I call this as simply Superman. And the way how you inherit from a one class or the base class is you put up a colon, then you mark up the keyword which is public, and then we can just simply mention the name here. Now, I haven't seen much of the deviation from this public keyword. It simply means I want to publicly access this one, and I'm not pretty sure if this keyword uh, plays 
much of the significant role. Uh, I don't have much of the specific knowledge on this particular area. I tried to research a little bit onto that through books and through even uh, talking to some of my friends who daily work on that. They have said, um, no, we haven't seen much of the deviation here as well. I don't know how this is serving anything different when we say private or anything. Because if we want to inherit automatically everything in the protected is inherited to you and public can be accessed by anybody and private is not accessed by anybody. So what's the point of putting anything else here? So again, can be debatable. And if you have anything more that you can refer me to read, I would love to enhance my knowledge. Okay, so we have created this one. Now the beauty about this is since this is a class in itself, it can have in, in its own data members. Like for example, Superman will have a Boolean property flight. That means yes, he can fly. So that's the private area. But now let's move on to the public area and here things are gonna get interested. First and foremost, I want to create a, a, a simple constructor here, which is gonna be Superman. Now, how I want this constructor to define is very interesting. I want to simply say that here's a string, which is name. So anybody who uses this Superman class is gonna provide me the name. Once anybody provides me the name, I want to use the constructor from this man class. So I don't want to pass on name and age and everything like that. I just want to be heavily dependent on this here. So what I'm gonna do is, once that is being done, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call the constructor from this man. And remember, whenever I call this constructor from the man, I have to pass on two things, the name and the age. But since I'm creating the uh, man here, or Superman, I'm gonna refer this name, which is given to me as it is, so I'm just transferring this name here and I'm hard coding the value that every time uh, the user of Superman is going to be of 26 age. And definitely this brings a whole lot of power to us that yes, we can hide so much of the detail from the user. Imagine there were like two or three more of such thing that you had to pass on. You can actually hard code that value. You can grab these value from website or anywhere else and you can ask the user just to provide the name. So much easier already. And then after that, we just put up these guys and that's it. These are all done here, of course, with a semicolon. So this is all great and this is all done that we have, uh, we have put up here. Now, okay, moving forward into the Superman, we also want to override one more method which is in the public already, which is this run. Since Superman can run at a very high speed, I want to put up like this. Ah, come on, you should be like that. You shouldn't be like that. Okay, so now Superman is not gonna run simply by saying I can run. He's gonna say I can run at light speed. There we go, nice and easy. Now notice the name of this run inside the man and the name of the method run is exactly same. But what's going to happen, the Superman will override this method and if you're gonna create object from the class Superman, the run from the Superman is going to run and never this run will execute, okay? To prove the point a little bit more, we're gonna create one more class here because it's so much easy. We're gonna have a Spider-Man this time. And again, I can just copy this and I can paste this here. So easy to implement. I'm gonna simply say Spider-Man and constructor needs to be overwritten as Spider-Man as well. And you can create now a Spider-Man and he's not gonna have a property bool. He's gonna have a property of webbing. And Spider-Man can also be created by having a name and we are gonna provide a default age of the Spider-Man, probably a bit younger, uh, 19 would be good. And he is gonna say that I can run at normal speed. Normal speed, there we go. So now let's go ahead and test out all the theories because right now this is all assumption, but entire testing is gonna be done inside the main. Let's go ahead and create a couple of users, not much more than that. So first and foremost, I want to have a Superman Superman is going to be created by Clark. So notice here, if I just say Clark, this is not going to be allowed. Hopefully, there we go, not allowed because you need to follow the constructor rule here, which says that I just need to pass on one thing and the name is going to be Kent. There we go. So this is super, super easy. But now notice here one more interesting thing that in the Clark, if I put up a dot here, I can access run, but not only that, I can access this one here, which is actually inherited from the main here. So I can just run say name here, put up a colon, run this one, and you are going to notice that we are able to have this Clark Kent with the name. Now notice something very, very interesting. 
we're gonna say name and I'm gonna put up this guys and I'm gonna say and age is like that and we're gonna put up these and I'm gonna use an underscore age as well so I have overwritten or I kind of had written this main method I've modified it a little bit what impact is this gonna give me at this class which I haven't actually touched yet now I'm gonna run this one and notice our hard-coded value actually is being passed on to that age and here this user has no idea what's going on so again a very very tricky situation there you can work a lot onto this main class and the sub-derived class or derived classes can have a lot of impact based on that so very powerful thing that we are doing here I know this example is very small you might not be grabbing it but these things actually get very very powerful in the C++ uh, they do insane kind of a level uh, thing here again okay let's create one more user with that so this time we are creating a spider-man and we are gonna say hey Peter and there we go we can go ahead and say this is Peter if I can write that and Peter again has an access to all these things which we can uh, give to Superman like Peter can run and I think Clark can also run so we're gonna say hey Clark can you run and both are now running but both of them are gonna be running at different speed I, of course Clark can also say the names so why not to say that as well let's go ahead and say Peter is gonna say name with a semicolon let's go ahead and run that and now you can see a whole lot of difference here that uh, I forgot to put up a space there which is making it absolutely weird space and we are gonna run that again okay so it says now the name is Kent and the age is 26 and I can run at a light speed while on the other hand the Peter the age of Peter is uh, 19 and I can run at normal speed only so I know this is a very basic example but I have tried to cover all of the syntax that's possible you're gonna face in that of course your code is not gonna be one or two liner it's gonna be much more lengthy than that but the concepts are gonna 100% remain exactly same and remember my words always everybody's gonna tell you that make sure you spend enough of your time onto your base class so that when you create these derived classes later on uh, it can serve you well there so that's it I'm gonna rest this video here because it's pretty long but I hope you have understood the concept of these things pretty clearly and pretty nicely and in a fun way that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one this concept of friend keyword, it's a very popular concept first and foremost in the interviews and in exams and everywhere. But I'm not a big fan of friend keyword in itself. I think the whole idea of the friend keyword is very flawed and especially from the perspective of security. I think it's very, very flawed and no matter how good example you can give it, I still wouldn't able to convince myself that yeah, this is a great uh, way of using the friend keyword. I think it's a very big security issue and can leak a lot of your data outside, which is not a good thing. And that's why you're gonna see in almost every professional code, you are never going to find this friend keyword. Still it is there and let's just finish the debate and you need to know why it is flawed and how it is actually flawed. So let's just say you are designing this. So this is exact same example from the last video. We have a main class here, which is man. And from this main class, we are having a derived class, which is superman. In the main class, we are having private area, some of the protected area and some public area. Same goes for the superman, some of the private area and some of the keywords like constructor and run method being overridden. Now let's just say uh, there is a private member here, which we initially designed age. We have never exposed age to anybody so far apart from saying it name directly. For some reason, you don't want to access it through the same name, say name, you say name, and we want to access it directly through this, uh, this one here. For some reason, let's just say you have an example, something like this. We want to say printf, and now I want to have this here, so person D, because age is an integer, I am well aware of it, slash n. And I want to access this age here. If I do so, compiler will soon give me an error that this is not really a good thing because age is a private member of men. Now, concept-wise, if you want to give somebody an access of age, just go ahead and declare it in the protected area. That's why it was created. One of the best approach that you can do if for some reason you have to do some manipulation like that is to create getters and setters. They were created exactly for this moment. So we can simply say that I want to return a simply a getter here. Uh, get age would be great name for it 
and then thereafter I'm going to use this return keyword which is going to give me a return age. There we go. Nice and easy, very much easy. And here then you can use simply this get age method which is absolutely fine, totally no problem with that. But for some reason uh, somebody might argue that I still want to have an access of this age. Now in here uh, this is still not going to be allowed. So what you can do obviously you can use the keyword here which is friend. So what you can do is you can say friend and you can mention the class who you want to become friend. In this case, Superman. So there we go. Now you're going to see that error is gone. If I put a semicolon, that Superman now has an access to this age available. But this is not going to be the case for this Spider-Man because I haven't mentioned this. So if I change this line from here, copy that and let's place it up here. Now you're going to notice that since we are friend with Superman but not with Spider-Man, age is not allowed to be have an access by the Spider-Man. Now definitely you can come back here and can say I want to become a friend with another guy and you can say friend class Spider-Man. It's going to get rid of the error. But I think this is fundamentally wrong at a variety of levels. First and foremost, once you declare this, it doesn't really expose the age, but all the data members that are actually private. So it expose everything. And this class can almost treat it as a public class, of course, only by these guys. But I think if you wanted to give them an access, writing them in the protected is much more secure way. And not only this, because this actually usually is written after when everything is done. And once you're exposing too much of the data after writing the entire class, you don't know what other programmers have written it into it. And this usually creates a lot of problems. So again, from security wise, not a big fan of friend, but since the concept actually exists there, uh, again, you can also have your own judgment, whether you like it or not, you agree with me, or you can 100% disagree with me. But there you go. This is your simple friend keyword. Now you decide whether you want to use it or not. My personal advice is stay away from this friend keyword and try to use more protected area. That's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and we have discussed so much about the inheritance. There is a very teeny tiny topic still remaining and this is really the topic which shouldn't contain in its own dedicated video but I'm still keeping it just to make sure you can come back and watch it. So we have seen so far that I can inherit from this main class. And you can inherit and create as many base classes as you would like. But let's just say for some reason, what you're having is simply a class of money. And this class doesn't have any protected or even private. It's going to have just one thing, which is public. And this is going to be a simple method, which is not going to return anything. Just say got money. And there we go. Nice and easy. And it just simply puts a message that every superhero is not going to be very dirt poor from now onwards. And we are going to simply send them some money. So we're going to simply say, uh, got, uh, I think it's not really big money, but uh, 5k USD, USD in, okay, in my account. There we go. Nice and easy. No big deal. And obviously, just don't consider this as really a simple one-liner class here. Just assume this is a class which is also filled up with some kind of details. Maybe you are designing a web application and this, simple, this single class can have a lot of API access and handling of the JSON. And you have already created a base class here, Spider-Man, which is based on your existing web application, maybe handling database and stuff. So let's just say you want to more give the feature that I want to handle APIs as well. All you can do is you can come up and can say, hey, I want to access this class, which is money. And that's it. You got all the features and all the capability. Now you can derive from two classes. And again, the things are going to be exactly same. There's no point of me adding more private variables or data members, more uh, protected and more public stuff. Exactly how it used to work in my main uh, class or the man class that we have created, this is going to work exactly same. Now, since this is a very uh, public method that we have got, Peter is going to directly get an access from it. Not a good idea, but in this case, uh, Peter is going to directly say that, hey, uh, did you got money? So Peter is going to say got money. And when I run this, he's able to run that. Although we have created an, a class and you can see got 5k USD in my account. So Peter is going to be really, really happy. 
Now again, uh, there is no point that I would like to do this here. But again, you can do all these stuff that we have done in the man class. We can declare protected, even can have these getters and setters, which will be a better idea. And then we can give them uh, money based on however we like. Again, this is a really simple example. So yes, to give you point that yes, multiple inheritance is totally allowed in C++ and you can name, uh, use this syntax to inherit from the multiple classes. This is the way how you do it. And doing it or not doing it is totally up to you. But again, it is totally possible and it is being done quite a lot in even in the professional codes as well. So that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Polymorphism. Very, very interesting. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and in this video we're going to talk about polymorphism. So let's go ahead and talk about it. We have already talked about it. In one of the uh, last videos, I told you that we can have a method in the parent class and that method can be borrowed with the same name and can be modified further in the child class or also the subclasses. This exact same concept where a single method takes multiple form is known as polymorphism. But without a doubt, I would also like to take you over the polymorphism Wikipedia page and would like to throw up some jargon in front of you. So in programming language and typically theory, polymorphism is the provision of single interface to entities of different types. This is a point exactly where things are 100% accurate, but really it's tough to understand it. Or the use of single symbol to represent multiple different types. Much, much better. So we can have a method with the same name and that method can be modified into multiple classes with different name. But there is a great gotcha here. There is a great catch that you need to be aware of it. So let me walk you through that. And the reason why a lot of people say that be extra cautious with pointer, you're going to notice that here. So let's just say we create a class with the name of one. I'll keep it very basic because the concept is the idea is not about making things very complex. The idea is to make things simpler. So we're going to go ahead and do like that. Now here we have a class one. Now I won't be putting up any data members in it directly. We'll have a public access and we are going to create a simple method. Now this method, we are going to say that this is an intro method, which takes an intro of the user and nothing more. Uh, it just uh, puts out a message. So we're going to simply say see out a message and it will just display the name of the class. So it's going to say I am one. And of course, with a slash in, there we go. Nice and super easy. Okay. Now, can we have another class which might be derived from this class? Yes, of course, we have already learned that and we can absolutely do it. So we're going to have a class which we'll call as two. There we go. Nice and easy. Again, this one is going to be uh, based on the first class. So what we have to do is put up a colon, then say public, and we're going to mention this one. As soon as I do this, this means this class is based or is actually inheriting things from the first one. Again, I'll have a public uh, zone here. I usually call that as public area or public zone. And again, this is going to just inherit a method, which is going to be intro like this. But this time the intro method will be different, obviously. So we're going to have a C out, which will, which is going to say, something like this, I am two, because obviously this is two. And there we go. Nice and easy. No doubt so far. And we're going to make one more of this one here. There we go. This one is going to say that I am three. This will be based on one. And this is going to say that I am three. Now, so far, we have seen that this is a pretty common scenario where we have one base class and this class may be inherited by multiple other classes a pretty common scenario. And once I come up here, I can say that this one object is A, this two object is B, and this three object is C. So far, no problem. When A says that I want to give it an intro of A, when B says give me an intro, and when C says give me an intro, of course, putting up a semicolon after every one of that, when I run this program, without a doubt, you're going to see that there is one, there is two. And if I can put up a slash and after every one of it, it's going to look very, very beautiful. So let's go ahead and do that. There we go. Now run it one more time. So we can see it says I am one, I am two, I am three. We have seen this. This is exactly what polymorphism is. But things actually become tricky when you start using pointer. So instead of just displaying this one, two and three, I'm going to remove that. You said that you are not just an object from it. You are actually a pointer, which is going to point something and you are of type one. Now this is going to make things much, much interesting. Once I come back here, 
I say that A, since it's a pointer, now it's not gonna refer to itself, but it's gonna hold the reference to the B. Not a big deal. It's a pointer, it can hold a reference to anything, now it's holding a reference to the B class. So, technically speaking, it's a pointer or it's a value which is pointing towards the B. Now, when I try to access the method, remember when pointer doesn't access the method by dot, rather they access the method this with this weird syntax and which is intro. So what is going to be the result of it? And let's go ahead and do that uh, one more time to make things much more interesting. That this time you're gonna hold a reference to C. Okay, things are very, very interesting already. Stop giving me this error. Now we are simply seeing that A, first and foremost were uh, pointing towards B. So it is expected that the intro of the B should come out and here it is pointing towards C, so it is expected that you are going to be displaying the intro of C. But strange thing will happen when I run this program. You're going to notice it says I am one, I am one. So no matter where the pointer is pointing towards, still it doesn't know it's always running this thing here, which is the intro from the one. Not really a great idea, at least in this case, I really don't expect this to happen, but this is always going to happen. Remember, I told you, be extra cautious with the pointers. Now, in order to solve this ambiguity here, we need to introduce one keyword here, which is going to be virtual. So we can mention that this method is actually virtual. And anytime you anybody just overwrites these methods, I don't want to run this method, but rather that inherited version of that should be running up. Now, once you mention this in the base class, no matter how many classes are adopting, it just works fine with every one of them. That's why I created not just one, but actually two classes. So notice here, I am two and I am three. So this solves a big problem for us, which is a pointer ambiguity issue. So in this video, you learned more about the virtuals as well. And one more thing, sometimes some methods are marked as virtual who hasn't any definition. So if a method doesn't have any definition, sometimes people like to call them as just zero as well. But anyways, if a method which doesn't have any body or definition can also be called as pure virtual function, but I think that's just a mere syntax and some vocabulary being introduced. But yes, just for information, if a function doesn't have any body and is marked as virtual, sometimes people like to call it as pure virtual function. But now you have understood absolutely that why virtual keyword is necessary and where it can be implemented and how this can actually save the day some of the time. So that's it for this video. I hope you are enjoying this and let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Atesh here and welcome to this new section. This is going to be a bit shorter as a section because there is just one fun topic that I want to discuss here, which is smart pointers. Now here is a big word of caution that I would like to mention everywhere. There are high chances that the compiler that you're using on your machine or probably a compiler that you're using online may not support these systems. These smart pointers are fairly a new addition and in the recent version, the compiler are still polishing them so that they can give you a support of these smart pointers. So just a caution, it might not work on your system. So this, is, might, be a vid this might be a video where you just want to watch and learn and just understand here. So first and foremost, let's talk about these very interesting topic which are smart pointers. Now, there are a couple of issues with the pointer and probably everybody might have said it to you that please be cautious while using pointers. And one of those reason is the memory leaks. Pointer, since they directly point towards the memory, there are many cases in which sometimes there is a leak of memory which might even crash the program, may can uh, run into security issues and a whole bunch of other things. Since it's a very powerful language and you might have heard the very famous term, with great power comes great responsibility and that's exactly true with the pointers. So in order to understand it further, I hope you remember from some of the previous videos, we talked about the new as well as the delete keyword. The new keyword actually allocates a memory and the delete keyword deletes a memory. That's pretty obvious. We have already seen that up here. Now, also I mentioned that with new keyword, delete is required 100%. If you are using a new keyword, you have to go and you have to use the delete keyword. Now this is not really common and in fact you're going to notice in a variety of code that people write, especially the beginners, they are kind of uh, forgiven about this delete keyword. Especially if somebody is coming up from a background of Java which automatically deletes the stuff, you are quite accustomed of using a new keyword to delete an ob to create an object from a new class but you never actually write the delete keyword. Very common scenario. 
And these smart pointers are actually here to solve this exact same issue where people use the new keyword but forget to use the delete keyword and nothing more than that. Now also with this, I would like to mention one more important thing about the smart pointers that they are a wrapper around the real raw pointer. So basically that what it means is your memory is allocated in the stack uh, and that's how we actually deal with that, not with a heap and other stuff. Everything is actually in the stack. Also, I would like to give you some of the assets that you should read if you have got time after watching this section. Now, in the Microsoft website, you're gonna notice docs.microsoft.com, a big URL, then a CPP smart pointer. So if you're gonna search for Microsoft smart pointers, modern CPP, you may land up in this page pretty easily. So in the smart pointers, they also mention a whole lot of things about how things are actually going on. First and foremost, please notice that you cannot use them directly. There is this memory here, which you have to include and then only you can use it. This page in fact has a lot of things about the stack allocated object and destructors and how it actually works. They have a couple of nice examples as well. Again, a little bit more complicated. I'll give you much more easier example to understand this. But if you'll click on this memory, you're gonna notice that this is entire uh, definition or the documentation for the memory that you need to worry about. And there are a lot of methods and things that you need to go and you may want to work on uh, something here. So for example, a uh, get deleter, uh, make shared, these are some of the methods we are about to use, some things like pointer safety, and everything is given and nicely here. Again, as I said in almost every single one of my course, it's not possible for me any course or any book to cover everything in that particular subject, C++ is no exception. Eventually, you will come on to the phase where you have to read the documentation on your own and understand the things on your own. And I'm trying to move you forward in that same direction now. So in the next video, we are gonna understand about these smart pointers and there are actually types of smart pointers, not much, but we are gonna discuss just three, the major one of them. Eventually, I'm sure in the future, they will release much more uh, categories of the smart pointer, but this is all good enough for us. So let's move into the next video and talk about our very first smart pointer and it's super easy actually. So let's go ahead and move on to next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and this is going to be a short video. What can I do? Smart pointers are super easy and there is nothing much more to drag the videos. So the very first pointer that we're gonna learn about uh, inside the whole arrays of smart pointer is gonna be unique pointers. Now unique pointers, as the name suggests, is very unique and one thing that you should absolutely know about before moving anything further, that unique pointer actually frees up the memory as soon as the scope ends. And this brings our discussion about what actually is a scope. Now we have already seen so much about the scopes and let me show you, walk you through with that. So the scope of this main function is actually this much. And if I declare something else, for example, if I declare an if block, the scope of this if block is actually from here till here. If I use something like for loop here, the scope of the for loop is starting from this curly braces to this curly braces. So this brings us the point that a scope is actually usually defined by a set of curly braces. Now, if I write something like this, this means this is a scope, but this is an empty scope. A very common thing being asked in the interviews too, but remember, an empty scope is just this much. Moving back. So we realize that a unique pointer is always gonna be unique. It's memory get free as soon as the scope ends. So if you're defining it inside any scope, just like the for loop, we free up a i integer value outside the for loop. Similar to this, the memory gets free up as soon as the scope ends. And the most important thing is you cannot copy the unique pointers. Obviously, they are unique. They, don't, they are not meant to be copied up as well. Now, the most important thing is why they are not allowed to be copied because we have a separate pointers which are allowed to be copied. The problem with the unique pointers and the problem that they are trying to solve with the traditional pointer is that let's just say this is a memory block and this pointer is referring to this memory. Now, as soon as this pointer gets delete, this memory gets free up. But if you allow, or in the traditional pointer also, sometimes the same memory space can be actually pointed by two different pointers. And this is a classic situation where memory leak happens. In the traditional way, when two pointers actually point to a same memory, and let's just say this pointer 
is deleted. That means this memory is going to be freed up. There is no memory there. And this pointer is still pointing towards this, which is not even a memory location now. So this is pointing towards nothing. This can lead to a variety of security issues. So that's why this unique pointer comes in. It's not like it's totally disallowed. We have a separate pointers which are allowed to have a copy, but in this case, it is not allowed. So let me walk you through with a simple code example of it. So how this is being done. First and foremost, remember the scope is here, just like this. And the most important thing is just to include that. So we're gonna include memory there. Again, just writing this piece of code might support, might not support in your particular case. We're gonna create a simple class here, which is gonna be simple user. It's gonna be really, really absolute simple class with uh, two things, constructor and destructor, and a test function so that we can have some of the testings. To create a constructor, we simply go ahead and say this is gonna be a user and just like that. And I'm gonna say simply see out, and I'm gonna simply say something like this, user created. If I can write that, come on, user created with a slash n, of course, there we go. And we are gonna copy this one and we are going to paste it again. And this is gonna be a destructor by using this tilde sign. And this time user will be uh, destroyed or deleted, however you like to say. And we're gonna have one more method, which is gonna be simply void uh, test func. And that's not gonna do anything at all. This is gonna be simply a C out which is gonna say like this, and is gonna say I am a test function, nothing else. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an object from this, but not just any ordinary object, an object which is gonna be a type of unique pointer. Let's go ahead and do that. Remember, I am inside this scope. So I'm inside an empty scope. This can be a scope of if and else, this can be a scope of for loop, anything else. Now first, a non-traditional way or a way which nobody likes in the C++ world, but that actually happens, so let me show you that. First and foremost, you simply say that I want to use a unique underscore PTR class. This is sort of a template which requires you to pass on a class. We are gonna simply say user. And then the regular way of creating an object from the class is actually by equal sign, then we create a new and something like this. Of course, I forgot to put up a name there. So let's just say we name it this variable as Sam and we create a new and we simply say user like this. So this is a common way of creating this. But this is not allowed actually by default. And if you look at the definition on the Microsoft website, you're gonna notice that this constructor actually is not allowed. It is actually blocked inside this unique class. So what they allow you to do is actually get rid of this and wrap this up around with a pair of parentheses and this is allowed. And this is simply a non-favorite way of uh, developers. Nobody likes to use this one. The simple reason is because it again uses this keyword new here, which is not really good and nobody actually likes that. And why is it having a problem uh, with this new user? I think I have done it nicely. And it looks pretty okay. Let's see what the error is. Uh, calling a private constructor of class user. Yes, of course, my bad. I should be declaring a public area. There we go and should be all good. Save that. And now it should be all good. There we go. So this is a non-favorite way of developers simply because there is a usage of new keyword. Although, although behind the scene, the new keyword is gonna be behaving bit different because this is a unique pointer. But as I said, nobody likes it. So why should we also like it? We are gonna just discard this. We're gonna walk through with a different way how everybody writes unique pointers. So we're gonna simply say unique pointer, provide a class, again, name it as a Sam, but this time we are gonna use equal sign and this time we'll use one of the thing which is make unique. And remember, I told you briefly about it while discussing in the last video that we are about to use that. This is exactly coming up from the documentation. And here we need to pass on the class which is user. And in this case, we don't have uh, any arguments to pass on. So we're gonna just remove this one and there we go. And believe me, that's really the simplest thing that we have got up here. Okay, and just like the Sam, uh, it's a regular pointer. Feel free to use it just like a pointer. So we can use these arrow guys and can have the test functions and whatever you are supposed to do, please do that with this one. The only thing that is not allowed to be done is actually create another unique pointer. And we simply go ahead and say, this is gonna be user, uh, just like this, remove this one, come on. 
and what we can do is sem with a double m and refer it to this sem. This is not allowed. You're gonna see the compiler is gonna give me an error that call to implicit delete copy constructor is disabled. So what happened is in one of the previous video, we saw that how we can actually overwrite these methods, uh, which was simply constructor, we overwrite that, we can write destructor. And remember, we wrote the copy constructor as well. We overwrote that. And that was simply was done because of this particular video so that you understand that yes, copy constructor can be overwritten. And that is exactly has happened here. The copy is totally not allowed. The delete keyword is there in the copy constructor. And that's why you see that it's not allowed. So this is not allowed. We're going to put up a comment and we're going to say this is not allowed. There we go. So this is all what we have got. Now, interestingly, one more thing, I would like to put up a C out here outside the scope. And we are going to simply say, uh, outside, outside code with a slash n, of course. Now notice here very carefully what's going to happen and how it actually is going to happen. So as soon as I run this program, notice here a user was created successfully. I'm a test function was executed here and then user was destroyed. So as I mentioned, as soon as the scope actually goes out, that's it. The unique pointer is destroyed and the memory is freed up and the outside code runs exactly same. And notice one thing here, the new keyword was not there. The delete keyword was not there and the uniqueness of the pointer was guaranteed. So a couple of problems are being solved here. So that's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video. In this video, we're going to talk about the next topic, which is just like we have unique pointers, we have another set, which is shared pointer. In the unique pointer, you are not allowed to share the memory references or create two pointers which points to the same memory. But in the share pointer, it is allowed. And there is a very big caveat here. Uh, so let me walk you through with that. So again, we are gonna just create another block just for the sake of reason. You can find all of these things in the same uh, code file, which is in the attachment. So moving forward, and of course, I believe that you are watching them on learncodeonline.in uh, because that's where I'm uploading all these contents originally. If you're watching them on any other third party platform, please do let me know. So uh, let's just say, just like we can create a unique pointer, we can actually create shared pointer as well. So shared PTR, again, the same syntax, you might be familiar with that by now. And we're gonna simply say user instead of Sam, this is gonna be Tim. And then we can use the same uh, syntax, make underscore shared here and we provide a class user. We have nothing in the parameters, so we go ahead and do this. In the shared pointer, what is allowed for you to do is create another shared pointer uh, of the same class, obviously, and we can have a Tim with 2M this time, and we can directly store a reference here, and we are gonna notice no error this time. While in the pointers, uh, unique pointers, we actually got a compiled error, and here we are totally allowed. And now both of them actually are pointing towards the same memory, and both of them can be used uh, for all the objects that you're calling for. But there is a big uh, caveat here that you should be aware of that. Now, I told you that this is actually totally allowed in the unique pointers and even in some of the codes, you're going to see this kind of code being uh, utilized. But in the shared pointer, if somebody is using this kind of syntax, which is new user, uh, by the way, if you just wanted to see that, I can show you that this is totally allowed. So we can have a shared pointer. We can simply say user. We call it as Tim. And instead of calling a new and then saying uh, a user like that, and having this, instead of that, we actually go ahead and get rid of this equal. Remember, we say parenthesis and parenthesis goes here. And this is actually totally okay, but it's actually a very bad decision in this case because you're playing a lot with the memory. Okay, moving a few videos back. I told you that whenever a new keyword is being introduced, now you're not using a stack memory, but you're using a heap memory. Now, in case of shared a pointer, a memory is located in your uh, stack and which keeps a track. So a single memory location and you are creating a stack which is pointing towards that same memory. And eventually all the references when are gone, it actually deletes that memory space. But with the usage of new keyword, you are actually wasting a memory because not only your stack memory is used, uh, but actually to keep account of all these uh, pointers, you are actually creating another memory in the heap, which is not really a good idea. So wasting a memory is happening quite a lot in the case of new. 
If you got it, that's okay. If you didn't got it, that's okay. The whole idea is that this is a bad practice and this is a good practice and this is a good code. So make sure whenever you're using the pointers, you use this syntax of make unique, make shared and stuff like that. You will always be appreciated by the senior developers. Yes, this is a good practice. So that's all about the shared pointers. And not only just two, you can create as many shared uh, pointers uh, just like that. And as soon as the scope is over, uh, for all the st shared pointers, remember when all the shared pointers are with, done with their job, then only the memory is going to be freed up. So that's all you have to care about it. And that's all we need to care about it as of this video. That's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. For years, we have heard the thing that C++ or in C++ language, the memory management is not automatic. This happens in other languages like Java. But with the introduction to these smart pointers, I don't know how much these textbooks are still accurate, which says that memory management is not automatic in C++. Definitely with the smart pointers, the memory management is moreover and a really automatic process and can be you can write an entire code block which automatically mem manages the memory. Anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about the weak pointers in this video. I told you in the last video that we have these shared pointers and they share the reference towards the same memory. And I also told you that there is something known as a bit of counting that goes on, also known as reference counting, but let's just say as counting. So there is some guy which is keeping an count of how many pointers are there which are referencing towards the same memory. As soon as the count goes zero, then the memory is freed up. But let's just say you want to go back to our old problem where a memory is there and this pointer is pointing towards it. As soon as all the pointers are being destroyed, I don't know why you would do that. Uh, we came so far into solving this problem. But again, let's just say you want to go back into the problem and you want to have a pointer which might be in a situation which is nobody's keeping account of it. And it might be stranded on the way that nobody is asking you that, hey, are you even pointing towards a valid memory or you're just stranded on the island empty there. If you want to get back into the situation, they have still kept the code totally back end, uh, backwards compatible and you can create still here something known as a weak pointer. And in the weak pointer, you provide the same class and call this as uh, wtim for weak tim and that is going to be pointing towards the tim. So again, uh, this is pointing towards the same memory. This is also pointing towards the same memory. This is also pointing towards the memory. But there is some guy which is keeping account of Tim and the Tim with tip and double M. But there is nobody who is keeping account on this. This is all stranded alone guy uh, walking in the path where nobody is keeping a track of it. Uh, one thing that I would like to point here and you should keep in mind that in the unique pointers you are allowed to create the first instance of these pointers like make unique. Here also we are able to create the first instance of the shared pointers with the make shared. But there is no such thing with the weak pointers at least as of now time the recording. So if I just try to d do something like this uh, make underscore uh, weak and go ahead and do stuff like this and say, hey, user, there's, there's nothing like that uh, which is happening here. And again, it doesn't really make sense to have these kinds of things. So again, compiler, please give me some errors. And it says, hey, uh, what are you doing? There is no such thing as make weak uh, because it's not allowed to do so. It's only allowed to keep a reference and nobody's keeping a track of it. So you're going to see more code like this. So there we go. As I told you, this is not really a tough subject, which is it's a really easy and to be honest, everything that's coming up as a new addition in the C++, it's much more friendlier to understand. It's much more easier to explain compared to the old traditional C++ things. But again, I would like you to question this uh, almost everywhere when somebody says, uh, is memory management automatic in the C++? Since you know about these smart pointers, ask yourself whether it is an honest statement or maybe it needs to be updated now. That's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, first and foremost, I'm really happy that you have made so far into this course. That means definitely you're enjoying it and we're gonna have a little bit more fun. So on the most recent edition, not most recent edition actually, the, 20, the C++ 20 version is out, but keeping that aside, one of the most talked thing which is included in the C++ is the move semantics. And yes, we are gonna be talking about the move semantics in this video. Couple of things before we go ahead, Yes, we will be covering up entire move semantics in just one video because it's really simple. No need to keep on dragging. I'm not in a race where I have to compete with other marketplaces. Hey, my course is of this much long hours or how many videos? No need of that. 
Also, there is a lot of debate around move semantics. Of course, everybody knows it's good memory wise, but what actually is move semantics? There's a lot of debate around it. Some people say that if you use instead of the single M person, you use two M person sign, that's move semantics. I don't believe that. If that would be the case, it would be called as move operator, but it's called as move semantics because a lot of semantics are involved in it. And it's an additional way that how we were used to do things in the C++ using the copy constructor, it's being changed a lot by the introduction of the move semantics. Now, the reason why I have first taught you about uh, the constructors, the destructors, and the copy constructor especially, is because we are gonna be talking about it a little bit and you will be able to understand more of that. So if you have skipped the part where I talked more about the copy constructor, please go ahead and watch that first and then come back here. I'll be waiting you here. Now for this video, before we get started, again, keep that debate inside, M person, two M person, I'll give you a small assignment. Create a program to swap two values. I know we are so much in depth and we have talked so much of advanced stuff. Why such a basic program? Because this program will help you to teach so much. And of course, it's going to help you to understand about the memory, how the memory actually works. And you'll, you'll learn the reality and why move semantics is used. So go ahead, pause the video and I'll be waiting here till you write the simple program. I hope many of you did pause the video there. If not, don't worry, I'll, I'll write some of the code with you. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and write some of the move semantics here and not move semantics, actually a basic program which can uh, swap two values. So usually what people write in this case, which is absolutely 100% correct, that you write simply a swap program. And this swap program is gonna expect two inputs. We are writing that generally for integers. So let's just say we expect A is being passed to us and we say that you are gonna pass on another value, which we can call it as B safely. And once we are into this, we simply go ahead and create a simple temp variable. And first and foremost, A value goes into the temp. Then we go ahead and say, hey, now A can have a overwritten value of B and B can be overwritten by a value which we have safely placed in the temp. And did I wrote temp correctly? Nope, <laughs> there we go. And this is all what we have got. And pretty easy, very basic program. I think everybody can write this. Let's go ahead and have a few variables, a very basic one, three as A, and we're gonna have a B as four, no big deal. If I call this swap here with passing A and I pass on B, since I'm expecting directly a reference, I don't need to do anything else here. I can just go ahead and work it fine. And I'll be printing out just one value, which is gonna be A like that. So we're gonna say A colon and then we are gonna dump out the value A, of course with end line and there we go. I don't need to print the value of B. I am pretty sure we can all decide if the value is being swapped or not just on A because we are just learning this stuff. So A is having four. Okay, great, we have swapped the value. Now, what happens is, since you have written so many of these programs exactly like that, or maybe a program for double, you don't even realize that this can be really memory exhaustive. So what is happening right now is something like this. We have a regular copy operation. We had two variables, A and B. And now on the next line, when we call this swap method, actually a temporary variable was created in the memory. A and B. And with the help of with this temporary variable, we were able to swap the value uh, instead of A and B. Now these are B and A. No big deal. We have done it so many times. What we don't realize is this new green area, which is a memory. We think that, hey, this is just an integer. If we are consuming a small bit of memory here, we can consume it here. No big deal. And usually space is not that much uh, space doesn't get that much of attention. But in the case where you are actually writing a program, now just for a moment, imagine this is not an integer. You're writing a program for swapping two values which are coming up from a class. And a class can have probably 100 or 500 data members, maybe more. And if you swap up a value for these two things, you're actually reserving a memory for 500 of the data members here. And God knows what what's inside them. Probably a full-fledged array, some pointers. You just want to copy and paste them. So you are reserving so much of memory just to copy. And previously we didn't have much of the choice. We had to do it like that way. And this is a very, very 
uh, intensive task and in some of the cases, not in all the cases. In case of integers and doubles, I wouldn't use move semantics. I would rather like to go, hey, it's just an integer, just go ahead and do the job and call it a day. But in the case when I'm defining some templates here or I'm using some of the uh, standard templates here, then it can be really difficult. So what could be the solution of it? Now the solution is actually really simple, which this copy, uh, not copy, this move semantics has given to us. Simply, instead of having reserved a memory and call it as temp, why don't you just create a simple temp reference and just call it on the same level here? Now when you're overwriting the things, uh, your temp is actually still there and is holding the reference. So instead of creating another memory, we directly just call it up here and call it here. So now we have uh, one more uh, variable which is pointing towards the same memory and instead of copying the data, we directly move the data inside it. And that is really a great thing. Again, it comes with a caution as well. And the most important thing is that how actually we use that. So in the move semantics, uh, what you can do is we can convert this existing method into move semantics. And again, move semantics is a part of this namespace, which is standard. So we can use it directly here. Again, if you are not using this line, make sure you put up standard and the name resolution operator means colon colon, and then you work on with that. So how do we use it? We actually keep everything exactly same, but in order to use the move semantics, we consider this move as a method. So we simply say, hey, move and just goes like that. And now it hasn't created a separate memory space, but rather has moved A into the temp. And now A is actually almost empty now. It's not holding anything else. So now A is empty and we can say, hey, whatever the value inside the B, we can move this value into the B. There we go. And now finally, what is gonna go inside the B, whatever the value we have in the temp. So we simply go ahead and move. Now definitely we are creating one more variable here, temp. But this variable is actually better compared to the previous version because we are not actually copying the value. Copying the value keeps two reference of the same entity. But in the case of move, we actually move that. So we are not reserving twice the memory that we should be. There we go. And in case of here, we are actually not doing anything else. It's just exactly the same. So it still works, it still serves the purpose and the user is not having much of the trouble here. So this is a little bit of the memory optimization which has uh, given to us by this move semantics. Coming on to another topic and another aspect which is closely related to uh, this move semantics. What are the L values and R values? Now, L values and R values definitely can be very debatable, but let me tell you, they are not. They are super simple and super easy. L value is something which is on the left-hand side and R value is something that is on the right-hand side. And yes, there is a lot of debate going on on that, but let me tell you, this is exactly what you need to know. So anything that is on the left-hand side of this equal operator is vaguely considered as a left value and R value is on the right-hand side. The general idea here is that anything on the left-hand side is usually available on the next line too and is in the memory. Whatever is on the right-hand side is generally not available on the next line, which is true in this case. In this case. So three here is a 100% R value, means once it's gone, it's just gone. It's not available in the next line. And in this case, A is can be considered as 100% left value because you can reference it and we are referencing it in the other line. So it is stored in memory. Now things become interesting when you define another method. So let's just say we are gonna have a method and this is gonna be print me, just like that. And what it does, it all, all it does is actually it returns an expression that says uh, I am print. And it can be anything like that. It's just a dummy method here. Now what you're gonna notice if, when people talk about the L values and R values is use this example. Let's just say we have a string, if I can write that, then it's gonna be a simple string, call it as an S. And this variable is gonna store whatever is being returned from this print me method. Can we do that? 100% we can do that, there is no problem in it. And this, what is the value this S is storing? Again, this S is a L value, means it's a left value, the print me, is an R value because its reference is not available on the next line. And what is the value that is storing inside the S? It says, I am print, 100%, that's your L value and R value. But where does this move semantics comes inside this as well? Now, it comes here because what is happening, uh, this print me is actually 
inside uh, inside the memory and is running and whatever it returns is given to us. So again, we sort of have two references here because as soon as you're gonna call uh, this s, it's gonna first call this print me and then this method will run. So again, not really greatly optimized in this case. But C++ goes way in depth about optimizing. So what you can do is you can do something like this. And instead of using single ampersand, which is usually for reference, but you can use two ampersand and can define a double S string. And now when I say this print me, this is again going to run fine. The only difference between the first S and the second SS is that in this case, we are copying a reference of print me inside this. But here the double S, because it's a move semantic type, it's not copying any reference, it's not keeping a track, it's directly referencing to this value here. Again, it's a little bit hard to visualize, I give you 100% on that, but just understand one thing here, that the single thing means we might have, or there are chances of having a copy of the value, so memory might be doubly occupied, but in the case of move semantics, this is completely gone, it means we are having just one reference of the thing and we are not copying the things, we are moving the things. So this is just the base idea of the move semantics. Definitely move semantics is a great topic and should be discussed a lot more. And in fact, I would recommend anybody who is taking a C++ mode into their career path, uh, try to read more about move semantics and uh, make it a habit to use more of a uh, these move semantics. It's going to serve you great over the time and you're going to save a lot of memory. So told you, move semantics are super easy to understand. That's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. Standard template library is one of the very great feature of C++ with some things which I don't really like but a majority like 95% of things is something which I like. Now, first and foremost, why do we call it as standard template library? First and foremost, they are just standard included in the standard namespace. That's why standard. And template library, we have understood in the past that template is something like an empty plate. You can put anything on top of it, whether your own custom class, integer, character, whatever you like. And that's exactly what it does. So in this, in this uh, simple example, we're going to understand one such thing about the standard template library. Remember, it's a very huge topic. I don't think you can cover it all of it in any course or book. You need to understand how to learn the documentation and eventually think, learn things on the go. So one such topic in the standard template library is a vector. So first and foremost, you need to include the vector. Again, in some compiler, I think vector is gonna work in majority in almost all the compilers by now, but there are chances. Some of you might be watching in your universities and college and some really, really old version compiler is there, so I cannot guarantee for that. But if you're watching it on your own personal laptop, you have included or downloaded stuff like code blocks, code light, Xcode, it's gonna work fine. Moving on, the one and only thing I don't like about these vector is the name vector itself. It should be called as array list. Things would have been much more easier for beginner to call it as just array list. This video is going to be divided into two parts, one very friendly for the beginners and the second part uh, it's not so friendly for the users because we'll be overwriting some of the data, especially not the data, we'll be overwriting an operator which is this guy. So at that point it might become a little bit of an advanced topic. Again, have patience in that case. Okay, moving forward. So first and foremost, let's see that how this uh, vector actually works. Now again, uh, don't consider this as a vector, rather consider it as an, a simple array list. Here's the difference. In the usual way, we create a simple array and we have to specifically mention that what's going to be the size of that array, five elements or 50 elements, we have to make it in advance. But in the case of array list, aka known as vectors in the uh, C++, the size can be grown up to any level. What basically C++ does behind the scene is it takes your array, which is of five length initially you said, and you say that, no, I'm not gonna be putting up five values. I would like to put up 10 values. It takes that array and allocate another space in the memory, this time enlarged space. Is it very optimized memory wise? No, these operations are costly, but actually the ways of pros are actually overweight in compared to the cons. So majority of the time we use that. Okay. Moving forward, first and foremost, let's see that how we can have these vectors. Again, usage of these vectors are really simple. You just have to simply say vector 
And as you can see, you can insert any classes here. These are templates. As I say, templates are always like empty plate, put anything on top of it. Now, unlike other languages, especially like Java, you don't need to very specifically put a class here. You can actually put old data types here like int or char. In case of Java, it's not allowed and we have to say something like uh, integer here, integer, not like integer and something like that. In, in C++, they are much more open. You can put up anything, your own custom classes and your own basic data type like integer. In the first version of the video or the initial half, I'll talk about integers and in the second half, the advanced guide, I'll create a class and we'll insert some data through classes as well. We're gonna call this one as inti and that's it. Now, because this is not your ordinary array, it is an vector type, you can ask a lot of questions and it's gonna give you a lot of answers for that question. And what I say how to ask question is simply say inti and put a dot. My editor is good enough, probably yours is, so it can give you some of the suggestions that what are the methods available. Methods like back, which gives a reference back. Very, very important. I'll ask you this later on. You can also get a begin, a back, clear, data, end, front, pop back, push back. There's a whole lot of things. Again, I cannot mention all of this and I cannot show you a tutorial for all of these. You have to walk through on your own, you have to read into documentation and find out most of the things on your own. That's always gonna be happening. Now one other thing that is pretty easy is actually enter the data. For that we can say push back and enter any of the data inside it. For example, I'm gonna just insert two into it. Now similar to this, I can actually copy this and insert more data into it, as much as data I like. So it can be three, it's gonna be four, it's gonna be five. Remember here one more thing, that I never mentioned that this inti is gonna be of that much size. I can keep on growing it, keep on increasing it. So basically it can be a unlimited data size here and there's nothing wrong into saying that. Now things become interesting when you want to loop through it. As I said, it's gonna be an array and one other thing that you do with the array is loop through that, very common operation. So I'm gonna show you a couple of ways how you can loop through it. First, let's go for the easy way. So I'm gonna go for a for loop here. So first and foremost, I need an initializer here. So usually we say int i is equals to equals to uh, starting position of the array. What we can do interestingly here is, first and foremost, it's not gonna be int, it's gonna be of auto because I don't know what's inside this template. Integer, maybe character, maybe something else. So I'm gonna initialize it with just an i. Now i is gonna start from the very first position of this array, whatever. I can definitely provide it the very first initial location manually, but rather in this case, you will notice that this happens quite a lot. People ask question to this inti directly, and we can simply say, hey, I want to know what's your uh, starting location begin. Now this begin gives you a reference of the very start location. Similar to that, in the condition, you can also check that keep on running till i is actually not equals to inti, dot end and this is going to give me a location of the end and then i can simply say plus plus i which is going to increment the location or in this case increment the value here now the thing become interesting when we go on to the c out and say hey this is going to be a simply end line now obviously you consider this as an array and you would like to have this something like int and i'm going to go for i but this is not possible because we have asked question and we are storing a reference here. Later on, I'll show you that how we can actually do this, but this is a little bit of advanced, not much, but little advanced topic here. Now, I said it multiple times in this video that this is a reference to begin, and this is always compared by the reference where the end. So who can store the references? Yes, you might be saying pointer at this time. And yes, basically that's what it is. You can have a syntax like this. We can dereference the pointer and have the values here. Let's go ahead and run this one. And as you can see, this is here. Again, there's not much of the difference. Some of you might be saying, hey, why we are doing so much of the hard work for just an array? This is not an ordinary array. This is a vector. This is a growing array and which can be super helpful for you in building a lot of application. And in a lot of advanced code, you're gonna see exactly this syntax. Now moving on, moving on to the part where we talk a little bit on the advanced side of this array. For example, I declare a simple struct here and I'm gonna ask you a question as well. Let's go ahead and enter this one first. 
And I'm gonna simply say that this is going to have a name. Let's call it as corners. For some reason, you are designing a software where you need to have uh, float values for uh, something like A, B, C, and D. You have four corners for some reason. Maybe you are designing an Adobe XD where you have to drag and drop all the corners at the same time. Maybe for some reason you are designing it. First and foremost, why did I define the structure here? And I said that vector can accept the classes. Why didn't I design a class here? Obviously, when there is no method inside the class, it is recommended that you use the struct. Can I use class instead of it? Yes, 100%. I just need to make sure that when I use a class, make sure that you put up a public keyword as well. These are exactly the same things. But I'm going to stick with the class, with the struct here. There we go. Okay. Now, one more thing. First and foremost, let's go ahead and use another vector here. So vector, and this time I'm going to say corners. There we go. And we're going to call this one as corners as well. A very common syntax you're going to see. Instead of saying int, int, corners, cornery, uh, we just name them exactly as whatever the class or the structure name is. Okay. How we're going to add the values inside it? That's very interesting again. So we can simply call this as corners and we can add values. So let's go ahead and use again, same pushback. But this time, this is a structure. It doesn't take any value like one. It takes a set of values. So I can use this syntax. And when you have more than one value, according to your class, you can provide all the objects inside it. One, two, three, four. Great, nice and easy. I can even copy this and add one more uh, value it to it. So there we go since this is an almost an array, but this time array is holding more than one values. So we have four, then we're going to go five, six, seven, eight. Great, no problem. Now I want to loop through it. Can I loop through this exact same manner? Yes, of course, 100% you can go ahead and do that. But let me show you something different here. Another syntax of using this. So we're going to use the for loop again. Now this time what's going to happen is you will be using things differently. You want to use an integer this time, not an auto. Maybe for some reason you want to do it. I'm going to go i, which is going to start from zero. Okay, no problem. But the problem is that in the condition, I want to know the exact size of this vector. I don't know how long this is because it can grow up and eventually I don't know. Let's just say the input is coming up on the runtime. User is entering the input. He is entering some matrix or something. I don't know how many matrices he is keep on entering. So in that case, it's a good idea that you simply call that a uh, vector and just ask for size directly on and size actually gives you a constant and you have to just compare it with something so I can just simply say here that I want to keep on running till I is actually less than corners dot size so that's great now once I'm on to this I can actually keep on incrementing it there we go nice and easy now comes up interesting part since we are going for this here uh, we are referencing an I this is not a pointer anymore. So this syntax definitely is not going to work. Okay, now if this is not going to work, uh, then obviously what can I do for this one? Now surely I don't have the luxury of using this corners and uh, something like this and can say I. Because the problem is the operator overloading. This is not allowing me to keep on streaming these values back to back. If I have just one value, that's great. But since this is not possible, I need to overwrite this. So this is a bit of advanced part. Again, if you don't get it, that's okay. Just skip this part and let me show you how to do this op operator overriding. We are actually overriding a bit of an advanced operator, which is a streaming operator. So first and foremost, I have to say that this is going to be OS stream. Return type is going to be the same. And I am actually overriding an existing operator, which is this guy. Okay, so first and foremost, what you are going to be accepting uh, as a parameter, I have to accept obviously OS stream and uh, reference of it, we are going to say stream. And we are also going to mention that this operator now should be streaming out continuously all the values inside this class. So I need to pass on a reference of this class as well. So we're going to say const uh, corners, a reference of it, and feel free to call it as anything. I'm going to call this one as just corner. Okay. Now after that, let me just get a little bit of the more spacing. There we go. Then we have to get this stream. And this we are gonna, we're actually writing a structure that whenever we are overwriting it with this class or 
this operator is used with this class, how it should stream my data. So I'm going to simply say just display all of my objects. So I'm going to say corner dot a. In this place, if I want to do more of the stuff like calculation or editing, I can actually do that here. But I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to just space out everything and I'm going to just dump them on the screen. So I'm going to simply say corner dot b. And we are going to have one more space. We're going to say corner dot c. And there we go. One more, just one more. So corner dot d. So how many you are having, you have to grab that. Now, don't forget to return this stream as well. Otherwise, things are not going to work. So we have to return this stream. Now, this is basically a very simple overwrite that we have done. If you have grabbed it, uh, that's OK. If you haven't grabbed it, that's OK, too. Now, once we have overwritten this operator to stream out continuous objects from our class, then we can go ahead and notice that now I can use a default syntax here of treating this corners as a regular regular array. If I run this one here, you're going to notice that we are directly throwing them up and I need to shrink that. And we can see that we got uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm just con constantly just throwing them up. There we go. So this is a bit of a uh, bit of advanced topic. Yes, I do understand. But again, there are many more hidden gems inside this standard library and especially the standard template library where you are being provided with lots of such templates and lots of iterators as well through which you can iterate them, you can modify them. And one other thing I would like to mention here as well as a side note, since C++ is a very close language to memory and a ton of software are being designed, you're going to notice that a lot of people actually rewrite a majority of the things in the C++ as well especially companies which are running the proprietary softwares, uh, including the game engines and things like Microsoft Offices and a whole bunch of others. They even overwrite these vector implementation and sometimes even how behind the scenes C++ is treating any array and something like that. So they many times overwrite these things to be more powerful and more optimized uh, for the memory. So just a side note that yes, sometimes you even uh, even rip off all the things from the C++ and rewrite them again, whether that's a simple plus operator or something like that. So that's happens, that happens quite a lot. That's it for this one, a small tutorial about the vectors. If you have grabbed it, that's great. If you haven't, that's fine too. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next one. Lambdas are a must-have feature in any language. C++ got a bit late, but finally they are here. Now, lambdas are something which initially a beginner really don't like, and eventually when you'll start working on some of the frameworks, libraries, databases, and some of the other APIs as well, you're going to appreciate that how much time lambdas actually save for us. It's usually good to go ahead and define a method and use it again and again, but sometimes, in fact, many times, especially in the case of database connectivity, it's really a good to have a very small function which doesn't have any name and it's just disposed eventually. Like, once you define a method and give it a name and properly place it somewhere, it's always going to be there. But sometimes you don't want that. You want that I want a function to do some stuff and just I want to dispose that right away. There's going to be no need in the future of that function. And yes, I do understand that eventually, at the first time when I was learning them, I thought that why would anybody do that? But eventually when I start working with the databases and all those stuff later on, I realized, yeah, they are very, very helpful. And in other languages, they are present in Java, in JavaScript, in Python, they're almost everywhere. A side note, in C++, lambdas and closures are two different things. We are not gonna be talking about closures. We don't want to make it confusing. I also won't be doing a very, very intense task with the lambdas because the goal here is to understand the lambdas, not to get confused with them. If I'll introduce a, a topic which is very complex and we are achieving that through the lambdas, then you won't be able to understand the core syntax of the lambdas and core usage. So we're going to keep it down very, very simple. First and foremost, how does the lambda look like? It's actually really simple to have a lambda in your application. And let me show you how it looks like. The syntax is really simple. You start with the square brackets. That means, yeah, that's going to be the start of the lambda. And after that, you put up your scope. That means your curly braces. And that's basically an empty lambda here. And of course, uh, make sure you run that because this is an empty function. Nobody's going to come to run it. 
because it doesn't have any name. So you cannot reference it later on. So you have to run it as soon as you define it. So that's the thing we have to got it. Now this is basically a lambda that we are having, but is it of any use? No, because we are not doing anything inside it. So what I can do is I can simply go ahead and say C out and I'm gonna put up a syntax. Let's just go for hello. And of course I can put up my website name, uh, which is learn code online dot in, of course. And uh, I'll add a slash in as well. We'll put up a semicolon and that's basically it. Is it weird? Yes, of course. I will 100% give you on that, that yes, this is weird. And in fact, it runs and it works and it prints out the thing. is in itself very, very strange that what kind of gibberish is that? Square brackets, then the scope, and then we are running it directly and we are able to do all of these things on the go. Yes, I'll give you on that. Now, interestingly, a couple of more things comes up that you think that, yes, this is a scope, I can run it. So what about if I have a return data type onto it? Let's go ahead and build something like that. Again, square brackets, then you put up a scope here, just like that. But now, instead of the scope, you have a return type as well. Now, what you're gonna notice in such cases that when you have something like a return, uh, probably 100, like that, in that case, what we do is we move these uh, curly uh, these parentheses right up here. And the return type, whatever that is, we don't mention that. It's automatically being determined by the variable that is there. Usually auto is used in such syntax. But again, uh, it's not really compulsory. It works fine. It compiles fine. Right now, it's not giving these things to any other variable. That's why we are seeing it. But again, I will 100% give you, this is one of the weird syntax. In other languages, the syntax is much more easier, very friendly, but this is what we have got. Now let's understand one more scenario, which is not really a great example of Lambda, but you'll understand this nicely. Lambdas are also used when you want to treat a function just like a variable. You want to toss them around everywhere. So let's just say we have an auto and we call it as sum. And for some reason, you don't want to define it at the very top, you just want to define it like a lambda. So what you can do, you can define something known as generalized lambda, quite used uh, quite a lot. So we use these guys again. And since we will be actually returning or we'll be taking some input from the user as well, so let's define them first, and then our scope goes like this. So what we're defining is we are doing just simple task. We are simply having a return statement which uh, calculates A, plus B. There we go. Very simple. But I don't want to keep it very, very simple. We are quite in depth in the course. I want to just generalize at least an auto to them. So auto A and auto B. Now, I don't know what data type it is. I'm just mentioning them as auto. So it determines them automatically for me. Now, this is weird. Uh, yes, of course, this is 100% weird here. But what we have done is we are actually not using the templates, but rather we have defined a very generalized lambda inside a variable sum and we can use it multiple times and can calculate a whole lot of stuff. So we're gonna go ahead and do something like this. So we're gonna say C out and we're gonna say something like this, sum of uh, two and uh, five is, again, this is not really a best example I could have come up with, but there we go. Now I can treat this sum variable, first need to put these, I can treat this sum variable as a method and I can just pass on values like this, two and five. And of course I'll put up an N line and there we go. And if I run this, obviously this is gonna calculate the stuff, uh, two and five are seven, but also since we have generalized this, we can go ahead and say something like this, that sum of uh, 2.5 and 5.5 is actually, we can provide a sum of 2.5 and again here as well, which is 5.5. We'll be able to grab that because we have generalized an auto here, so automatically this is being calculated. Not only that, since this is a generalized lambda, we can define something interesting here as well. I can say A is gonna be, or we are gonna have a string A, which is gonna be something like ABC. Again, a literal string here. We're gonna have a string which is gonna be B, and that's gonna be simply uh, D, E, F. And we can actually sum that out too. So I'm gonna quickly sum that. And directly let's use a sum. 
Again, you might have noticed that my compiler is also saying that uh, the variable that you're using sum is actually a lambda and is not actually a function because we don't have any name for it. Lambda actually saves a bit of memory too. So we're gonna simply have a sum and I can say a comma b. And there we go, we're gonna grab a sum of it. I'll put up an end line, I don't need it actually. I'm gonna run this one here and we're gonna see that uh, a, b, c, d, e, f, I actually need an end line. So we're gonna say end line and there we go. And by we are having this one because of this guy, there we go. So it should be all good now and we are able to grab that. So there we go, I know this is not really very complex example, but I really didn't want it to have more of the complex example. We definitely ca can go in depth, we can connect the database, we can have a reference that whether the database was connected or not, we can write a simple lambda for that. But I wanted to keep things simple because already there are tons of confusing examples on the internet about lambdas. I highly recommend to read the Microsoft documentation on the lambdas, they have a little bit more complex example. Surely gonna give you a hard time to understand that, but this is what it is. Coming on to the summary of this video, regardless you appreciate it or not, you now have a full knowledge of how Lambda looks like and you can define Lambdas whenever it is needed. And that was my only goal with this video, to introduce you with the syntax of Lambdas so that during the project time, if you see these syntax, you can actually be friendly that yes, I have seen something like this and more advancement, you can do them on the go. So that's it, a very quick and small introduction about lambdas. We'll catch up in next video. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video. In this video, we're gonna talk about files. Before I say and talk more about the files, let me tell you one very important thing, that file handling can be done very easily in the C++ and majority of the stuff comes from the, its predecessor, which is most of the stuff is actually borrowed from the C. And if you'll be working into any company which handles up these files like images or MP3s or video files and they are dealing with the core C++, then you'll find that that, li that company has designed their own library or module for handling these files. The default stuff which handles the file is not very elaborative and it's not much used, but still we are gonna take a look on briefly that how it works as a default one. Again, I mentioned that there are enough of third-party libraries as well in C++ that can handle file much, much nicely and there is a good layer of abstraction so that you can focus on just the file and you can get rid of the weird syntax that is usually there in handling the file, especially in the cases of uh, images and video files. With that aside, let's go ahead and uh, do a very teeny tiny stuff in this video. We'll be just learning the basics about files here. Now again, I would love to break down this video into a couple of parts so that you feel much more comfortable in the handling the file because for the beginners, it might be a bit of a tough topic. First and foremost, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a variable and just an ordinary variable. So I'm gonna say create a static const care pointer and we can name this one anything. So I'm gonna say uh, this one as original file. And again, this is a weird name, but this is a variable name, okay? And we're gonna just insert some of the element inside it or just a simple name. And this is gonna say original file dot txt. And that's what is inside my variable, okay. Now the important part is this is just a variable. It can be of any other type as well. Uh, not any other, but couple of other types are supported. But definitely since we are providing a name here, it can be directly a string type, but usually you're gonna see the character constant here being used. Now let's see how we can handle the file. Now in order to handle the file, what you're gonna notice is we use this file here. Now this is always in all caps. This is coming up from the C library directly. Uh, yes, it is available in the IO stream as well, but most of the time you're gonna see people defining the C standard library for using this file. Both of the versions are totally fine, and again, it might depend on your compiler as well, so make sure you double check that. Now, after that, all you have to do in here is create a pointer of that, and usually we call this pointer as file handling because it handles the file. But again, it's a variable name, it can be anything. Now once you have this, you can do a whole lot of things with this one. The first thing that we are gonna learn about in this case is gonna be f open. Now f open requires you to pass on two things. First, the file name, and second, the mode in which you want to open the file. You can see here as well, file name and the mode as well. Now file name, I have already taken that down, which is original file, and then comes the mode here. Now before I move ahead and go ahead and talk about these modes, 
would like to mention one more interesting thing. Now here in my editor, you can see that I have got this main file as well as I have got this products, which is uh, inter underscore CPP. So this is where all the things are. Now, most importantly, even if you are working in Visual Studio Code, Code Blocks, Code Lite, wherever, you should know where actually your output is coming up. This is gonna be different for every single system, so make sure you know where your output is coming. For me, I can just simply right click on the output file and can say show in Finder, and this is where my executable is coming up. You can notice this is inside some of the debug folder. It's gonna be different for every single IDE, so I cannot help you much apart from this, so make sure you know where your executable is coming up. This executable is gonna be different for Linux, maybe different for different Linux flavor as well. And there's gonna be different exe file for the Windows. For me, it's directly like an executable here. So make sure you're able to find that up because this is exactly where your file is gonna be coming up. So make sure you watch that out. Now, apart from that, in the mode, actually we have got a whole lot of types of mode here. Not much, but actually six type of, or maybe a little bit more. So what we can do is we can provide a different kinds of mode here. And modes are how you want to open your file. You want to open your file in the read mode, in the write mode, or maybe in the append mode. There are a couple of modes available. The most interesting one is actually the write mode. What it does is if the file exists, it opens it up for writing it, writing purpose and if the file doesn't exist it just creates a file for you so this can also be used for creating the file as well now once we have created the file it is very important that you close that file as well otherwise you'll be leaving some spaces for memory leaks as you can see here the f close takes a file pointer here and we have already created a file pointer we have named it as fh and that's it that's all we have to go now once i do this all we are doing is we are opening a file for write mode if the file doesn't exist, we are going to create and then open it. And since we have said file close, it's going to just close the file. Very simple. So let's see that. So here we can see that it's uh, there is nothing in here. So I'm going to just shrink that a little bit so that you can see file actually created. And we run this and the file actually comes up. Now, although this is a very basic and blank text file, there is nothing inside it. But this is how you actually create your file. Very simple, very easy. We're gonna be doing a bit of bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna just move this so that you can see things happening. And that's good enough. Okay, so now that you have created the file, uh, all we can do is we don't need to do much of the stuff. Let's see one more, a couple of more stuff as well. We want to rename the file as well. So I'm gonna copy this one and I'm gonna paste this one and I'm gonna call this one as uh, edited file and the file name this time is going to be edited file .txt, edited file txt. Now for that, I actually don't need to open or close this because we can rename it directly and renaming and deleting the file is actually super easy. All we have to do is just use this rename. It takes old and new character pointer, which we are providing up here. So the original name is or old name is uh, original file and make sure file is there for changing the name. And we can simply say the new name is edited file. And that's it. Told you, it's really, really simple. So we're gonna run that. And now our file name got changed. No big deal. I'm gonna comment that out. And the last thing that we are gonna do is remove this file. So let's just say remove. And in the remove, you don't need to pass this much of the parameter. You just need to pass on the file name. So in this case, the file name is actually inside the edited file. And that's it, I can remove this and I can remove all of this. And that's it, that's all you need to remove. And we're gonna run that and there we go, the file is gone. So there we go, nice and easy, a simple example that will help you to understand that how the files are being created, edited and deleted. Definitely we haven't opened the file yet, we will be doing that very soon, but I think this gets you a brief idea. Now, as a simple assignment, uh, make sure you read a little bit more about the file. Again, the Microsoft documentation are pretty, pretty good, but sometimes they actually work only on the Microsoft systems like Visual Studio Code and Windows. So if you're on other system, make sure you watch out for this file because Windows has got a lot of overwritten for this one. So that's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hatesh here and welcome to another video on file handling. So in the last video we saw that it's not really that much stuff to handle file. All it requires is just a file pointer and it can do a lot of stuff. In this video we'll be writing into the file. We know how to create a file now and rename it and delete it. 
In this video, we'll be adding some information in this file and we'll be reading that out. Pretty simple and I'll give you an assignment of removing that file at the end of this video. I hope you can do that. Let's go ahead and see that. Now first and foremost, I'll go up at the top and usually in the recent code, you're gonna see that nobody actually defines things like hash define and to create constant and stuff. Rather, uh, people prefer actually to use const expression here, which is almost similar to that, but it's actually a better approach of defining the constant. So I'm gonna define an integer, call it as max buffer, and its value is gonna be a literal 1024. Okay. Why we are declaring this? We will be using this to actually flush out our buffer while reading the file. For just writing into the file, it doesn't really, we doesn't really need that. So we're gonna go back. First and foremost, we actually need two things, a name and what information you'll be sending inside the file. So we're gonna be putting up both in, into the character constant here. So constant character pointer, I'm gonna say file name, and the name of the file is gonna be uh, my, my, uh, this file, I'm really running out of the name here, my this file.txt, definitely you can do a better job than this, but yeah, this is file name, my this file. Okay, and then we need another, what information will be going inside that, so we'll be saying character, uh, constant character pointer, I'll call that as information, and I'll put up some of the information in here. So I'm gonna say lorem, ipsum, dolor, sit, emin, uh, yes, uh, emit, I, yes, I really remember a few of these words. So yes, we have got these two information, now we want to put these information into the file. Whenever I say I want to put some information in the file, the file keyword comes into your mind, and you create a simple pointer, which you call as file handler, and that's it, that's basically it. Now, first and foremost, we need to open the file in order to write into that. We have seen that there are a couple of modes actually. The first uh, parameter that we need to pass on is the file name, which I have already got as a uh, file name. Now the modes are very interesting. In the previous one, we saw that we can use this W mode uh, to write into the file. I'll show you one more mode in this case. In fact, two more modes in this case. First, let's talk about how the, actually this write mode works. Now after that, the file is opened up, so you want to put some information into the file. So I'm gonna run a simple for loop to run multiple information or get an iteration of information inside it. So regular for loop, so we're gonna say int i is gonna be starting from zero, and we will be putting up the information probably for 50 times, that's great, and we're gonna say plus plus i. Okay, this is all basic stuff. Now how we put up the information, just like we have puts, we have been using puts for a really long time in this course, we have all these F uh, acronyms as well. So you can see there is a guy known as F puts, and it's not just F puts, we have got F put S, we have got F put C, we have got F put WC, which takes different parameter and can be used for different of the choices here. What really suits us in this case is this F put S because it takes a constant character pointer and the file name as well. So I'm gonna say that this is my information, so please take this, and you have to put this inside this file which is handled by this file handler. There we go, I've told you, it's really super easy. And once you have put up this all information, don't forget to close the file. So we're gonna say F close, which takes just one thing, this file handler, and there we go. Told you, it's really, really simple. Now let's go ahead and run this one. Before I run this one, I would like to shrink this a little bit so that we can see that where the files are actually being created. So there we go. We got this file and now notice very closely that how much of the text is being put up inside this. Okay. Great, we have got this one. Now notice it one more time when I run this one. Notice I'm not making any change. I'm again running it. So technically 50 lines were already there. We should have 50 more lines because this is what we have got. But what we can see is exactly same amount of data. If I run it as one more time, it's gonna run successfully and we are gonna get the exact same amount of data. And that is what the W actually does. So read mode is to read the file, w mode is to write the file, but the append mode is actually to append the data in whatever the data is existing there. So if I use an append mode, that means keep whatever the data in my file safe and start writing from the next line. So if I run this one here, now it runs nicely and we can see that the data is actually doubled up. If I run it one more time now, the data should be 
much much more so there we go so this is the difference between variety of modes uh, append mode write mode and read mode i highly recommend to read a little bit more uh, because it's not possible to cover everything but uh, definitely read a little bit more okay now since we have learned how we can write into the file let's go ahead and comment this out now we want to read the file and learn a little bit more in order to uh, read from a file, first and foremost, you need this. So character, we're going to need a variable. We're going to call this one as buffer. And this buffer will have an array and will be of some size. And the size that we're going to use is the max buffer. Now, it's not compulsory to always use a buffer size of 1024, but this is usually an ideal size on which we want to flush our buffer. But again, it can be a little bit longer. New processors and new memories can actually handle way more than this. Now after that, we are gonna declare a simple file. Again, we are dealing with the file, so we need this file pointer, a file handler, and then we need to open the file. So we're gonna say f open, again, same thing, provide a file name, and in what mode you want to open up. It makes sense to open the file in the read mode if you just want to read it. Okay, great. Now, we want to run a continuous loop which can keep on running and we want to display the output on our standard output, means our console. So let's go ahead and keep on running a simple while loop. Now inside the while loop, just like we have this f puts, we have this f get as well. And notice here again, f get s, f get wc, f get c, there is a whole lot of things that we can use. Notice this first one here, f gets. It takes a character pointer, an integer, and file, uh, file pointer here. This is the interesting one here. So we'll be dumping out all the information uh, from the buffer, uh, which we have already created. The integer actually takes uh, that what is your maximum buffer size on which I should keep on flushing it. So we're going to provide a max buffer here. And the file pointer, we have got it as fh. Okay. Now what do you want to do when we want to just display the output? So for that, we're going to use this f put here. So f put s, notice it takes two parameters. The first one is going to be the buffer. So just display the buffer, but where you want to throw this buffer? Now this is where it gets a little bit weird. So how does this work is actually we don't provide a file pointer this time to handle it, but rather we provide it where we want to dump this information, which is std out. In our case, the standard output is our console, which uh, is used to dump all of this information, but not compulsory. You can see a lot of people dump this information into another file for reading purposes and a whole bunch of other things can be done. We're gonna keep things simple and final, we are gonna just close this one. And there we go. Now, if I run this one code here, it's gonna be pretty simple and easy. If I run this one, now I can see that all information is dumped on my console, which doesn't really look good. But anyways, I told you. Now again, I would like to remind you that uh, reading and writing these files is not really tricky, but again, every company implemented these things because this is not really an abstraction. This is really, really digging up into a lot of things, especially when you are reading up the data from the file, this is like too much. And we have other nice resources which can simplify these things and you can focus on just reading and writing instead of worrying about these f puts and all these things so majority of the companies have their own implementation of these file handling and you will be working on them that's it for this one and let's catch up in the next one hey there everyone hitesh here and welcome to this section where we are going to talk about stl the standard template library before we go ahead further, I would like to mention to all those group of students who have actually directly jumped into this section and have skipped all the other lessons. Here's my word of advice. Please don't do this. You are going to face a lot of issues because the way how we have structured this course is that we have already introduced so much of the STL in the past. And this entire course structure is actually not about your regular school books or textbooks. This is very different. This is personally designed by me. So make sure you watch all those videos before getting in a hurry that I just want to learn only STL. But definitely you will get a lot of good stuff in this as well. But again, you might be crying out and saying in the comment section that, hey, I didn't got this, I didn't got that, while other students will be able to understand it. So don't skip that. Okay, moving further. We're gonna talk about the STL or standard template library. You should know one thing, that the standard library and the standard template library are two different things. 
And yes, many times they are interchangeably used, but it's not really a good thing. The standard library is something which is namespace standard, and the standard template library is more about, about generic programming, which we are gonna discuss in this video. So make sure you keep this in mind. So let's talk about this STL. And there are three major reasons why I personally love it, and probably you are also going to love this STL. And from this video onwards, I'm not gonna be calling it every time standard template library, it's too big, everybody calls it at STL, I'm gonna be addressing that with the same name. The first thing that I absolutely love about it is it takes generic programming to the next level. Now what is generic programming? I consider this as something between uh, you write your pseudocode and you write your actual code, but generic programming is more about in between the pseudocode and the actual code. In this, let's just say I want to make a program of which number is bigger. I'm talking about just the numbers. I didn't explicitly mention that whether it's gonna be an integer number, a decimal number, or even a character. I'm just judging which one is bigger. So in the pseudocode, you just write very abstract code, but in the genetic programming, you don't really care about the data type that much. You just care about the implementation that much. And this is moreover about the genetic programming that we take. And C++ STL takes them at a very, very much bigger scale. We're gonna discuss a little bit more on the practical example of what exactly is genetic programming and how do we write it in this video only. The next thing that I absolutely love about STL is it provides the built-in data structure and algorithm, and there is no shortage of them. The STL is designed in such a way that it provides you a whole lot of things that we're gonna talk in the next video, but during that all the things which is provided by it, there are so much of the algorithms and data structure provided by default to you. Data structure which can be helpful for linked list, doubly linked list, and a whole bunch of other things. Algorithms like a bunch of sorts are directly just given to you. You just need to apply them. And the best part about this whole thing is that since everything is just built in inside the language, it's almost like I'm just using C++. There is no additional trickery I'm doing. These are just the core language feature itself. And if you're using any compiler which has been built in last like five or seven years, I'm pretty sure it supports the STL. It's being really here for more than a decade. So you're gonna see this almost in all the compilers. So compatibility wise, there is no issue at all and you can use that. And this is one of the reasons why so many people prefer in the competitive programming as well as in the interviews, the C++, because there is a generic programming, there is STL, and there's so much of the data structure that can be handy in these situations. Now definitely other languages also provide one or the other versions of these uh, data structures. Python has got its all iterators and all those other stuff. Similar to this, C++ has got it as well. Now, coming up onto the point, Generic programming, this is a very debatable topic. A lot of people debate about it. I would also like to start a little bit of that, but don't take it too much here. So just generic programming, what actually it is? The generic programming is really simple in which data types are not specified at the time of implementation of code logic. And we really don't want to care about it as well. I want to write as much as generic of a programming as well, or generic implementation, so that no matter what data type comes up, it automatically adopts that data type. Not only the data type, if there is some a, a custom-made class being designed, I should be able to handle that as well. So definitely it requires a lot of brain work to design a code which can handle almost anything that comes up. And not everything can be molded into the generic programming. Just keep that in mind as well. Now also, I would like to mention that some of the books as well as some of the advanced programmer call it as runtime polymorphism. Yes, of course, this is absolutely 100% correct. Polymorphism simply means when things takes more than one form. We saw that already in the course many, many times that how one function can be utilized at multiple places. But here actually things are at runtime because this function doesn't take any other form before the runtime. When program is, uh, when the values are fed to that program, then it takes the shape. So in variety of uh, things, you're gonna see that known as a runtime polymorphism. But again, don't get confused too much. Already these keywords, polymorphism, abstraction, confuses a lot of people. So don't get confused, just focus on what the code aspect is. With that, I would like to end this debate with one very important note that we still need to mention the data type. This is not an escape to make C++ more like Python-ish where we don't care about uh, integers or float or any other data type. We still have to worry about them, we still mention them, but we really don't care about them inside the generic implementation. Okay, I hope you got that. 
Now let me show you what actually generic programming is and we're gonna write a very simple program. Uh, we have seen this as many times but I know many people are just new for just this section. So let me show you that. So generic programming is something where we create our own templates and uh, first and foremost let's create a template here. So we have seen that in the past as well we get a template and inside the template we just mention the data type. We don't exactly mention something like int or maybe float or something like that. We actually mention a very simple uh, type name and call it as a t. Now this means that this t variable can take multiple forms. It can be converted into integers or floats or characters or maybe anything else as well. Depends on how you are implementing. Just below that we define a simple method or maybe a class however you like to implement. I'm going to mention it as a get bigger, not bugger, get uh, bigger which is going to get me a value that out of two values which one is bigger. So first thing is I need to take two values and input and we are going to expect that a t data type is going to come up I'll call it as a, a t data type will come up I'll call it as b. There we go. Now obviously I will be comparing the value and will be returning the bigger value and the data type of that is going to be same just like a and b. So I'll say that a t value will get returned and that's it. Nice and easy. Now we're going to simply say return and then we want to compare uh, a and b. So let's go ahead and say that I'll compare if a is greater than b then I'll, sure, I'll make sure that a gets returned otherwise we'll show that b gets returned. Nice and easy. We have seen this kind of implementation so many times for addition, for multiplication, doing a lot of stuff. Now the advantage what this generic programming gives us that here I'm not worried about what data type t is. And instead if you don't want to call it as t you definitely can call it as v and you gotta call it as v almost every place here. Not almost, almost exactly every place. So this is one thing that you should keep in mind that it's not really compulsory to call it as t, we can call it as v. But in most of the programming books as well as online blogs it is called as t for uh, just a template. But again it can be of anything. Moving further, what this does it gives me a lot of freedom about not to worry about my method itself. So one, what I can do is I can simply say get bigger and I can provide literal values here 3 and 4 or 3 or 5 however you like to go. And I can say something like this. Now when I run this program you're going to notice that this time I get 5 here. So I'm not worried about whether I'm passing the integer type or I can say that I want to compare between 3.5 and uh, 3.6 maybe. So we are this time passing up the decimal values here and still we are able to grab the perfect results. This is a generic programming. Now what might surprise you a little bit that it can also take a character as well like this and I can remove this and provide a character. Is it going to work perfectly? No, probably not how you are expecting it because it can it just compares the ASCII value and gives you that ASCII or ASCII however you say that and it compares that and gives the result based on that. Probably not what you want but definitely with a little bit more of the checking and more over the implementation of this, this can be modified. This is known as generic programming. And in the standard template library, almost these kinds of generic comes up in a lot, apart from a whole lot of data structure which is provided to you by default. So I hope you are very excited to get started with this one because this is so much fun. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Hatesh here and welcome to another video on STL. In this video I would like to walk you through with the different components or the parts of the standard template library. One thing you need to understand that standard template library is huge and we can just sit here and talk about it for a month or maybe longer than that. But it's not possible, it's not really practical to do it. So eventually no matter how many topics I cover you eventually have to go into the documentation part of STL and have to learn things on your own. This might uh, this might make a lot of you unhappy that hey why are you not covering everything about STL? It's not possible. It's like asking cover everything about C++. But I'll give you enough of the idea that you can try things on your own and you'll have enough of the learning knowledge about majority of the components. So let's talk about the STL. The majority of the STLs are divided into four components and there are little bit more than these four components and you might be asking why there is one in purple because that's a special component or special part of STL. Let's talk about some of them one by one. Some we have discussed a very little tiny teeny uh, in the past as well so we're gonna start with that. 
So the first major component is iterators. Now iterator is something which you can loop through over or you can just access all information in a sequential order. And you might have seen them in the vectors. But it's not about just that, that vectors are just iterators. There is a whole lot of iteration debate that we can have. For example, integer can also be very loosely considered as iterator as well because they are completely capable of iterating the values and are used there. Are they 100% iterators? No, they are not, but they are a loose type of these. Pointers, a similar situation here. So iterators, just like loop, are there, but there are a couple of types of iterators that you're going to see people talking about. There are a type of like input iterators, output iterators, uh, forward iterators, which are used for the singly, singly linked list. There is a bidirectional iterators, which are used for doubly linked list. And there are then random access iterators, which are a whole another nightmare of the things. So again, it's not possible to cover all of them, but I have given you enough of the idea that if you want to go further into them, you can. We have already discussed vectors. We will again come back on the vectors and I'll show you some of the essential parts of these iterators as well. After that comes up is functors. Now functors are uh, really one of the most debatable things and it simply is an implementation of the parentheses or the methods where these parentheses or their constructor can be overwritten and you can now manage state. The state management is one of the hottest debate uh, which is being done in 2019 and 2020 and probably a little bit more than that. And every single framework that you are seeing coming out, whether on web or C++, is talking about state management because this is a big programming issue we haven't talked about years. Things like what's going to be in my variable because variable keeps on changing the state and new information keeps on coming. And to keep a track of what information was that in that variable in the past and what information will come up in the future or current is actually a big thing. And that is actually being done by the functors. A lot of time in the sum of the books, you're going to realize that some people say that uh, if you are using a pointer to keep a track of function, then all of these you can do through the functors. Again, this can be a little bit of the tricky subject. After that comes up is the algorithm, which is the most favorite subject of majority of the students who are competing in the competitions and a bunch of other stuff as well. C++ gives you access to a whole lot of searching and sorting libraries and they just cook it up for you and give it to you. Now, in majority of the competitions, you will never be asked like implement a breadth first search or a depth first search. There is always some kind of modification being done in those algorithm and Definitely these default searching and sorting can save a whole lot of time for you. But again, these are very important and favorite topic for a whole lot of people. Now after that comes up is the container. Now container is all in itself a different giant which is hiding in the standard template library. So what container is, it's a specific implementation of some well-defined data structure. So what does that mean? Now, it's not about integer floats and uh, floats and the pointers in the data structure. There are a whole lot of data structures available to us. Let's talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail. So let's talk about containers. We have seen they are implementation of well-defined data structure, but what are those data structures? The first one is the sequence type. The sequence type data structures are moreover like vectors and list. And as we have discussed in the past as well, that vectors are moreover like an array, but it can grow. And we have seen in the past videos that how it grows actually in the memory. We have discussed that, won't be doing that again. So we can see that we have list and the vectors. We have dex as well, also known as, some people call it as dqs, uh, but it's actually dex. We have stacks as well. We have queues as well. And a whole bunch of, uh, I think these are the only one majority which are used one, but they are, the only common thing is they are all sequential. There is another type here, which is associative type. Consider associative type moreover like a bag and you can put up all information in that bag. So we have a set, we have multi sets, we have maps, we have multi maps. The thing is that uh, if you want multiple information like a set only allows you to have a unique value into that. And if you want duplicate values to be allowed in your whole bag, then you want to use a multi set. Similar for maps, maps are moreover like a combination of two values. Also maps are known as uh, two tuple a very, very specific name for them. But yes, these are known with that. So maps consist of two tuples means a key value pair, and that is being used. There is another one which is unordered associative uh, types. Again, uh, it's really, really going on. But 
you might be noticing here that the types of the data is exactly same. We have sets, multi-sets, we have got maps and multi-maps as well. So what's the difference between associative types and the unordered associative type? It's about how under the hood they are implemented in the C++. So the first one, the associative type, are actually taking advantage of binary trees. So if you want access or you want to take advantage of the binary tree features for searching and for sorting, then go ahead and use associative types of that. And if you want to use hash maps, but make sure you are aware about that hash map may sometimes produce a really, really worst case. But again, sometimes they are exceptionally good and there is no match for them. So it depends on what situation you are in, whether you want to take advantage of binary trees or whether you want to take advantage of hash maps, you can actually go ahead and use that. Now with this, surely we haven't talked much about what is this binary tree, what is this hash map. I do have a separate course about the data structures and algorithm in C++. Uh, that knowledge is surely going to be very, very helpful, but I'll make sure that it doesn't become really a hindrance in this course uh, to understand all these uh, things, whatever we are going to discuss. Of course, all of them is not at all possible, but I'll try my best to have uh, to give you enough of the knowledge. So there we go. A brief talk about what are the types that we can see in the STL, and I hope you have enjoyed this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there, everyone. Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, we're going to talk about functors or function operators. Yes, there are a couple of other names as well. And we'll be choosing a path where the understanding of the concept is on the priority and we'll choose the very simplest possible example. I have seen many times while explaining these complex topic, people try to go extremely in depth with the cost of clutterity over the original concept. I'm not gonna do that. I'll try to bring up as simplest and as easiest example so that once and for all, you understand what are functors. Again, the functor simply means you are doing an, a little bit of over operator overloading over the parenthesis. And by parenthesis, I literally mean these guys on the main. So again, this can be modified up to a great extent if you go much in depth, but I'll give you a very basic and simplest possible example. So without a further ado, let's get started. So in here, uh, let's just say, and this is a quite common thing that you will be doing as a C++ programmer is rewriting a variety of your classes, including your ints and bools and floats and a whole bunch of other things. You in fact write more, more than what you expect. So let's just say there is a task of creating your own custom float class. You call this as my float. You definitely can call it as a float with a capital F. It's not going to bother you much, but still I'm going to call this one as simply float. So let's go ahead. This is my class. No big deal. In the class, I have a member, which I call this one as a simple float. I'm going to call this one as FL. And yes, the, the font in the Xcode makes it looks like one. So I'm going to call this one as FT. Yeah, that's actually better. So we're going to call our float as FT. Now this is all great. Now I'll have a public area in my float, in my class, my float. And the first thing is I want to have a constructor. So my float, there we go. Constructor is being overwritten. What I want to do is usually initially we start the integer or anything, it starts with the zero, but for some reason, I don't know what, but for some reasons, this constructor doesn't allow it to start with the traditional one. So we can simply say that our FT is gonna get started with 0.1. Again, it's your custom class. You are fully uh, authorized to do whatever you like. Apart from that, we are gonna have one more method which will be able to grab the value. So we're gonna say void. We have designed these kinds of things in the past as well, so it should be absolutely clear to you. Just an ordinary getters and setters. So this is gonna just get the value. So we're gonna simply say C out, C out, there we go. And this one is gonna just grab the value. So let's grab FT and provide an end line. There we go. So far, nothing about uh, functors or anything like that. This is all basic stuff that we have got. I'm gonna create an object of my float. I'm gonna call this one as floaty, just like that. And inside the floaty, you want to grab the value. So let's go ahead and first grab what's the default value that floaty has given to me. I'm gonna run the program and without a doubt, we got 0.1. So our class is working fine. Now I have a special objective here. I want to define a functionality for this floaty, something like this. And in this floaty, I want—I don't want to say something like this, like uh, add a value. I can do this kind of a stuff, add value, and I can add uh, 0.1 here or 0.2, something like that. That is 
absolutely easy to do. I can define a method like get value and can accept a parameter and can do this. Now sometimes while creating your own custom classes, you want to happen these things directly with the constructor. That constructor directly accepts the value and we simply go ahead and do that. Now in these cases, uh, we cannot use these constructors because constructor actually runs for the very first time only. So we won't be able to do and put up a default value. So obviously this cannot be achieved by a constructor. We need to overload and we need to overload these parentheses because this is where exactly the value is being passed on. This is something known as operator overloading, totally valid, totally allowed in C++. If you remember from one of the previous video where we talked more about the vectors, we actually overload uh, these operators. So this is exactly the syntax how it goes on. So you'll get much more clarity on that video too. Let's go ahead and do that. It's actually super simple to overload any operator. First, write your return type. In this case, I don't have any. You write the keyword, literal keyword of operator and the name of operator which you want to overlo overload or overwrite. In this case, I want to overwrite this one here. Now also, then after that, you pass on the parameters that you accept. So again, remember, there is a two different thing here. These guys, which I want to overload and these guys, which where I'm expecting accepting the parameters. So this could be changed to something like this as well. But here, since my requirement is not to overload these guys, but rather to overload these guys, that's why I'm writing a big confusion point uh, that can happen here. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is whatever the value somebody pass on, I'm going to expect that this is a float. Again, templating could have been used here to make it much more awesome, but we're going to keep things super simple. I'm going to call this value as V. And once I go inside that, I'm going to simply say, that whatever the existing value uh, I have defined for the float, just take that value and we are gonna simply add the value V to it. There we go, nice and easy. Now we're gonna simply close this and that's it. Now, what is going to happen, what is happening here? No, it's not FL, it's actually FT, there we go. Okay, now what is happening when I run this program? Now this value is gonna be taken up and will be added to the existing value. In order to get it more, let's see what the floaty is exist uh, is consisting. So we're going to simply say get value after this and run this program. Now notice here that it says 0.2 now. But what happens if I just uh, give it a 1 2? Since float is a bigger value and int is a smaller value, we can actually cast that and we don't need to worry much about it, at least in this case. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to see 1.1, there we go. And you can even uh, replicate this multiple times if you wish that here I'm passing on a value of uh, 1.3. And then I'm grabbing the value so you can see this method actually works every single time the way how we want it to. Again, the whole idea is to overload in this case, these parentheses, a default functionality here, but it's not limited to these ones. We can actually overload a whole lot of things as well, just like we did an overload on these guys. It can be done for many other uh, purposes as well. And this is going to be called as functor or the functional operator. Told you it's really, really simple to have this one. And I hope you have enjoyed this video. Let's go ahead and catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video on STL. In this video, we're going to be taking a sub part of the algorithm. Now algorithms are designed to do variety of functions, but one of the core foundation concepts that or the task that algorithm usually perform is either searching and sorting or some versions of it. In this video, we're going to be talking about sorting and it would be totally unfair if I just keep on talking about sorting without tell you about the sidebar of this. Now the big sidebar of this topic is that we haven't actually talked about the sorting because this was course about majorly for the C++ understanding behind the scenes, memories, a whole bunch of thing about C++, not about C++ with data structure. I have a completely dedicated and separate course about it already available at my website learn code online and you can check that out. Anyways, so sorting can be done through variety of types and over the years mathematicians have given even enough amount of their time that we can find out what searching and what sorting is going to be the best for that data structure. In this case we are going to be taking an example of simple numbers and integer array and we will be sorting them and then we're going to talk more about what's happening behind the scene of this sort function that is given to us by STL or standard template library. Now notice here, we are not using the templating here. We are not using uh, something uh, 
really our own design template because behind the scene what's happening are these templates. So let me show you, it will get much more clear up here. So I'm gonna create two numbers here. So I'm gonna simply say, uh, let's go ahead and say int numbers, not numbers, int numbers. And this is gonna be a simple array and I'll put up some values into it. So let's just go ahead and say that there will be three, then we'll be putting up two, maybe six, maybe four, seven, three, not three, nine would be good. Yeah, just like that. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six values into it. So let's just enter the six because it's an array. Notice here, I will be calling this one not as an array, but I will be again and again calling this as an iterator. And this is very important that you also call it as an iterator, not as an array. Because the method that we are talking about, the sort method actually works on every iterator, everything on which you can loop through, it works on that, not just on the array. So keep that in mind. Now let's go ahead and have a simple C out. So we're gonna simply say C out. And we will be saying uh, something like unsorted values. And uh, just like that, we will be putting up an end line. There we go, nice and easy. Now, obviously we need to first dump out the values on our console and one of the very best way to practice even and keep this in practice as well is we have the shorter version of the for loop now in C++. So instead of looping through all those big by int i n equals something like that, just try to pick up a shorthand number. For example, I'll be declaring a number n and that will be trading through my all of the numbers and I can just go ahead and dump out this n here on numbers, however you say that and I will be adding up this guy, and uh, there we go, looks nice. Okay, so what we can do is we can copy this, and we can paste it one more time, and this time this is gonna be sorted values. So how we're gonna sort these values? Now there are a lot of, sort of sorting mechanism that we can follow, we can break this into half, can sort it one by one, there are a lot of algorithms that happens. One that we are gonna be using is gonna be called as sort. That's it, just like that. Now what it takes, it takes the start of the iterator and it takes the end of the iterator. And in one of the video where we talked about the pointers as well, we talked a little bit about we can directly pass on numbers which gives a memory allocation of start of the value. And this can be actually incremented as well. So for example, I can say numbers and add six to it to grab the result. And I can point actually to the final value or the last of my iterator in this case. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this program. If there are any errors, we're gonna debug them. So there we go, we can see that first unsorted values, and in fact, uh, we didn't got any of the end line here, but anyways, you got the point. So what we can see, uh, I would like to first and foremost put up a slash in here. Let's go ahead and, uh, ah, anyways, let's discuss this. Let's not go for these function, uh, beautification of the program. So first and foremost, we got unsorted values. So three, two, six, four, seven, nine, as it is what we have got here. And then the next time we are able to grab two, three, four, six, seven, nine. So the values are definitely getting sorted out. Now, one other thing that you should remember uh, behind the scene that this sort might be optimized, might not be optimized because behind the scene, it's not actually implementing some of the very famous of the sort. By the way, it, the sorting which actually is happening behind the scene in most of the cases, it's gonna be an intro sort, which is not even a good popular sort. Now, first and foremost, intro is usually a, a kind of a hybrid sort, but let me just be very clear that what you're gonna read behind the scene and what interviewers usually expect is that the sort method that you put up default, it actually uses a quick sort mechanism behind the scene. But there is a catch there that not only it only applies these uh, uh, this quick sort, but it also keeps on evaluating whether it is optimized for memory or not. If it sees that there is some optimization threshold being crossing over, then it doesn't really apply the quick sort, then it automatically switches on to heap sort. Now, if you don't know how the heap sort work, that's gonna be a problem because most of the compiler actually gives you an option of using forcefully the heap sort which is applied behind the scene. So you're gonna notice something very, very different in the result. I can definitely pass on these numbers and the same uh, ending of it, uh, plus six, and it's gonna be very easy for you to understand the, the difference between the result that's gonna come up in a second if you know uh, the data structures. Otherwise, just keep that in mind that it can give you sometimes some weird results. So if I go ahead and do that, you can see that now we have got two 
uh, then we have got four, then we have got six, seven, nine, and then the last value is three. So yes, it can behave a bit odd based on what values you are inputting it, so be extra cautious. I won't be talking much onto this. It would be injustice to talk about it without talking about the heap sort and the quick sort and a bunch of other sortings as well, which I've already done in my other course. So this is a quick idea uh, to have it. And where does this STL kicks in into this entire thing? Now notice here, very interestingly, that we're gonna change this one as float. And this one is gonna have six, so that's okay. So we're gonna say 3.3, uh, uh, this one is gonna be 3.5. Basically, I'm just converting all the values into some kind of decimal value so that we have floating values. Doesn't matter what that is. And just the last one, 9.8 is good. Now here, uh, that's all looking good. And we don't even, I don't think so we need to change this one here, but actually we need to. Uh, let's go ahead and change this one here and we need one more here. So float, there we go, nice and easy. I think this is good enough. Now what happens when I run this program now? Let's go ahead and see that. That actually gives me the exact same result what I was expecting in this case. How that happened? Again, the magic of templating. This, how the sort method is defined is moreover like a generic programming. It doesn't care what values you are throwing them up, whether these are integer or these are floats, whatever that is. I'm gonna try my best and will apply the sorting mechanism over it. So this is, again, generic programming being happening behind the scene and that's why it is a part of STL or Standard Template Library. I hope you have enjoyed this one. Let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to another video. In this video, we're gonna be covering up another topic of algorithm, which is searching. So we have seen that how sorting can be done in the last video. And here's a quick side note. Will you ever be using sortings and searching like this? Probably not, but in many cases, these can be lifesaver and that's why they are here. In majority of the cases and even competitions, you will be modifying these algorithms. So chances are high that you'll be writing code from the scratch and on your own, okay. The only issue with the searching that we are learning here and the default STL searching is, it works with the sorted array only. So make sure before you perform or use this method, you are all sorted in your array. Without this, it's not gonna work. And the simple reason behind that is because behind the scene, the algorithm that works in this is actually a binary search or also known as divide and conquer. So you keep on splitting your array and try to find that. Again, I'm not going much in depth because that is covered in my other course and going too much in the depth of how they work and processing all of that on a pen and paper is really out of scope of this course. So now how do we do that? We are taking again, same example. I have converted that into integers and I'm not really a big fan of how the implementation is actually of this particular sort is in this. I would, re I would, refer I would recommend you to go ahead and uh, implement it on your own. Moving further. We have got an array, which has got six, and another integers are there, and we are printing them out, and before going or doing anything else, we are actually sorting it out. And we are using simple method for sorting. As I said, as long as you remember that behind the scene, binary search actually works on, which is almost like divide and conquer. We can go ahead and say binary search. Now this binary search, actually not this one, uh, binary search that we're gonna talk about is this one. So it requires you to have a forward iterator, then a forward iterator, and then a constant value. Remember in the very first video, not very first, but actually in one of the video in this section, I talked to you about there are variety of types of iterators, the forward iterators, uh, and there were a couple of others we discussed. I, won't, I don't want to just drag this again, but this is a type of forward iterator that we are using here. So again, the issue is really same. We want to provide the forward first iterator and forward last iterator. And let's go ahead and do that. So first and foremost, we're gonna pass on this numbers. For the last one, we are gonna say numbers and we'll add six to it because that's the last value. And what is the value that you really want to search? Probably I want to search seven in this case. And that's how you do it. But chances are high that you won't be using it like this, although this is perfectly accurate, but you won't be using it like that because it really gives you uh, information that whether this number is present or not, whatever the number you actually want to search for. So what you can do is you can cut this out and we can use if and else block here and can paste it. So if the number is gonna be found, then we can simply print out a C out message and can say number 
found, of course, in all caps. And uh, let's have an end line, looks nice and easy. And in the other case, we can actually print this out and can say number not found. Okay, looks great. Let's go ahead and run this. And uh, we see, of course, a number found here. But if I try to search for something like 13, which is not present, and if I run this one this time, number not found. So this concludes that this binary search actually works nicely. Am I a fan of this binary search? No, not like how this is being implemented in the C++. I really don't like it that much. But again, everybody has their own opinion and you have full right to have your own opinion. Uh, but I would recommend you to just go ahead and do your own implementation. Even the STL and the generic implementation of this binary search, I'm not a fan. But anyways, you got the point that how this can be used. So that's it for algorithm of searching and sorting in the STL. And I'll catch you up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Atesh here and welcome to another video. Although our topic about algorithms is almost done, but I just wanted to mention one more thing which is actually super good, my personal favorite too. And the way how this is implemented is so much nice and so much better. I'm a big fan of this particular topic. Also, this particular thing may be or may not be, may be used in a variety of competitions as well. Because in those competitions, although you will never be implementing th things like uh, what is bubble sort or what is a heap sort, there are some variants or version that you have to figure out on the go. There is no tutorial or no book for that. On the go, you have to figure them out. And one of the key essential thing is we get a sort data and based on some condition, we have to actually split this data into two halves. Again, what condition, what not, these are really very relevant topic for some another day, not for this series. So let's go ahead and let me show you what actually it means. So first and foremost, we're gonna go ahead and have a return zero at the end. Doesn't really matter, although in this case, we'll show you just a moment. Depends on compiler, you don't actually always need to pass on this return zero, may surprise a lot of you. But let's just say, we are gonna have a vector, make sure you have a vector class imported. If you have already watched the video, I'm pretty sure you are comfortable with that. So we're gonna be simply saying that I want to have a vector of integers, and feel free to have any vectors in this case. I'm gonna just go for integer. I'll call them as my ints, and I'll have a value into them. So the value is gonna be from one to 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, maybe more. Feel free to add more values into it. Okay, now first and foremost, we want to iterate through over them. So we're gonna be saying something like this, that hey, for loop, please go ahead and declare an integer x. And this x will be iterating through over all the values. Although writing here x would not be great idea, I'll show you in a minute that why is it. And uh, what we are doing inside that is we'll be displaying this x and we'll be showing up with a space. And that's all what we'll be doing. And just once we are outside the loop, we are gonna simply say C out. I'll be going a bit old school slash in just like that. Now, if I run this program, this program is gonna run fine if I can actually put up these guys here. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and run this one, build succeed, and there we go, it runs nicely. And just to show you the side notation as well, I can actually remove this, save this, and I can run this one too. And this is also gonna run fine. So again, there's a lot of things you can learn on the go. Return zero is one of that, and modern compiler is, modern compilers are designed way differently. Again, I'll put it that because it might freak out a lot of people. Okay, now we have we have seen that how this is being done. The another algorithm which is given to you by STL, which is my my personal favorite, is actually partition. And the reason why I actually love it because you can actually provide it not only just first last, but there is a predicate there, which is my personal favorite. First, let's deal up with the situation how we can have a forward iterator first. Simply, we can ask it that my ints, which is a vector, please give me a begin. And what is gonna be the last? I can ask my ints again that, hey, what is your end? There we go. Now comes the predicate part. Predicates are actually a lambdas. And whenever I see lambdas, that means I just smile at that. that. That means there is unlimited power that is given to you by lambdas. Define your own functions, define your own uh, conditions and just do whatever you like to do. So I can actually define a lambda directly here. This is how we start the lambda. This is how we return the value. And this is how we write the definition. Is it weird? A hundred percent. I told you at the time of lambda discussion too. So what you'll be returning? 
I don't know what value will come up, so I'm gonna make it as auto and I'll call it as an X. And here I'll say that, hey, whatever the value you simply return, just go ahead and say return. And the expression that we are gonna be returning actually depends on what you really want to do. In this case, I'll say that, hey, we are gonna just take a, a module from two, and if the value is equals to zero, basically a simple condition to test out even and odd, we're gonna return that. Now, the question comes is, what happens to those values which doesn't match to this condition? And what happens to the value who matches out these condition? And that's where the partition comes into the picture. Let me show you that. Let's copy this and let's print it out again. This whole partition, wherever you have given the memory, actually automatically works on them. So when I run this one here, notice here that a 10, 2, 8, 4, 6, these are all which satisfies the condition, moves on to the left hand side, and 5, 7, 3, 9, 1, which doesn't satisfy the condition, moves on the right hand side. And the best thing is that behind the scene, they work with the algorithm, which is O of M, not really the best, but it's not really the bad either. It's actually very good, very optimized. So we can go ahead and work on with that. Pretty nice, told you. And I love these lambdas here. Again, this can be a bit of confusing code if you haven't watched the previous videos, so go ahead and watch them. There is another guy here, which is also known as stable partition. And of course, there is a whole lot of detail about just the partition. Uh, this stable partition actually keeps the order of the values, however you have given, tries to maintain it but it's really tough to maintain when you are having a condition and all of that. It tries it best, but I'm not gonna recommend that, that it's gonna serve the job always. You tend to be happen to be using more of the partition as compared to anything else. Again, it's not possible to discuss more about partition because it's a very big library, not library, it's a very big class that has a lot of methods and you can do it. One final thing I would like to also mention here that Usually you're gonna see me doing this minds.begin.ends because it's much more easier for me to explain it this way. In a lot of code, you're gonna see something like this, which says, hey, begin, and they provide you this inside it. So like my ints, there we go. And again, this is perfectly valid. It's going to work absolutely fine. And technically speaking, there is not much of a difference between this version and this version, sort of a member function and stuff, but we won't be going down into that lane. Just wanted to mention that yes, these things do happen and you'll be seeing tons of code like that. So I hope you have enjoyed this and let's catch up in the next video. Hey there everyone, Atesh here and welcome to the new section on STL. We are still continuing our journey in the standard template library, although whatever we have studied so far is good enough to give you a brief idea, but I thought let's go one step further and give you more information about it. In the last section, we talked about functors and some basics. In this section, we're gonna talk about containers. As you know, containers are just like simple variables or a bit more like an array, but definitely on steroids and different kind of a steroid. And every container has their own specialty and methods that comes with them. Some are really very specific about accessing the values at an instant time, or some are really specific about uh, adding the value or removing the value. So each one has their own purpose. In this video, we're gonna talk about uh, vectors. Now, now, I would like to remind you, because a lot of you are just jumping from section to section, we have covered about the vectors in a couple of videos in the past as well, so consider this as a part two or a part three on the vectors. In this video, I'll just walk you through some of the brief things that you should know about vectors, and definitely go ahead and watch the video where we first talk about the vectors, which was much more in detail. Let's go ahead and get started. So first and foremost, again, there is no video or I don't think so there is any tutorial which can cover everything and every method about vector, but I'll give you enough of the knowledge that you can declare your vectors and can ask some questions to it. So as you know, vector simply starts like that and make sure the vectors are included. It is essential to use the vectors and you can provide any of the data type in it. You can design your custom classes and can input that as a vector and can use all the functionality of vector. But in this case, we are gonna use the default data type. It can be string, it can be nums, anything like that. Now this is an initialization of the vector. And let me declare another one. This one is gonna be more over like string. And we're gonna call this one as heroes. Now another way of initializing a vector is just like this. It might look a bit of strange as well, but yes, this is actually totally uh, valid and totally allowed as well. So we are gonna say Batman, and we are gonna have a flash, and we will be putting up 
Okay, why is this not taking up? Because I forgot. There we go. So Batman, we got Flash, and we're going to get one more, which is Superman, probably a bit more. And we are going to have a Robin. So there we go. So this is, as you can see, if I try to build this up, this builds nicely and even is going to run nicely. And this definitely can surprise some of you that where is the equal sign and all of that. But yes, this is a special implementation and vectors are allowed to have runtime values directly. So this definitely is a bit stranger, but we got this one. Most of the time, we are going to see that you use your vector and you use a push back method to insert a value into it. For example, if I just say, hey, add value 5, and I'm going to copy this number of times. So copy that and paste that probably 3, 4 times. And you're going to see 5, then 6, 7, and 8. So this is the most common way of inserting the values inside the vector. But you're going to see that sometimes people try to run the loop and try to take input from the user or try to add some values into it. So for example, we can run a simple for loop. Let's initialize i with 0. And we're going to be inserting 5 or 6 values. So i is less than equal to 5. And we are going to say plus plus i. We're incrementing it. And then you can insert the value. Again, for inserting the value, most of the time you're going to see that people use this pushback. And we're going to inserting whatever the value of i is. OK. So this is a very common way of inserting the values into it. Now, coming up on to the questions, you can ask a lot of questions to the vectors. We have seen that in the past one video as well. Let me walk you through with some of the questions that you can ask. So let me show you that. So what you can do is you can ask this nums a lot of questions. One of the questions that you'll be asking most of the time is size. So you can ask directly, what's your size? And can loop through these uh, vectors more efficiently. Or you can ask more over things like, what is your exact capacity? Now, definitely there are methods through which you can resize the capacity of a vector. And the, the scale up sizing happens automatically, but is very, very cost, not very cost efficiently, because the entire array is being copied and is being placed somewhere else, which is a very cost inefficient method. Apart from that, you can ask more questions. And one of the questions that you'll be asking is, uh, what's your max size, which actually returns a pretty big number and big size. I would like to insert a bit of value here so that we have it. And we're going to insert an end line so that everything just goes, come on, at the end line here. So let's copy this and paste it right here and right here as well. OK. Now we're going to save that. And these are the questions that you can ask. I'll run the program at the very end. First, let's have a small discussion about it. Now, a couple of questions that you definitely would be asking uh, your vectors quite a lot is something like this. When we have these nums, and you can ask the question that is empty. And my editor is really great enough to give me an idea that it returns a Boolean value. So there is a more things like emplace and stuff like that for iterators. We're not going in depth of that. But you can see that empty is a method uh, which can return me a Boolean. And I can do all the if and else and conditional checking based on that. I'm going to put an end L here as well. Now moving forward, how we are going to be displaying the values of the number is the most interesting thing and probably the most uh, you can say variety is available in this section, how we can display the values. Again, all of them are absolutely correct and absolutely great. There is no such this is wrong, this is right. Feel free to use any one of them. So we're going to simply define an auto i. Uh, you can define an integer as well. But in this case, the way how we are using it, we want to declare a variable type with an auto. We have already discussed the auto in the past. So we're going to first initialize it from the start of the vector. So for that, we can ask questions to vector that give me the location where you begin actually. And then we want to keep it running till we hit the very end of it. So i is uh, keep it running till you hit i is not equals to nums dot end. And we are going to say plus plus i. So this keeps on incrementing nice and easy. Now after that, we can simply go ahead and simply say, hey, the c out. Now important thing to notice that I cannot do c out i here directly and stuff like that. There we go. Now you might be asking why I cannot do this because this i is actually not valid. It's not a variable that you are implementing here. It's not definitely an integer. So what this returns us nums.begin is actually 
an address where this location actually starts. We have seen and discussed that in the past as well. So moreover, this is moreover treated like, an in, like a pointer. So once I do this, now I'm totally allowed to run this method. So if I run this, everything is gonna run nice and fine. Uh, let me show you that. So first and foremost, we asked uh, the size of it, then we asked for the capacity, and then we go for the max size. We asked the question, is it empty? Definitely not. And then we finally dumped all the values here. And definitely the size is actually reserved a bit more compared to what you are putting up the variables. But we can, uh, we can do a lot of things in here. For example, now definitely the implementation is a little different, but the nums, we have option of uh, shrink to fit as well. It's not gonna work directly here. The implementation is different. I'm not gonna cover everything here, but we have these options. And in fact, if I just say nums dot, I can see they have, I have got a whole lot of things. Like I can use uh, back, begin, clear, end, front, insert, pop back, reverse begin, uh, reverse end, there is no end of this talk up here. Now I would like to uh, close this talk by showing you uh, one more thing which we have discussed in the past as well, but still uh, for all those people who are jumping around the sections, uh, what you're seeing here about the nums begin, uh, nums end and the nums begin, this actually can be replaced by another way which you'll be seeing quite often is uh, something like this. You use a begin and then you pass nums and same goes for the end as well we can write the exact syntax uh, by saying, hey, I want to grab an end, and what the end I want to grab is for nums. And again, there is no thing like uh, this is more efficient or that version is more efficient. They are exactly same efficient, and you can use any one of them. So this is a small talk on vector. I highly recommend to go out, read some of the docs from Microsoft or any other company which, uh, which are talking more on the vectors. It's a very good thing, very popular, and most talked uh, thing in the STL. So go ahead. Don't be shy, spend probably a day, two, or probably even a week in just exploring more about vectors. It's gonna be helpful for you. That's it for this one, and let's catch up in the next one. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, and another data type, or another container in the STL, which is equally famous to vector, is list. And list is a bit different from the vectors. In the vectors, we always have a guarantee that we'll have a continuous space in the memory. But in the case of list, it is not guaranteed. But the best part is that although vectors and list are different, but still we have an access of iterator through the list and we can loop through them. Now, at a very first overview site, it, it might look that we are definitely talking just about the arrays, but in the case of list, it's not really a guarantee that we'll have a continuous memory allocation of the space. But still, we have an access of iterators, that means we can loop through over them and can dump out all the values or all the information. So under the hood, they are very powerful, they are very good, and we're gonna take a look on that. Now, one thing also you should uh, keep in mind that in the case of list, the traversing of the list is not really considered as very optimized, or we can say it is really expensive. And in the case of inserting the value or removing the value from the list is really, really quick. In fact, really, really quick. Now, lists are mostly used in the case when you have a doubly linked list. In case you don't know what that is, it's totally okay, just a side information. For the singly linked list, we have a different kind of container that is mostly used. For the doubly linked list, we use these lists. But again, there are other data types which you can modify and can uh, do this exact same work as well. So just for the side info. So how do we use the list? Just like we have used vector, we have to first include that. Let's go ahead and include and say, hey, list. And that's pretty much it. It's gonna work almost in every single compiler. Now, how do we declare a list? Just like vector, you can have a list and you can insert your own custom design class or you can use your by default uh, data types like integer, string, or anything else. I'm gonna call this one as my list. And now let's see that how we can actually insert information in the list. Now, surely we can put it up one by one. I'll show you that as well. But the most common one you are gonna see is having a simple loop. And in the loop, we're gonna start with an integer. I'm gonna start with three for no good reason, but I'm gonna get started with the three. And I'm gonna keep on increasing it. Uh, just keep on filling the value till i is less than equal to uh, 10 maybe. And we are gonna increment that by plus plus i or i plus plus. It's not gonna bother in this case much, but yes, we have discussed that. And then we use, what we use to insert the data inside this 
is again the same uh, method that we go for vectors as well, which is push back. And I can keep on adding the value in here. Okay. So assuming that my list now contains a value which is from 3 to 10, it's going to be added up here. But what about if I want to add more value? What you're going to notice that how we do that is just by adding a my list dot push back. Interestingly, how we actually get data out from it. Now, there are a couple of ways how you want to get the data out. First is just for the reading purpose, I want to check what's inside my list. And second is I just want to remove it. The most common operation that you'll be doing using the list is actually popping the values. First and foremost, let's see what's inside them and then we'll be doing the popping. So you can check out what's inside the front like this. And you can also do something like this, my list dot back. And you can check what's actually placed at the very first position of the list and what's uh, at the very last of it. But this actually is not going to dump the value on our console. So we're going to say see out like that. And I'll be adding an end line here as well. There we go. And I think we can just copy this entire stuff and we can paste that here as well. There we go. And we can say back. So this is about just checking whether the data, uh, what data is actually inside the list. But what about if you want to remove some of the data? If you want to remove some of the data, then what we have got is we can simply, we don't need to actually see out for that. We just want to delete that. So my list and there is a pop operation. But again, pop operation is given with the two features to you, pop back and pop front as well. So this time, let's just pop a value from the back. So whatever the value is there at the very end of the list will be removed. Remember the difference here. This front and back is actually showing you the data that what's there. This is just peeking into the list. This pop back, pop simply means just get that value and just destroy it. Even though you are able to, some of the cases you are able to see uh, what the value which popped out, but pop means it's gone. It's not no longer be the part of the list. Okay, now after that, once we have seen uh, this pop back here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try to print it up. But before I print it, let me show you one more method that you'll be using a lot is this guy reverse. So this is not part of the algorithm. The algorithm part is more over sort and search. This is a special feature of the list which can reverse the entire list. Again, the reversing is not really very reliable because in the case of integer, it's going to work really fine. But if you have something of a data type, which is your own custom design class, I don't recommend to use this because it might just jumble your data. Okay, let's go ahead and just grab all the values and dump them. So I'm going to use a range based loop this time, I'm going to simply go ahead and say get me an auto I. And then we have to loop through with this my list. And then all we have to do is see out and we can directly use this I to dump out the value, I'm going to add this one like that. And after that, I'll have a see out for an end line. There we go. Now let's go ahead and run that and first see what the values we are getting and how things are working. So first and foremost, I checked out that what's the, uh, I actually inserted the value. So from three to 10 is being inserted there. After that, we checked out what's actually in the front of this list. So three is definitely at the front, the last value is at the back. So that's my 10. And then I said, Hey, just remove one value from the back. So 10, technically got removed at line 27. Then I asked that please reverse my list. And since it was in the integer, it was pretty quick and easy to do this. And the operation was exactly how I expected. But this comes with a caution that in case you're using some of your custom templates and classes, this might actually be very, very dangerous to use. After that, I dumped up all the values using the simply for range based loop that we have seen in the past. And we can see nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. So this is pretty good and pretty okay in this case. Now let me show you one more thing here. Uh, this is going to be coming up from this algorithm mainly. So these my list actually has an access So my list dot sort and this is going to just sort it. Again, is it a recommended way to go for all the data types? Probably not. In this case, we are having a special data type, which is integer, and which is going to work absolutely fine. So I can just copy this, uh, this piece of code, run that. And we are going to see that sort is able to actually sort all of my data pretty, pretty nicely. Again, is this guaranteed all the time? Uh, probably not. And is this only the method that we have got with the my list? No, definitely not. My list is a very, very 
uh, elaborative topic. You can have an assign, begin, clear, end, erase, front, insert, uh, merge, pop back, pop front, push back, push front, remove, resize. You got the point. It's a really, really very explicit. And you can see the list of methods are really, really long here. So what is my recommendation? I think you know it by now already that please go ahead and spend some time on the list as well. You now have got that how things actually work. You have got a basic beginner friendly idea that how you can test out these methods, even though you're looking them from the documentation, this is gonna help you a lot. Don't be in a hurry, spend good amount of time on list as well. It, it is gonna serve you well in the future. That's it for this video and let's catch up in the next one. Another data structure in this STL is Q. Now Q are very specifically designed. They have certain limitations on them and all for good reason because the data structure or the situation you are in actually demands this kind of data structure. Again, what situation? God knows or probably you only knows. But we have these kinds of data structure. Now Q is almost like a McDonald's Q and they follow the same rule. Whoever goes in the McDonald's first will be served first and then the later on. So they follow the FIFO rule here. First in, first out with a bit of a small exception in a similar data structure, which is priority queue. We have DQs as well, but we're gonna talk about them later on or probably next video. Let's go ahead and talk about these queues. Again, not all the features are gonna be available to you in the queue because this is being designed, keeping in mind that we have to put certain limitation on the methods that we are actually making available for the user. So how do we get started? It's actually pretty simple. We go ahead and say, hey, I want to use queues. So there we go, queue. Now first, let's go ahead and use this queue. So I'm gonna say, I want to use queue. As you can see, you can use class T. That means you can use your uh, templating, but in this case, to keep things absolutely simple, we are gonna go ahead and say, I want to use integer. I'm gonna call this one as my queue for queue, like that. And the only thing that you have to know about the queue is you can add the value. So you have this push. Uh, in some of the other data structure, you will be provided with more uh, freedom in how you want to insert the data here, it is just push because it's like a McDonald's queue. Uh, we're gonna talk about this data structure later on. I should not be going ahead of myself, but later on you're gonna see that uh, the push from front and push from back is allowed in another data structure. I won't be talking about that data structure anymore. Let's keep it only to this one here. So we're gonna say the push and now notice one thing very, very interesting and I'll show you this one here. So make sure you understand and keep an eye on what data I'm inserting because the priority queue is gonna be very interesting in this case. So I'll adding some of the data into the push. So first uh, the 10 guy goes in, then the guy 12 goes in. I'll have this one and then we go ahead and 14. Uh, probably have one more which is gonna be 16. There we go. Okay, so this is all what we have got. We have added 10 and behind the 10, 12, 14 and 16. Pretty easy, no big deal. Now this my queue, what you can do is you can ask questions to it, like what it's at the front end on the value. Now let me actually go ahead and do the C out of this one. And I will add a simple, not here, I will add up a li end line here as well. There we go, nice and easy. Now if I run this program, you're gonna notice that it's gonna give you that who is at the front and 10 was at the very front of this queue and that's what we get at the return. We can ask that who is at the end of it so I can simply say, hey, who is actually the end of it or not the end actually, it's a back, my bad. <laughs> who is at the back of it and we can run this one and this is gonna see the 16, who was at the very last or who is still at the very last. Now notice here what we can do is we can actually pop some of the values. Pop simply means just remove the one value. And you might have guessed right that who is gonna get a pop here. So I'm gonna just uh, copy this here and paste this here. So this will give you a brief idea that what's happening. So when I run this pop, now notice here, and I forgot this one. Now let's go ahead and run this one. So notice here what I see is 16 is there, 16 is still here. So who got actually popped? who is going to get popped when you get at the McDonald's uh, line here. And that will give you an answer and let me show you that. So there we go. Now it is 12. So who got popped up? 10, the first guy who got into the McDonald's line. So there we go, this is the whole thing. Now one thing that you might really not like about this MyQ is it doesn't give you a great access to the iterators and that's the only not so great thing about it. So 
how do we iterate through over it? We iterate through a very, very strange syntax, and which is really not one of my favorites. So we can use the while syntax and I can ask the this my queue that are you empty or not. Now this obviously is gonna keep me, uh, return me a Boolean result, but I want to keep on doing this. So I'll use a negative value of it. So until unless the negative result is actually uh, okay, I just keep on, I, as soon as there is something inside the queue, I want to keep on iterating a simple negative logic. I won't be talking too much, otherwise I'll lost in myself. Okay. So this is all what we have got. Now the syntax is again a bit weird inside that. So what we have to do is I'll just add a simple empty parenthesis first and then I'll ask a question again. So my queue, can you show me what is at the front of you? And it's gonna say, hey, I can actually show you easily that. But what's bad about this one here is that you have to actually pop out the values as well. So we have to say my queue dot pop. And since popping always happens from the front, the front guy will be, will be removing it and the next guy will automatically come up front and will show that. But this actually results in an empty queue once you actually run this one because we're not only just seeing it, we are actually performing an operation which is removing the values from my key. So if I run this one here, and notice here we get 12, 14, and 16, but if I just try to see a value here, what's actually at the front, copy and paste that, and I'm gonna just run a C out, and this one is gonna have a, just a simple slash N, like that, and I'll have one more C out, and this one is gonna say uh, outside something like that so that you can get a notice that yes, we are actually outside and line and there we go. So now if I run this one, you are going to notice that there is actually nothing. So this is uh, what we are actually trying to pop the value. There is nothing at the front. It's actually zero. We never inserted a zero there. So this is a really bad situation that if you try to loop through it, you try to find out what's there, it's actually uh, goes and just gives you nothing, nada there. Okay, now moving more front on to this, uh, since we have these Q and we are talking about it, let's go ahead and talk about one more type of stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead at the very end of it and we'll show you something very, very interesting. Exactly same concept as the Q, but this time we actually call it as priority Q. And just like you can define your Q, you can have your priority Q. I'm gonna call this as my PQ for my priority Q. And my PQ is gonna get some of the values. So let's get push some of the values. Notice the difference here. Here we also called it as push. Here we are also calling the push, but this time I'm gonna add a few values. So notice here, I'm inserting 10. I'm gonna copy this and we'll paste it some more time. So 10 goes in here, but this time the next value that's going on in here is 40. Let's go ahead and paste another value, probably 50. And then we are gonna grab a value, probably five. Now keep in mind that what we are adding, this works almost like a queue, but with a different hint here. Here we are adding first in the line of McDonald is 10, then 12, then 14, and then 16. So these are how they are inserted. Here also they are inserted with 10, 40, 50, and then the five value goes in. Now what I want to do outside of that, I want to show you that what value is actually going on. So I'm gonna copy this, and I'm gonna paste this here and I'm gonna run this, and you're gonna notice some very surprising difference here. Okay, and uh, looks like we are not actually printing that out. Obviously, we are, re we are repeating this. We need to print out and work on this my queue, my bad. So we are gonna add my queue here. We'll be checking for that. And very strangely, this my queue or my pq.front is not available here. It's gonna give us an error that this front is actually not available. I don't know what that is. And the reason for that is, to keep a difference between the queue and the priority queue. So the, the working is exactly same, but here we don't call it as front, we call it as top. Okay, and that's all we have to do. And rest of the stuff, like my uh, pq.pop is gonna be available just like a normal regular guy. And of course, top works like that. Okay, seems good. Now when I run this, notice very interesting stuff here that automatically 50 is actually very top of it. Okay, and then we have got 40, then we have got 10, and then we have got five. This was not the case with the regular queue. 
So what we can deduce from this a priority queue. So the value who has highest priority will automatically bubble up at the very top. So consider this almost like a McDonald's example again, but this time the guy with the highest order is gonna be at the top automatically. He will be given a priority. Priority queue is being used a lot in the cases of especially threadings and in the cases where you're designing some of the system level work or maybe some of the operating level work, then these are being used quite a lot. And since we get an inbuilt structure from the C++, this being this actually is being overwritten quite a lot. And if even if I go to the definition of it, you can see it's not just about the top. We have got these empty methods, size, top, uh, push. Uh, there's a whole lot that we can do. Uh, so again, not really very big, but still we can do a lot of stuff in here. So this was your brief introduction about the queues and the priority queues in the STL. Let's go ahead and catch up in next video.